CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Tell me the truth. Are you sensitive... Impressionable, tender-hearted, squeamish, maybe? Are your sensibilities easily offended? Are you fussy or persnickety? If you are all or any of these things, perhaps you had better not listen to what follows, for the tale we are going to tell you is aptly called a horror story. Take them back. Take back these slippers. You don't like them? They are bewitched. But they're so beautiful. They are cursed. They are the spawn of Satan. Take them back. Our mystery drama, A Horror Story, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Robert Dryden. It is sponsored in part by Contact. The 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. You have been warned. You're about to hear as dreadful a tale as has ever been told. Appalling in its frightfulness. So pause a moment. Think hard whether you're able to endure it. If you have qualms about listening, turn to something sweet and soothing. But I urge you to gather your courage and listen. Nothing on the first floor, nothing on the second. Only the third floor remains to be explored. Uh, mm, Why do I bother? Why do I persist? Well, if anyone cares, this place fascinates me. Has for 20 years. Ever since I first came to New Orleans in 1829 and saw a crowd of frightened people gathered outside this building on Common Street. Mm, By eavesdropping among them, I learned that they thought the place haunted by a collection of gruesome ghosts. Now, let's see what's in here. Oh, I declare if the third floor yields no more than the other two, I... Ooh, I say, what an exquisite fireplace. So delicate. Pure Adam. As a world traveler, I've become something of a connoisseur. Still, you... Oh, what's this? Looks like a loose brick in the chimney breast. Oh, really, the town should take better care of... Let's see if I can pry it loose. Oh, yes, I can. Oh, why are people so neglectful? Still, no one comes here anymore. They're too frightened, I suppose. Imagine being afraid of ghosts. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh-huh. got it. Good. Now, uh, what may I find here? What could there be in the space behind the... Oh, oh, yes. There's something. Yes, yes, yes. There's a... A, a little book. A little book bound in red Morocco leather. And that... Wait, what have we here? Oh, good gracious. A pair of shoes. Oh, how sweet, how dainty. Uh, Now back to the little book. Uh, Oh, my word. It's a diary. And the name embossed on the cover is plain as day. Gaston Donnet. Gaston. Gaston Donnet. Monsieur Savinet? Come here immediately. 
Something wrong, Monsieur Savine? An emergency. The Count is coming for dinner. It's his first visit to the Palais Sauvigné, and what do you think has happened? The head chef has had an accident, and he's in the hospital. Oh, what a pity. Well, you know who the Count is, don't you? Oh, I know, I know. What's to be done? There's nothing to be done but turn the whole thing over to you, Gaston. What? But I've been engaged as assistant chef. I don't have the capacity, the experience. My friend, I... there is no help for it. I'll tell you what. I'll give you Pierre all to yourself. Pierre? The scullery boy? Well, he's been with me for two whole years. Pierre, come here. You'll see Pierre is very knowledgeable. Yes, Monsieur Sauvignon. Pierre, my boy, who do you think will dine with us tonight? Hmm? The Count himself, friend to the king. But the head chef, he, he's at the hospital. Unhappily, but we must not let that affect us in the least. Monsieur Gaston Donnet here will be in charge. Oh. And you, Pierre, you are to leave everything else to others and devote yourself to him. Do you understand? I understand. Now... What shall we prepare for the Count, huh? Perhaps a, a, a leg of lamb, Eslington, with the proper vegetables? A Normandy sole before that. Oh, and, and, and for his particular pleasure, truffles served in the silver cocotte and wrapped in our finest linen napkin. Oh, the poor Gaston Donnet, poor chap. It's no small thing to prepare a superlative dinner for an important client. I know. I've wandered the world. I've been in Paris ho, 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 more than once. Well, uh, let us read on in the diary what happens next. Ah, uh, when the Count has eaten his dinner of truffles, of Normandy sole, of lamb Eslington, and all accompanied with the best wine, and all finished off with an exquisite plum brandy, what then... Success, success, Gaston. Oh, what a great success. I'm so happy, Monsieur Sylvie. He raved about the souffle. He was ecstatic over the leg of lamb. He all but, but kissed the vegetables. Oh, let the head chef stay in the hospital. You, you, Gaston Donnet, you are the best chef in all of Paris. Oh, Monsieur Sauvignet, surely not. Now listen, listen, dear chap. The Count intimated to me just before he departed, he plans to come back soon. It's too much. Now, that, 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 dry your eyes ah. and get on home, because that's where I'm going. Pierre? Monsieur? You'll uh, close the place, won't you, so that our heroic friend here can go home? Yes, Monsieur Sauvignet. Then good night, my valiant Gaston. Good night until tomorrow. Good night. Oh, what a glorious night it has been. Aren't you going home, Monsieur Nenet? What? Home? <laughs> to tell your wife about your success. I have no wife. Oh, there must be someone you can boast to. Monsieur Sauvignet said the Count adored the souffle and the lamb. All but kissed the vegetables, he said. But he said nothing about the truffles. <laughs> no, he didn't. The beautiful truffles in the silver cocotte. Pierre, did the Count enjoy the truffles, do you think? Well. If so, why didn't Monsieur Sauvignet mention it? Well, they were a little overcooked. Overcooked? You said overcooked? I heard the Count remark to his lady friend that they were slightly overdone. After all, they require only seven to eight minutes in the oven, and yours were in there for ten. That's not so. That's not so. Oh, yes, I noticed. At least ten minutes. Why, you dirty little beggar. Why, you... Oh, keep, keep away from me. Keep away from sure me. Sure, that, that knife. No, the knife. Put down the knife. The filth. Please. 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 Oh. 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 You... You... You killed me. Piece of dirt. Nothing but a piece of dirt. Oh, absolutely incredible. Fantastic. Oh, my, I'm not at all sure I should let you hear this part. It's too, uh, too, uh, too, uh, uh, well, we've read this far together, and I know you're perishing to find out what comes next, so, all right. Gaston Donnet, as you've heard, stuck a kitchen knife right through Pierre's heart, and Pierre fell down dead. 
Then Gaston, appalled at what he'd done, dragged the boy's body into the little cuisine, and there he... Oh, there I tell you. Uh, There he removed Pierre's clothes and burned them in the small fireplace ordinarily used to incinerate discarded skin and feathers and uh, uh, other rubbish. Then he... Oh, this is fantastic. He, uh... Well, he dissected and dismembered the body and removed every last bit of flesh. And then... (laughs) Really, this part is superb. He prepared the flesh in any number of ways. Marinated, stuffed, gratinade, minced, pickled, smoked. Oh, you do have to admire the man's ingenuity. Oh, say you do. Then the following day, there was such an outcry in the kitchen. Where is he? Where is that boy? Where is that good-for-nothing boy? Yes, stone heaven's name, what's the matter? Stupid upstart. Pierre never showed up, Monsieur Sauvignet. I've waited all morning. I've searched the place. No sign of him. No word from him. Nothing. Yes, so calm yourself. What am I to do without a scullery boy? I shall find you a scullery boy. Within the hour, you shall have a scullery boy, and a good one, too. Because you know what? The Count is repeating his visit. The Count? Yes. He's enamored of your cooking. Who knows? One day he might invite the king to be his guest. Would he come? Who knows? Now, what shall we serve the Count tonight, huh? Monsieur Sauvignet... Is it true that the Count did not appreciate my truffles? I heard something to the effect... Oh, that was nothing. A trifle overcooked, he said, but it was nothing. Now, for this evening, first uh, some scampi, perhaps? Leave the menu to me, monsieur. I shall prepare something... something incomparable. Something... New. You don't want to tell me what you have in mind. I want to work from my own inspiration, my own invention. I want it to be uh, a surprise. Oh, 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 I don't have to tell you, do I? That evening's repast was a mad success, a wild triumph, start to finish. Such fragrance. Freshness, such combinations of flavors, eight courses, and each one better than the last. The Count and his dinner guests agreed to a man that never, never in their gastronomic lives had they enjoyed such a repast, and they sent a great storm of compliments to the genius chef. <laughs> oh, isn't it marvelous? Isn't it divine? For, of course, you know what they had eaten with such gusto. Oh, my dear Gaston, let me kiss you, both cheeks. Oh, I kiss your hands. The Count and his friends enjoyed their dinner? Enjoyed. They were rapturous, Gaston. They were ecstatic. They were they were beside themselves. Ah, I'm so glad. And the new scullery boy, Francois, he, he served you well? Well enough. Francois is a good boy, but you, oh, you need no one but yourself and your incomparable talent. Ah, you're very kind. Yes, Tom. I cannot keep a secret. I must tell you. What secret is that? The Count is coming back. Oh? And this time, tomorrow or the night after, but certainly within the week, he hopes to bring a guest, a solitary guest. A lady? Oh, I think not. A gentleman, a high-born gentleman... The most noble gentleman of them all. What you mean? A royal gentleman, Gaston. Him? Of course, he will come disguised. It wouldn't do. Oh, no, no, of course not. And the Count wants you to prepare for this noble, this, this, uh, royal gentleman. The same dinner you prepared tonight. The same? The very same. Oh, my reputation is made. Just wait till everyone hears. Ah. Francois. Francois. Come here, my boy. 
Oh, and uh, bring the large mallet with you. The one we use to hammer out the scallops. Oh, yes, yes, that's the one. Hand it over. Thank you, Francois. Now, turn around. And now face the other way. Yes. That's it. Now stand very still. <coughs> I'm sorry, Francois. But what else could I do? say in the diary if the Count's guest was actually the king himself, although it does say that both gentlemen enjoyed that dinner immensely and sent the most effusive compliments to the chef. <laughs> However, according to what it says here, shortly thereafter, great outcries were raised by the mothers of the two vanished boys, and Gaston Donnet suddenly left Paris, never to return. <laughs> Which is quite understandable, wouldn't you say? Ready to continue? Be very sure, won't you? Because there's more to come. And if your heart stops or your hair turns white, don't blame me. I warned you, didn't I? Yes, I did. I told you from the very beginning, this is a horror story. Proceed, sweet ladies, kind gentlemen. Remember, this tale has come down to us in the form of a legend, built little by little by one storyteller after another. Each one delighted in what he had been told and then added whatever provocative details he thought might captivate his audience and seduce it into listening longer. That is, after all, how legends have come into being since the world began. Ready for the diary again, hmm? And for a change of scene? In 1829, New Orleans was already a fair city and a prosperous one. A proud and stylish and extremely forceful man, Mr. Poncet, was the leading citizen of New Orleans. And uh, into his office one day stepped a sturdy, aggressive man who looked to be about, oh, 50 years of age. Mr. Poncet, I believe. Ah, uh, the same, sir. And whom do I have the pleasure of addressing? Uh, my name is Ferro, sir. Lucien Ferro. Ah, a stranger to New Orleans? Well, not completely, sir. I have been plying my trade for some months. And your trade is? I am a shoemaker. Ah, ha, ha. You mend shoes, do you? No, I do not mend shoes, Mr. Poncet. I make shoes by hand. I cut every piece of leather. I sew every stitch with these two hands. I see. Well, now, what can I do for you, Mr. Farrow? Everyone tells me you are the most influential man in New Orleans. I want to buy that building on Common Street. Uh, which one do you have your eye on? The one with three stories, six chimneys. It's the only one vacant at present. And you want to move your shoemaking enterprise into that building? I do, sir. Isn't it a bit large? Three floors? Oh, one floor. The first one will suffice for my workroom. The third floor, that will be my home. I have walked through it. The light is wonderful. And the exquisite fireplaces in every room. Uh, but do you need so many rooms, a man living alone? Nah, but I shall not be living alone. I got married yesterday. Did you now? Well, that's splendid. <laughs> Congratulations. As soon as Camille said yes, I made up my mind that the building on Common Street must be mine. Uh, you? You're married? I, uh, alas, sir... Uh... I am a widower, but my beloved wife blessed me with a daughter, my angelic Monique, who is more precious to me than all the world's treasure. Of course. How old is Monique? Seventeen in a few months. <laughs> Soon she will make her debut. Oh, how splendid. It will be splendid, I promise you that, sir. 
I'm willing to spend half of all I've got to see that she's introduced to society in the grand style. Perhaps, uh, perhaps when she has chosen her gown and had it made, perhaps... You would come to me for the shoes? <laughs> Perhaps I shall. Uh, by the way, Faro, what do you uh, propose to do with the second floor? You'll have your little shop on the first, you'll have your living quarters on the third, but uh, what about the second? What, what'll you do with that? Oh, I'll find a use for it. Things are settling down. Quite a prosaic little diary, after all. There are lots of mundane details I won't bother to pass on to you, all about Pharaoh fixing up the top floor, this very floor, which I stand on now, and moving in with his rather uh, colorless wife, Camille. Grandiose claims of how his shoemaking industry flourished. A lot of petty boasting that you wouldn't be interested in. But now... Ah, yes... Here it starts to get interesting again. <laughs> you like this part, I think. Good morning, good morning. Oh, uh, I was looking for Mr. Lucian Faro. Is he here? He's gone out on an errand. But he will be back. He didn't say when. Oh. I, uh, I wanted to ask him to make something for me, something very special for my daughter, Monique Ponce. <laughs> Uh, you, uh, you, you work here for Mr. Faroe? I'm his wife. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I haven't had the pleasure. <laughs> uh, tell me, Mrs. Faroe, are, are you enjoying your new home? It's very nice. Your husband's fame is spreading, you know, all over New Orleans. So he tells me. Everyone says his slippers are the softest, the most pliable, so flexible. <laughs> the ladies who wore them say they can dance all night and on into the morning. So I've heard. I'll tell you why I'm here, Mrs. Farrow. I, I wanted to order a pair of his wonderful slippers for my daughter, Monique. Uh, look here, I brought a swatch of the material, her... Uh, dresses to be made from. My, my daughter has dark hair and dark eyes. Well, you can see, this is the material. Damask, isn't it? I believe that is what they call it. White damask, with just the faintest little thread of gold running through it. Beautiful. <gasps> Beautiful. Now, if uh, your husband can make shoes to match, <laughs> will he be back soon, do you think? I've got no way of knowing him. He never tells me anything. Oh, well, I'll, I'll wait a bit. Suit yourself. <clears throat> Tell me, uh, your husband has rented out the second floor, hasn't he? Yes, he has. To a restaurateur, I believe. A private dining salon, they say. So they say. Small, but uh, elegant. So I've heard. Oh, forgive me, Mrs. Farrow, but you, you talk as though you'd never seen it. I never have. Well, I am surprised. Your husband makes a, an excellent investment, and you you don't even care to see it? Oh, I care. It's grown famous all over New Orleans. The cuisine, everyone raves about it. So he tells me. But you have never dined there. Oh, no. Here's my husband now. Ah, uh, Mr. Ponce. Well, glad to see you, Mr. Pro. <laughs> Mr. Ponce wants to order a pair of slippers. Oh, fine, fine. For Monique, for my daughter. I showed your wife the material her dress is being made from. You see, the, this is a small swatch. Very nice. I can get more if you'd care to make the slippers to match exactly. No. No, that wouldn't do at all. Well, I simply thought... I have my own materials. Well, if, if you insist... I do insist. My materials are a thousand times more pliant than this damask. Oh, whatever you say, Pharaoh. Well, good day, Mrs. Pharaoh. Good day. How long was he here? Only a few minutes, Lucien. That's all. We chose to wait for you. What did you two talk about? Oh, your success for the most part. He mentioned the restaurant on the second floor. He asked if I'd ever dined there. He asked you that? Of course I said I hadn't. I said I'd never even set foot in the place. 
Why can't I see it, Lucia? Because I say you can't. But why can't I? I'd like to so much, Lucia. I've already told you why you can't. Because you say I can't. Precisely. I see. But I'd certainly like to. I hesitate to tell you what the next few pages of the diary hold. Oh, I don't think I can read on. Uh, yes, I must, if we're ever to finish this macabre tale. So I'll just tell you straight out. The secret material Pharaoh used for his extraordinary slippers was human skin. There, I've said it. And the source of his supply was the slave market. Oh, my word, what a really terrible fellow he was. Yet you do have to admire his enterprise and his courage in setting it all down here. You do have to respect that, don't you? Yes, sir? Do you have a reservation? Oh, I yes. The name is Ponce, table for two. Ah, may I show you to your table, Mr. Ponce? <laughs> I suppose you might as well, but keep an eye out for my daughter, will you? We're dining together. She has dark hair, dark eyes, and she'll arrive alone. I'll watch for her and bring her to you. Ah, here's your table. Can I order you an aperitif? Oh, no, thank you. Uh, I'll just wait for my daughter. As you wish, sir. My appetite has been whetted by what I've heard of your cuisine. I'm looking forward to... I beg your pardon. I think I see a lady alone. It could be your daughter. Ah, uh, Monique. Her name is Monique. Good evening, madame. You're expecting a gentleman? No, I'm by myself. I just wanted to see what it looks like. The management does not permit ladies unescorted. Are you the owner? I am the owner. Now, if you please... Lucien Ferro is my husband. He's your landlord. I cannot permit you to stay. He owns this entire building. It's his shoe shop on the first floor. I help him there sometimes. And we live on the third floor. But I've never set foot on this floor, and I thought Absolutely I'd... impossible. If I could just look in this one... Ah, uh, on the other hand, come with me. I'll show you the whole place. Oh, it's, it, it's lovely. I'll show you everything. You're very kind. Through this door here, if you please. Is there another room? Yes. Through here. Oh, but... but... Go on. Go on. But I, I don't... Uh, but this is the kitchen. It is the kitchen, and that is the back door. But I don't want... And you're leaving by the back door. No, I don't You're wa- leaving now. I don't want to leave. Now, Camille, this instant, you... You called me Camille. Oh. Oh, Lord. How do you know my name? Shut up, woman, shut up. Why? Lucia. It's you. What on earth have you done to yourself? Shut your mouth. But you look so young. You you, you sound so young. You, oh, you're quite different. You be quiet and get out, Camille, or you'll ruin me. What's the point of this masquerade? Why are you pretending to be two people? You're a fine shoemaker. Why do you have to be a chef as well? Why should I be one man when I can be two? But which is my husband? What is my name? You can't go on with this deception. You must stop. Never. Never. We shall be so rich coming... No. No. I won't go on this way. I can't. I don't know who I am, who you are. I'll, I'll tell. I'll tell everyone. You'll tell no one. Uh, no, no. Did you come here just when everything was going so well? Poor Camille, indeed. For her desperately ambitious husband strangled her right there in his own kitchen. And that... Oh, merciful heavens, I 
I hate to tell you what comes next, what it says here. As he looked around him, and the pots and the pans and all the accoutrements of his profession, the thought crossed his mind that... Oh, how can I say it? He, uh... He thought to himself, what a fabulous, what a fantastic dish I shall serve my customers tomorrow night. The strange, the weird, the grotesque, the bizarre. We so seldom encounter such things in our ordinary lives confined to the world of fantasy, of fiction, of fable. And for my own part, I am perfectly content that such should be the case. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Back to our legend which was invented to curdle your blood and freeze the marrow in your bones. If it has not done so, then it has failed in its purpose. For to make you gasp, exclaim, to make the hairs on your body stand on end, why, that is the very proper purpose of a horror story. I'm feeling better now, able to read on, I think. There's a passage here that reveals what you must already have guessed. The proprietor of the restaurant on the second floor was not only Lucien Ferraud, he was likewise Gaston Donnet from Paris. <laughs> oh, dear me, how things have turned around in this world. It's enough to make one's head spin. Uh, well, anyway, the diary goes on quite calmly for a while, and then... Ah, Mr. Ferrault. Mr. Ponce, welcome to my little shop. <laughs> You're looking extremely well. Oh, thank you. I never felt better. And your charming wife, is she doing well? Satisfactorily, thank you. I'm uh, sorry not to see her. She's elsewhere. You know, it was to your wife that I first showed the little swatch of damask. She admired it so much. And I told her about Monique's debut. She seemed most interested. Yes, I'm sure she was. Oh, yes, we had nice little chat, nice little chat. We spoke of your tenant. My tenant? The man to whom you let the second floor. Oh, yes. And the restaurant that he opened... Why, it's become almost as famous in New Orleans as your delectable little slippers. Has it indeed? Yes. Well, shall I fetch the slippers, Mr. Ponce, uh, for your daughter? Ah, Monique slippers. Yes. Of course. That's what I came for. I have them right here. Ah, here. Here they are. Oh, Mr. Ferrault. Oh, my friend. You like them? Like them? I have no words to convey what I feel. How white they are. How pure and white. Yes. Oh, they are like jewels. Royal jewels. I call them my masterpiece. <laughs> Has your wife seen them? Any? Uh, no. I haven't shown them to her. It'd be so nice if she were to come in right now. That is unlikely. Before I take them home? You might have a long wait. Yes, you're right. I must take them home and show them to Monique. God bless you, Faro, and give you continued success. <laughs> have you guessed it? Has your clever little mind penetrated the secret of Lucien Ferro's latest adventure? Have you succeeded in following the intricacies of his criminality? <laughs> if so, I don't have to tell you that the soft and subtle slippers which Mr. Ponce carried home in triumph were made of the white, young skin of Camille Ferro. Ferro! Ferro! Are you here? Where are you, you rogue? Come out here! <laughs> Mrs. Perot, are you here? I must see your husband at once. It is imperative. 
Well, I, I must see someone. I must see someone now. You were looking for me? Uh, you villain, you monster. Something is wrong, sir. He, the devil. I, Mr. Ponce, for what... Or I... are you a sorcerer, a wizard? Mr. Ponce... Or do you yes, have the I... evil eye? Confess, you barbarian. But what is it? What must I confess to? Oh, you know very well. No, I don't. Mr. Ponce, you left here an hour ago with the slippers. You seem to have... The been... slippers, yes, yes, the slippers. You... Don't like the Those slippers? Those cursed slippers, the abominable your slippers. Your daughter does not like the slippers. There are your slippers. Uh, take them. You're bringing them back? You take them and never let me see them again. You don't want them? You unwrap them and you'll see. Unwrap them and see what you have created. Unwrap them and behold your masterpiece. Well, I shall, I shall. Not in my presence, you won't. Wait till I'm out the door and never come near me again. What in the world? What went wrong? What? What's that? What, what's that sound? Can, can he be? Is it, is it in here? Ah, ah, my, my slippers! My, my beautiful white slippers! What, what's got into them? What, 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 is, what are you saying? Are you, are you mad? Wait, wait, no, come back. Stay still. Where are you going? I, what, what, what's got into you? No, 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 don't touch me. Not me. I, not me, not me, not me. Stay away from me. Ah, I, 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 I'm all scared. I, I, what? They're following me. You will leave me if I can get to my own floor, my own place. Right on, on the floor, floor. To, to the top. Right. I'll, I'll hide. Yes, yes, yes. I'll hide. I'll, I'll hide here. Fire! They're here! They got in! They're coming at me! Ah! They're on me! They're crawling up my back! They're inside my hair! On my face! No! Oh, no! They're sliding down my back! I... Oh, good Lord! Oh! Only rather they're on my diary! No one must ever see my diary! No one will never know what I have done! If anyone is to know! Oh, no! 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 Heaven forbid! Ah! Where can I hide it, sir? Aha! Yes! Yes! I'll hide it here behind this brick in the chimney! Yes! Yes! Here! Yes! Yes! Hide Behind this brick! No one will ever find it! Aha! Now! Now! I did put back the brick! Oh, Lord! The slippers have skittered into the chimney. They're sitting on top of the diary. I, uh, at any rate, they're not chasing me. Put, put back the brick now. Uh, have peace. A little peace. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, quiet. No noise. All quiet now. It's all very quiet. Uh, Camille, where are you? Where, where have you gone, Camille? Uh, and Francois and Pierre. Oh, the police. They're here to get me. They're, they're going to arrest me. But, but what have I done? I haven't done anything, just tried to make a living. Had little success, and I... I I'm innocent! I'm innocent! I'm innocent! Dear friends and citizens, may I have your attention? I know you... I know you expect from me some explanation of what was found in the place on Common Street a few weeks back. The authorities have said that I might tell you all that is known. Though how it all came about is a matter for conjecture. When the police broke in on the third floor of the Common Street building, they found... Uh, be brave, my friends. Be prepared for something... Horrendous. They found a dead man. They think they recognized him as the owner of the building. Though, to be brutally honest, 
They could not be absolutely sure because the body... The body, good people, had been... skinned. Yes, my friends, they have concluded that this poor man went mad and flayed himself alive. I know what you're saying to yourself. Yes, I do. You're saying, how could he read all that last part in the diary? How could anybody have written it down with the slippers carrying on like that? It's impossible. Well, you're right. The reason I know what happened is that I am Gaston Donnet, later Lucien Ferro. That is to say, I am his astral, his uh, etherical body, vulgarly called a ghost. So I know all about it. Oh, and that banging at the door that poor Donnet Ferro thought was the police? No, not so. It was two ordinary men who knocked. One wanted to buy the restaurant for an astronomical sum. The other had come all the way from Paris. A certain wealthy count had died and left a quantity of money to Gaston Donnet in memory of a marvelous meal he had cooked for the Count some years before. All that work for nothing. Where did I go wrong? Where? It seems clear that there was a place on Common Street in New Orleans 150 years ago, and a man certainly did rent it and opened a shoe shop on the first floor and rented out the second floor for a restaurant and lived with his wife on the third floor and later died. And no doubt there was something strange about the man. But those are all the verifiable facts we have. As for the rest, well, you know how people talk. And as they talk, legends are born. And legends grow. And legends never die. I'll be back shortly. The horror story in modern literature started with The Castle of Otranto, written by Horace Walpole, quickly followed by The Mysteries of Udolpho by Anne Radcliffe. Honoré Balzac took up the form and improved on it in France. Bulwer-Lytton rivaled him in England. And in America, it was brought to a peak by our own Edgar Allan Poe. Let's face it, the horror story is here to stay. Our cast included Robert Dryden, Mary Jane Higby, Ian Martin, and Arnold Moss. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. Not possible. First, because you have to see me to know that I am your mother. You mean you have proof? I have the best proof in the world. What? You will see. All right. But you'll have to come here, to my house. Very well. I know the address. I will be there within 15 minutes. Madam Burham. Something wrong, sir? She hung up. Is she coming here? Yes. She'll be here in 15 minutes, she said. She said she has proof? Proof that she's your real mother? Yes. What proof? She said I, I would see for myself. I don't want her to be my mother. I don't want to see her. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. Lend me your fears. It happens now and then that a man will vanish without warning, disappear completely without leaving a trace. Or a man will suddenly lose his memory. His body remains, but his mind has gone. What is essential in him leaves us, and we are left perplexed, mystified, frustrated. All we have to go on is rumor, speculation, theory. And since we cannot explain it, after a while, we tend to stop thinking about it. Until it happens again to somebody else. You're back. Oh, my husband, you're back. What? You won't even embrace me. Who are you? Who am I? What kind of question is that? How can you say you're my wife? We've been married for more than 15 years. No, we haven't. What are you trying to say? I'm trying to say that I'm not your husband. You're not my wife. I don't even know you. What's more, I'm not even standing here. How can I be? I haven't even been born yet. Our mystery drama... A Long Time to Die was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mandel Kramer. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. His name is Alfred Stewart Ainsley. He's 41 years old. Average height, average weight, average looks. Nothing about his appearance to make him memorable. Indeed, he has never in his life done anything to bring him notice from beyond the circle of his immediate family, his close friends, and his rather esoteric profession. His name was in the newspaper twice. First when he was born, and then 30 years later when he was married. However, he is about to make up for it. Right now, his name is on the front pages of newspapers in every country of the civilized world. Alfred Stewart Ainsley, quiet, unassuming, has it in his power to shake the government of the most important country in the world and perhaps alter the very course of history. Alfred, do you want a drink of water? Water? Darling, I know this is difficult, but... Feel okay, Al? No, Jerry, he's not feeling okay. Can't you see? There's obviously something wrong with him. Al, what is it? He's pale. He's sweating. Now, look, Al, you're not the one who's being investigated. What have you got to be nervous about? Al, say something. If you're not feeling well, we can ask for a recess. The chairman's just come in. The committee stands in order. Mr. Ainsley, we will resume with your testimony. I must remind you, Mr. Ainsley, you are still under oath. I would like to continue along a line of questioning initiated by Senator Selby. Would you turn, please, to page 684? Thank you. Here it is, Al. Question. Is it possible that Congressman Carstairs could have forged the Secretary's handwriting? Answer, Mr. Ainsley... Senator, I would have to examine more examples of both gentlemen's manuscript. Now, Mr. Ainsley, you were given these specimens to analyze overnight, were you not? Or were you not, Mr. Ainsley? Well, you took those samples, you examined them, say yes. Uh, yes. Very well. Now, are you in a better position to answer my question? Well, are you, sir? How? Had you told me you had studied them and come to a conclusion? How? Answer Adam's question. 
Counselor, is Mr. Ainsley having trouble understanding the questions? I uh, know, sir. Mr. Ainsley, it's obvious that something is troubling you. Yes, sir. Well, then suppose we take a recess, give you a chance to rest. Committee will adjourn till 3.45. <laughs> Talk to me. I never saw that before. Hmm? Saw what? A man makes smoke. The way you make smoke. Are you serious? We have pipes and we put the tobacco in the pipe and that's how we smoke. But you're holding something. What's that called? All right. All right. I can play along if that's how you want it. This is called a cigarette. Cigarette? You mean you never heard of it? No. Well, that's odd. Right here, in your pocket. Put your hand inside your shirt pocket. You have a pack of cigarettes. How long do you want to play this game? It isn't a game. Tell me what it is, then, Al. You call me Al. I'm not Al. You're not Alfred Ainsley? No. All right, who are you? My name is... Mahatwiki. Yes? In your language, it would be Running Beaver. That sounds like an Indian name. Indian. That word, Indian, yeah, yes, yes. In this language, in your language, it would be Indian. You claim you're an Indian? Yes. Well. You don't believe me? Just tell me how you got here. I was sent to the north to scout the, uh, uh, you would call them the Iroquois. Scout? Yes, to see if we should make war. War? Make war or become allies. I was on my way home to my tribe. I was at the place where the mist covers the rocks. I walked into the mist, and there was a noise. What kind of noise? Loud thunder, a flash of lightning. It was as if someone had hit me over the head with a club. I knew nothing. Then I was sitting in a strange room in strange clothes, and strange people were talking to me on a subject I know nothing about. You claim to be an Indian... You talk about fighting and wars. Well, that would be before the white men came to this country. I've never seen men like you and these others. There is one small detail that troubles me. How does it happen you speak English? I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. I was returning to my people. They live near the banks of the great river. The Great River? The Potomac. Ah. As I told you, something took place in the mist. I awoke. Now, now I am in a strange place. I find that I can speak the language, but I don't know what anything means. Where is this place? Who are you? I'm your doctor, your friend. My name is Carl Stitzer. And who am I? Al Ainsley. You're a collector of and a dealer in autographs. Historical papers. You're considered one of the top experts on handwriting. I don't know what any of that is. What is it that you know how to do? To track? To scout? To hunt? All right, Al. I've gone along as far as I can. Now, let me tell you something. Your testimony can destroy Congressman Carstairs. I don't know anything about this Carstairs. If you testify that, in your opinion, Carstairs forged those papers, then not only will Carstairs be destroyed, but the principles he stands for will be discredited. You believe in what Carstairs stands for, Al. I am not Al. You're torn, Al. You don't want to examine those documents. I don't even know what documents because are. Because if they are forgeries, you will put an end to Congressman Carstairs' political life. And you can't bring yourself to do that. I am a stranger in a strange land. I need a friend. You're afraid to find out if Carstairs is guilty. You can't face the consequences. When a man finds himself in such an intolerable situation, he, he tries to escape. You're a doctor. In my language, that means a medicine man, a magician. You've escaped to a remote past, to a long-gone, buried, forgotten world. You don't believe me. You don't believe me. <laughs> Doctor, what is it? Think, Joan. Think carefully. How long have you and Al been married? 
11 years. And how long had you known him before that? We were kids in school together back in the first grade. Then you've known him all his life? Just about. Has he ever been interested in Indians? Indians? No, not that I know of. You don't have anything in the house like, oh, handicrafts, weapons, books? That would have to do with Indians? Mm Mm-hmm. Nothing at all. Does Al have a secret life? Doctor, I'm not going to answer any more questions until you tell me what you're driving at. Well, see that he gets plenty of rest. No visitors, no excitement. And please keep in constant touch with me. Doctor, can't you tell me anything at all? No. But I do have to ask you one more question. Does he know how to shoot a bow and arrow? What kind of a question is that? Just answer it. I would say no. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, maybe we better find out. Morning, Jerry. Doc, I've been waiting for you. Is Al dressed and ready? Look, Doc, you've just got to talk to me. Why? 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 Don't pretend to be living in a world of your own. You read the papers, you hear the news broadcast. Yes. Al has to testify. Yes or no? Whichever way, it no longer matters, but he can't remain quiet. He's not the only handwriting expert in the world. The committee can call another. It's too late for that now. The rumors are out. He's been bought off. He's been scared off. And both sides are under suspicion. I admit it's an unfortunate situation. Now look, look, Doc, you can maybe stall the committee another day, maybe two, maybe even through the weekend recess. But that is about as far as you can go. I'm doing the best I can. Why can't he testify? I can't tell you. You can't or you won't? Both. Now let me tell you what's going to happen. The committee has the right to assign their own doctors to examine Al. I know. Well, how much time do I have? A week? That's really stretching it. I'm ready to go with you, Doctor. Al, Al, how do you feel? Let's go, Al. Now, why can't I come along? Goodbye, Jerry. A fox has been by here. Is that so? Mm Mm-hmm. You can see his tracks. Well, I can't. This valley looks familiar. And yet, so strange. Where are all the animals? There's no sign of deer or wolf. Where are the animals? If you really are running, Beaver, you wouldn't believe what's happened. Now, in this box is a bow. A bow? Yes. Here's the bow, the strings, the arrows. I've never seen a bow like this one. How strong. And these arrows. I don't know the first thing about it. Is this mine? To keep? To be able to hunt with? Why don't you hit that oak tree? About 60 or 70 yards to the left? Well, that's no shot. The tree is standing still. A child could hit that tree. What's moving? Is there a rabbit or a squirrel, a hawk? No, I'm sorry. There's nothing around. All right, then. I'll put this arrow into the center of the trunk of that small tree on the right. That maple. But that's almost 150 yards. It's an ordinary shot. I'm ashamed of it. But there's nothing else. Right in the center. Well, Doctor? I don't know, Running Beaver. I don't know. How do I explain this? Someone, probably a seasoned politician, said once, when in doubt, tell the truth. That sounds great, in theory. But how would you like to have to tell this kind of truth to a sharp congressional committee? We'll have more of this kind of truth when we return shortly with Act Two. a beautiful stretch of countryside running along the boundaries of Washington, D.C. and Maryland. Hilly, wooded, charming. It's the site of many lovely homes. Some 500 years ago, it was just as hilly, just as charming, much more wooded, wilder, of course, filled with game, and inhabited by Indians. Running Beaver! Running Beaver, it's you! Stop! 
Huh? You, you're alive. For days, the council has been waiting for you, Running Beaver. The council? You're ill. You've just returned from a long, hard, dangerous journey. But you're the only one who could do it. Now, what... What bothers you, Running Beaver? I, uh... I you, you act as if you don't even know me. I'm your friend, your blood brother, Eagle Wing. Come, we must go to the council immediately. Many days ago, the council sent Running Beaver and three companions north to the Iroquois nation to determine peace or war. And now Running Beaver returns alone and we ask him, where are your companions? And shall the Iroquois be our friend or foe? Speak to us, Running Beaver. Running Beaver, say something. I am very tired. The important question should not be answered by a man who needs sleep and food. Running Beaver shall return to the council after he has eaten and rested. Sit, my husband. I have meat, corn. I was so frightened, so afraid the Iroquois would kill you. Sit, rest, and, and eat. Now, I will tell you the news about the boy. The boy? Our son. He's been chosen for the Wolf Society. You always wanted that. Your mother brought him this bearskin robe. You're not eating. It's not cooked. It's the way you like it. Is something wrong? You don't look right. Perhaps you'd better see the medicine man. The medicine man? Red Bear. He always liked you. There is something wrong. This is not like you. Not to be hungry. To be so quiet. You're frightened. Why are you frightened? You wouldn't come to me, Running Beaver, so I've come to you. Leave us, White Swallow. Now, what nature of evil spirit is within you? Was there a spell cast upon you in the Iroquois country? I wonder if I can talk to you. You wonder... Your father was my closest friend. I seem to understand. How, I don't know, but I seem to understand this language. Is that a surprise? This is your language. I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't know how I got here. A spell has been cast upon you. I'm sure you won't believe, but... I am not running beaver. How can that be? My name is Alfred. In your language, it would mean a wise elf or wise counsel. Excellent name. I come from, well, perhaps it would be this same land, but, but I live, or shall live, hundreds of years from now. I could tell you stories of, of great things, of great ships flying through the air, of enormous buildings. I, I don't even know where to begin. It must be a time of great magic. Unbelievable magic. What a happy time that must be. I couldn't say that it is all that happy. I find that hard to believe. With all that magic. At any rate, I was going to an important meeting of the committee. Well, never mind what that means. I decided to walk to the bus instead of driving my car. I'll explain to you what they are later. There was a mist near Rockledge... And I walked into it and something, something seemed to explode in my head. And when I walked out of it, I, I, I was in these clothes. I was somebody else. I was frightened. I began to run. And suddenly someone stopped me. Yes, Eagle Wing. He is your friend. You don't believe a word of this. How can I? You are exactly like running beaver. Your body is his. Your voice is his. I am not running beaver. What am I supposed to say to the council? You will have to appear. The tribe has been waiting for days. The life of every man, woman, and child could depend on what you say. What am I supposed to say? The truth. The truth is what I just told you. Can I say that in front of the council? 
No. Then what can I do? Now, rest. Sleep. Sometimes the spirits speak to us in dreams. I'll need more than a dream to get myself out of this. Running Beaver? My husband? Are you awake? Mm -hmm. Oh, what a dream. Joan, you'll never imagine... Oh, no, I'm still asleep. Running beaver. I, I... Can you eat something now? Cool. Oh, here, wear this robe. Your mother made it. My mother? Please, can't you tell me what's wrong? Running beaver, may I come in? Who's that? Your oldest friend. Do you mean you don't know Eagle Wing's voice anymore? Running beaver. Running beaver, you must come to the council at once. But he's not well. I know, I know he's not well, but there's trouble. Trouble? There, there's talk all over the village. Now, what happened to the three men who went with you to the Iroquois? Did you kill them? Kill them? How could he kill them? They were all his friends. What passed between you and the Iroquois chiefs? Running Beaver, you must tell him. I don't know. I don't know. I tell you, all of you gathered here. I don't know. Running Beaver... In war and peace, you've been first among us. We sent you as our ambassador to the Iroquois. We entrusted you with the lives of three of our bravest young men. Now, where are they? Their families have a right to know. Speak. Chief, I will speak for him. No one can speak for a man before the council. Not even you, Red Bear. Running Beaver is ill. What kind of illness? He has lost his memory. That's a vineyard loss of memory. Quiet. Where is my son? Where is he gone? I can't see him anymore. Quiet! He has lost his memory? Yes. Can you cure him, Red Bear? I can try. You have six days. At the end of that time, Running Beaver will talk to the council or else submit to justice. <laughs> Why did we come out here? I'm so cold. Where is your knife, Running Beaver? Knife? Running Beaver always carries a knife. Well, I didn't think... Give him your knife, Eagle Wing. Why do I want a knife? Eagle Wing, attack him. Attack? But everyone knows Running Beaver can't be beaten with a knife. Let's make sure. I'll only do it if he keeps his knife in a sheath. Now, you know how excited he gets even when we fight in fun. Attack him, Eagle Wing. Have your knife at the ready, but Running Beaver. Look, are you ready, Running Beaver? Now. Hi. What did you do that for? I, did, did I catch you off guard? Look, I am trying to tell you people I am not... Eagle Wing, go back to the village. But I... Do as I tell you. I was once. never able to do... Go back to the him. village. There is magic yes. here. Yes, yes, I'm going. I'm going. What did I just see? You saw a man knock me down. You don't know how to fight with a knife anymore. When did I ever know how to fight with a knife? I can't believe it. I was just a quiet kid when I was in school. And I suppose you can't shoot with the bow. No. Or throw the lance. I'm trying to tell you I am not your running beaver. Then we have magic. Call it what you want. But we have trouble. <laughs> Chief of this council, I call upon Running Beaver to speak. Chief. Chief Star Tracker. I haven't called on you, Red Bear. I called upon Running Beaver. But, Chief. The council has given you six days, Red Bear, six days to cure Running Beaver. Let me talk. Gentlemen, I don't know how to make you understand. Be quiet. No, no, no. Let him talk. But he's mad. Let us judge. I am not who you think I am. I am not running beaver. I told you he was mad. You say you are not running beaver. No, I am not. I don't know how to convince you because I don't even know how it happened myself. White Swallow, step forward. Yes? Is this man your husband? Yes. She really does. Silence! Why do you deny? Are you tired of me? 
Is there another woman? Oh, good Lord. You could have been living 500 years from now. You women never change. I thought you loved me. All of you, listen to me, please. I know it's hard to believe, but I am not running beaver. Who are you, then? I am a man from a time... I don't know. It must be hundreds of years from now. Yes. Silence. 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 Well, it's not good, is it? It will depend. Depend on what? Star Tracker is a devout believer in magic. I think he believes you. Well, then it can't be bad. But the people are angry, and three young men are missing. Probably dead. The people feel it's your fault. But... Probably the council will declare that you have been possessed by an evil spirit. It's all nonsense. I'm sure you know what you think. But you asked me what I think... What will happen? The evil spirit will have to be driven out of you. How? Or shouldn't I ask? By fire, by lance, by arrows. You mean they'll kill me? That's how we drive out the evil spirit. Is there anything I can do, Red Bear? I don't know. But I'll try to think. Stand before the council. You have been ordered to report. You refuse. I tried to tell you. Therefore, the council has decided to drive the evil spirit out of you. No! Tell them, Running Beaver, tell them! We must have silence. Tonight, Running Beaver, the council will drive the spirit from you. Wait! He has the right to ask for judgment by combat. What are you saying? Must I remind the council of the law? Very clever, Red Bear. No one dares. Silence! Silence! Well, you've heard the challenge. Who will fight Running Beaver? Your reputation has just saved you. No one will dare to meet you. No one? No one will accept the challenge? Are we a tribe of trembling women? Must I... At my age, save the honor of the people. I'll fight him. Eagle Wing, you, you're his best friend. No longer. After all, he denies he's running beaver, doesn't he? The council accepts the offer of Eagle Wing. May the one who is right win. Clear a space. Wait. The law says each contestant must fast and pray for three days. No, no. Silence. We shall obey the law. We shall meet again in three days. What did you get me into? I got you three days. What good will it do me? You could learn to fight with a knife. Well, you've been a quiet, unassuming handwriting analyst all your life. You've never so much as swatted a fly in anger. Now... Suddenly, you have to fight to the death, with knives, no less. And uh, how is the other fellow doing? The one who has to face the congressional committee? We'll see how it all comes out when we return shortly with Act Three. Just as telephone wires can cross when they cover great distance, so can lives when they cover great spans of time. Two such lives have been disrupted. Running Beaver, an Indian who lived 500 years ago, and Alfred Stewart Ainsley, who is a contemporary of ours. Alfred Ainsley is now talking to his lawyer. That is, his lawyer thinks it's Alfred Ainsley. We know it's running beaver. Al, 
level with me. Is this a stall? I keep telling you, I don't know what you're talking about. I can't help it. I talk to the reporters. I talk to the committee people. Nobody understands you. You keep saying you're a friend of Al Ainsley. Yes, Al. We've been friends since college. Then you should know that I am not Al Ainsley. My name is Running Beaver. I'm an Indian. I lived about 500 years ago. <sighs> I better get Doc Stitzer back here. Jerry, what are you doing here? I ordered complete rest for Al. You know what Al just told me, Doctor? He thinks he's an Indian. It happens to be true. It happens to be... Oh, I see. Yeah, I, I think I see. What do you think you see, Jerry? They got to you too, Doc. Who got to me? I don't know. But somebody doesn't want Al to testify. He's been bought off, and so have you. Jerry, I resent the that. The two of you concocted this ridiculous... It happens to be true. Do you think that you can sell this to Senator Adams, to the committee, to the news media? I only tell you what I perceive as the truth. Oh, they'll skin you alive. What is he saying, Doctor? Something very unpleasant. That's not the worst. You're going to be finished, Dad. Your career will be ruined. You won't have an ounce of credibility left. Jerry, enough for now. No, it's not enough. They'll get you on contempt. They can even pull obstruction of justice, conspiracy. Al, do you realize you can go to jail? Jerry, he doesn't realize anything of the sort. But it should be obvious It to would him. be if he were Al Ainsley. Doc, are you crazy, Jerry, too? Jerry, this is no time for anyone to lose his head. Okay, 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 okay. Let's be calm. Let's be reasonable. How does a thing like this happen? There's no answer. I've, I've done some research, consulted. And the best I can come up with is... Look, at the speed of light... There's no regular sequence of time. The past, the present, the future, everything is mixed and jumbled up. Everything becomes a storm of pure energy. Doc, what can I do to convince you guys? Sometimes, in rare cases, our thoughts, our ideas achieve such intensity that they, too, become a form of energy and carry our minds into this, this raging storm. And minds can be mixed up and thrown from one body into another. I can't believe I'm sitting here listening. Whatever the reason, he's not Al Ainsley. Oh, I'll get a hold of yourself. Jerry, now you can't excite him anymore. I'll throw you out of here. You may not have to throw me out. I want to leave. Now, Al, in exactly three days, you'll have to appear before that committee. If you value your reputation and your freedom, please think up a better story. Or best of all, tell the truth. <laughs> Are you awake, Al? I brought you some tea. This is the first chance I've had to talk with you. Darling, what is it? Are you my wife? I mean, his wife. What are you saying? I'm not your husband. Don't say that. It's true. I know you, darling. I've known you all my life. Who knows you better than I do? I am not Al Ainsley. There's someone else, isn't there? Another woman. <laughs> Please. I knew you were timid, but I didn't think you'd go this far. I have a wife. What? Her name is White Swallow, and we have a son. Al, I don't know what your game is, but you won't get away with it. Gentlemen, this visit of yours is most unusual. I know it is, Senator Adams. I have no right to conduct committee business privately. Senator, we just wanted to acquaint you with certain facts. And... And? Well, please just listen. No matter what you hear, just listen. Then use your own judgment. Go ahead, Al. Senator, I am not Alfred Stewart Ainsley. You're not... I am running bear. I am a Potomac Indian. Well, this is most unusual. Dr. Stitzer and I, we believe that I lived 500 years ago. Somehow, I have occupied the body of Mr. Ainsley. But though I have his body, I have none of his skills. And? And that's all. And this is what you want me to believe, hmm? It's the truth, Senator. You'll be at the committee hearings on Monday morning. Senator... Didn't you hear... Doctor, I don't believe a word of it. Your head's 
no use. It's no use. Watch the knife. Watch it constantly. Don't look at your opponent's eyes. Oh, Red, there I'll never learn. You may not be running Beaver, but you have his great body, his strength, his agility. I'll tell you what I don't have, his desire to fight. Are you a coward? No, I just don't believe in violence. Strange. I can't kill anybody. The council has already decided, Red Bear. But this will be murder, Chief. He isn't running Beaver. He does not know how to fight. A man who doesn't know how to fight? Impossible. He is not one of us. He's from another time. Well, how does he happen to be here, then? There is a place, Chief, where the soul that belongs to each man is put into his body. Yes, we know that. It is the sacred, haunted place where the mist meets the rocks. There's always thunder there. Evil, malicious spirits have an opportunity to play tricks. And so... I understand. I even believe... But the council has spoken. He does not know how to fight. He will have to learn. Keep the knife low I, and moving. It's no use. I just can't kill anybody. Even to save your own life? Even to save my own life? Then you are a coward. What's the good of it? Suppose I kill Eagle Wing tomorrow. Then what? At least you'll be alive. To do what? To live out my life here in an alien place doing things that I hate? Fighting, hunting, killing? No, I'm better off dead. You'll have to testify before the committee. I can't. You'll be ruined. Well, if that's the only way... Relax. Think. Don't fight against Alfred Ainsley. Accept him. Let his thoughts flow into your brain. Let his knowledge come to you. Why? So you can get past the committee. And then? What do you mean, then? Then what will I do? Live here as Al Ainsley, away from my wife, my son, my friends, my people. Never to hunt, never to fight. To exist in this strange and terrible world, a place I can neither understand nor accept. No. Rather let me be disgraced. Why do you want to be disgraced? So I can die of shame. Wake up, running beaver. Wake up. It's time to start out for the fighting ground. So early? You still refuse to fight him as running beaver would? Yes, I refuse. Why? I told you. I want to die. I know why you would want to die in this life. But I don't understand why you would want to die in your other life. What are you saying? What troubled you? You are a man of trouble. I see that. When you walked into the mist, were you troubled? How did you know? I am only guessing... In your other life, did you also want to die? I'm not sure. Perhaps, perhaps I did want to. Why? Because, because I would have to say something that would, that, no, you couldn't understand. It would have to be something you hate? Yes. Yes, I would have to ruin a man that I had always respected. Did he, does he deserve to be ruined? Yes. Because he broke faith. And you did not have the courage to do your duty. I... In other words, you are an even greater coward than I thought. Maybe. Would you rather die under Eagle Wing's knife, or... Or what? Or go back. Do your part as a man. Face your responsibility. Go back? Testify against... Isn't that what must be done? Isn't that what truth and justice demand? Yes. Then you'll go back. But how? How can I go back? Are you sure you want to? Yes. You'll do what's required? Yes. You believe it with all your heart? Yes. Yes, I believe it. Now I believe it. Then come with me. Where? To the place of mist. The sacred place where you became running beaver. Time to be leaving for the committee meeting. I'm ready. I decided to go with you. Let's get it over with. Tell me, something bothers me. It bothered me that first day when I thought that you had willed yourself into amnesia. I can see how Al Ainsley could have found life intolerable. 
But you're not Al Ainsley. No. Therefore, my diagnosis was wrong. I don't think I understand. Why was life also intolerable for running beaver? Why were you trying to escape as running beaver? To escape? What was tormenting you? How did you know? Did I guess right? Yes. From what were you trying to escape? I had gone with three others to the Iroquois. As an ambassador. The Iroquois promised peace. I knew it was a lie. My three friends were bribed. On the way home, they plotted to kill me. I was too smart, too strong. I killed them instead. If I told this to the council, I would make enemies. I was afraid. I see. Would you rather die like a man among your own people, if indeed you must die at all, or would you rather die of shame here among strangers? I am wiser now, but it's too late. It's too late for me. I can't go back. Are you willing to face the council? Face them? Defy them? Fight them? Let's go back to this place where the mist covers the rocks. And when we reach it, try, try to go back. All the way back home again. The committee will stand in order. Mr. Ainsley, are you finally prepared to report your findings? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I've studied all the relevant materials, and I am absolutely convinced. I will stake my professional reputation on the fact that the signature is forged. I say this to the council. Three young men of the tribe took bribes from the enemy. I alone refused. They tried to kill me. I killed them instead. I will answer for this deed with my life. If any man here thinks he can take it. At a certain speed, at a certain intensity, at a certain burning level of anxiety or desire, time, space, and spirit can be twisted out of shape or sequence. That's how we might explain it today. On the other hand, there are evil and mischievous spirits who delight in creating misery and confusion. That would be yesterday's explanation. Choose one or the other. Or supply your own. I'll be back shortly. What's the moral of our little tale? Simply this. Whenever you're desperate for a means of escape from a problem, don't try too hard for an easy way out. You might just be unlucky enough to find it. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Grace Matthews, Arnold Moss, Nat Poland, and Mason Adams. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Do you hear me, Peor? With this rod, and in the names of Gagarin, Amartin, Algar, and Algasta, I summon thee. It's coming, Arnold. There it is. Over there. I see it. Take the rod and give me the arm. Yes. Stay where you are. I hold the Arthim, whose hilt is signed with the seal of Solomon, and which is more powerful than you are. Now hearken to me. We have a life for you. You will know her as you always have before, because she has your mirror. I give her to you, and thus buy another year of life for Mia. Is it agreed? Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal.
This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of your own terrifying imagination. It has been said that... We are prisoners in a dark closet with small openings that on occasion admit some light. Small wonder that the demons who lurk in the deepest corners are more real to us than the sweet light of reason outside. There is so much evil in our world that light turns naturally to shadow. Even the love of Stephen and Amelia Stampler for their son Michael is converted to suspicion in this dark closet we live in. Reverend Stokes, I don't want a theological debate. I want you to tell your congregation the truth. And what is that, Dr. Stabler? That my son Michael conducts his lab experiments for scientific purposes. And shall I ask him to believe in coincidence? What coincidence? That a peaceful town is ripped apart every time your son returns. That cattle die for no reason at all. That we are suffering epidemics and the worst drought in our history. All because of coincidence? Yes. This is the 20th century. What else could it be? Ask your son, Dr. Stampler. Ask your son, Michael, if he's just doing lab experiments. Our mystery drama, A Sacrifice in Blood, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Milt Wissoff and stars Patricia Rowe and Ralph Bell. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Time to turn to the macabre and nightmare world where there is no shortage of blood. Our tale opens on a pleasant enough note in a fashionable restaurant where Dr. and Mrs. Stampler are celebrating a special occasion. But I promise you, it will end in true gothic horror. Not another drop, Stephen. I've had my fill and so have you. I suppose you're right, my dear, but... (laughs) This is really so special. One more dig and the Stamplers hang up their shovels. Not really. But we'll be digging up flower beds and compost heaps instead of ancient grave sites. No regrets? None, my dear. We should have retired years ago. Then why not now? I mean, what can this one dig mean? Well, it will be a fitting climax to our career, Amelia. Perhaps the most significant find of our lifetime. Professor Serubius agrees with me. The last excavations there indicate a pre-Toltec civilization existed that was not completely archaic. A highly sophisticated people. Who worship the devil. Oh, why not? Most of us still do. Black masses are held in California. Covens of witches gather in New Mexico. Blood rites take place in the shadows of New York skyscrapers. Oh, nonsense. You've had too much wine. Oh, too much wine. I haven't had enough. Come, Amelia. Let's toast the occasion. To a splendid find. To a safe return. Dr. 
Dr. Stambler. Dr. Stambler. Yes. I am Professor Sarubius. Oh, thank you for meeting us. This is my wife, Amelia. My great pleasure. It's very nice of you. Not at all. Oh, here, uh, let me put your bags in, please. Uh, will you get in? I uh, can't tell you how I've looked forward to meeting you, Professor. Uh, Miguel, if you please. Oh. And uh, I am honored by the opportunity of working with so eminent a scientist. And I would be delighted to have a nice hot bath and about three days of uninterrupted slumber. <laughs> oh, planes are almost as uncomfortable after ten hours of flight as the small donkeys we rode to the Shenandoah site. The Toltecs have always been regarded as the earliest civilization in the Americas. The new finds at Ashtapulco may show one much heavier steel. You really believe it was a civilization? Almost oh, certainly. Not by our standards, perhaps, but certainly in its day. You shall have the opportunity to see for yourselves. We leave at 5 a.m. Monday morning. But that's three days away. Why the delay? Ah, there is much preparation, including the paperwork. You shall get some rest, and I will have the pleasure of acting as your host, if you will permit it. Of course. And forgive my impatience. <laughs> there. It is I, Miguel. Just a second. Uh, forgive me. I know it is late, but it was necessary for me to see you. Oh, that's all right. Come on in. We weren't in bed yet. What is it? I, uh, I am afraid I have bad news for you. We will have to postpone our trip. Why? There is word of trouble in the mountains where the site is. But what kind of trouble? Oh, nothing serious, but it will cause us some delay. Why didn't you tell us sooner? I just learned it, Stephen, when I returned to my room. How long will the delay be? I was, that is hard to say. But what kind of trouble is it, Miguel? An uh, Indian has been found. Murdered. It was... Uh, it was a ritual killing. His skin has been removed. Oh, God. Well, we uh, still get back to the basic question, Miguel. How long will we be delayed? Then you're still bent on going? Well, of course, Abedi. A native killing isn't going to stop me. I've encountered worse on other digs. Well, answer me, Miguel. Perhaps you should forget it, Stephen. Oh, come on. Now, both of you, I'm not going to change my plans. If you insist, we will continue, but... I must warn you, it will be difficult to assemble a crew. But not impossible. No, no not impossible if, if we pay enough. There is always someone who will take a risk if the inducement is great enough. I guess you're right, Miguel. See what you can do. Then you'll go along with me? I wouldn't miss it for the world. <laughs> making much headway, Miguel. Can't they dig any faster? We are up very high, Stephen. More than 10,000 feet. It is not conducive to strenuous exertion. They didn't display too much zeal on the climb, either. Well, they're not used to the altitude. Why didn't we get men who are? But you know the answer. No one else would come. You haven't seen anyone else since we got up here. They know better. They have broken through to a new chamber. And I hope it's more fruitful than the last one. Let's go take a look. Look there. They have an opening wide enough to go through. May I? Of course. This is your excavation, Stephen. Are you are you all right? Yes. Come on in. It's... My God. It's so still in here. Even the echoes die after thousands of years. We seem to be in the anteroom. I imagine the main chamber is just through those doors. It would appear so. Get the men in here. We've got to get those doors open, and it looks like one heck of a job. Siga pronto. No, no. No quiero entrar No, no, no. Siga pronto. No, well, what are they waiting no. for? Eh? They will not enter. Well, tell them they'll get docked if they're not in here pronto. It is no use. They will not come. 
All right, then we'll get the doors open by ourselves. Let's see how thick they are. Throw me a hammer, will you? Hmm. It's pretty solid, Big Al. How? Perhaps Stephen struck some kind of a trigger mechanism by accident. Well, never mind how. It'll save us some sweat, that's all. Stephen, please, be careful. There's something here that makes me... I would go ahead. Not on your life, Miguel. This is one big step I'm going to take. Come on, follow me. Good Lord. It's an enormous chamber. It's like a giant cathedral. Bring the lamps up. That door. It's, it's cut in a single block. Oh, yes. It must weigh at least ten tons. Look at the bar reliefs on the walls. It is the devil that these people worshipped. Beautiful. Sinister, malevolent, but beautiful. Bring the lamps forward. <laughs> What is it, Amelia? The skull! This pile's a pretty skull! We have found what we are looking for. The sacrificial chambers of the temple. Yes, you're right, Miguel. Can you uh, make out these inscriptions? I see, yes. They tell the story of the ritual. These were incense burners where human hearts smoked. The skulls piled at the base of that enormous slab of stone were sacrificed on that altar. What's that? Well, Miguel just described it, my dear. The stone slab was the altar. No, I mean in the center of the altar. Probably the debris of centuries. I just saw something stir. <coughs> it's a baby. Oh, completely naked. Oh, that cold stone. Oh, poor child. Oh. No. Yeah, no. Oh, he's lovely. He's so warm. Well, how could he be warm? I mean, so cold and damp in here. Oh, he must have been left here a few minutes ago. Well, perhaps someone left him as a as a warning to us. Oh, but impossible. There is no other entrance beside the stone doors, not even the windows. This was the sacrificial chamber of these ancient people. Well, then how, Miguel? I don't know. And I'm afraid the answer, if we ever find it, will not be pleasant. Well, at least whoever left him had sense enough to leave some protection. There's a woven mat on the altar. See? And that is one of the mysteries that troubles me. What are you saying, Miguel? The fabric the child is lying on. Examine it. Yes. Yes, I see what you mean. It was woven when the temple was new. When a bright star appears in the east and a child is born, there is a season of celebration. But when a child appears on a sacrificial slab of the temple of an ancient people who worshipped the devil, what will the season bring? Perhaps we shall know more when we return shortly with Act Two. We live by the philosophy that no one is born evil. That only time and circumstance can corrupt the innocence of an infant. And yet, deep within us, we feel some doubt when monsters arise. What made Cain? Was Adolf Hitler or Jack the Ripper ever a clean slate? Why should we not wonder even stronger when a child appears out of nowhere in the temple of Satan? I am not happy to see you leave, my friends. We'll miss you too, Miguel. Oh, that of course, but I wish you had not decided to adopt the baby and 
take him with you. I would have preferred you to leave him here with me until I could uh, ascertain what his origins are. I think he's right, Amelia. There's still time to change our minds. Oh, no. No, we fought harder to take him with us than those artifacts from the chamber. I'm not going to give him up now. What difference does it make where our son came from or who left him there? He's a perfectly normal baby, and he means more to me than the trophies we're carrying off. Well, if you have made your minds up, then all I can say is, via condios. I am very delighted that you both have what you wish. Stephen, your find will have an historical impact. Our find, Miguel, would have been impossible without you. And my gratitude for helping us with the baby. We've named your godchild, Michael, for you. Ah, a great honor, Emil. You'll keep trying to trace his parents? Yes, if that is what you wish. Don't try too hard, Miguel. It doesn't matter where he came from. We're all he needs from now on. I hope you are right, Emilia. Stamper him. Oh, no. I'm sorry. That will have to wait. And look, another thing. Don't set up any more interviews. My wife and I have had it. All right, I'll let you know. Right. <laughs> Don't be so short with Conrad. He's only trying to promote your book. I know he is, Amelia, but we're entitled to some privacy. We've been back home for almost a year now, and I'm sick of interviews and publicity. The people poking around here. Oh, you know you don't mean that. You're positively glowing with success. Yeah. You proved your theory about the pre-Teltic people, the influence they had on earlier civilizations, and, well, just look at the results. Academic honors and, oh, the fantastic sale of your books on the expedition. This year has been good for you, Steve. Well, of course it has, Amelia, but if we hadn't gone on that bloody trip, we'd have some peace at least. We wouldn't have Michael. Well, there you're right, my dear. Oh, he's quite a handful for a kid his age. Only a year old. He's been walking for months. And he's such a good-looking child. He's so well-behaved. No, too well-behaved. You know, it's scary. He hardly makes any sounds at all. Oh, count your blessings. Our neighbors envy us so. They want to know how I discipline Michael. <laughs> he's such an angel. Doesn't need any discipline. Well, maybe he doesn't, but I do. I've got to finish my notes for the lecture tour. Are you sure you won't come with me, Amelia? Well, who'd look after Michael? Well, Karen, she's perfectly capable. Oh, nonsense. I mean, he'll be gone a month. He needs me. So do I. Oh, don't tell me you're jealous. Oh, no, no, no. But I am disturbed. You've got to give a little, Em. Don't try to smother him. It's no good for either of you. I didn't expect you home so soon. It's Michael's birthday, so I thought I'd be early. I was taking a sentimental journey back through the years with Michael's birthday books. Here he is at two. <laughs> yes, I remember. We took him to the zoo, and he was fascinated. <laughs> Here he is a year ago. Five years old, growing like a weed. Oh, that reminds me. What can I do to help with the festivities? Oh, nothing. Just relax. Where's Mike? Well, I sent him out to play. On his birthday? I don't understand. What's wrong, Amelia? Nothing. The party's off? No one's going to show up? Is that it? Oh, who cares? Well, you do for one. Why aren't they coming? Because we have stuffy neighbors with stuffy children. I just think it's time we moved. Oh, they're all out of step, hmm? That's right. Take their side. Oh, for heaven's sake, Em, yeah, I'm not taking any side. I just want to know... Well, he tears butterflies apart, yanks legs off frogs. Well, he inherited your scientific curiosity. Oh, you know that's impossible. Well, I mean, you, would you set an example for him? Em, level with me, would you? What happened between Michael and the fielding child? Nothing. I, I, I told you. All right, then. You don't mind if I call them and straighten this out? You you, you go ahead and, and call. You'll agree. It. It's a tempest in a teapot. I'd rather hear it from you, Em. Sarah? This is Stephen. Stephen Stampler. 
Well, yes, I know. I read your note. Well, can you tell me why? Michael did what? Are you sure? Oh, I see. Yes, I know how you feel. And, uh... Thanks for being direct. Bye. Well? Uh, I just don't understand. Curiosity. It's simple, childish curiosity. Children try to discover the world around them. They, they smell, taste, feel. They hurt. What do you sometimes they hurt? Not out of malice. Try to be honest, Em. How would you feel if you were Sarah Fielding? I hope I'd have the good sense to take things in stride. Would you? I can't believe it's you, Amelia. You've lost all sense of objectivity. And you've lost all sense of proportion. Are you trying to cast Michael as a, as a monster? I'd like to understand him. But I think I need help. And so does he. <laughs> Amelia? Oh, <laughs> there you are. How are the silver bells? Fine. But the cockle shells are a bit droopy, and so am I. Oh, nonsense. Very gallant, Stephen. But age is beginning to catch up. I don't know where the last ten years have disappeared. Seems only yesterday that Michael was six, entering school for the first time. Now he's almost grown. Seventeen. Oh, my, you look handsome today. Oh. Are you even wearing a tie? <laughs> yes, so I have. And what's the occasion? We have a friend in town, old Ceruvius. Oh, I didn't know he was in this day. Well, neither did I. He's consulting with the museum people, and he'd like to see us. I asked him out to lunch. Oh, that was thoughtful. Now, there's no need to fuss, Amelia. Of course not. I'll get the soil off my hands and throw something together. If Miguel doesn't mind, I certainly don't. Well, thank you, Em. Is there anything I can get from town for you? No, just hurry back. Cerubius is dying to see Mike. What, what, what time is Mike due here? Oh, dear, I forgot to tell you. There was a letter from Michael in the morning mail. He's staying at the academy through the holidays. Well, that's odd. Did he say why? Well, he wants to catch up with some schoolwork, and there's an experiment going in the lab. He, well, he just can't leave. Well, that's too bad. Miguel was looking forward to a visit with Mike. He made quite a point of it. This is quite a machine. <laughs> it sounds like my coffee grind. <laughs> it's reliable transportation, Miguel, despite the noise it makes. <laughs> and how is the boy? Well, very well. And so is Amelia. You look fit. I should be. I still clamber over rocks like a mountain goat and dig interminable tunnels. Have you uh, found anything more at the old digs? Enough to verify your findings. But one thing we never discovered. No trace of Mike's parents, eh? No, no. I have shown the pictures you sent me to every man, woman, and child in the region. Nothing. Hmm. Well... How is he getting on? He seems to like it at the academy. As a matter of fact, things are going so well there, he won't be home for the holidays. I'm sorry. Oh, it's too bad. I must see him. You... Uh, perhaps I still can. Well, he's not due home until the summer vacation. In that case, Mohammed must go to the mountain. That's quite a trip. <laughs> not to see a godchild. <laughs> Well, here we are. We're here at last. Miguel, how nice to see you again. It is always a pleasure, dear Emilia. Oh, you look more enchanting than ever. Oh, thank you. You're so good for my ego. I have drinks set on the terrace. Would you like to unpack first? Ah, uh, no, I think not. A drink would be fine, and then I must be going. But you've just arrived. I prepared lunch. We haven't seen you in years. Too many years. I know, but I may get a chance to stop in before I go home. What made you change your mind? He's going to visit Mike. Aren't you, old friend? Yes, I think so. Oh, she'll be delighted. 
as we are disappointed. I hope so. It would be nice to feel wanted by a godchild I have not seen since he was uh, uh, an infant. I'm sure he'd love to see you. He keeps asking about you all the time. You can feel flattered, Miguel. You seem to be the only human being he has any interest in. Yeah, besides you and Emilia. Of course. That's a strange thing to say. Oh, you must forgive me. I have not been in civilized company for ages. My conversation is a little, how do you say it? Uh, Rusty? Exactly. <laughs> my bones and my speech are undoubtedly growing rusty. <laughs> that is why I want to see him on this trip. I may never have the opportunity again. Stephen? I'm just finishing the shelf, dear. Very well. Michael, I don't understand. No hello? Should I go out and start over again? Oh, it's not silly. Hello, darling. Ah, uh, that's more like it. Stephen, it's Michael. Mike! I know. Mother had the same reaction. I just got through sooner than I thought I would. So I rushed home. Put your bags in your room and I'll fix something to eat. You look well, Dad. Why shouldn't I? Leisure is good for the thinking classes. Oh, you look a bit drawn. Are they pushing you? No, I'm pushing myself. There's so much to do. What's new? Your godfather paid us a visit. He wanted to see you. Well, here I am. Oh, you had to leave. Obviously, he didn't get to see you at the academy. No. I didn't even know he planned to make the trip. Oh, that's odd. He said he would go to the academy directly. We must have crossed paths. Oh, excuse me, Mike. Hello. Yes, this is Dr. Stephen Stamper. Would you mind reading it? What? Would you read that again, please? Oh, my God. What is it, dear? It's a wire from the academy. They found Serubius. Found him? Yes. Miguel is dead. Michael! Michael! Are you home? He's out, Amelia. His car's gone. Strange. He seemed under the weather this morning. Well, he didn't want to attend the funeral. Oh, nonsense. He just wasn't feeling well. You still believe that act after all these years? You know, he's always avoided unpleasantness that way. Well, it was unpleasant, Stephen. An old friend to... to go that way. All right, all right, Em. It's all over. What could have done it? You mean who, Em? No, I don't. Nothing human could have been responsible for Miguel's death. I wonder. You wonder what, Dad? Where did you come from, Michael? You startled me. Well, I was in the garage. My fan belt's loose. I was tightening it. You should have come to the funeral. What for? I never saw Professor Cerubius. He was your godfather. You were his namesake. No, I wasn't feeling so hot anyway. I thought I was coming down with something. How do you feel now? Better, I think. You look healthy enough to me. Well, that doesn't mean a thing. I'll put the tea up, and then it's off to bed with you. She still thinks you're a child, Mike. I know. I want to talk to you, Dad. That's why I came home from school. All right, shoot. I really don't know what I want to do. I think I've had the academy. But you said you liked it there. You're doing well. I know, but I, I can't make the scene there anymore. Too much work? No, not really. I'm just not on to some of the stuff I've got to handle there. The creeps in Fairmount are still living in the 17th century. They'd have witch burning if the law didn't forbid it. Well, what's that got to do with you? Well, some of my experiments have got them on the warpath. How about you working in the physical sciences? Well, not exactly. I've been going beyond that. Like what? Well, for one thing, ESP. You've always felt I had it. Well, that's not considered supernatural today. Yeah, I know, but the townies think it is. Well, that's all the fuss I think you should stay on. It never pays to bow down to ignorance. 
I'm glad you see it that way, Dad. Oh, but there's more, isn't there, huh? What do you know about my people? Where I come from? Not too much. How about Cerubius? Well, he thought he was on to something. He was on his way to talk to you about it. Mm. Too bad we missed each other. Did you? Well, of course. I told you I was on my way back here when I heard... That's not exactly what happened, Mike. He called me from the airport when he landed. What did he say? I don't know. Amelia and I were out. He left a message with our answering service. He said he was going right out to see you. That he had phoned ahead. I never heard from him. And that if anything happened, there was a letter that he was mailing to us. Well, then you did hear from him. By mail, at least. We never received the letter. Did you? Now you're accusing me of tampering with your mail? I'm only asking, Michael. Do you really think I saw Cerubius that night? Did you, Mike? You're as bad as the townspeople. What do you want to hear? A full confession? Oh, okay, I saw the old man. I killed him. Is that enough? Or do you want me to invent the gory details, too? <laughs> Fear can be a force for good or evil. It can keep us from harm, or it can be a malignancy that feeds on darkness and ignorance. Is Mike a victim of rumor and coincidence, or is he truly evil? We'll find out when we return shortly with Act Three. a peculiar kind of fear we call courage that makes us go on when all we want to do is find peace and shelter. It makes men who fear heights climb mountains. Soldiers who detest war and suffering advance on bloody battlefields. Some call it pride rather than courage. Choose now. Retreat now and regret it or go on with me to Act Three. Mark, I've just heard from the police. They're still running down leads on the murder of Cerubius, but they admit it seems hopeless. Too bad. Did you ever get the letter he said he mailed you? No, I don't know what could have happened. Neither do I. How are you doing in the workshop? I don't know. Thank God frogs are such fast breeders. I kill them off so fast. No results? Only with our neighbors. They seem to connect my frogs with everything bad that's happening. The Gilmore child comes down with meningitis. My frogs are responsible. The, the drought and the unusual heat. The salmonella outbreak. All part of my wicked machinations. How would you like to come out of retirement? Both of you. What do you mean? I'd like to go back to the place you found me. To see if I can trace my origins. Maybe I'll find myself then. Well, I don't know, Mike. I just hadn't thought about it. Well, then don't. Let's just do it. Oh, Bernard! It's a gift from our loving neighbors. It's a brick. There's a note attached to it. Let me see that, Mike. This is your last warning. Leave or we will send you back to the hell where you belong. <laughs> They're not all clods after all. Someone has imagination and a gift of expression. This is no laughing matter, Mike. I'm going to find out who's responsible for this outrage. Uh, Dr. Sampler, delighted to see you. I think we can do without the formalities, Reverend Stokes. I just want some answers. Yes, so do I. I haven't seen you in church for quite a while. You're very fortunate I didn't attend last week. I don't think you'd care for my reaction to your sermon. Oh, then you don't believe in the presence of Satan. No, I don't. All I know is what that kind of talk leads to. Oh, the brick, you mean. I'm sorry about that. Well, yes, you should be. You've got these farmers half insane with your superstitious prattle. Some say that about religion. I wonder why. All right, let's not get sidetracked, Reverend Stokes. I don't want a theological debate. I want you to tell your congregation the truth. 
And what is that, Dr. Stump? That my son Mike raises frogs for his lab experiment. Shall I tell them to believe in coincidence? What coincidence? That a peaceful town is ripped apart every time your son returns. That cattle die for no reason at all. That we are suffering epidemics and the worst drought in our history. All because of coincidence? Yes, yes, you tell them that. This is the 20th century. What else could it be? Ask your son, Dr. Stamton. Ask him if he's just doing lab experiments. I told you, Dad. I'm going back where you found me. With or without you. Mike, that is foolish. Cerubius excavated for years but found nothing. What makes you think you can? Because I was born to it and Cerubius was not. He was contaminated by Spanish blood. My lines are pure. I need to find my way to another world. Will you come with me? You're not serious, Mike. I've got to go, Mother. I thought you'd understand. Well, I do. I, I just want you to think things through a little longer. Go back to school. Just finish this semester, and then we'll all go back. I promise you. That makes sense, Mike. It's only a few months. What do you say? Okay, but I won't let you stall me past then. I think my word is good enough. It is, Dad. Then, that's settled. Now, why don't you take Dad out for a walk? This room needs cleaning and airing. Are you implying? Not at all. I'm uh, stating it quite clearly. Either I clean this place now or I'll send in some goats to keep you company tonight. Now, shoot. Okay, I'll go. Uh, how about the keys to the car? Well, I thought we were going for a walk. Well, take a rain check. I'd like to drive into the city. I'll be my guest. Yeah. Just drive carefully. Don't worry. I'll be back for dinner. Can I give you a hand, Amelia? I don't think so, Stephen. My, this place is dusty. I'll empty the trash basket for you. Just dump things in the uh, plastic bag. Don't you feed Mike, Amelia? Of <laughs> course I do. Look at all these hamburger wrappings. Well, I think he feeds his frogs with them. Oh, no. What's wrong, Stephen? You're as white as a sheet. Yeah. This piece of paper. Well, what is it? It's part of an envelope, Amelia. The one that contained the letter Cerubius wrote to us. <gasps> oh, my God. Why didn't I... Destroy the letter? That's what I'm wondering, too. And I don't like the answer I get. <laughs> Hello. Yes, this is Dr. Stampler. He what? Can't be. We'll be right over. Yes, but I want to see my son. What is it, Stephen? What? Stokes. I don't want to see him. I want to see my son. Hello. Hello. He hung up. What happened? Mike, they're looking for him. What for? They claim he's killed someone. I don't believe it. What, with the car? I mean, with an accident? It was no accident. They found Claire Baxter dead. What's that got to do with Mike? They claim he was seen near the place where the body was found. Well, where's Mike now? He disappeared. I found our car in the ravine. Oh, no. I'll go see. Good evening. Yes, Reverend Stokes, what is it? Well, may I come in? No, you may not. Now clear out of here. What's oh, wrong with you, Steve? Please come in, Reverend. Right. Thank you, Mrs. Stampler. I know it's painful, but I must talk to you. What is there to talk about? Your son. I tried to reach you before... With facts. But you wouldn't listen. Well, why should I have all these silly nonsense... No nonsense this time, I'm afraid. Your son has committed murder. Just because he was seen near where the girl was found, I'll bet half the no town would have been No one else in town would kill the way Claire was slaughtered. Please, I don't want to hear any more. Can we just sit quietly and wait? For what? For your son to return. And then what? Then we'll... We'll do what must be done. You won't wait here. Now, be sensible. There are men just beyond this door. I would prefer to do this as reasonably as possible. Do what? Just 
Ask him a few questions, Mrs. Sampler. Now, please let me handle this. Or would you prefer mob violence? Ask your questions, Stoke. Oh, I'm here. You might spare yourself. Not yet. I've got a score to settle with old Nosey. Sit down, Michael. It's all over for you. For you, meddler. No, Asmodeus, your time has come. Asmodeus? Asmodeus, Satan, whatever you call yourself. Sit down and answer my questions. I changed my mind. I'll answer your questions if you catch me. Stop him, Stephen. Please don't let him go. No, I'm in it. Don't worry. Stokes will never get him. Neither will that mob. He's on his way back. Back where? Well, we found him, Amelia. In the sacrificial chamber. Sarubia said someday Mike would return. <laughs> so badly to find his way back. He must be here. I'm glad he got away from the mob. I'm not so sure about that. I pieced together Sarubius's letter from the scraps in the wastebasket. It explains a great deal. Michael was not just an ordinary Indian child abandoned by his parents. The tribes have a legend about the pure-born son of kings who is sacrificed for his people. Do you think Michael? I don't know, Amelia. I don't know what to believe anymore. There's, there's a light in the chamber ahead. I know. Hold this lantern, Amelia. Hold it high. Don't come any closer. Michael. Oh, thank God we found you. Where are you, Mike? Boy, we believe in you. We trust you. Stay where you are. Do as I tell you. We want to help you. Then leave. That's the best you can do for me. You kept me from my destiny when you took me from this tomb. Let me fulfill it now. We love you, Michael. Please save yourself. Hold the lantern higher, Amelia. What is it? There's a child, and There's a baby on the altar where we found Mike. It's Michael. It, it can't be. Yes, yes, I remember every detail. Stay back, stay, stay back, Amelia. Don't come any closer. It's a child on the altar. It's Mike. Someone or something is standing over it. <laughs> oh no, oh no! I can't believe it. The child's off. Oh God, no! My God! Oh my! It's too late, Amelia. It's all over now. Whoever it was has disappeared, Amelia. He's gone. A child is born, becomes a man, then dies. The natural order of things. No one can upset it. But not in the case of Michael Stampler, or whatever his true name was. He was plucked out of antiquity by accident and returned there by desire. I'll be back shortly. dark closet was open for a short time, and instead of light streaming in, evil oozed out. An ancient magic spanned the bridge of time, and for a while, dark forces swirled once again, turning reason into fear, understanding into violence, and light into shadow. Our cast included Patricia Rowe, Ralph Bell, Don Scardino, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Well, he's a mad killer, you say, so he wanders around, and if he gets a chance, he'll kill. 
she sees a woman alone in a parking lot, Mrs. Denson. He shoots her. He sees Mrs. Drew in her backyard. He shoots her. He sees Mrs. Goodman alone in her apartment. He shoots her. Okay, how do you account for Mrs. Cannon? You're dealing with a madman, Lou. You can't account for anything he does. All right, three women are targets of opportunity. They happened along, or he happened along, and that was it. But he went out of his way to kill Mrs. Cannon. Look, he had to slug the night watchman. He had to take the elevator up 12 stories to find her. It means he wasn't just out to kill any woman. He wanted that woman. Why? That's good thinking, Lou. And if this were almost any other kind of case... Blake. What? Oh, no. Not another one. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated. Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Someone once said that we are what we eat... A statement I'd not dispute. But I think we might go a step further and say, at least with equal accuracy, that we are what we think. Curiously, though, our thoughts shape our lives, our very destinies. Most of us, as any psychiatrist will tell you, are motivated by thoughts so deep within our psyches that we're really not aware of them at all. In point of which, consider the strange case of Anton Stern. But Anton, please, Jonathan is dead. Our son died more than six months ago. Bella, why do you do this to me? Why are you trying to break my heart? Oh, my darling, break your heart. I'm trying to put the pieces back together again. By lying to me? By telling me that Jonathan is back and... But... This... He's playing now, in the studio, playing. Anton, I hear nothing. In the studio, practicing. It's Jonathan, I tell you. Come, Stella, come and see for yourself. Our son is alive. <laughs> Our mystery drama, Concerto in Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Marion Seldes and Ian Martin. It is sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines, and imported Vigna Rosé wine. I'll be back shortly with Act One. This is the strange story of what befell Anton Stern only a few years ago. A story few people know. Yes, I am talking about the celebrated conductor of the City Symphony. To begin this curious tale, I'll ask you to join me in the Stern's duplex apartment on Park Avenue in New York City. It is late afternoon of an overcast autumn day. In the gracious living room, we find Stella, Anton's lovely wife. 
and his equally attractive daughter, Rebecca. Oh, Mother, stop pacing up and down. You'll be worn out by the time Father gets here. I can't help myself, Becky. I haven't seen him in two months. You should have gone on tour with him. Or at least spent some time with him in one city or another. I would have you know that if Dr. Edmonds hadn't advised against it. Well, I'll never understand why. Granted, Edmund is one of the best psychiatrists in the country, but still... He felt you... that my presence during the tour might might be too much of a reminder of Jonathan's death. Well, you know as well as I that the tour was largely arranged as therapy. I never realized what mental depression could do to a person till Jonathan collapsed and died while recording the Paganini first violin concerto. Your father conducting... Oh, what a terrible shock. To see your son, only 20 years old, drop dead before your eyes. Oh, I'm sorry, Mother. I brought it all back to oh, you. It's all right, Becky, dear. I, I expected Jonathan's death sooner or later. I was prepared for it. Your father wasn't. But he knew of Jonathan's condition, his congenital heart condition. Yes, but he never believed. It frightened me. The way he kept insisting that Jonathan was alive, imagined he heard him practicing in his studio upstairs. Well, thanks to Dr. Edmonds, he recovered. And two months on tour has brought full recovery. <gasps> They're here. I I I'll answer the door, Olga. Becky, Becky, how do I look? Beautiful. Only don't look worried, Mother. So. Yes, yes. Anton. Stella. Oh, Anton. Oh, Stella, darling. my darling, my darling. Oh, I, I missed, missed you, you so. I, I missed you too. I did, I did, I darling. too. Oh, how I've missed you, and it's good to be home, Stella. It's good to be home. Oh, Rebecca. Welcome home, Father. Oh, thank you. It's good to see you, my dear. You, you were kept in practice while I was away? Oh, yes. If I practiced any more, I'd have worn out the keyboard and the violin. The violin? Oh, why waste your time? How many times have I told you why waste your time on the fiddle when your brother's a prodigy? You stick to the piano and leave the violin to your gifted brother. Believe me, you... What is it? Why are you all looking at me? Well, you said... Well, you talk as if... As if Jonathan... Well, where is he? Why isn't he here to greet me? McNally, I thought you said, when, when we talked on the phone, you said... I know what I said, and I know what I'm hearing. What, what? Antron? Where is he, that son of mine? Where is he? <laughs> oh, of course. In his studio. Always in his studio. Jonathan, I'm home. Your father's home. McNally... You said he was all right. He was. Heaven help us till we came through that door. He was. Anton? Yes, come in, Stella. All of you, come in. Are you all right, Anton? What? It's all right, hmm? Nah. To know that my only son is dead, that's all right. You... You do know, then? Oh, yes. But for an instant there, a few moments, I was sure I heard him practice. Just as he used to. And I rushed up here to the studio only to find... emptiness. And then again, I knew he's dead. Dead. Do you want us to call Dr. Edmund? I'm all right. I'm recovered. As fully recovered as anyone can be after the death. His only son. You understand that? Your only son. Yes, I understand. What happened just now is just one of those things. Coming home after two months away, it got to me, that's all. Ah, how about a drink, Anton? It's been a long, tiring day for you. The plane trip from Seattle. And... Yes, yes. A drink would be good. Let's, let's all go down and have one. Come along, then, dear. Stradivarius. Jonathan Stradivarius. Who moved it? Who, 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 who? Well, don't just stare at me, all of you. The, the case, I, I, I placed it here on the table just so, with the bowl of flowers there and his photograph there, and, it, and it's been moved. Who's been touching this case, touching Jonathan's violin? Well, I didn't know that you... Wanted I, it untouched? What? But I said so. I made it clear. No other hand was ever to touch the strand. 
You? Father, I didn't know. I, I you didn't... You didn't? Father, it, it's got to be kept in condition. It's a priceless Stradivarius. It's got to be played. And you so that... played it. You played Jonathan's violin. And Tom... It was never to be touched. I said that. I made it clear never to be touched. But Becky is your daughter, Jonathan's sister. She's not Jonathan. No. But I love you too, Father. Every bit as much as Jonathan did. Oh, I... I love you, Rebecca, but I... Never touch this again, please. It was his. It's all I have left. To remember him. It's sacred to me. Promise me you'll never touch it again. I promise. Yeah, more wine, Mac? Uh, thanks, Anton, of course. It goes well with the beef. Uh, Helga is still the finest cook in the world. She certainly hasn't lost her touch while we've been away, Stella. No. And so long as she keeps her touch, I must be careful to keep her. You'd be astounded, McNally, at how many of our friends offer her more money to leave us for them. <laughs> uh, well, competition is competition. We lost Vladimir Blensky, thanks to it. The man who replaced Jonathan. You... Oh, glass slipped out of my hand. That was... Clumsy of me. No, no, of me. I'm sorry. Because you mentioned Jonathan? Huh. Nonsense. Nonsense. I tell you, I'm perfectly recovered. Yes, Father. We did lose Oblensky, as Max says. He was not the finest concert master we ever had. Jonathan was that. No one can ever take his place, but Oblensky was good. Very good. Very good. He left us in Seattle. Uh, tomorrow I must try out another uh, a woman, Saskia, uh, uh, Saskia, what's her name again? Rubens. Better than Oblensky, ask me. <laughs> no, not as good as Jonathan. No one can ever, will ever replace him in the orchestra. Or in my heart. Uh, speaking of Jonathan, Anton, Beckwell has asked me to talk to you again about releasing the Paganini first violin concerto. You know my answer. Oh, but, Anton, it was, if not the finest, certainly one of the finest things that Jonathan ever did. And it killed him. Anton, you can't say I can and I do, Stella. As for you, Mac, it was without doubt the finest thing he ever did. Do you know why? Because he wanted it to be. He practiced and practiced and practiced until I warned him that he would kill himself if he didn't stop. His heart. I, I, I knew his heart wouldn't take it. But the heart attack, it could have struck at any time, anywhere. Oh, he was determined, my son, Mac. Determined to play it to perfection. Perfection. And he did. And because of it, he... He died in front of my, my very eyes. Oh, father, my own father. Leave me alone. But, Father... Rebecca! Sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. Anton, she loves you as much as Jonathan did, perhaps even more. More? Impossible. No one ever loved me as much as Jonathan. But perhaps you never gave anyone else, gave... Gave Becky the chance. Oh, why are you badgering me like this? Anton. Anton, where are you going? To the studio. And please, leave me alone there. Uh, I'm sorry, Stella. It's not your fault. You know how it's always been. With Anton, the sun rose and set on Jonathan. Becky, she was always second in his affections. And now, with Jonathan gone... She wants to be first. Huh? No, no, I don't think that. I think, oh, I don't know. A young girl yearning for, reaching out for her father's love, that's all. She loves him. She wants him to love her, that's all. Is it all? What do you mean? Jonathan is gone, Stella. But you know as well as I, he still stands between Becky and her father. <laughs> Becky? Oh, Saskia. 
Yes. And let's hope she plays as good as she looks. Maybe we ought to move to one of the back rows. Why not? Well, I can see she's nervous. You know, a tryout. I'm sitting here. Maybe she just... Oh, <laughs> forget it. Saskia Rubens is a pro. You know, all pros have nerves. All right, gentlemen, let's get on with it. <clears throat> Are you, uh... Ready, Miss Rubens? Yes, Maestro. Now, we can take any moment you wish. Well, it doesn't matter to me, Maestro. Whatever you want. Huh? I see. <laughs> You're very confident. Oh, why shouldn't I be? I wouldn't be here for a tryout if I wasn't good. Oh. Well, well we'll try the first movement after the introduction. <laughs> Miss Rubens, perhaps you'd rather try the rondo... Well, what was wrong? You ask me what was wrong. You don't know? No, I don't. You don't know. You're playing notes, not heart. That's what's wrong. Notes without heart. You might as well tear up the music. We'll try it again. This time with expression, Miss Rubens. Hey, well, here we go. What now? I don't know. Miss Rubens. That that fingering. Yes, Maestro. Where did you get it from? Get it from? I I, I don't know. I, I suppose I've always used that fingering. You copied it. I beg your pardon. You heard my son. Or a recording in which he used that fingering. Well, of course I've heard your son. I've heard every recording he ever made, but I've never copied... Well, unconsciously, perhaps unconsciously, Maestro, you could... I have never copied anyone, including your son. Ah. Well, then again, we'll, uh... We'll try it again. <laughs> I think you're right. But if you are, Becky, what does this mean? I don't know what it means, Mac. I wish I did. Saskia Rubens using the same fingering as Jonathan Stern? Is it a coincidence? Or is some arcane force at work? Even Rebecca Stern is confused and unable to say what is taking place. Well, perhaps matters will be clarified when I return shortly for Act Two. When Jonathan Stern, child prodigy and at 20 solo violinist of the city symphony under his father Anton died suddenly. Anton fell into a deep depression. Recovered, or so it seemed, he took the symphony on a two-month tour from which he returned a few days ago. in the city concert hall as Anton tries out a new solo violinist, Saskia Rubin, something strange and baffling seems to be happening. Stop! Stop! Is this some kind of joke, Miss Rubin? Some kind of grisly joke? I don't know what you mean, Mark. No one has ever fingered that passage played it the way you are except my son, I... my dead son. I've told you, I don't know anything about that. If I am using his fingering, it, it's an accident, a coincidence. Accident? Coincidence? Mac! Hey, yes, Anton. You heard? Is she using Jonathan's fingering or not? Well, she seems to be, yes. But, Father... And Mac! Uh, Mac, has anyone but Jonathan ever used that fingering? That's it, I know. Father! If this was an accident, Miss Rubens, it's the kind of accident I won't stomach. I warn you not to repeat it. You needn't worry about that, Maestro. 
I won't be here to repeat it. That's fine with me. You can get out. Father, will you listen to me? What, Rebecca, what? You've forgotten something. Jonathan was the only one who ever used that fingering because no one else ever could until now. Oh, yes, you... You're right. Only a prodigy, a, a genius like Jonathan could... How could I forget? Well, you were shocked and upset. But she, Reuben, she... As I said, it's just an accident. No, 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 Rebecca, not that at all. Don't you see, daughter, don't you see? Well, of course. <laughs> By the greatest good fortune, you found someone else to replace Jonathan as a soloist. Replacement? She's no replacement. She is Jonathan. What do you mean? Yes, what do you mean? Well, why, he's returned. His spirit. That wasn't Saskia Rubin's plague. That was Jonathan. And, and the fingering of her hand, but Jonathan's spirit in that hand. Oh, why, don't you, don't you see? Don't you see? It was Jonathan's way of telling me he's returned. Mac, get her Rubens. Get her back for me. Oh, now, the way she stormed out, I'm not sure I can. You can. You will, Mac. You, you must. Well, Becky, good to see you again. Sit down. Cigarette? Thank you, Dr. Edmund. Thank you. I read about your father's triumphant tour, I suppose it's called. Nothing but praise and acclaim for the orchestra and him. How is he? Did the tour turn out to be the therapy I felt sure it would be? Well, that's why I'm here. I need your help for me as well as my father. Something went wrong? Well, when he arrived home nearly a week ago now, he thought... Well, it only lasted a few minutes. He thought Jonathan was still alive. That he could hear him practicing in the studio. Hmm. Well, of course, when he went to the studio and Jonathan wasn't there, he realized it was just his imagination. Well, these relapses do happen. Yes, but but the strangest thing happened yesterday afternoon. He was trying out a new violinist, Saskia Rubens. Well, yes, yes, I've heard of her. Well, during the tryout, she played a passage the way Jonathan played it when he was alive and... She used the identical fingering that Jonathan, only Jonathan, could use. And my father saw it, heard it. Hmm. Another little relapse? Huh? I saw it and heard it, too. Oh? Father thinks that Jonathan has returned to him. That using Saskia's body, his spirit and his genius has come back. And you? What do you think? Well, I don't know what to think. I, I, I've i never been so confused. That, that's why I'm here. Well, I treated your father's melancholia. Then when he went on tour, treated you for a milder, much milder depression. And once you faced the reason for your depression, you snapped out of it. Becky... What was... Tell me again. Put it into words. What was the reason for your depression? Ah, come now, Becky. Say it. I was glad Jonathan was dead. Why? Because he always stood between my father and me. That my father loved him more than me. <laughs> he did. All my life, I've wanted my father's love. And when Jonathan died, I thought at last I'd have it. But I haven't. <laughs> Especially now that he believes. <laughs> that he believes. <laughs> that he believes Jonathan has returned. Yes. Yes. And that, Becky, is why you're confused. I'm happy. <laughs> You've allowed your brain to recreate the ghost we got rid of together, you and I. <laughs> Becky, Jonathan has not returned. Rubens, this fingering of hers or whatever, she plays that way, that's all. As simple as that. Oh, you can convince me. 
that no one will ever convince my father. Yes, well, someone, if not me, someone else said better. Because if he doesn't realize what he's come to believe just isn't so. Yes. If he doesn't... He loses mind, Becky. Anton. Hmm? Oh, yes, Stella? Calm down and have some lunch. All you do is sit here in Jonathan's studio holding his Stradivarius, fondling it, caressing it. It was his. He loved it. I love it. Yes, I know, but... And I've had a thought. Sitting here holding the strad, it, it's brought Jonathan closer, helping him to commun- Anton, communicate. Anton. He gave me the thought. What thought, Father? Oh, Becky. At the concert tomorrow night. Saskia Rubens will play this Stradivarius. Jonathan's Stradivarius. But you said no one must ever play it again. No other hand but Jonathan's must ever touch it again. It will be Jonathan's hand that plays it tomorrow. Anton, my dear. It will help Jonathan, his spirit, help it to return. Why don't you understand? It's only Saskia's body that sits there, but it's Jonathan who plays. Her hands become his. It will be his hands that hold the strand. Play it tomorrow night. No. Huh? It will not be Jonathan's hand. It will be Saskia Rubin. I tell you... Becky, you're deluding yourself. And worse, you're letting your mind, your emotions get out of control again and play you tricks. And if these tricks go on, you will go mad. Oh, you sound like Dr. Edmund. Well, I'm telling you what Dr. Edmund said. I've just come from seeing him. Seeing Edmunds? You? Yes. I needed help for a depression of my own. Oh. Oh, well, I, I'm, I'm glad you went to Edmunds. Oh, why should that upset me? After all, we, we were all saddened by Jonathan's death. I was not saddened. I was glad. Becky, oh my you, God. You were glad? Glad Jonathan was dead? Yes. Yes. And I'm sorry I was glad. I'm sorrier than I can tell you, but I couldn't help myself. You've got to understand. Understand? And I... What kind of sister were you to rejoice in her brother's death? What kind of woman are you to be happy at anyone's death? What kind of daughter to take pleasure in my sorrow? Oh, Father! Get out. Get out of the studio and never, never, do you hear me? Never set foot in it again. Father! Out! Out of the studio! Yes, and out of my life! Why? Why, Mac, must you talk about this now, minutes before I go on? I know it's not exactly the best moment, but Vic will ask me to ask you again. And tell him the answer is no, and it will always be no. The Paganini killed Jonathan. But, Anto... Don't you understand why I can't release it? I couldn't bear to hear it. I'm sorry, Anton. Forgive me. (sighs) It's time. You gave Saskia the strad? Yes. And told her why I wanted to play tonight? I did. What did she say? She said... Oh, yes, 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 yes. She said, tell him Saskia Rubens is the virtuoso tonight. Not Jonathan Stern. We'll see... We shall see. Come. Well, Mike? I don't know, Stella. He's in a strange mood. I've never seen him like this. What do you mean? I don't know. One minute he's irrational, I guess that's the word. And then the next, what he talked about, maybe he's to blame that Becky felt about Jonathan the way she felt. He was. To a large extent, he was. Ask 
Oscar Rubin can play like that? Ah, Oscar Rubin, it's the nice circle of gold. Mac, what in the world? Why is that song yelling at Oscar? Oh, it's like that. No one but Jonathan Stewart. What's happening to him? Listen to him. It's not you. Not you. Jonathan is playing. Good Lord, he's talking to Saskia. It's Jonathan. It's Jonathan. He's gone crazy. Mac, he's out of his mind. Oh, good Lord. Johnson, you come back. You're here. Play, my God. Play. Oh, look, he's swaying back and forth. He's yeah, falling. Mac. Somebody catch him. Oh. I'm done. Oh. In a moment of high drama, certainly never before witnessed in the concert hall, Anton Stern crashes across the podium to lie unconscious on the stage floor as the audience and the orchestra sit in shocked astonishment. I'll return shortly for Act Three. Unable to face the death of his son... Anton Stern, conductor of the City Symphony, vacillates between reality when he knows Jonathan to be dead and fantasy when only minutes ago he believed Jonathan's spirit had taken possession of violinist Saskia Rubens in the rendition of the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto. Now in Anton's dressing room... He lay him on the couch. <coughs> now gently, uh, gently, lads. Uh, ah, thank you, boys. And close the door as you go out, will you? Mark? Mark? Ah, take it easy, Anton. You're going to be all right. Oh, what, what happened? I, I I must have fainted. I, I don't remember. Yes? Stella and Becky, let us in. How is he? Oh, Anton, Anton, what happened out there? I... I don't remember. I... I you, no. Wait a... Yes, it comes back to me now. Yes, Father. What? Jonathan. It worked. It worked. What worked? The Strad letting Saskia play John's violin tonight. It, it brought him back from the dead. Anton, you must stop believing oh, such still, nonsense. I tell you, he was there before me on the stage, using Saskia, her body, her hands. The Strad is the link, the bond that holds Jonathan to this world. We can keep in touch, my son and I, through that strand. Father, you must... Don't tell me what to do or not to do, Rebecca. You think I don't know what you're up to? Up to? You wish to keep us apart, your brother and I. No! Because you were always jealous of him, envious of him. No! You told me, admitted you were glad he was dead. Anton, she never meant that. She said it. Get her out of here. Anton! Out of my sight. Out in heaven's name, Anton. It's all right, Mac. I better go. Oh, he's out of his mind, Mac. He's out of his mind. Get the stride from Saskia, Mac. Just as soon as. No! Get it now! You needn't tell me why you're here, Becky. The papers are full of what happened last night. Yes, but Dr. Edmonds, they say nothing about what went on in my father's dressing room afterward. Nothing about Jonathan Stradivarius. Why, no. Tell me. Well, you know that after Jonathan died, my father put the Strad in its case and closed it and placed it in Jonathan's studio, flanked by vases of flowers, a sort of a, a shrine. Yes, and also, it was his intention that no one should ever play it again. Yes, so it came as a shock to us all when he decided to let Rubens play it at last night's concert. Why did he do a thing like he that? He got it into his head that Jonathan was using Rubens' body to return to Earth. And if Rubens played Jonathan's favorite violin... It would doubly ensure Jonathan's return. He's... he's convinced it did? Absolutely certain. Hmm. What else happened last night, Becky? Well, he... He 
believes that I want to stand between him and Jonathan, that I always was envious and resentful of Jonathan. And well, you were. Well, I know. But you cured me of that. You made me realize it wasn't Jonathan's fame I wanted, but but my father's love. And now that I want it more than ever, and, and want to give him my love to comfort him, he refuses to see me. He'll change his mind. I don't think so. Yes, he will. He loves you, Becky. Loves you every bit as much as he ever loved Jonathan. Well, then why hasn't he ever shown it? Maybe he's never thought he had to. Maybe he's always believed you knew it. Oh, he's never said. Exactly. Never said. Never opened his heart in words. <laughs> That's half the trouble with the world, Becky. Is it too late for us, my father and me? It may be. So much depends on how deep he's gone into this psychosis of his. Psychosis? He's become fixated on the Stradivarius. Well, there are two ways to cure a fixation. You can either gently pry the patient away from it, a procedure that can take years, or you can risk smashing it. And in my father's case? Knowing him as I do, I would be for smashing it. There's risk involved, grave risk, but also calculated risk. The question in my mind is... Yes? Are you willing to take that risk? I? You. Put it another way, Becky. Do you love your father as much as you think you do? Love him enough to risk his life and yours? Anton, put the Stradivarius back on the table. Stop holding it, fondling it, caressing it. It will bring him back to me. He'll come. I know he'll come. Anton, dearest Anton, you delude yourself. Jonathan is dead. There is no such thing as death. You believe in life. I want to believe. I love him, miss him as much as you, but I won't. I can't delude myself. Leave me, Stella. Leave me alone. Come downstairs. I'll have Olga make tea. No, I, I'll stay here. Anton. Here. Thank you, Olga. I'll pour. Mac, you'd rather not have a drink? Oh, no, no, Stella. Tea's fine. If we could only persuade him to see Edmund again. Oh, I tried. It's no use. I lay it on the line, Stella. This could mean the end of Anton's career. Don't say that, Mac. Every penny had to be refunded for the concert the other night. The board of directors called me on the carpet this morning. They know there's something seriously wrong with Anton. Well, I'm afraid we know that, too. And then there's Bakewell. He says the recording company will sue if Anton goes on refusing to release Jonathan's last recording. Oh, Becky. Mother. Mac? Oh, boy, get those eyes. Oh, you poor kid. This has really got you down, hasn't it? But not out, Mac. I've just come from seeing Dr. Edmonds. Well, why did you go to see Edmonds? What good can he do? Well, that's right, Becky. Now, don't get me wrong. Edmonds did his best, but it wasn't good enough. He's upstairs, brooding in Jonathan's room. If he isn't already mad, Becky, he soon will be. But that's why we've got to do something drastic. What do you mean, drastic? Edmonds says that father's become fixated on Jonathan's violin, the Strad, because... In effect, it replaces Jonathan physically. It's all that's left of Jonathan. Well, I think we're all aware of that. Yes, well, Edmund says there are two courses open to us. One would be the treatment that would take years and might not be successful. And the other is to take the drastic action that I just mentioned and smash the fixation. Smash it? To bits. But if we take the second course, in Edmund's words, it could kill father. And me. What do you mean? I mean that if I fail... You? You will do this, whatever it is? I'm the only one who can. If I succeed, Father will be well again, and and in another way, in a, in a special way, so will I. But if I fail, he, he can... Well, he very likely will be driven into hopeless insanity, in which case he'd be better off dead. And you? Becky, 
You... Oh, I'd be better off dead, too. And no one played the Tchaikovsky the way Jonathan did. No one ever could. Genius. Sheer genius. Mac, you heard him, and you, Stella. Anton, eat your dinner. It's getting cold. All gone, all wine, please. You're drinking, too. And even practicing. Why... When he practiced up there in the studio, I would listen for hours on end. Such sweetness of intonation, such delicacy of fingering and bowing, and oh, why, I can hear that now. So clearly, so sweetly, I would almost swear he was in the studio now, practicing this very minute, practicing. I enjoyed his practice, too. Why, it was a privilege to hear him, Anton. <laughs> you know, if I shut my eyes, I believe I could almost hear him. Anton? I do hear him. What? No, 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 no. Listen. 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 I hear nothing. I, I do. Oh, no, Anton. I hear him. He's come back. His spirit came back. The studio. He, he's there now. Jonathan. Jonathan. Stella. Jonathan. Please, God, make it work. I'm practicing. What else? You? You in your hands, his... His violin, you dare? I don't see what's so daring. You are not to play it, not to touch it. I warned you. It is Jonathan's violin. Jonathan. Well, seeing that Jonathan's dead. He's not dead. His spirit lives. Well, so does mine, and so does my body. He can't play it. I can. He played it last night. Oh, he... Rubens played it, not Jonathan. Just as I'm playing it now, not Jonathan. Sacrilege. Give me that. No, I'll smash it first. Are you out of your mind? No, you are. You can think of nothing but Jonathan always. Jonathan and because of that, you become fixated on this, this piece of wood and cat gut. Oh, cat gut. <laughs> you think you're the only person in the world who mourns Jonathan. <laughs> you think you're the only one with feelings. You think mother didn't die a death with Jonathan. <laughs> that I didn't. <laughs> that Mac didn't. Oh, you selfish man, crying and begging for a little thing that was Jonathan this fiddle. Give it to me. All right, very well, I'll give it to you. But first, over my knee. Oh, no. And then, against the wall. No. 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 Ian. Take it. Splinters. Pieces. Becky, Becky. Becky. How could you do this? Oh, because I love you. And you love me. Oh, Father, I can't bear it, but I must tell you. That look on your face. It isn't the Strad. It's a copy. No. Not the Strad? Jonathan Strad? Could I destroy that? But, but oh, you... even if I could. There was no need. It wasn't a violin that had to be destroyed, only what it meant to you. I didn't break a violin. I I broke your madness. Do, do you know? I, I think you did. When, when you smashed it, splintered it inside me, something, I, I, I don't know, it, it's... Smashed and splintered, too. But it might not have. You might have been smashed and splintered. It was a risk I had to take. And you took it, Becky. Because you love me. I've always loved you. Didn't you know that? Oh, yes. And I love you. Only. Only what? Till now, I... Oh. I never knew how much. They say that when something is broken and mended, it is stronger than ever before. Does that apply to the human heart, do you suppose? Not 
don't know about yours, but my heart's been broken more than once, and I'm still around. Well, my heart may not be stronger, but it's a lot wiser. Yours, too? I'll be back in a moment. Speaking of wiser hearts, as we were, Anton Stearns is much wiser. One thing Anton learned after a long chat with Dr. Edmonds was to tell someone of the love within him. Honestly, we just don't do it enough, none of us. Our cast included Ian Martin, Marion Seldes, Carol Titel, and Lon Clark. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I can't understand why you keep asking people to take you away with them, Lucas. I think you ought to make up your mind... To get out of here, Mr. Albertson, not just so as you can take me with you, but for your own good. Maybe they'll still let you go. Let us go? They'll damn well let us go if we want to go. I sure hope so. We could still leave tonight. Better chance to get away after dark than in the daytime. Now, look, you're... You're going to have to explain that, Lucas. If you want us to take you away with us in case we go, well, you're going to have to tell us what is going on here. Well, they're all dead, you know. Uh, Not me. I don't think. But all the rest of them's dead as dead can be. Been dead for years. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. There is nothing to fear but fear itself. Those ringing words ushered in the first term of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, 32nd President of the United States. Neither Mr. Roosevelt himself, his presidency, and the duration of it have anything to do with this story. Only that unforgettable phrase, which is as true now as it was then, as valid for an individual as it is for a country. Senor Matero. Something blocking the road. Are you all right, Senorita Welch? Si, yes. But what are those flares up ahead? An accident, perhaps. I don't think so. Wait. You hear horses' hooves? What's that? Some caballeros coming. Maybe they're the police or local officials. With guns in their hands? No, Senorita. I think you are going to get your romantic wish. I think here come your bandidos. <laughs> mystery drama, Conquest of Fear, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Tammy Grimes. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. (laughs) 
most of you listening must remember Elizabeth Welch, that shining star who seared her way across the American screen like a comet, appearing suddenly from obscurity in the full bloom of womanhood, and after her meteoric career, retiring to obscurity again as a wife and mother of a man equally as charismatic as she. Elizabeth Welch was, in her early 30s, one of the great femme fatale. The stories of what men dared and lost for her are legion. This is only one of them. It must be quite high up, Senor Materos. Yes, Senorita. The Pyrenees. These are mountains, not molehills. No. Mountains, by all means. How ominous and forbidding they look by moonlight. And lonely. So terribly lonely. And this road... It is cut from the heart of the mountains. By the day, it is of the most beautiful. A necklace wound about the hills of Spain. By night, it's more like a dying snake in its last contortions. Is this a tunnel we're going through? No, just a cut through the hills. If you could look through the top of the car, you could see the sky. I don't want to look up. It makes me think I might have been far safer in that sky on my way to Madrid in a plane. But then I would have missed the pleasure of your company. And there was no plane till tomorrow. You're sure it wouldn't have brought me to Richard faster? That's all I care about. Believe me, I have checked through the agency. Mr. Barton arrives on the night plane from Rome. By car, you can meet him in Madrid before 3 a.m. By plane, it would have been in the middle of the day tomorrow, or since it is almost midnight, today. Then we have no quarrel. After being separated for three months, every minute counts. Except, I still would have felt safer by plane than by car. Have no fear, senorita. My chauffeur Miguel has eyes like a cut and hands as quick. As quick as his master's? I, I beg pardon. Will you take your arm from my shoulder, please? I was merely trying to distract the senorita. Shall we just keep this all at a business level? I was vacationing in Biritz. I learned that Richard was finishing his film early, and the agency asked you to arrange for me to get to Madrid in time to meet the man I'm going to marry. Which I am doing to the best of my ability. If I believe you without question, will you behave yourself? I will try. I think I prefer a promise. From my head, you have it. But in matters of the heart, or... Oh, come on, Juan, knock it off. There's no future in this for either of us. Unless you have a plan to take me to some mountain eyrie and then force me to submit to your nefarious desire. I am a gentleman, I hope. I would never force a lady. Whatever happened to that Spanish machismo? I should have known if I tried to cross swords with you, I would be defeated before I even began. No. You are a most attractive man. Earlier in my life, <laughs> but that was before I met Richard. I am going to Madrid to be married, senor, to the man that I think, in her secret dreams, every girl and woman would like to be married to. So, may we leave it at that and try to enjoy the rest of the trip. I am properly chastened. Then now that we understand each other, senor Matero... Oh, poor favor, Juan. So that I know I am forgiven. There really isn't much to forgive, is there? Juan? Thank you. Tell me, who lives amongst these tumbling rocks? Who knows? Shepherds, goat herders, animals, birds, and... <laughs> no outlaws? Bandits? Gypsy bands? Oh, not in this day and age. There were in other days and other times. Since the war... El Codillo ruled all Spain with an iron hand. Who is to say no to the general? Nor is it a wise thing to try... What happened? Uh, there's a tree trunk across the road. Uh, Senorita Welch, are you all right? See, si, see, si, yes. But what are those flares ahead? An accident, perhaps. Uh, probably a washout. I don't think so. You hear? Those are horses' hooves. How did that huge trunk get there? I don't know, but we cannot pass. There are caballeros coming. They must be police. Or local officials. With the guns in their hands, sir. Uh... I'm afraid you have got your wish. These are bandidos. Hey, you already have the door open and welcome, bueno. What is the meaning of this? Quiet, little man. 
And do not try anything foolish, you or the man who was driving. You are surrounded, and we are well armed. Pedro, bring a torch here. <laughs> now, let us see what game we have flushed. Ah, I swear to the name of the car of the most incredible. A driver dressed as prettily as a Saturday matador. A fat merchant and... Uh, hold the torch higher. Pedro, ye, que corazón, no? Una señorita la más hermosa. So, please descend. I have no intention of getting out of this car until... Until what? I think the señor was referring to me, Juan. Por qué? Why do you think that? Because he said please. Well, señor bandit? <laughs> the lady is correct. But get out. Very well. Now what, senor bandit? Be quiet, woman. Now listen to me, senor, whoever you are. My men will remove the tree. You will drive to the nearest town, Madrilengo. I will give you three days to arrange the ransom for the senorita. And the sum will be... Uh, 10,000 American dollars. Ten thousand. Don't interrupt. Listen. We will make contact with you in three days... Through the La Fonda Hotel. You will be watched. Do not contact the police. You must be out of your mind. You cannot abduct this woman. Do you know who she is? She is a star of the American no, cinema. Uh, no, American senor, Pedro, I... Pedro, uh... the touch. Gracias. Hey, por Dios. You see? You would be mad. Oh, be quiet. The... I warn you, you talk too much. Muy bien. Well, the same instructions, senor. Only now the ransom is 100,000. That's ridiculous, whoever you are. Senor Matero says only someone I know in the briefest acquaintance. He couldn't raise any sum of money like that for me. Climb in your car, senor. Boy, that Would you it. prefer to be shot and let us handle the negotiation? Do what he says, senor Matero. Very well. It is better. And I will make all arrangements for your freedom. I'm sure you will. And now, little Saturday matador, in your bright little uniform, climb in and drive. Pedro, Carlos, Luis, move the tree trunk. Start the car. Now you drive straight to Madrilengo. And now, El Curio? Don't call me that. Oh, pardon me. What else are you? That is not to discuss. I am what I am, and you are... I am what I am also. <laughs> you mock me, huh? That is all right. But this is not some moving picture script. Get up. On what? Behind me, on my horse. Oh, my apologies, senorita. I have no extra horse for you. So, with your permission... Or without or it. Or without it. Here, my hand. And I beg you to ride behind me. I only hope the horse is as strong as you, senor. <laughs> he has been ridden double before. But this time he may be hard to handle. Why? He has never known a whip as biting as your scorn. Are we ready to go? Why ask someone who has no choice? Well, I know I owe you some apology. To be close to you with your arms about me is to know how truly beautiful you are. And I have a shame. You damn well ought to. To have set a price of only 100,000. It should have been a million. Eh? Yeah! Caballero! Vamos! <laughs> Buenos dias, senorita. Are you out of bed? A moment. I am awake. Yes. I am Mercedes. Buenos dias, Mercedes. What is it you want? I am to serve you. Shall I help you dress? If you insist. Because what you wear is not for our mountains. I brought a skirt and a blouse if you... Would not be ashamed. Ashamed? I'd be delighted. <laughs> if I hadn't lost my bags in the car, I'd have some jeans or slacks. Well, anyway, 
Can you help me unhook this blouse? Oh, the si, sea, senorita. You say you are Mercedes. That is my name. You're very kind to help me dress. How old are you? I am nearly in my 20th year. Oh, <clears throat> what a beautiful suit. Que colossal. And so beautifully stitched. Oh, oh, let me help you with my skirt. Thank you. These are your clothes? See. Si. It's lucky we're the same size. There. And the blouse. So? How do I look? Oh, I, I will tell you something, senorita. I do not think the suit you took off was so beautiful. Not now. Why? Because when you put on my clothes, my skirt, my blouse, suddenly they become just as beautiful. Oh, Mercedes. I think you were sent to me as an ambassador of goodwill. Okay. I think you have been sent to make me forget that I am a prisoner held for ransom. Oh, please, senorita, do not think too harshly of our leader. Can you give me any other reason I should think otherwise? Oh, yes. He is desperate for all of us. We are starving and alone and we need ammunition. Ammunition? For what? Against those who are in power who would kill us. You mean the police? Those in authority, if you wish to call them that. You will come to no harm here. Are you so sure? Supposing no one thinks I'm worth $100,000, what would your peerless leader do? Just keep me here? Another mouth to feed when you cannot afford to feed those who have already? Well, anyone would pay 100000 to free you. But suppose they don't. Then the man you worship so completely would have no choice but to cut my throat. No, Rita Dios, he would never do that. I wouldn't count on it, Mercedes. You see, I know who he is. The small, dark girl, eyes shadowed with fright, stares at the taller woman with the tawny hair and the sea-green, steady eyes. But behind Elizabeth's composure is a bitter regret that she has blurted out a statement that could be her death warrant. I shall return shortly with Act Two. There's a word in very common coinage today the word macho. In Spanish, it means literally a he-goat. But figuratively, it expresses an almost mystical necessity of maleness. The Spanish term machismo, which is at the root of his honor, his right to live, his pride. It is what so many times in history has made the Spanish a great people. And at the same time is perhaps their Achilles heel. The Spaniard can be the kindest and most charming of men, but also the most cruel. Which face will Elizabeth Welsh's captor turn towards her? Yes, come in, Andre. From the way you opened the door, I might have expected you, Senor Bendito. Don't call me that name. Since we have not been formally introduced, what shall I call you? The name is Fornada. If you need a name, Senor Nadier will serve well enough for a few days. Very well, Senor Nadier. What can I do for you? Nothing. Are you being taken care of? Under the circumstances, I suppose. Muy bien. Adios. Just a minute. I have a complaint. Tell it to Mercedes. She will know if it can be remedied. Forgive him, senorita. He has much on his mind. So have I. What, what is your complaint? Is there some way I can help? I don't know. I've been shut up all day. I feel like a jungle cat in a zoo. I would like to go outdoors, take a walk. Can you arrange that for me? I don't know. I, I can ask Rafael. Rafael? My bro... You, you said you knew him. Oh, <laughs> you mean the bandido. I don't know him by that name. What? Then what? El Gitano. <gasps> uh-huh. That's all I need. I wasn't wholly sure. Now I am. What is Spain's foremost matador doing holed away in these mountains? He's so, so 
difficult to tell. And do not call him Bandito. What else is he? What else are all of you? We are citizens. It's so hard. I, I, I do not have all the words, you see. It, it, it was like this. When I was in... Oh, you understand. A, a, a baby just beginning to walk. My, my father was Don Ernesto Federico Locker E. Albinez. And he owned all the land you see from the mountains at dawn and beyond. He was what, what you call so rich. Then there was a war, a terrible civil war. Don Ernesto would take no part on either side. He was so proud. Always he had ruled his people and let no other touch them. So, so, go on, little Mercedes. I am... Too little to remember all that happened. I only know that finally he had to run here to the mountains with his family and all of those who followed him. Now, this was after the war? See? Si. But he had taken part on neither side of the war. Why did he have to flee? Well, he had, what you say, sheltered men from both sides. When they were better from their wounds... Many did not want to go back to a war where brother killed brother, so so they stay with my father. So the regime threatened your father? When El Cordillo sent his men to take our land, we became banditos, outlaws, desperados with the price on our heads, or so they call us. Well, I say it again. What are you? We take only what is ours from our own land. That is not to steal. And what about me? I don't belong to you. You pass across our lands and we must have some payment. We must, we must live, eat, feed our people. So you send your bully boy, you send your machismo or whatever he wants to call himself to get money from innocent people. He is not a bully boy. What else would you prefer to call him? Extortionist, kidnapper, abductor? He is our leader. That man... Who brought me here was your father? I know, mi padre morte two years ago. That was when Raphael came back. Raphael? You mean El Gitano? All right. I cannot deny who he is. Oh, why did he not stay with the bulls? He was a great torero. The greatest. All Spain knew he was the greatest. El Gitano, the gypsy. He was magnificent. I saw him three years ago in Seville, and then suddenly he disappeared to come back to this. Why? I do not know for a certainty. Because my father died, maybe. Because of me, maybe. I, I do not think that either. For he could have sent for me, and I would have... Come to him wherever he was. You love him that much? Oh, but of course. Even though he had deserted you? But he had to do that. Didn't you feel you had some claim on him? No, senorita. How can any woman love a man who leaves her? Why should I not? He is my brother. Why do I even ask? I have no rights. Come in or not, as you desire. What is it this time, Senor Nadie? Mercedes tells me you feel shut up, oppressed. It is no thought of ours to punish you. If you wish some air, come with me. I don't need a guard. Escape is not only unlikely, but impossible from this mountain fastness. Still, I prefer to go with you. I prefer to make sure. After you, senorita. Ah, oh, that's better. How fresh the night air smells. It always does. Always to prisoners? How nice. There's a moon. Where are we going? Up there. There is a ledge behind that big rock. You can see miles from it, even under moonlight. A lovely view. Especially for prisoners. Much further? No. It's hard to see in the shadows. 
Hey, if you don't want to look out. No. I need to stretch my wings. Here? Around this rock? Yes. Oh, yes. It is lovely. But you're right. About what? It is a view for prisoners. You, as well as me. <laughs> what does that mean? What it says. You are obviously a man of background. How can you condemn yourself to a life like this? It is my place. These are my people. I am their leader. They depend on me. To rob and steal? Call it what you will. There is no choice. I live this way because I prefer it. Whatever I want is easy to achieve. I take. You are an anachronism. Living in a medieval world. A world that no longer exists. It may be, but this is my chosen world. What is so different about the one outside? A world of liars, cheats, fair weather friends and fools. I give you your world, senorita. I would keep mine. You've taken mine away from me. That is only temporary. I hope. Can you say the same for yours? Hiding by day, skulking by night, at the mercy of weather... It is enough for me. Yes, it. Or for your sister, Mercedes? It will have to do for her also. Why not? She is a woman. A woman? <laughs> see, see, senorita. I suppose she is. <laughs> do you know, senorita, until you came, I think I had almost forgotten what a woman is. And now? Now? With you beside me? Just as suddenly I remember everything a woman is. The sound of her voice, the smell of her, the trap of her hair, the scented brushing against my cheek, the promise of her lips, and the touch of them that can be as irresistible as... Is that what you gave me this little touch of freedom for? No. To parade your machismo? What you want? You take? Yes. But I am not yours to take. And you will not touch me again. You have courage, Elizabeth. I didn't give you the privilege to use my name. And what is life without courage? It's the best thing we humans have. You, of all people, should know that, senor. Not yet. Senor, nothing. No. No, please stop calling me that. Then shall I call you by your real name, El Gitano? Oh. Who told you that? Mercedes. She talks too much. No, I recognize you for myself. Just answer me one question. What made you run away from what you were, El Gitano? Were you afraid? I could kill you for saying that. But you won't. And shall I tell you why? Because you can't kill fear. You can only conquer it. You are not fighting the world. You only fight yourself. And it is a battle that will be won or lost back in the bullring. Senorita Welsh. I'm here. At the window, Mercedes. Shh. Keep your voice low. We are to escape. You, Rafael, and me. The horses are waiting. Where? Shh. Outside. But we must be still as death. If the rest of the camp should find out... Money is so important to them? Oh. For your ransom, most of them would kill their own mothers. Or you, or us, Raphael and me. Am I so important to you, little Mercedes, that I should risk your life? I... I can't answer for myself. But I think yes. But for my brother, there is no doubt. I would do anything to save him. Oh, 
Senorita. This is as far as I go with you. Follow the path before you. In about three miles, you come to the town of Madrilengo. You should find your Senor Materas there at the La Fonda Hotel. You're not coming with me. Mercedes is guarding the pass. I don't think we were followed, but I have to go back to her. And then? We will go away together to make a chance in life for my sister. I owe Mercedes at least that. And your people? The ransom will be paid. How? You have asked me about fear and if I was afraid. Well, now at this moment I tell you, yes, 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 I was afraid. I ran from the bullring because the fear was in my belly and my legs would not support me. Can you imagine what this fear is like, the fear of the bulls? What is worst of all are the aficionados that only yesterday loved and adored you and now are crying for your blood, ready to fling you aside like garbage. And then... Then comes the worst fear of all. Fear that you are no longer a man. So I ran and lived with fear and hated myself and hated the world. And now? Ah, Now at least you have given me hope. You can't kill fear, but you can try to conquer it. Huh? So... We'll go back to the bulls. Bravo. Senor Bravo. I'll watch for your name in Seville in Madrid. <laughs> if I can get corridos again, first I must practice, prove to myself in the smaller rings that I am ready. And when I am, then I invite you to come see me. And I must pay you a ransom. That will take time. It is an affair of honor between me and my people. But when it is done, you will come and see me fight the bull? I don't know if I'll be here. I want you to understand that I am on my way to Madrid to be married to the man I love. Ah. It's La Guerra, no? I still hope. Thanks for setting me free. It was you who set me free. One thing only I ask in return. Yes? My future is in your hands. Do not give me away to the police. Well, I promise you I'll keep your secret. Then I give you one more to keep. Ay, how hard it is to say not in Spanish. I, 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 I love you with all my heart. <laughs> Madness, of course. But I will always hope. By Alcantias. Hasta la vista, gitano. The scatter of the horse's hooves raises a cloud of gray Spanish dust that half obscures the departing horseman. For a long time, after she can no longer see him, Elizabeth Welch remains looking after him. In her mind, two thoughts. Will Raphael win his battle with fear, and will their paths ever cross again? I shall return shortly with Act Three. Whether or not Elizabeth Welch might have spent much thought on the strange man who had abducted and then set her free, events allowed her no time to. Her marriage to Richard Barton caught the fancy of American and even world audiences and catapulted them both to a dizzying superstardom. These were golden years, basking in adulation and snowed under by work, till at last something far more important than fame happened to Elizabeth. Hey, Bats. I'm over by the pool. Hi, darling. I'll come and join you. <laughs> ah, if I can make it. Are you all right, Angel? Just pooped rich. I didn't expect you home so early. All the retakes finished? Yep. They can't fuss around me anymore. They can't shoot me anymore anyway. I'm beginning to show. And it's all your fault. Oh, my fault. I like that. Who has talked nothing but baby since the day we were married? Well, 
It took me long enough, but here's number one. Well, let's not start counting till we've successfully hatched one. Rich, let me tell you something. Hmm? This is only the first. I'm going to have seven. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> what about your career? As of today, my career is ended. Goodbye, Elizabeth Welch. I am now only Mrs. Richard Barton. Well, we'll see. But certainly you're not working for at least eight months or so. And I turned down the English picture, canceled everything for the next six weeks. I'm taking you on a vacation. Where would you like to go? Hmm? Oh, darling, I don't care. I don't know. Maybe we'll just stay home. I've told Lucy no interviews, no agents, and to turn down all invitations. Mind? It's what I want. Oh, speaking of invitations, there's one I thought you might get a laugh out of. I don't want to open my eyes. I'm so comfy. Read it to me. It's from Spain. A letter. And it contains box seats for a bullfight in Seville. Oh, no! How wonderful! What's the message? It says, the heart never forgets and still hopes. It has been a long road, but I am ready to dedicate that bull to you now, Elizabeth. I will hope with my heart that these tickets will bring you to watch. And it's signed... El Gitano. That's right. I seem to remember him. The gypsy. He was a pretty classy torero in his day. What is he? An old flame? Sort of. Tell me, when is the creda? The last day of this month. Then I know where I want to go on my vacation. Take me to Seville, Rich. Take me back to Spain. Are you feeling any better, Rich? <coughs> I don't know. That's what I get for coming to Seville. Spanish flu. I'm just not up to going to that bullfight. I don't like them anyway. Oh, forget about that. I'm not going. Oh, yes, you are. I called Juan Materos. He's going to take you. But I can't leave you alone. I want to be alone. Sleep this off. <laughs> Come on, honey. Don't you think I know that for some reason this is very important to you? Important enough to bring us all the way from Hollywood to Seville? Well, I wanted to explain, but it seems so... so silly. I don't want you to explain. I just want you to go see your dashing Torero. Richard, are you jealous? Should I be? Of course not. Raphael is only... Only... Whatever he is, you go see him again. If we're going to have seven children together, I want to make sure I'm the man you really want to father them. Jude, look, Juan, look. Watch how he's working the ball. You still think he's lost his touch? He looks well, muy bien, but these first passes... How close do you want him to work? The horn is inches from his leg on every pass. Perhaps, perhaps. They say since his return, he is fighting like the old El Gitano, but still... Uh, still what? Uh, I still remember him in the same ring here in Seville six years ago. He was bad, very bad. One would have thought he was afraid. could not have put a sheet of paper between his legs and the horn. Could a man like that be afraid? I must agree he's not afraid, but he should be of this bull, senorita. Why? He hooks to the left. He is dangerous, this Toro. Dangerous. Now you like him, hey, senor Matero? Magnificent, superb. If he kills as beautifully as he has fought, tomorrow all Spain will be his. What is he doing now? He is asking El Presidente to dedicate the bull. I, he is asking for the ear. See the hand at his ear? <gasps> what is it? What's wrong? Nothing. They are waiting to see whom he will dedicate the bull to. He is coming this way. I wonder who... I can tell you who won. He is going to dedicate it to me. He's taking too much chance with him. There's blood in his costume. Nada from the bull as it touches him. I tell you, if he kills clean, you will have both ears, hooves, and tail. What's wrong? La Muerta. Now he kills. Watch. A 
Coronado. He is God. The bull hooked to the left at the last moment. Senor Elizabeth, where are you going? I must go to him, Juan. He wanted so much to see me again. I must go to him. Oh, Senorita. I have prayed you will come. How is he? But the most powerful. He's not going to. They say, well, the coronado is still hurt. A man can hope. The doctors gave him drugs, but still it was hurting. And though I felt his hurt so much, I was glad. But now, now he hurts no more. Just me, his sister, who still hurts. He will die. Poor little Mercedes. You are very brave. No. Not I, Senorita. El Gitano is the brave one. Go now. He wants to see you. El Gitano. Oh, yes, Senorita. Ah, you came. This was good today, no? Oh, this was a bad bull. The pigs were not right. It happens, a bad bull. But you know, he was my best bull. The very best of all. You were magnificent. Well, it is not for the Torero to decide. It is enough for him to know he gave his best and that he was not afraid. Yes, that is the best. The very best. I paid back all the ransom. Did you know that? You didn't have to. I paid back all my ransoms. There are times, these times, this time, when a man must put his affair in order. Hey, Tommy. Hush, hush. There is a thing I need to ask. One last favor. You have only to ask. There is enough money left over to take care of Mercedes that is arranged. Although things are not so easy to arrange. Guard my dear sister, senorita. Give her courage after... I promise you. But, Rafael... No, 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 no. I am not worth your tears, senorita. <laughs> what am I saying, senorita? An old habit. You are una senora now. Yes. You had better be, I think. Eh? I see. Eh? I feel there is... A niño coming, eh? Yes, my first child. Ah, uh, no. I think that was me. Through you, I was reborn. You're not going to die. We'll get the best doctor. To die is not so bad in itself. Come close. I have one last secret for you. I will keep it safe. I know. All my secrets are safe with you. Keep this one very safe. In all my fights, since I saw you last, the fear has still been there. The terrible fear. Until today. Today was glorious. A day I shall never surpass. <laughs> Today you were all man, Raphael. Muy hombre. Muy hombre. That is enough. So I have everything a man could ask for, except you, Elizabeth. And that I never could have. I am content. It is the will of God. El Gitano. Salute you. What was that? A kiss I once didn't return. Why now? Because for this moment, and my husband would forgive me, I can say, Yo, Tadore, con dodo, mi corazón. Then, then God is truly with you. Fire, 
Namen Deus, el Itano, vaya con Dios. In the labyrinth of our minds lurk old and individual fears we all try to skirt or run from. Not many of us are brave enough to bring them out into the light, to turn and face them down. This was the story of one man who, with a woman's help, prevailed in his conquest of fear. I shall be back shortly. Elizabeth Welch never did return to the films, but she did have those seven children and is still happily married to Richard Barton. The first of their children was a boy who is named Raphael. That was Richard's idea after he heard the whole story. I've always wondered whether Elizabeth didn't hesitate between the two most important men in her life, but then seven children. I think that leaves no possible doubt of how deep her devotion is to her husband. Our cast included Tammy Grimes, Rosemary Rice, Ian Martin, and Sam Gray. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. What'd the killer do with it? I guess he took it with him. No, I'd say she took it with her. A woman? (laughs) Why? Is this one of those famous Tom Turner flashes of insight? There was a woman in this room. How do you know? How do I know? (laughs) I can smell it. Smell what? The perfume. Perfume? Can't you smell it? It's very faint, but... Well, now that you mention it, uh... (laughs) maybe I do. I'd never have noticed. It's kind of familiar, too. Familiar? How? Hiya. I don't know, Doc, but I just have the feeling I I ought to recognize it. Tom. Tom, hey, what are you staring at? Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and True Value Hardware Stores. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sounds of suspense to the fear you can hear. Make yourself comfortable, for there are ill winds blowing outside. This is a tale of a titanic struggle between two colossal forces, one natural, the other supernatural. The prize, a girl's soul. And in the clash, as fire and water mix, there is the very devil to pay. Come with me now to the Solway Firth in Scotland to meet the first of the forces. It's the tide. It comes in faster than an express train. Is it always like this? Twice a day. Doesn't it ever break? It will, when it gets just about abreast of us. Isn't it exciting? 
That's one word for it. That's why you don't dare go out on the flats on foot. If the tide was due, you'd never make it ashore. <laughs> mystery drama, Speak of the Devil, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Jada Rowland and Nick Pryor. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll return shortly with Act One. say he who dreams on the Solway will wake in another world. Not only is the tide a terror, but so are the quicksands, and far worse than either, the bogies, warlocks, and unnamed things that haunt Scottish history. The Scots word for tonight's story is eldritch. It means uncanny, eerie, frightful, otherworldly. Listen. If you will put out the light, Mrs. Petrie. Oh, hold my hand, Mike. You'd better hold both mine. Why? You can't trust me in the dark. I'm sorry, Colonel Bruce. Now, Mike, Mary Ellen, I know you two young ones think a seance is a mite daft, but it's not the way the Colonel, Mrs. Petrie, and I feel. Well, then maybe we'd better not stay. Oh, no. We need five of the circle. It's a blessing you're here. But please, be serious. All of us have made contact with your dearest ones who have passed on through my control. Control? That's a messenger who brings us messages. Anatu. He once was a slave in Babylon. Babylon? It's just... scary. Hang in, darling. Now, may we all join hands, please. I'm asking you not to break the chain of contact now. Clear your minds. Make them a blank. A quiet place. I'm reaching now. Reaching away and above and out and over from here to the bonny, bonny other place that lies beyond our kin. We're biding here, Anna, to asking you back into our circle. Will you not come back? To us again. Most precious lady from across centuries, the time is not right, not right now. I beg you, Kishbar is breathing fire tonight. Go, there is Stop it! In heaven's name! Someone get the light! Uh, yes, yes. It burned. It burned. Ellen, oh. the damn light! Mary Ellen, are you all right? Yes, sir. What's all that smoke? Oh, that's just the incense we burn. I'm the one to blame for meddling in the business of the Lord. We'll not ever have a seance in this house again. I'm afraid I lost some... Devil out of hell this night. Ouch! Oh, don't wriggle so much. You stuck the pin in me, Aunt Jeannie. Oh, I'm sorry, Ellen. <laughs> oh, but it'll take more than a pinprick to burst your happiness. Thank you, Aunt Jeannie, for letting me come home to be married. And for such a heavenly day. Oh, well, I'll accept the thanks for bidding you back to where you grew up. When Dad died so suddenly, I... I was lost. I didn't know what to do. Well, you did just the right thing. You came home. 
your two modern young people who are a lot smarter than we old people are. It is proud I am to be part of the gamble you're making in your lives. I am all goosebumps. I'll get back into my jeans and sweater. I've got a skin, just like I had last Wednesday night. Oh, don't mention it. I should never have had you children in that circle. It was so scary. What happened? I don't know. It was some kind of trick, wasn't it? I don't play tricks. Well, it... It was Maggie, your mother, who had the second sight, you know. That wee wisp, so delicate and so, so vibrant. When she died, it tore the heart out of me. But Will went off to America and left me to bring you up. Well, it, it put my heart back. And then when you were 15 and almost grown up and he wanted you to join him, I... I was left alone again. How could I stop you going? I didn't want to go. I know, but you were his flesh and blood. I found a way out of my loneliness. Nights when the roar of the tide used to come boiling up the firth outside the windows there. I thought I could hear Maggie calling to me. But when the wind was scurling out of the northeast, I'd hear her voice on the wings of the blow. And I began to think maybe I had the call, too. That's when I started the seances. Until the other night? Yes. I'll never hold a seance again, so the subject is closed. I realize I'm just a foolish old woman. I've never been so scared. You promised me to put it out of your mind. What's past is past. Your future is all that matters. It seems so right to be back. As if, as if something were calling me. Oh, you're cold. I'll stir up the fire. No, no, don't bother. I just miss my American central heating. I think I'll go outside in the sun for a minute or two. Oh, go take a good brisk turn down the road while I finish this hymn. That's a good idea. Ah, but don't go down the first road. Take the high road. Why? Well, I saw your Michael off this morning for the Solway. You don't want to run into the bridegroom on the wedding day. It's bad luck. Kiss me, Ellen. And Janie thinks it's bad luck for the bride and groom to see each other on the wedding day. You can't fault that. Back in Nebraska, my mother used to feel the same way. But that's just old-fashioned. And Aunt Janie something else? Darling, your Aunt Jeannie sure is something else. Good or bad? <laughs> About 90% good. I just don't dig the spirit kick. We won't have any more of that. It was awful, though, wasn't it? That's all kind of self-hypnosis. That terrible, raspy voice. Whatever it was saying. Ellen, there wasn't any voice. You didn't hear it? I heard something that sounded like your aunt choking herself to death. But the first voice. That, that's a, just the old girl practicing a little ventriloquism. No. No, that awful burning smell. Well, I will admit I like the Hare Krishna incense better. Come on, Ellen, let's forget all that mumbo jumbo. Hey, dig that crazy character out there. Fishing in those little pools in the flats. What's crazy about that? Oh, on horseback? that everyone does because of the tide. The tide? I forgot. If we hadn't been up in Glasgow wedding shopping, I'd have shown it to you. Look out there to the west. If that gilly is up on his horse, it must be... Oh, yes, here it comes. <laughs> and there he goes. You'd think the devil was on his tail. What's his hurry? Look, the tidal bore. It's coming. You mean that big wave down at the mouth of the estuary? Yes, it's the tide. It comes in faster than an express train. Listen. Holy baloney. Is it always like this? Twice a day. Worse in the autumn and in the spring. Doesn't it ever break? It will when it gets just about abreast of us. Isn't it exciting? That's one word for it. That's why you don't dare go out on the flats on foot. If the tide was due, you'd never make it ashore. Oh, Michael. It's so thrilling and so good to be alive. I love you. What'd you say?
Words, sir? Husband. Read that loud and clear. On my way. What's taking you so long? Just brushing my teeth. Please come to bed. Why didn't you say that in the first place? Will you come under the covers? I'm freezing. I'll put some more coal in the fire. I don't want coal. I want my brand new husband. You got him. Oh. What is it, darling? Nothing. It's just... Just that funny smell. It's the coal smoke. Remember, you don't want coal to keep you warm. Just me. Oh, my darling. Yes. 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 My husband, my darling, my husband, you. No, no, please, no, no, don't, don't touch me, go away, no, no, oh no, I go, anything wrong? No, Aunt Jeannie, why? Well, I, I was dozing and I thought I heard... What, what's that I smell? Is it your candle? Oh, oh, I, I guess I let the fire go out. I, it's a damp chimney, but just the same. Is, is Mary Ellen all right? She's sound asleep. See for yourself. Oh, I, I'm sorry to bother you, but... What is it? What's troubling you? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I was the one that dreamed it. Oh, be gentle with her, Michael. She's so sensitive and delicate. Like her mother that died all those years ago. We'll keep her from any harm. Good night, Aunt Jeannie. Good night, Michael, dear. If we can. If it's in human hands to be able to... Snuff my candle out if you will, old Ricky. But hear me this. You'll not have Mary Ellen. You'll not have her like my sister Maggie. Old Ricky could be translated Old Smokey. It's a Scots name for the devil. Jeannie should know better than to mention him, for the old proverb says, Speak of the devil, and his horns appear. Let's see when I return shortly with Act Two. Dreams are made to die with the opening of day and superstition fades and falters in the sunlight. So by the following morning, we might hope our bride and bridegroom wake and rise on the right side of the bed. Let's find out as Michael comes downstairs. Oh, good morning, Michael. I'm in the kitchen. Come on out. Morning, Aunt Jeannie. Well, how is the bridegroom today? Well, the bridegroom's first rate. It's the bride who's not. Oh, what's wrong with the wee lass? Oh, I don't know. I... I think now you were right last night. Huh? Right? About what? Oh, she, she had some kind of a... a bad dream. But if she did, she won't tell me about it. W what do you think it might have been? Oh, I don't know. She's a sensitive wee thing. And she's back in the part of the house where her mother died. That... that was Maggie's room you're in. Maybe I should never have put you there. Anyway, I'll get her tea and go on up and have a wee chat. And I couldn't tell Mike. I couldn't. Not after what we... My wedding night. How could I dream anything so... so vile and hideous? A great... Gross presence bearing down on me. 
breath so sick. The lips slavering and that awful fur, fur all over. Oh. And the fire burning me. That scorching smell. Oh, Aunt Jeannie, what a nightmare. Oh, I wish now. And that's all it was. But it seems so real. Well, it wasn't. Because when I came by, you were sleeping sound. Oh, drink your tea now. Oh, it's a good thing you married that nice American boy with his head screwed good and tight. Mike. Oh, he'll blow all the cobwebs out of your head. And he's going to have a good chance to. What do you mean? I mean, you two are going to have a nice honeymoon all alone for a big, long month. Where are you going? Oh, I've got an old girl school chum who lives just outside Blackpool at St. Anne on Sea. For years, she's wanted me to visit. I'm not going to drive you out of your house. Oh, you're going to do more than that, Mary Ellen. You and your handsome, bonny husband are going to move downstairs to my room, away from this drafty old flu. And while I'm gone, I'm going to get it fixed so the fire will burn clean. But... And I'll not take no for an answer. <laughs> I thought Scottish weather was supposed to be terrible. Rainy, damp, no sunshine. This has been a very particular May. Our honeymoon. Yes. Sorry it's over. Desolate. Still, with Aunt Jeannie back, maybe you'll get a little more work done on the book. Darling, I have been busy in research. It is a love story. Speaking of that, do you think... Look down the road. I can't. Your front's in the way. That's Dr. Ferguson bringing Aunt Jeannie back. Our month is up. Speaking of your front, do you know how you blossomed in the last four weeks? All right, playboy, let's concentrate on other physical problems. How do we get out of a hammock without breaking a limb? <laughs> Welcome home, Aunt Jeannie. Oh, Mary Ellen, precious. You've turned into a real Scots lassie. You've got the bloom on your cheeks. It's happiness. And those warm spring winds from the west. Hello, Dr. Ferguson. Hey, well, Mrs. Tilson. As a physician, I can only concur with your aunt's diagnosis. You're a picture of health. And how are you, Mr. Tilson? Never better, sir. Oh, I can believe that. Well, I really have to be back on rounds. Thank you for meeting Aunt Janie at the station. It should have been me. Without a car? Oh, you'd have had hard shrift getting me aboard old Bess since the carriage broke its wheel. You know, Jeannie, you should put that old horse out to pasture. Now she's nothing left to poon. Oh, I couldn't do that. We're too used to each other, poor old soul. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dr. Ferguson. Away you go. Right you are. See you soon. <laughs> I'll take your bags up to the house, Aunt Jeannie. Oh, give me a hug first. <laughs> That's right. Now, off you go. And me and Mary Ellen will have a week's chat on the way up to the house. <laughs> Goodbye, Percy. I should never have said that. <laughs> he hates the name. I'm not sure I blame him. Oh, well, that's not what's on my mind. How are you, dearie? You can see for yourself. Oh, don't say anything to Mike yet. But I just have to tell someone. Aunt Jeannie, I think... I know I'm pregnant. <laughs> Well, Mrs. Stilson. Tell me, am I pregnant? Oh, the tests will prove it, but I'll bet on it. And let me say that you're the loveliest expected mother I've ever had under my care. Well, a little morning sickness is to be expected in these early months. Still... There's nothing wrong, Doctor. Ah, a young, healthy woman, what could be wrong? Still, we must take precautions. I'm writing out some medication for you that I want you to take each day. But what does Dr. Ferguson say is causing it? It's nothing, dear. Just some little hitch. Honey, we both had thorough physical checkups before we came to Scotland. The RH factor is ruled out. Why should you... Lots of women have morning sickness. It isn't only in the morning, Helen. I'll talk to Dr. Ferguson. Maybe we should 
change the medication. Mary Ellen, dear. I, I talked to Dr. Ferguson and he's completely puzzled. I'm not sure that I am, though. Is there anything you want to tell me? What can I tell you, Aunt Jeannie, that I haven't told him? Are you... Are you in pain? I've talked to the doctor about that. It... It isn't pain. It... I don't know. Ellen, are you... Are you dreaming again? Of what? Of... Of the presence. I don't want to talk anymore. I just want to sleep. Only I don't want to. I don't want to sleep at all. It's just that I'm so tired. So tired. You have to help me, Aunt Jeannie. How, Michael? Dr. Ferguson says that, that physically Mellon should be all right. That the, the baby seems to be thriving. It's her mental state that... Do you know she won't go to sleep at nights? She forces herself to stay awake? What is it she's afraid of dreaming about, Aunt Jeannie? It is that, isn't it? I can't tell you just what she's dreaming. I'm too far out of touch since I went away. But I do know one thing. The only way to stop it is to get her away from here. As easy as that? Oh, not so easy, maybe. She's bound and determined on having you finish your book first. Ah, the devil take the book. Melon comes first. You sure you don't mind, Michael? I'm very sure. We're going home to have your baby 3,000 miles away. Oh, darling. I don't know what to say. It... It can't be too soon for me. Well, it's sooner than you think. We're booked out of Glasgow tomorrow afternoon. Home for America. I don't know. I should be feeling all sorts of things I know, but... the only one I can really feel is relief. Oh, such blessed relief. Oh, for the first time, as long as I can remember. Days, weeks... I just want to go to sleep. Good night, darling. Rest. Sweet dreams. You'll keep me safe. You won't let me come to any harm. For better or worse. In sickness and in health. Until death do us. Sleep, poor baby. Rest. <laughs> I love you, Michael. I love you. Keep our baby safe. Don't let... Oh. Oh. Send Aunt Jeannie up to you while I phone. Aunt Jeannie! Aunt Jeannie! What is it? What is it, Michael? Helen, maybe a miscarriage. What's Dr. Ferguson's number? Oh, you know, get him by the phone. It's out of order again. Hello. Hello! Laddie, laddie, it's no use. It won't be fixed before morning. I'll go to the neighbors. It's a party line. If one's out, they're all out. Oh, God! How far did the doctors? It's a good three miles. Who's got a car? Only Colonel Petrie, and he's away up to Edinburgh for his regimental reunion. All right, then I'll go on foot. Aunt Jeannie, go up and help her. I'll make it as fast as I can. By the way, Michael, can you ride a horse? Yes. Good. Then take old Bessie. There's a bridle and saddle by her in the barn. She'll get you there faster. Take care of her, Aunt Jeannie. Don't let anything happen to her. Right along the first road till you come to town. He's the third house in on the right. And take care of yourself. <laughs> Taking 
Michael so long. Oh, oh, just lie still. Don't bring back the pain. It's funny. I thought it was going to tear me in two. And then within ten minutes after Michael left the house, it just stopped suddenly. As if... What's that? Oh, there's a car. That'll be the doctor. I'll let him in. Bide quiet now. Oh, 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 come on in, Doctor. What took you so long? Oh, I tried to phone you the moment I found out, and I got here as soon as... Yes. Oh, then you know. Oh, of course I know. Who do you think's been taking care of Mary Ellen? Now you get on up to her. What? Where's Michael? Oh, Jeannie, Michael is dead. Dead? How? Oh, here, let me close the door. Oh. Was... Was Michael writing to try to fetch me? Oh, of course. She... She thought she was losing the baby. What, what, what happened to him? Bess must have thrown him. Oh, she never threw a body in her life. She was oh, as gentle something as... Something must have frightened her, driven her frantic. Jeannie, oh. this is a terrible thing to tell you, but... But I examined the boy, and his body was covered with hoof marks. He was literally trampled to death. <laughs> Ellen has kept her baby and lost her husband. Some evil force shadows this innocent and tragic girl and still may threaten her. Those hoof marks, were they from the horse? Or in some dark, unfathomable way, were they supernatural? A demon's footprints? Perhaps we'll know when I return with Act Three. Ellen, after her first wild emotion when she heard of Mike's death, has retreated into herself, her face white and drawn, her eyes black and empty like two holes burned in a blanket. Now, as the doctor comes down after examining her... How is she today, doctor? No change. Listless, unreachable, hopeless. And her health. The baby. The baby. Yeah, there's no doubts of its vitality. Oh, I, I have a terrible time getting her to eat anything. Well, you must be more successful than you think, Jeannie. There's nothing the matter with Mary Ellen physically. No, it's her mental health that concerns me. The poor Baron has been through a terrible shock, Percy. Yeah, I know. You, you don't think there is any chance of her losing her mind? Jeannie, Mary Ellen is beyond me and my knowledge. Somehow we've got to call in a psychiatrist. Oh, Percy. What is it you're afraid of for Mary Ellen? <laughs> well, you don't like my medical terms. I want to know. Very well, then. Schizophrenia. More specifically, dementia precox. Paranoid type, I guess. Oh, well, what does all that mean? Oh, withdrawal from life, delusions of all kinds, persecution, unseen enemies, that sort of thing. Oh, the second sight. Just... Just like all of us. Now that's enough of that nonsense. You're all sensitive, delicately balanced women, but all things being equal, perfectly normal. Well, I have other calls to make. Oh, well, I, I'll walk you to the door. Any instructions for Mary Ellen? Oh, just that she keep on with the sedation I provided. And Jeannie, try to persuade her to let me call in another doctor. I'll, I'll see what's best to do. Be very careful. I'll do what's right. Yeah, I think maybe tonight I'll take a run up to Glasgow and have a consultation with a friend of mine there, Dr. Engel. Good man. Maybe I could persuade him to run back down here with me just to observe her. Oh, by the way, till, till I see what I can do first, eh? Yeah, all right. Another day or so can't do any harm. I hope. <laughs> It's Aunt Jeannie, Mary Ellen. May I come in? If you want. I thought you might like a wee cup of tea. No, thanks. What are you staring at? Off the window. The soul way. The tide just came in. Roaring and boiling. 
so fast, so fast. And now the water's all smooth. And with the sun on it, everything's wiped clean. All the mud and the slime buried and hidden. It's so peaceful and calm. Water is so soft and friendly. I wonder if it heals as it washes over. What are you thinking about, child? I'm thinking about the first time I showed the tide to... to Michael. The day we were married. The day you said it was bad luck for us to see each other before the wedding. Oh, I was just joking about superstitions. Nobody believes those old wives' tales. Nobody believes so many things that are outside the ordinary. So many things they say don't exist but might be. Did you see Michael's body after? What? Did you see the marks of the hooves? Oh, don't talk about that, lass. I know they said the horse trampled him. I asked Dr. Ferguson about the hooves and he wouldn't tell me. You'd tell me, wouldn't you, Jeannie? Oh, tell you what? Were they like horseshoes? Or were they cleft in two? Were they cloven hooves? In the name of God, what are you saying? I'm not speaking of God. I'm speaking of the devil. Or some demon that haunts my tree. No, this is no time for foolish fancies. You mustn't let dreams spill over into your real life. Or is it the other way around? Oh, Mary Ellen, I don't know what it is you have on your mind, but... You can get me to Michael. Let me talk to Michael. He'll know. He can tell me what to do. Take me to Michael and Jeannie. Take me to him. Oh. Oh, can I, Mary Ellen? You know he... I know he's dead. I know he's passed beyond. But you can reach him. You can hold a seance. Oh, no. oh, no. I swore I never would again after what... After what happened that night when something got loose? Some evil presence? Something from... Auntie, you let him loose. The least you can do is help me undo the harm. I can't. I won't. I'll get the doctor. You dare to bring him here and I'll kill myself. I swear. Child, you're out of your... No. Not yet. But if you don't have that seance and let me find out from Michael what to do, I will be. I'll lose my mind. You've got to promise. Promise. Oh, calm down, child. Calm down. Tonight, now. No, that isn't possible. There, there have to be more than two to form a circle. Then call in the colonel and that other woman, anyone. Just promise me. Promise. I need him. I need Michael. Promise, Aunt Jeannie. Promise. May God forgive me. I, I, I promise. <laughs> May we all join hands, please. Clear your minds. Make them a blank, a quiet place, open and hushed. I'm reaching now, reaching away and above and out and over from here to the bonny, bonny other place that lies beyond our ken. Can you hear me, Anatu? Can you come to me into our circle? Anatu, we're reaching for you. Oh, I can't make contact. Ask for Michael. I have no way to him. Then let me. Oh, try it. Everyone, concentrate. Be still. Be still. Michael. Michael, I need you. Come to me. Oh, Michael. I love you. I 
Michael. It's not our child you're carrying. Get rid of it. Oh. Michael! It's no use, child. There's no contact tonight. We can break the ring. Will someone turn on the light, please? Oh, I'm that sorry, Mary Ellen. It's all right, Aunt Jeannie. You gave me what I wanted. I found out what I needed to know. Oh, I'm afraid that's quite impossible, my dear. You're not as backward as that, Dr. Ferguson. Abortion is perfectly legal, isn't it? Oh, I'm not concerned with the legality, Mary Ellen. As it happens, it is, but... Uh, then help me. I can't, dear. It's too late. What do you mean, too late? When you came to me a few weeks ago and we determined your pregnancy, you must have known that I would know it was already well advanced. But it wasn't. Michael and I were only married a month before that. You should know that. Well, of course I know that, my dear, but facts are facts. You were carrying a child that's past midterm. And abortion now is just too dangerous. Past midterm. Four and a half months. My guess is at least five. That fast? Oh, God, no. It mightn't wait. It could be born any minute. There's no one to help me but myself. Well, I'll drive you home, child. And I'll give you something to get a little rest. She's sound asleep now, Jeannie. Let's go downstairs and talk. Mm. Poor wee angel. So thin and pale and haunted. I, I, come away. Let her rest. What you gave, you'll never take away. Never? It's never going to be. Help me. God, help me. The tide. The tide. Yes, that's the way. Full moon. The, the time was right. And for our own protection, I see no other way, Jeannie. But to lock her away... Well, we're not locking her up. It's a sanitarium. It's a really lovely place. I don't think I could do it to her. I, I, I'll care for her. Jeannie, dear, if Ellen had preeclampsia or a threatened miscarriage or any one of a number of other diseases of pregnancy, she would have to be hospitalized. Now, think of it that way. All right, Percy, if you think it's best. It's the only way. Oh, no, doctor. Mine is the only way. Oh, that sounded like the front door. Ella. Oh, I'll, I'll check upstairs. You look outside. Oh, but I thought you said she... Oh, dear Lord. I got the premonition. Mary Ellen? Mary Ellen? Are you out there? Ginny! Ginny! It's Mary! She's gone! No. I gave her enough sedation to knock her out, but she's gone. But where? I had where? to be out on the first. Come on, Ginny. We've got to catch her before the time. wasn't a chance. We couldn't have saved her. My poor wee motherless lamb. It, it did not take it long to follow her poor husband. But, but the child... It hadn't been born, and she didn't want it. It wasn't Michael's, you know. 
Uh, are you sure of that? Oh, yes. It was five months old at least from the size. <laughs> A monster. Uh, no, I didn't say that. Still, I was thinking of x-rays. There was something strange about that embryo. I can't quite explain. It was nothing you could have understood, Doctor. So, at the last, it was all the Lord's will. And maybe for the best, at least, Michael and my Mary Ellen are in God's pocket at last. Who dreams on the Solway will wake in another world. Our story has come full circle. For us, it is the end. Let's hope that Jeannie is right. And for Ellen and Michael, it is only a beginning. I'll be back shortly. One final thought. If you believe some dreadful incubus possessed poor Ellen, driving her and her husband to their deaths, there is another explanation. Insanity did run in her family. So either way, even if there was the devil to pay, it still was all in the mind. Our cast included Jada Rowland, Nick Pryor, Bryna Rayburn, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. He must have been going 60 miles an hour on that road. The speed limit there was only about 30. You haven't arrested him, have they? No. But the police were called, weren't they? Yes, yes. Didn't they give Mark a sobriety test? No, nobody even suggested it. I mean, Mark didn't seem to be drunk at all. And of course, he didn't say he'd been drinking. He didn't mention the speed he was traveling at. Well, they asked him. Mark said he was going 35, and the woman just... Stepped out in front of him. You see. He had to say it, Daddy. What did you say? Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. We all know the phrase brotherly love used to express strong ties of affection. But actual brothers may be bitter enemies. Is it because they are so different or because they are so much alike that their ties are twisted into a tangled web of misunderstanding, a form of self-hatred rather than love, with the shortcomings of one blamed upon the other? Acting together, their power for evil can be devastating, especially when antagonisms are passed on from one generation to the next. If anything would happen to me, Jerry, what would you do? Well, I'd go ahead with the sale, of course, and claim the inheritance. Well, no, not all of it. 
You can't. Now, don't worry, Gordon. Nothing's going to happen. But, Jerry, if it does, promise me you'll take care of my family. Look, I don't have any obligation whatever to your wife and oh, kids. Please, Jerry. Promise. I'm, I'm scared. Something's happening to me. I, I can't breathe. <laughs> mystery drama, Stamped for Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elizabeth Pennell and stars Lloyd Batista and Russell Horton. It is sponsored in part by General Electric Citizen Band Radios and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Taylor was a stern and taciturn man who was never close to either of his two sons, although he seemed to favor his younger son, Jeremy. If he ever shared his true feelings with anyone, it was his wife. But he had been a widower for some years, and today, if anyone knew anything about his personal affairs, that would be his lawyer. Now George Taylor is dead, and his sons have returned to the Midwestern town of their youth to attend his funeral. Although they arrived from opposite directions, they are now together, waiting impatiently in the lawyer's outer office. Come in, Gordon. Jeremy, it's been a long time. I want to know why my father's house is locked. No one met me at the plane, and yet you didn't tell me where to get the key. Uh, I had my instructions. Uh, I thought you might stay with your uncle. Have you been in touch with him? Uh, no. Uh, did you call him, Gordon? I haven't talked to Uncle Morgan in years. I left a message, but his wife said he might not be able to come. Well, what's the matter with him? Well, your uncle's a very old man. Don't and... tell me Dad left something to Uncle Morgan. <clears throat> well, since the other party has already been informed, we might as well... Uh, 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 just, just a minute. What other party? I will proceed with the reading of the will. That's what we're here for. I, George Taylor... Being of sound and disposing mind, declare this to be my last will and testament. First, I bequeath my house and its contents to Miss Agnes Bodwell. What? Agnes who? Agnes Bodwell. She's a registered nurse. A nurse? Oh, you said father died suddenly. Healthiest man I ever knew all his life. Who, who the devil is Miss this? Miss Bodwell took care of your mother years ago when she was bedridden. Well, I'll be damned. Uh, where is this Miss, uh, what's her name? You know, she's been called away on a case and won't be able to attend the funeral. What about the house? She hasn't had time to decide what to do with it. Who cares about that old house? I don't want it. You please read on. To my brother Morgan, I leave a single stamp, the one known as the Brattleboro Eagle. He will know what to do with it. <laughs> a single stamp? Oh, that's rich. Shows what Dad thought of Uncle Morgan. Perhaps he thought more of him than I would have guessed. Well, what do you mean? Well, your father was a stamp collector. Well, of course he was a collector. But what good is one stamp? I understand there are rarities. Oh, some stamps are valued at fifty, seventy-five thousand dollars $75,000 apiece. You're kidding. But, uh, keep reading. I'm the eldest son, and I want to know what my father left me. Yeah, and, and you can skip the legal mumbo-jumbo. And he goes on to say there's enough money in his executor's account to cover funeral and burial expenses and to clear any outstanding debts. And who is the executor? I am. That follows. Well, go on. Get to the substance of his will. Yeah, what about stocks and bonds or, or whatever else he had by way of investments? Well, that I don't know. You don't know? Your father was a very secretive man. Even with his lawyer? With everyone. Look, you, you haven't finished reading the will. Now, now where, where do his heirs come in? I'm getting to that. The remainder of my estate I leave to my two sons, Gordon and Jeremy. It is sealed in a case which has been turned over to my executor for safekeeping. Ah, that, that must be the stock certificates and bank books. In witness thereof, I have hereunto set my hand and sealed... Oh, look, forget all that. Where are these important papers? Well, I have no knowledge of the contents of the case, but I do have the key. Where is it? Right here. My instructions are to unlock the container in the presence of both of you. So what are we waiting for? Oh, I can't do anything more today. Well, in the name of heaven, why not? 
Because it's in a vault at the bank, and the bank closed at 3 o'clock. When does it open? Nine tomorrow morning. I'll pick up the case and take it to you. Now, where will you be? Well, I'm staying with relatives of my wife. Uh, here's the address. Oh, no, you don't. Not with a bunch of people looking on. We'll, um, we'll meet in my hotel room. Where's that damn fool lawyer? What time is it? Uh, ten after ten. We should... Oh. Hello? Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, send him right up. Oh. Do you think this lawyer is on the level? What if he's pulling a fast yeah, one? That thought occurred to me. But you know how crazy cautious Dad was about the people he did business with. Well, just suppose our fine executor removed a few items no, no, like... No, no, don't start imagining things. The certificates will have our names on them. And he wouldn't... Do... I'll get it. Come in. Ooh, wow. It's, it's a whopper, isn't it? Yeah, it's heavy, too. It feels as if it were full of books. I thought you meant a briefcase. That's practically a trunk. It's a suitcase, actually. And you see, it's sealed with tape as well as lock. Well, here goes. Let's rip the tape off. Come on. Come on. Where's the key? I have it right here. And I feel like the male counterpart of Pandora. There. Uh, and it's just a bunch of folders. I'll take that gray one. Hi, right, George, there are books in there. Wait a minute, there's, there's nothing in this folder but stamps. Sheets and sheets of them. If... Well, the other stuff must be at the bottom. This book is filled with stamps, too. Oh, colorful, aren't they? Yeah, I'm only interested in one color, green. Don't be stupid. That wouldn't stash away folding money. Well, there's got to be something more. Uh, uh, look in the pockets for bank books. I felt all along the sides and inside the top. Uh, keep keep looking through those folders. Yeah. Uh, uh, nothing but crummy sheets of stamps. I don't think you're going to find anything else. You said you didn't know what was in here. I didn't. But your father told me not long ago that he had consolidated all his holdings. Well, then where are they? He had stocks and bonds, I know he did, and, and a large bank account. At one time, maybe, but it looks to me as though he converted everything into his stamp collection. What a dirty trick. Not with all these unused stamps in perfect condition. You may have inherited a sizable fortune. How much do you think? Well, I'm no stamp collector. I wouldn't have the slightest idea, and I don't know anyone in this town who would. Well, then I'll, I'll take him back to New York with me. The big city will have several stamp appraisers. I'll find out who's the uh, best. Uh, nothing doing. As the eldest son, I'll take charge of this suitcase. Don't you touch it. I can find an appraiser just as well as you can. There must be plenty in Southern California. Oh, I think you'd be better off in New York. Down by Wall Street on Nassau, there's a whole city block. So, full so, of... so it's settled. I'm, I'm taking them with me. Not unless I come along. I'll change my plans and fly back east with you. Well, then I'll keep the case right here for the night. I wouldn't trust you alone with it for five minutes. Well, what do I know about stamps? You know enough to remove something which might look tempting. We could uh, divide these folders up right now. Half for you, half for me. Well, you'll be sorry if you do. I imagine it's the total collection that would have the highest value. Well, when do we leave? I'm booked on the first flight out after the funeral tomorrow. Three o'clock in the afternoon. Well... My mission is complete as far as you two men are concerned. I'll be leaving. Not without the suitcase. Well, I don't understand. You see, I don't trust my brother Gordon any more than he trusts me. So you keep the stamps overnight and then bring them to us at the airport tomorrow. quite sure your flight hasn't been canceled? No, yeah, seems to be right on schedule. Yeah, what I thought with all those hurricane warnings on the East Coast... Doesn't mean a thing to these big jets. Well, I'm glad to see the last of this suitcase. Here you are. Oh, thanks. Uh, thank you. Incidentally, they won't let you take it along on board the plane. It's too big for hand luggage. I'll check it through on my ticket. Uh, oh, no, 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 you won't. I have almost no luggage, and I'll check it out on mine. All right, snap out of it, boys. Am I still the family arbiter? <laughs> All right, here, I'll toss a coin. Your call, Gordon. Heads. Tails. Suitcase goes on your ticket, Jeremy. He always did get the brakes. <laughs> Jerry, I just thought of something. Uh, don't bother me. I'm trying to sleep. Uh, but I just thought, what if Uncle Morgan really got the best of the deal? 
Well, how could he? Well, if that one stamp is so valuable, maybe that's where all Dad's money went. Impossible. Now, what makes you so sure? I told you, he cleaned up in that big oil deal. You cleaned up on it, too, didn't you? I never cleaned up on anything. Believe me, I'm just as poor as you are. So will you shut up and let me get some sleep? Jerry, huh? uh, Jerry, wake up. Uh, uh, what do you want now? Fasten your seatbelt. Uh, why? Are we getting ready to land? Oh, not yet, but the stewardess made an announcement. Oh, uh, uh, where is she? Uh, uh, a stewardess, I- I'd like a cup of coffee. Oh, I'm sorry, not right now, sir. We're experiencing a little turbulence. Oh, must have slept longer than I thought. It's pitch black out there. Except for the lightning. We've hit some really rotten weather. I don't like it, Jerry. I... You know, I just thought of something else. Oh, what is it now? Is that suitcase insured? Well, I didn't insure it. You should have thought of that before we left. How, how could I? Anyway, we don't know the value. Well, relax. We'll soon know what it's worth. Please be sure your seatbelts are fastened and observe the no smoking sign. What the devil's going on? Gordon, will you take it easy? Ladies and gentlemen, your captain has asked me to assure you there's no cause for alarm. You may experience a few moments of discomfort until we have passed through the eye of the storm. Jerry. Uh, Jerry, where are your baggage checks? Well, uh, they're, they're in my wallet. Oh, show me where. Oh, for Pete's sake. Yeah, but what if something should happen? What, to you or to me? Either way, show me the baggage check so that if I had to get... Stop being morbid. Suppose something happens to both of us. Uh, and I guess our friendly lawyer will be left holding the bag again. And, and if something should happen to me, promise you'll take care of my family. Now, what makes you think a bachelor doesn't have responsibility? Well, not like mine. Promise me you... I don't have any obligation whatsoever to your wife and kids. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention please. Your captain is in full command. We can all cooperate by remaining calm. Why doesn't the captain come on and tell us so himself? I imagine he's too busy handling the plane. How can you be so calm? Jerry. Jerry, something's happening to me. I, I can't breathe. We are coming in for an emergency landing. I repeat, we are forced to make an emergency landing. Should the plane become depressurized, the compartment over your head will open automatically. Take the oxygen mask and place it firmly over the mouth and nose. Yes. Look, promise me, Jeremy. Promise me that you... Good Lord. We're, we're out of control. The, the, the plane is going to crash. I don't want to frighten anyone with details of a plane crash. Actually, statistics prove that air travel is the safest means of modern transportation. And many a storm has been weathered with little more than a few moments of uneasiness. Nevertheless, our unloving brothers are in a situation ominous enough to terrify the bravest. We'll find out what happens when I return shortly with Act Two. are written for protection, but sometimes an inheritance causes more dissension than joy. We have yet to find out who will reap the benefit of George Taylor's estate, a stamp collection which could be of great value. His two sons were planning to turn it into cash when they got to New York, but did they reach their destination? You will recall that George Taylor had an older brother, Morgan, and by the terms of the will, this older brother inherited a single stamp, reputed to be a rarity. He's examining it right now while his wife does the breakfast dishes. More coffee, Morgan? No, thank you, dear. I'm fine. Oh, wouldn't you know my hands are wet. I'm coming, I'm coming. Hello? Who? Oh, yes. Who is it? Your brother's lawyer. You know, the man who brought you the stamp. I wonder what he wants. Uh, No. Uh, No, we never look at television in the morning. No, the radio's not on just now. Yes, we do have a newspaper, but we haven't gotten around to it yet. We save that for the afternoon. What what, what is it, Martha? What's happened that's so important? (gasps) My goodness. 
Is that so? Oh, yes. Yes, I will. Well, uh, thank you very much for calling. Well, now, what was that all about? Does he want the stamp back? Uh, no, no, nothing to do with your stamp. Well, then what is it? Your nephews. They've been in a plane crash. What? I thought that would get a rise out of you. Uh, Martha, please, stop teasing. Have, have, have they been hurt? No. Both escaped without a scratch. That's what the lawyer phoned to tell us. Oh, thank goodness. They're all right. Where's the morning newspaper? Let's find out what happened. Oh, here it is. All over the front page. Well, read it to me. Um, Jetliner, flight to New York. The plane was caught in the tail end of that big hurricane we heard about yesterday. Oh, a really bad storm. Uh -huh. And it goes on to say, emergency landings, skillfully handled by the pilot, courageous crew evacuated all passengers without a casualty. Are the boys' pictures there? No, but take a look at what was once the plane. It caught fire right after all the passengers escaped. Think of that. It says the mailbags burned up. And every bit of baggage completely destroyed. Oh, what difference does that make as long as no lives were lost? Oh, my goodness. That telephone never seems to stop ringing. Ever since the boys were in that plane accident, people have been calling to talk. Let's turn this into some sort of celebrity. Just to... oh, hurry up, Martha. Answer the phone. Hello? Why, hello, Gordon. Yes, your uncle's here, but it's hard for him to get to the phone. May I give him the message? I'll come if you just help me up out of this chair. Yes, yes, it, just, just just a minute. Um, Gordon's in town, and he wants to see you. Asks if he can come right over. Well, of course, of course. I'm not doing anything. Uh, yes, Gordon, right away. Uh, goodbye. Neither of my nephews has set foot in this house for the last ten years. I wonder what Gordon has on his mind. It certainly was a relief to learn that you'd come to no harm, Gordon. But it must have been a terrible experience for both of you. Yeah, you bet it was. But uh, I'll come right to the point. Yeah, I wish you would. Uncle Morgan, how much money did my father have? Well, that's a strange question for you to ask me. How would I know? Well, you must have some idea. Well, your father bragged to me once a long time ago that he was well on the way to becoming a millionaire. Did you believe him? He never discussed his personal affairs, but when your father made up his mind to get what he wanted... But all that money, what became of it? I was under the impression from your father's will that you and your brother inherited the bulk of his estate. What we inherited was a collection of stamps. Oh, well, you're lucky. Your father had a very valuable collection. How valuable? Why, his block of Colombian inverts alone would be worth, mm, say, $20,000. And that one sheet of misprinted commemorative... Oh, Uncle Morgan, I don't know anything about stamp collecting. You see, the entire collection burned in that plane crash. <gasps> Oh, well, now, that does make a difference. Darn right it makes a difference. Jerry and I are wiped out. Uh, maybe you don't know that I was recently laid off, and I am completely broke. Oh, I'm sorry. Uncle Morgan, you're the only person I can turn to. You have to loan me some money. I've got to have money to live. Well, so do we all. Yeah, but you're comfortable. Look at this house. Mortgage to the hip. I only want to borrow some money. Your aunt and I get by just barely on Social Security and the interest on a few small investments. It's hardly enough to pay our monthly bills. Look, there's no use beating around the bush. I happen to know that by the terms of my father's will, you would let the... A <laughs> oh, stamp... Gordon, you've upset him. Now, your uncle can't talk anymore. You'll hear me out. <laughs> Not now. I will have to ask you to leave. Uncle Morgan, you... Now, that will be all, Gordon. Your uncle has had enough for one day. I'll be back. You can count on it. I'll be back. Morgan, are you all right? Certainly, I'm all right. Oh, thank heaven. You are a KG-1. <laughs> you were putting on an act, weren't you? Of course. And you did very well, too. 
Morgan, you are going to sell the stamp that your brother left you, aren't you? It all depends. Well, it could make a great difference in our lives. Mm, for better or worse, do you think? Well, you know I've never complained. Well, I'm suspicious of my so-called inheritance. Why should my dear brother George think kindly of me for once in his miserable life? Well, maybe he was trying to make up for the past. Uh, you know, he did claim me for a sucker. And his sons are nothing but chips off the old block. Morgan, guess who phoned while you were taking a nap? No need to tell me. I've been expecting to hear from my second nephew. Jeremy will be here this afternoon. Good. When he comes, bring him into my bedroom and I'll be working on my stamps. How are you, Uncle Morgan? Oh, well enough, I suppose, for sure. an old man. Mm, sure looks familiar seeing you with a stamp collection. I remember when I was a kid how you and Dad used to compare notes. Oh, uh, you're quite mistaken if you think we ever compared notes. But you both collected stamps. Well, I was never anything but a hobbyist. My father was an investor. He always said I didn't know a damn thing about stamps. Uncle Morgan, uh, I'd like to see the stamp my father left you. Is it uh, here? No, it's been put away for safekeeping. Oh, you mean it's not in the house? Well, I didn't say that. But my eyesight is not what it used to be, and I wouldn't want to get it mixed up. Well, uh, it. tell me where it is. I'll 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 get it for you. Oh, not now, Jeremy. Let's just have a visit. Uh, uh, tell me, how is your business doing? Oh, my business. What a laugh. Uncle Morgan, the... Uh... The fact is, I, I need money, and I have a proposition to make to you. I've already made it clear to your brother that I'm penniless, so don't ask me for a loan. I know a way we can both benefit from the stamp my father left you. Tell me. Uh, turn the stamp over to me, and I'll put it up as collateral for a business loan to tide me over. Then I'll give you your share of... My your... share? Well, that stamp was left to me. Well, sure, but you and Aunt Martha will have plenty of money to live on, and when I get on my feet, you'll have the stamp back. Don't, don't you see? Well, that's a proposition I'd have to think about. Why don't you think about it now? Oh, well, in good time, Jeremy. Uh, that's enough for today. I'll get in touch with you when I've thought it over. Gordon, you said you were going to talk to your lawyer. Have you come to any conclusion? Well, I haven't been able to see him yet. But I'm convinced that my father was not in his right mind when he made his will. So, what are you going to do? Unless you agree to sell the stamp and give me my rightful share, I'm going to sue you. Why, come in, Jeremy. What lovely flowers. For a lovely lady, Aunt Martha. Oh, thank you. I suppose you want to see your uncle. Oh, no, not at all. I, I came especially to see you. I can't believe this is strictly a social call. Oh, but it is. I thought you and I could get together and do something nice for Uncle Morgan. Oh, that's very thoughtful. I realize that now he's mostly confined to his bed, uh, you must be the family decision maker. Morgan and I have always worked together. Oh, it's only natural with someone his age. Uncle Morgan's mind works slowly. Mm, on the other hand, if you and I... I got... You want that stamp for collateral, don't you? Exactly. Where is it, Aunt Martha? Perhaps I shouldn't be doing this. But if we can do anything to make your Uncle Morgan more comfortable, I'll cooperate. Well... You have the right idea. So, now, if you would uh, give the stamp to me... We've uh, been keeping the package in this desk drawer. I assure you, you will never regret this, Aunt Martha. Here. Martha! Martha! Uh, just a minute, Morgan. Uh, don't, don't tell him I was here. I'll leave quiet. Martha! Can you come in here, please? <laughs> Old man, it worked. Just the way you said it would. <laughs> he fell for the whole scheme, huh? Hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> Wait till he opens the package and finds out it's nothing but a sheet of blank paper. <laughs> that worries me, Morgan. 
if Jeremy would go so far as to steal, then he might very well... Ah, I bet you a nickel, Martha. That's the other one back to bother us. Uncle Morgan, I'm fed up with all this stalling around. I've been expecting to hear from your lawyer, Gordon. You did mention legal steps. Yeah, he to... said the suit is inadvisable. And I'm tired of waiting for you to sell that stamp. In all my life, I've never acted in haste. You're just like my father, with absolutely no concern for me. Now, take it easy, Gordon. I always got the short end of the stick. No one ever paid any attention to what I wanted. I'd appreciate it if you'd stop shaking my Uncle bed. Morgan, I could kill you for the way you... <laughs> hey, you hurting my arm. Gordon, Gordon, stop it. Get away from your uncle's bed. Hey, you leave this house at once. <laughs> Are you sure you're all right? Yes, yes, yes. He, he didn't hurt me. Oh, but the coughing fit. You aren't putting it on this time, are you? No, Martha, no. Oh, but I feel better now. I'm going to call the doctor. The best medicine will be to keep those wretched nephews away. I will do anything Not to... Not to worry, Martha, dear. Just get a paper and pencil and let me dictate a letter. It certainly was good of you to come all this way to look at my husband's stamp. Oh, I'd travel around the world if I thought there was a chance to purchase the very rare Rattleboro Eagle. Well, then it really is as valuable as they say. Oh, very. Very few are known to exist. And I have a potential buyer who's been searching for years. Um, Martha, would you bring us that folder, please? Now, I, I haven't promised that I'm ready to sell this stamp. Oh, by the way, are you any relation to the late George Taylor? Yes, he was my brother. We've been wondering what will become of his fine collection. I'll tell you after you've appraised my stamp. Uh, here. Please examine my Brattleboro Eagle. Hmm. A beauty, isn't it? Uh, the color has withstood the test of time. Uh, oh. And the perforations are good. Oh, may I go somewhere where there's better light? Over here by the window. And if you want to turn on the lamp. Oh, thank you. It will take a moment with a magnifying glass. You will sell it, won't you? We could be rich. Shh, shh, Martha. Wait till we hear what he says. Uh, I... <laughs> I don't quite know how to put this. I'm ready for anything you have to tell me. Well, everything about it looks so right... The blue and, and this fleck of white. But on the back, did you happen to turn the stamp over? Yes, yes, I examined the back, but I've never known enough about Well, stamps. the glue. You see, they didn't use this type of adhesive back when this stamp was issued. Go on. And when I held it up to the light, I could tell that no wooden hand press could have possibly... It was manufactured more recently, was it? Well, I have yet to give it the watermark test, but... Uh, Mr. Taylor, I'm very sorry to say that from everything I've seen so far, your fine Bratterboro Eagle is a remarkable forgery. Now, there's a surprise and a deep disappointment. But perhaps this is the only way that Morgan Taylor could get his grasping nephews off his back. We would hope that he and Martha can live out the rest of their lives in peace, even if they must scrape along on very little. You might think this is the end of our story. Far from it. I assure you there are still some quite startling developments in store, which we'll come up with shortly in Act Three. Morgan Taylor knew more about stamps all along. It would seem his brother had played a cruel joke, leaving him nothing but a worthless forgery. The valuable stamps in that collection are lost forever, and Morgan, who now knows he does not have long to live, is worried not about his own future, but about his wife. I'm sorry, Martha. If it had worked out differently... I would have put it all in your name. Oh, now, don't you worry about me. 
All we both must do is to help you get well, and the doctor said. Uh, I know what the doctor said. Then I can read between the lines. Now, Morgan, you're overwrought. But you can be sure we'll hear no more from your nephews once they know the truth about your magnificent inheritance. That's just it, Mother. I don't want them to know. What? Oh! Oh, my dear husband. I should have guessed that you'd keep on playing the game. Well, if that's what you call it, a game. Will you play it with me? We've always been partners. I'll do anything you say. Well, then promise me that as long as I live, my nephews will never know that my grand inheritance was nothing but a scrap of worthless paper. We've come to apologize, Aunt Martha. I guess that plane wreck really uh, cracked us up for a while. First there was Dad's death, and Oh, then... your uncle and I understand... You boys have been through a great deal. Mm. How is Uncle Morgan? Well, I'm afraid he's not well. These past weeks have taken their toll. He must be kept very quiet. Well, may we see him? Oh, I think not. Oh, honestly, Aunt Martha, we just want to tell him how sorry we are. Well, uh, just for a minute. But only if you talk about cheerful things. Uncle Morgan? Is that you, George? Oh. Uh, no. No, I'm George's son, Gordon. Uh, I always wondered, George, why you didn't come to see me. But now, after all these years... Hi, you... Uncle Morgan. It, it, it's me, Jeremy. Uh, come closer, George. Let me get a good look at you. He's in bad shape. Boy, this is hopeless. <laughs> You think I fooled the mother? <laughs> you came close to fooling me. <laughs> ah, I'm deeply concerned. No, you mustn't be. I may have gotten even with Gordon and Jeremy, but there's no reason for them to take it out on you. No, they never will. But when I'm gone... Shh, Morgan. Why don't we burn the forge stamp? I have a much better solution. What have you done with it? Open the drawer in the bedside table and take out that envelope. Yes, Morgan? Uh, I want you to take that envelope right now and put it in the corner mailbox. Anything you say. Mm -hmm. Look at it. Look at the address. Uh, Morgan, you've addressed it to the dead letter office? Well, that's exactly where it belongs. The dead letter office. <laughs> What's our next move, Jerry? That all depends. Plan A or plan B. But they've taken the old man to the hospital. That makes a difference. He can't have long to live. Don't you believe it. He may be soft in the head, but he can go on for years and years with good nursing care. Hey, hello. Yes? Yes. My brother and I? We're the only relatives. That's right. We'll be right there. If that's who I think it was... Grove Street Hospital. Uh, Dr. Miller wants us to go there at once. Hmm, things are happening sooner than we thought. I'm uh, Dr. Miller. Y uh, your name is Taylor? Oh, that's right. You've called us here because of our uncle? Uh, why, no. It's about Mrs. Taylor, your aunt. Oh, and Martha asked you to call us. We knew Uncle Morgan was in the hospital. Well, they're both here. Uh, Mrs. Taylor was brought in this morning with a coronary. Aunt Martha? Well, how is she? Resting comfortably at the moment, but I felt it wise to notify the next of kin. Well, of course, you did the right thing. I'll uh, take you to her room. Hello, Gordon. Jeremy? Nice of you to come. Well, we only just Aunt heard... Martha, this is no place for you. You're looking much too healthy. Oh, you'll soon be out of here. Well, I hope Uncle Morgan and I both will. Aunt Martha, after all that's gone on, Jerry and I have been doing a lot of thinking, and, well, we'd like to... We'd like to really be members of the family. Morgan and I have always been quite self-sufficient. Well, of course. 
but since he's been so ill and all... We have a plan we'd like to tell you about. Go on. Well, the woman who lives in Dad's old house was much too big for her, and, well, we understand she's looking for a couple to share it. You're suggesting that your uncle and I... You see, Aunt Martha, this woman's a nurse, and, and she could help you take care of Uncle Morgan. Well, I must say that's very interesting. Do you like the idea? Oh, it's incredible. Wait till Morgan hears about this. Of course, you would be the one to decide. Oh, no, indeed. I never do anything without your uncle's full agreement. Only oh, he's in no condition to make any... Of course he is. But last time he... Uh, you I are mean, we... quite wrong if you think your uncle is incapable of making decisions. Go and ask him. But Aunt Martha... Go on. Discuss this unusual scheme with your Uncle Morgan. He's in room 302. And give him my love. This is ridiculous. If the old boy's in as bad shape as he was last but time... Hold on. If he doesn't know what he's saying, maybe we can talk him into anything. Oh, there you are. I was uh, coming to get you. Uh, doctor, we're looking for Uncle Morgan's room. I regret to inform you that your uncle is dead. Oh, well, that's unhappy news, but but you must agree, Doctor, it was not unexpected. Very true. Morgan Taylor was a fine man. I've known him for many years. Uh, should we go back to be with Aunt Martha? Well, I wouldn't if I were you. Uh, let me be the one to tell her. You can come back later. We have clear sailing. That's what you think. Well, of course we do. Aunt Martha has nowhere else to turn. You mean we're stuck with her? Well, stuck is hardly the word after what I found out. You've been doing something behind my back. I wondered why you were so agreeable. I've simply been using my time to learn more about rare stamps. You got hold of it. No, but I've discovered that the Brattleboro Eagle is one of the most sought-after stamps in the world. Worth how much? At least $200,000. Why, Aunt Martha's rich. Certainly, and when I give her all the details, she'll sell. I won't leave her alone with you for one minute. <laughs> Didn't think you would, but we can't spring this on her right away. Why not? Diplomacy, you fool. We must treat her very gently. All right, all right. I'm the eldest. I'll take care of the funeral arrangements for Uncle Morgan. Flowers, telephone calls, all that sort of thing. Yeah, but first, we must get to the hospital and give Aunt Martha our deepest... Sympathy. We're here to see Mrs. Morgan Taylor. Uh, n never mind, nurse. I'll, I'll speak to them. Uh, uh, I'm glad you're here. Um, well, is it all right to see Aunt Martha now? Uh, come down here where we can be alone. I, I, I've been trying to reach you. Well, I know there are things to be taken care of, and I'm quite ready to accept all uh, the responsibility. Sit, sit down, please. Well, how is Aunt Martha? I have seldom known a more devoted couple than your aunt and uncle. Oh, I know, and I'm sure Aunt Martha is going to need it's all... It's strange, uh, or perhaps it isn't, uh, how often this sort of thing happens. Well, our parents were that way, sort of as if one always knew what the other was thinking. Well, then you'll be better prepared for what I have to tell you. Just let me talk to Aunt Martha. Uh, I realize, Doctor, that she has no family of her own. When I told her of your uncle's death, she took it very calmly. Of course, she knew how ill he was. Well, he was an old man. He couldn't go on forever. But without him, you see... No, don't worry, Doctor. I've made up my mind to take good care of her. I gave her a sedative. In... Do you think it's worn off by now? When I looked in on her later, she was gone. What? She left the hospital? Within an hour of your uncle's death, your aunt died peacefully in her sleep. I'm glad you took full responsibility. That lets me off the no, hook. No, not now. The whole situation has changed. Oh, no, it hasn't. You're the older brother and you asked for it. Go on, do your duty. Oh, please, Jerry. The lawyer said that's enough cash to cover a decent burial. Oh, but the will says we share and share alike. Share what? Nothing but bills and a mortgage. Well, I'm putting their house up for sale. You can't until we find a stamp. You're the expert. Go through that collection again. It must be there. It's not. Nothing but some U.S. commemoratives. Maybe a couple of hundred dollars worth. Well, sell them. 
I think that Brattleboro may be in a safe deposit box. Well, then where's the key? Oh, no use. I've looked in every one of those drawers. Well, what did the lawyer have to say? Uh, he knows nothing. He says he never even met Uncle Morgan. Do you believe him? As much as you do. Oh, I've been through the closets and every pocket. Hey, the books. What if he put the stamp between the pages of one of those books? I'll stay here until I go through each one of them. Uh, and, and maybe there's a safe behind one of these walls. I'll tear down this house if I have to. No, 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 no. You, you have to get back to your family. I'll, I'll stay on here and see what I can do. I'm not leaving here until I find it. Not if I find it first. Good luck, boys. We know that no amount of luck in the world is going to help you find that stamp. Retribution? Perhaps. In payment for an insatiable greed. Not everyone earns his own way in this world, but if you depend upon someone else to make your way easier, you may be in for an unhappy awakening. I'll be back shortly. the mistakes the brothers Taylor made was writing their uncle off as a man too old to know what he was doing. Morgan Taylor knew exactly what he was up to. All the way. And so did his lifetime partner. What a pair of senior citizens. One unanswered question. Did George Taylor really know the stamp he willed his brother was worthless? And if so, what did he mean when he said that Morgan would know what to do with it. I leave you to reach your own conclusions. Our cast included Lloyd Batista, Robert Dryden, Russell Horton, and Anne Petoniak. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. You haven't said a word all the way home. No. But I haven't been sleeping. I've been thinking... I wish I'd known how to tell you all this differently. Oh, my, what's that? we better get over to the curb fire engines. Oh, I wonder where they're going. Hey, look. They're turning the corner, going down the block. Eric! What? Eric, it's our house. Oh. Oh, our house is oh. on fire. Look at our house, oh. Eric. It's in flames. Well, how did it happen? I don't know. Our house is burning, Eric. Where are you going? My papers. All my work. I can't let them burn. I can't let them be destroyed. Oh, no, you can't go in there. My personal papers. Eric, I have to save them. You stay here. Stay, I said. Oh, no, Eric, don't you go. No, you'll be killed. Oh, somebody stop him. Stop him. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall presiding as usual over a vintage assortment of tales of mystery, terror, excitement, and suspense. Someday we shall simply have to rid ourselves of all the well-worn cliches that obscure our speech and corrode our thinking. 
And for our present purposes, we should start with the one that says, ignorance is bliss. The fact of the matter is that the truly ignorant are seldom blissful. Indeed, they are usually unhappy, suspicious, stubborn, and frustrated. True, a little bit of wisdom may be dangerous, but a great deal of ignorance is usually fatal, as we shall demonstrate. The garden. I've, I've never seen such flowers. Beautiful, aren't they? Yes, how do you grow them? Oh, that's my secret, darling. Oh, should there be a secret between husband and wife? Well... The whole neighborhood's talking. How do you grow such flowers? You wouldn't want to know. Tell me. No. I insist. Very well. It's how you water them. Oh? Well, how do you water them? With blood. Our mystery drama, The Flowers of Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mercedes McCambridge. It is sponsored in part by Imported Vigna Rosé Wine and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. There are those who strive to be different, who march to the rhythms of their very own drummers, and these are a breed apart. When they succeed, we hail them as geniuses. When they fail, we confine them as madmen. In either case, they remain a mystery to most of us. They are beyond the common understanding. This is because, for so many of us, the usual tendency is to play it safe. The usual advice is, don't stick your neck out. The usual goal is to be like everybody else. Don't rock the boat. Don't make waves. These have been articles of faith for Walter Morrison and for Gretchen, his wife. Hello? Darling. Walter, where are you? At the office. I called to tell you I'll be late for dinner tonight. Oh, Walter. Well, can't be helped here. Parker's in from the coast, and I can score some points if I hang around and just chat with him, okay? All right. Oh, uh, uh, we should ask Parker and his wife out to dinner. Oh, she's really a horrible woman, Walter. Well, sure she is, but Parker can do me a lot of good. <sighs> All right, dear. I'll see if I can set him up. If, if it's, uh, go, wear brown. Brown? Yes, it's your least flattering color. You shouldn't look too good. She's older than you, and she'd resent it. <laughs> yes, dear, I understand. Is there anything else you want me to do, Walter? No, that's about it. See you later. Oh, just a minute. Hello. Yes. What is it? Mm, I was right. You were right about what? About you. Oh, uh, look, I don't buy anything from door-to-door -door salesmen. In that event, may I trouble you for a glass of water? Water? Actually, I'd prefer a glass of wine if you had it. I suppose it's uh, an odd request. In this century, in this place... In this time, the concept of hospitality has ceased to exist. Uh, sir, I'm really very busy. Now, consider your ancestors. They would have invited me inside with a hearty welcome, prevailed upon me to stay for supper, spend the night. I'm really not interested. Today, the stranger who rings the doorbell is directed to the nearest motel, if indeed the door is opened at all. Oh, you'll have to excuse me. My uh, telephone is ringing. No, it isn't. I warn you, I'll scream for help. I'll, I'll call for the police. You simply don't know how to handle this at all, do you? What do you want? What are you selling? What do you need? I already told you I don't want to buy anything. That's not what I asked you. I asked you what you needed. I don't need anything. Now, please just let me close the door. Is that really true, that you don't need anything? Yes. You have everything your heart desires. Yes, now, please. Love... Happiness, fulfillment. Oh, yes, yes. Think carefully. Don't answer quickly. I told you, I don't want anything you're selling. I'm not selling anything. Well, then why did you ring my 
As I was walking by, I saw you at your window. You reminded me of someone. Someone I knew a long time ago. I'm... I'm really not interested. You should be. I mean you no harm. And what... I saw your face. It reminded me of someone I loved once. But I can't remember her name. Oh, please, I'm frightened. Don't be afraid. You remind me of her. But who was she? There were so many. I must tell you, I love deeply and with all my heart, but not for long. Never for long. Who are you? God. You are what? I should say, a God. That's... that's... That's what? Impossible. Why? Because... Because everyone knows... What everyone knows is usually nonsense. It's what you know. What I know that counts. You say you're a god. Remember, I can see your mind. You've decided to humor me. You believe that I'm a lunatic. You hope I'm harmless. Oh, why do you say you can read my mind? Isn't it natural for me to think that a person who... My name is Dionysus. Dionysus? The ancient Greek god of wine and growing things. Well, I don't care much for wine, but I wish you could help me with my garden. You are beautiful when you smile. <laughs> Suddenly this whole thing just makes me laugh. Why do you say you're Dionysus? Because it's true. I'm, I'm dreaming. I must be dreaming. What are dreams? Dionysus. I remember I had a course at school, at college, in ancient lit. It was a long time ago. Dionysus and Apollo, yes, and Zeus and Pallas Athena. My sisters, my brothers. Dionysus, the god of growing things. I think I fell in love with you then. I know. Why have you come to me now? Because nothing grows in your heart anymore. What is this life you lead? This dull, empty life. Oh, I'm... I'm very happy. Walter and I, we're happy. We... Gretchen, why does nothing grow in your garden? Oh, things grow. They do. Then why did you say you wish I could help you with your garden? Well, because... I know, because nothing grows with beauty, with fire. Once, in another life, you were in my garden. The Garden of Dionysus. I remember now. Yes. And I'm sorry for the way it ended. You remember how it ended? Yes. It always ends badly when one of the immortal gods loves a woman of the earth. The garden. Do you remember the garden? I remember. You will live in that garden again. With you. That garden shall be in your own heart. And everything beautiful will grow from it. I have walked the world and wandered the centuries in search of you. And now I've found you again. I love you. I love you. But will you leave me again? Never. I will always be in your garden. My thought will always be in your heart. Come. Come, love. Let us walk in the garden. Have a chair, my boy. Well, thank you, sir. Read the report, Walter? First rate job. I appreciate that, sir. Well, now, Walter, Carraway's resigned. Yes, so I've been told, Mr. Baylor. And you don't have to be told the assistant general sales manager's job's wide open. Well, I don't have to be told that at all, sir. It's the jump, Walter. The big one. Yes, I've been aiming for it these past ten years. Well, we just don't promote a man around here. We promote a team. A team? A man and his wife. Oh, oh, I understand that. <laughs> Glad you do. Man has to have the right kind of wife. Yes, well, Gretchen is absolutely perfect, sir. Good. I'd like to meet her. Uh, well, sir, may I invite you to our house for dinner? Well, thank you, Walter. I accept. 
Uh, uh, what did you say her name was? Gretchen. Hmm. Sounds like a, a frivolous name. Well, her, her real name is Margaret, sir, but you see, Gretchen is, uh, is a kind of nickname. I prefer Margaret. Well, Mr. Baylor, I'm sure we can call her. You see, her. my boy, it's just after that very unfortunate experience with Carraway's wife. Here we have a man who's assistant general manager of this company, and his wife is practically a hippie. Gets her name in the news with all kinds of unsavory and disreputable people. Yes, I understand, uh, sir. You might say I'm, I'm snake bitten. We, uh, the company, we simply cannot afford yes, to take... Yes, naturally, Mr. Baylor. I can assure you that Greg... That my wife is everything the wife of an executive of this corporation should be. I'm sure of it, my boy. When, uh... When would it be convenient for you to dine with us, Mr. Baylor? Are you free Friday night? Yes, of course. Good, good. Friday night for dinner. Thank you, sir. And, and Walter, I, I think I can offer you my congratulations. Oh, my love, my love, don't leave me. Stay. Stay. Margaret. Margaret, are you all right? My love, you're not going. I'm not yet. Margaret. Not yet. Margaret. What? Honey. Oh, I was dreaming. I was dreaming. Well, this is, uh, unlike you to just nap on a couch in the living room. Are you all right? Yes. Yes. It was only a dream. Oh, but I don't have dinner ready. I must have fallen asleep. Well, that's all right. I'll take you out. We'll celebrate. Celebrate what? It's happened. Assistant General Sales Manager. Oh, Walter. Remember, remember, that's what we aimed at ten years ago. Well, today, today we hit the target. Is it official? Just about. Only one tiny detail. And that is? You. Me? What, what have I... you got to do with it? Everything. Oh, I don't understand. Now, listen, Margaret. Why do you think Carraway resigned? What did you call me? Margaret. Oh, my name is Gretchen. Well, yes, perhaps, but Gretchen comes from Margaret. Oh, I don't like Margaret. That's why I call myself Gretchen. Well, Margaret suits you better, dear. It's more mature, more dignified. I don't think so. Well, Mr. Baylor does. Well, why should my name be any of Mr. Baylor's business? Darling, before we get sidetracked, I asked if you knew why Carraway resigned. What does Mr. Baylor have against my name? Carraway didn't jump, darling. He was pushed. His wife didn't fit in. What does that mean? Evidently, a man's wife has to fit a certain image in this corporation. Well, I was never involved in any of your business things before. Yes, I know, but now it'll be different. Why did you say Mrs. Carraway didn't fit in? Well, she wasn't too careful about what she said. Why? What did she say? It doesn't matter. She, she's the type who says a lot of kooky, oddball things. All I know is that she said to me she couldn't take this... This rat race, seriously. Well, a corporation is supposed to be your life. You just can't say things like that in front of people like Mr. Baylor. Well, do I have to meet Mr. Baylor? Darling, what's gotten into you? Walter, is the company your life? Well, of course it is. It's always been. It's my career. It's our living. Now, that should answer that question. Are you going to meet Mr. Baylor here Friday night? He's coming to dinner. Did you have to invite him? He wanted to look you over here in your own setting. Why? Well, to determine whether you'd be an asset to the company. I see. Darling, what, what has gotten into you? Why all these questions? I'm sorry. I... I had this dream. About what? I can't seem to remember. All right, forget it. Come on, let's go out to dinner right now. Okay. And, Walter, mm -hmm. you're Mr. Baylor, I promise you. He'll be proud of me. Darling, I know that. Now, where would you like to eat? Oh, anywhere. Now, just remember, we can now afford the very best. Walter, uh, look. Look. What, what, what? What is that? The garden. What about the garden? Look at the flowers. Well, where? Where did you get those flowers? They, were, they weren't... Here this morning. Look at those colors. Did you ever see such colors? Yes, red. Such brilliant red. Roses and carnations and... Oh, I, I've never seen such beautiful the flowers. The garden. Our garden. His and mine. What did you say? It wasn't a dream. It wasn't a dream. 
Well, where are we? We have a quiet, rather shy, and self-effacing middle-class suburban housewife just this side of 40. A stranger rings her bell, announces he is an ancient Greek god, Dionysus, and that he wants to be her lover once again. Notice that again. Well, it has to be a dream, you say. Sure. But how about the sudden blooming of that lush, brilliant, beautiful garden? How about it? Further growth must await my return in just a few minutes with Act Two. Is this how it was in the ancient days? Did the gods appear in dreams? All the loves we read about between the immortals and their human subjects, were these all dreams, visions? Well, we don't know. We present only the facts in the case. And the basic fact in this case seems to be that suddenly the garden of Gretchen Morrison is a lush, luxuriant riot of color after she had dreamed that she had a love affair with the ancient god Dionysus. Well, people have had even more extravagant dreams uh, from what I've heard. It wasn't a dream. It wasn't a dream. What do you say? I... Oh, nothing. Charlie, how did you ever get all those flowers to... Well, I, I, I'd say it's miraculous. Hi there, Gretchen. Whoa. Oh, hello. Hello, Porter. Uh, how's the golf? Hey, what have you folks done here? Well, you know, Margaret, she just putters around in the garden. M Margaret? Who, who's Margaret? Oh, oh, that's my nickname for Gretchen. What have you done to your garden, Gretchen? Uh, uh, nothing. Oh, come on, Gretchen. I'm, I'm willing to abdicate gracefully. June and I consider ourselves the garden people in this neighborhood. Well, Porter, I, uh... And quite frankly, Gretchen, we never saw you as a threat. What I mean is, you did have a few respectable-looking plants. Yes, isn't it fantastic, Porter? Is it a fertilizer, a new kind of no, food? Not, dear, don't give away your secrets. Oh, come on, Gretchen, we've always been good friends. Well, they just grew, that's all. <laughs> oh, very shrewd, and I don't blame you. Mm -hmm. Every one of them is a sure winner at the Garden Club show next month. Well, just think, Porter, this will be the first year you're not going to win. I'll get to the bottom of this somehow. Yeah, well, good night, Porter. Good night. Margaret, Margaret, how how did you raise those flowers? Huh? Oh, I suppose you could call these the fruits of love. <laughs> Margaret, M Margaret, oh, oh, there you are! Didn't you hear me call you? You were calling Margaret. Now, look, dear, it's only for Mr. Bayless's sake. My name is Gretchen. Well, all right, well, just go along with it for tomorrow night. Now, what are you doing out here? I'm sitting among my flowers. Well, should, shouldn't we uh, be inside with dinner? I was just listening. Listening to what? To what they were saying. To what? Who's saying? My flowers. Your fl Flowers? They, they can't say anything. Oh, that isn't true, Walter. They're speaking now. Well, I, I don't hear anything. You don't hear flowers. You see them. Each color has a meaning. Now, Gretchen... That rose bush just in front of you. It isn't the same shade of red all the time. From instant to instant, it darkens and then lightens as the flowers feel and think. Margaret, quit this nonsense. Walter, it isn't nonsense. Yes, it is. Now, dear, I know. I know you're under a strain. But I'm not. Yes, you are. And I was thinking about it. Now, tomorrow night is the most important night in our lives. It is? Why? Why? Oh, my God. Which one? Please listen. Now, you and I, we've worked for this. We have ten years invested in tomorrow night. Oh, please, Walter, you mustn't excite yourself like tomorrow that. Tomorrow night, we cross the Great Divide. The what? That line that separates the successes from the also-rans. Tomorrow night, a door will open for us, and we step into the executive suite. Oh? Yes, oh. And that door will be opened by Frederick Tower Baylor, or it won't be opened. Darling, I'm it sure... It all depends on you. 
Now, here's what you have to do. I got this list from Mr. Baylor's secretary this afternoon. Walter, Walter, dear. I was in the midst of... In the midst of what? I was talking to these flowers. And now I think your anger has frightened them. Mar Margaret? Mar I mean Gretchen... Yes. Gretchen, you don't feel well. Oh, no, I feel wonderful. I, I, I've never seen you so... So So what? Well, you're usually so sensible. I've never been as sensible as I am at this very moment. All my senses are alive and free. Do, do you think... Should, should you see a doctor? Why? Because you're not well. That isn't true. Gretchen, what's wrong? Nothing is wrong. Even if I were ill, which I'm not, what would a doctor do? Prescribe a pill? And what would the pill be made of? From the essences of the very plants and flowers and growing things right here in my very own garden. So you see, all I need to do is just stay here. Now, will you look at this list? Mr. Baylor is a steak and potatoes man. Is he? Dinner should be no problem. Just the steak, french fries, a salad, and ice cream. And he likes the steak rare. Rare? Yes, practically raw, with the blood just about dripping from it. He's very close to the primitive, isn't he? You're Mr. Baylor. Now, look, let's not even joke about it, all right? And furthermore, he isn't my Mr. Baylor. He's our Mr. Baylor. It's our future. My dear, I shall not disgrace you. Through these past few days, I can't follow things around here. It's the, these flowers and this garden. Yes. And the way you've been talking. Which way is that? I, I don't know, but it isn't your usual way. You're not the same person. Oh, but I am. Oh, no, 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 no. There's something very different about you. Now, please, dear... On this tremendously important night, don't do anything that would spoil Walter, anything. Walter, Walter, I don't like the look on your face. What are you talking that about? look. No human being should appear that troubled. Well, it's important. How many times do I have to remind you? Nothing in this life should be that important. You look as if you... As if you could kill somebody. Well, maybe I could. After all, if you're out to make it in this company, you have to be a killer. Walter. I don't mean you have to commit murder exactly, but you have to step on people and, if necessary, destroy them, eliminate them as rivals. Well, that's committing a kind of murder. Well, look, look, why are we standing around here and talking about it? Have you destroyed many people on your way, Walter? Now, now what kind of a question is that? Have you? I suppose I've sidelined a few in my time. Walter. Well, it was them or me. Now, come on, this whole conversation is out of place. Now, about tomorrow night... Walter, my dear, I shall not disgrace you. Margaret, we're here. Well, Walter, it's a nice-looking place you have here. Yes, indeed. The little woman is certainly a lady of good taste. Oh, thank you. Well... Good evening. Dear, I, I would like to uh, present uh, Mr. Baylor, who, who is uh, executive vice president. How do you do, Mr. Baylor? Uh, hello. Uh, mm. Do you like my gown? It was worn by the ancient Greek women, especially on festive occasions. But we, uh, we, uh, did, did you uh, prepare a picture of, of uh, Martini's darling? No, my dear. We shall have wine later. Wine? Oh, yes. Wine made with honey. The ancients called it mead. Delicious. Well, yes, but darling... And we shall have a most wonderful supper. A meal that would be enjoyed by the gods themselves. Goat's milk and cheese. Bread and fruits. And dates and nuts. But darling, I told you that Mr. Baylor... But that will come later. First, I have prepared a bath for Mr. Baylor. You... What? Uh, dear. Well, dear. you bathe, don't you, Mr. Bailey? Well, I... I... One must separate himself from the cares of the day before one can enjoy the delights of the evening. And so you must wash away. I, I don't believe this. Uh, dear, I... I now, really Mr. Think... Bailey, we'll use the main bath, and Walter, dear, yours is waiting for you in the guest room. And now, if you'll excuse me for just a moment, I shall make sure your bath water is properly scented. The pitcher of goat's milk is there on the sideboard. It's ice cold and delicious. Walter. Sir, I... I really don't know what to say. Is this your idea of a joke? Now, Mr. Baylor, please believe me. Because if it is, I'm not amused. Mr. Baylor, I, I really don't know what to say. That, that, that ridiculous... 
ridiculous costume and, and, and goat's milk and cheese. Well, there must and... be some mistake. I'll, I'll straighten it out. Well, this is exactly what I have to guard against. I thought Caraway was married to a, a, a cook, but yours... I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Well, well you should be. Uh, m- m- Mr. Baylor, Mr. Baylor, where are you going? Where do you think I'm going? Home. But don't you say she's been ill? She's been, yes, that's it. She hasn't been feeling well lately, uh, sir. Really? You'd never know it to look at her. Good night. Now, Mr. Mr. Baylor, Mr. Well, whatever became of Mr. Bailey? Whatever became of Mr. Bailey? Do you mean you have to ask? Where did he go? His bath is ready. Yes, I'm sure it is. Have some milk. Here, drink it. You'll feel much better. Walter, why did you do that? Margaret, do you know what you did to me? I don't like that name. Do you know what you did to me? You destroyed me. Now, please tell me why. Why? Why did you destroy me? But I didn't. Tell me why. We've been married 15 years. I thought we loved each other. I don't know of any reason you would have to hate me. Now, why? Why did you suddenly destroy me? How many marriages are there like this? A man works hard with a single-minded dedication to getting ahead in his company. His wife sits at home... Gardens, does some club work, but mainly and mostly she waits for him. The big thing in their lives is the job, the career, the company. I suppose the answer is there are many marriages like this. Even the best of machinery breaks under stress, and human beings are not the most perfect machines. We'll see what repairs, if any, can be effected when I shall return with Act Three. There's a man who shares your bed, your board, just as you share his. You share a bank account, automobiles, a house, a boat, a place in the community. And then one day it becomes clear to you that you don't, well, you don't share each other. That is, you share things, but you really don't know each other. As a matter of fact, you're strangers. You've been married for 15 years and you're strangers. I don't want to discuss what happened here this evening. But what did happen? You deliberately ruined whatever chance I had to become assistant general sales manager. Well, if you have the ability, how could I have ruined your chance? Because in this company, ability isn't everything. Well, then in that case, quit and take a job in an outfit where it is. Oh, you just don't understand. And I don't have time to explain it, but you're ill. No, I've never felt better. What you did tonight... Was that the action of a rational woman? I think so. Would you do something for me? See a doctor. Why? Oh, Margaret. See, that's what's wrong with me. You call me Margaret. Well, that's just for Mr. Baylor's benefit. Well, he isn't here now. And why should I give up my identity for the sake of your boss? Isn't it bad enough that you gave up yours? Margaret, what's gotten into you all of a sudden? Now, you never spoke this way before. You were always so reasonable, so cooperative. Now, what is it? Oh, poor Walter. Don't take that tone with me. Now, Mark... Gretchen, listen, will you help me? I'm trying to help you. Come on, let's walk in the garden. Let's enjoy the beautiful growing things. Gretchen, I want you to see a doctor. No. Please, please, do it for me. There is something wrong with you. Are you aware of the things you said to Mr. Baylor? Darling, we live according to certain rules. I know. And I don't like those rules anymore. Gretchen. Gretchen, you're different. And and, and I'm scared. Now, just see a doctor, huh? But I told you, Walter, there's nothing wrong with me. Well, just let me hear the doctor say so. And I promise you, I'll abide by his decision. Mr. Baylor? Yes? May I come in, sir? I am busy. This won't take a moment. Mr. Baylor... I want you to give me another chance. I think the matter is closed, Walter. You know I'm the best qualified man in the company. Not in all respects, Walter. I'm sorry. She was ill. I'm sorry to hear that. She's being treated for it. 
I said I was sorry. You know, this business we're in, it isn't easy and it takes its toll. That's why it takes a special kind of man who has the support of a special kind of wife. Well, she's worked hard. And, and she's tried hard all these years with me. And I guess, I guess the strain was just too much. Walter, I don't think I can see my way clear. Please, sir, let's give her another chance. Better that this thing should happen now rather than later. We can nip it in the bud. She'll be all right, I promise. Well... In a few weeks, she'll be just fine. You'll see. Well, I, I'll think about it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And he said his name was Dionysus? Yes, Dr. Marks. And don't tell me he didn't appear. If you say he was there, he was there for you. Uh, why should the name Dionysus occur to you? Where did you ever hear it before? Well, I suppose in college, in the study of mythology. And that was years ago. I never even thought of it. But you absorbed it. And you now have the classic conflict between Apollo, who represents duty, and Dionysus, who is desire. But I never... All people face this battle. In some, it rages with more fire. In some, the flames are banked. But in no one is it ever dormant. But the garden, mm. the flowers and plants, and the growing things, how do you account for them? Well, there's a reasonable, rational explanation of sudden coming together in one spot of wind, water, soil. But this garden, he said, and I know, it's the fruit of love, our love. I sit there among the blossoms, and I know... He's with me. He's talking to me. My dear Gretchen, you'll learn better in the winter. What about the winter? In the winter, the garden will die. And so will this dream. Yes. Yes, my love, yes, I hear you. Yes, I see you. Gretchen! Gretchen! What? Oh, Porter, you startled me. Oh, oh, is this your secret? Do you, do you talk to your flowers? Of course. I, I just can't understand this garden. It grows more beautiful every day. Yes. Come on now, Gretchen, what's the secret? Uh, it's a garden of love. For sure, but how, how does it work? It's the love of two people. Okay, I won't ask. I'm satisfied just to enjoy it. I do have a confession to make. I was so wild with envy that I came in here the other night and I stole a small rose bush. But you could have asked me for it. I planted it in my garden and and the next morning it, it was dead. Oh? I was careful. I, I handled it gently. I, I watered it and fed it. But it died. It withered completely, as if it had died a, a long time ago. Perhaps it did. Gretchen, what's come over you? You seem so different, so... Yes? Well, you always struck me as a... Well, well, I'll say it. A, a very quiet little person. And, and now you, you glow all over. I feel there's a glow inside me. Ah, oh, Gretchen, it's beautiful. But I see now it's a... It's a, an awful beauty. It, it's a frightening beauty. Fear and terror. It's all part of beauty. Those crimson flowers. That, that red. It's like the red of blood. These flowers, they look as if they're being nourished with blood. They are, Porter. They are. How did you know? How, how did, uh, did, did, did I know? Well, I, uh, <clears throat> well, uh, uh, good night, Gretchen. Uh, good night. Hello? Gretchen, it's four o'clock. I called to check. On what, Walter? To make sure you were at the doctor's. Oh. Well, you have an appointment. Did you forget? No. Then what are you doing at home? I don't care to go. Now, what do you say? Well, why should I go? I'm not the one who's sick. Mr. Baylor is giving us another chance. Oh, Mr. Baylor, what an unfortunate man. He should spend more time with growing things. 
bring him home with you tonight. I'm on my way right now, this minute. Now, don't you go anywhere. Why, Walter, where would I go? Drink this, Walter. You'll feel better. Darling, I spoke to Dr. Morix. There is something wrong with you. Now, why don't you help yourself? There's nothing wrong, dear. How can you say there's nothing... I feel alive, Walter. All of me. Every part of me. Come to the garden with me, Walter. You live. You love. Like a god. Yeah, something's come over you. Don't ask me what. But a week ago, something happened. Yes. Something happened. You changed. Well, I can hardly believe you're Gretchen, my wife. I'm Gretchen. You had sense. You, you had a knowledge of, of life. Well, you and I, we worked together toward a goal. Yes, dear. But I found a better goal. You did? What? Love. Love? That was the secret. The secret of the ancient gods. Now, Gretchen, I'm going to drag you to the doctor. Oh, if you must fight, fight like a man with your hands. I despise you. Now, what has happened? You can't just suddenly tear down our life. What's wrong with what I'm doing? Why shouldn't I work for the Baylor Corporation? Because it's a house for slaves. Well, it's my job. We agreed. You never objected. It, it bought us this house and the cars. And turned us into fawning, simpering, terrified slaves. Okay, okay. Everybody in the world is a slave to something. That's what life is. You give to get. Yes. Everyone is a slave. But I have been freed. What do you mean, freed? By whom? By my lover. What, what lover? He's in the garden. Now, Gr Gretchen, Gretchen, you come back here. If you want me, fight for me. Fight him for me. Oh, love. Oh, love, stay with me. Don't let anyone keep us apart. Gretchen, Gretchen, who are you talking to? My lover. Don't you see him? You mean there's another guy? Someone else? Someone else who gives me what I need. Who? Who? He's a god. Who is he? I told who? you. I'll choke it out of you. He's a god. Who is the guy? Walter! You're joking me! Who? Who's the guy? You're joking who is... Walter! Walter! Who? Who? Please. Please. Bury me here. In my garden. Gretchen. Oh, please. It's dark. And no one will know. Oh, please. Hello, Walter. Just dropped by to see if there's any news of Gretchen. No. Well, keep your chin up, fella. Maybe she'll come back. Yes, I hope so. Did you two have a fight? Well, it was uh, more of a misunderstanding. Oh, I'm sorry. Have you notified anyone? Well, I reported it to the police, but... Uh... Oh, and Dr. Marks said that she must have wandered off. Funny. Funny how the garden, that, that beautiful garden just withered without her. Yeah. <laughs> she was right. She said it was the fruit of love. Without her love, it just... Yeah, yeah. Well, I... I just don't want to take up too much more of your time. No, no, it's all right. I wish I could figure out why those luxuriant plants grew so suddenly and just as suddenly they died. Well, uh, you know what Dr. Mark said. Uh, sudden coming together of sun and rain. Soil, water. Yeah, that's right. She's an inscrutable gal, that Mother Nature. Yes. We'll never know. I guess not. Well, uh, this is a good chance for me to say goodbye. I'm off on a trip. Oh? Yes, I, uh, made general sales manager. Oh. Finally, yes. Poor Gretchen. Came too late for her. How she wanted it, how she would have enjoyed it. Well, uh... Say goodbye to June for me, huh? Okay, well, I will. Walter, mm? is it my imagination? What? The garden. What about it? Those plants. They're dead. Walter, that color, that crimson color, that the scarlet color. Look. 
Why, that, that looks... It's, it's blood. Blood. Oh, you, you're crazy. It's just... Call Am I? But, but just look, blood on, on all the withered blossoms. Fresh, bright blood all over the garden. Gretchen. Gretchen. What do you mean, Gretchen? It can't, it can't be her blood. It can't be. Well, whoever said it, it was. It can't be because, because, because there was no blood. What do, you, what do you mean there was no blood? When I killed her, there was no blood. She fell. She fell, you see? And, and, and she struck her head hard against the tree, but there was no blood. Walter. Do you know what you're saying? I can prove it. Pick her up, you'll see. There is no blood. No blood. Well, there was some in the garden. In the beautiful garden of Gretchen and Dionysus. And the garden is no unusual garden. For all flowers have something in them of the one who plants them and watches and waters and nurses and loves them. I'll be back shortly. The Struggle the never-ending struggle between Apollo and Dionysus, between duty and pleasure, between what we want and what we must settle for, is fought inside each of us. And sometimes it's Apollo who conquers, and sometimes Dionysus. Happy, however, is he or she where neither has conquered, but where both spirits can live side by side in peace and quiet. But too much quiet gets boring after a bit. So uh, make sure we disturb yours tomorrow. Our cast included Mercedes McCambridge, Larry Haynes, Robert Maxwell, and Gil Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Somehow, in a manner yet to be determined... Mr. George Rivers was killed. Arrest me, Lieutenant. Arrest you? Why? I am guilty. Of what? Murder. Murder? Yes. I killed George Rivers. <sighs> Mr. Paradine, at this point, I must advise you of your rights under the uh, law. Lieutenant, I committed the deed. I shall pay the price. How did you murder George Rivers? In drama as in life. It is the inevitable, and so my artistry, my creativity could produce only the inevitable result, the death of Hamilton. Now my concern is the death of George Rivers. I know, I know, but at that time and in that place, they were one and the same. How did you murder George Rivers? I told you. What did you tell me? He died as a testimony to the truth. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Sign Off. The Sinus Medicines. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. The word tragedy is as old as the ancient Greeks... What is the essence of tragedy? 
It's a dramatic story told about potentially a noble person whose character is flawed by a single weakness. It's that weakness which causes him to break either some divine law or some moral prescript. The breaking of which leads inevitably to his downfall or destruction. Such is the story I'm about to tell you. I owe my life to you. You have strange gifts. Perhaps. And when you found the golden fleece... How can I find it now? I cannot see, half blinded by the snow. It's simple, Jason. Here, look into my eyes. What's happening? I can see. Rodica, I can see. Our mystery drama, The Gift of Doom, was adapted from the immortal Greek tragedy, Medea, especially for the Mystery Theater by Arnold Moss. It stars Kim Hunter. It is sponsored in part by General Electric Citizen Band Radios and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. It was the fall of the year 1897, just months before William McKinley had been inaugurated as the 25th President of the United States. It was a time when the discovery of fabulous amounts of gold in Alaska and the Canadian Yukon screamed from the headlines of every newspaper in the country. And in the town of Thessaly, in one of the states of the Great Plains, they had just garnered a harvest of another kind of gold. Tons and tons of beautiful yellow wheat. Phineas Cobb watches his nephew Jason as the hands prepare the grain for storage in the tall silos. One of the richest crops we've had in years. Yeah, I predicted it way back in early June. And so you did, Uncle. So you did. Too bad your father's no longer here to see it, Jason. Uh, Would have given him no end to joy. We can't bring back the dead. Uh, That's true enough. (laughs) <laughs> Keep this up and you'll turn out to be a very rich young man. I may or I may not, Uncle Phineas. That's still in your hands. The farm and all that's with it go to you. When I can prove to my dear uncle's satisfaction that I'm responsible, mature, weren't those the words? Uh, you know your father's wish as well as I. When, in the sole judgment of my brother Phineas... My son Jason has proved himself mature in his decisions, established a responsibility in all his acts, then... And only then do all my earthly goods and properties pass on to him, my son. That's it, Jason. What must I do? Well, I've told you half a dozen times. Go prove yourself a man. Show the world you can stand up on your own two feet. And hold on to the small fortune your father tore from the earth by sweating out his heart. And your prescription for that proof? That's up to you. You've never raised a hand to help yourself. Uh, You've no suggestions? Just possibly I do. Like what? You read the paper, same as I. Look at the headline here. Gold, gold, gold. The steamer Portland out of Klondike, bound for Seattle... Passed through Puget Sound today with a ton or more of gold aboard her. Very interesting. A year or two along the Yukon River up in Alaska with all the hardships might be just the right medicine for you. Might uh, come back a man. No, or not come back at all, from what I've read. Those are the chances we all must take. And should I not come back, then all this land and property reverts to you. Not so, dear Uncle Finney? It's in your father's will. Ah, well, I know. Hmm, the Klondike, huh? Sounds enchanting. I just might go. And I might just surprise you, Uncle Finney, in more ways than you would ever know. Look, we're almost there. The fog at last is lifting, Jason. Oh, 
That must be the outline of the settlement. It's Gagway. A cold Alaskan shore where everything begins. <laughs> we hope. I'm glad we two met back in Seattle. Uh, and I too, Jason. It's made the voyage on this great ship Argo almost bearable. I'll be glad to see the last of it. And smell the last of it. Tend to a cabin that was never meant for more than two. And all of them in search of the same thing. Gold. Like you, my good friend, Hector. <laughs> and like you. We'll pray that Lady Luck will smile on us. That's all we'll need. That and the supplies to last at least a year. Between the two of us, we'll strike what we came looking for. There's something that tells me. Whatever happens, I can promise you that nothing in this world will ever stop me. Nothing, Hector. Hey, I guess that means we've arrived. <laughs> Let's see, you got your blankets, heavy clothing, furs and robes, rubber boots, the mining pan. Uh-huh, the uh, horses, pack equipment. Evaporated eggs and onions, flour, cornmeal, rice and bacon. Tablets, coffee, lozenges, blocks of beef and pemmican. There's nothing that we lack. Well, now, you lads can joke, but once you get out there, you'll find that it's no laughing matter. You take it from old cannibal Joe. I know from sad experience. Yeah, but there's nothing like it. I'd still be out prospecting if my health had not run out. We weren't really joking, Joe. We know of the excitement or we wouldn't be here. And the danger. Like everyone, I guess we all keep dreaming of that great placer stream up in the sky where flakes of gold will glitter on the gravel bars and nuggets the size of bird's eggs will be scooped up by the handful. I, I like the way you talk, my boy. You have a feeling for what's out there. Uh, you, uh, you said you'd show us maps. Oh, yes, and here they are. They're a little crude. I don't draw well. We're told the water route by river. No, no, no. The winter freeze has started. You can't get through the ice. My advice is to take the Chilkoot Trail. This one right here? That's it. White Pass Trail until you come to Dead Horse Gulch and then on up to Summit Hill. Uh, is uh, that the border where Alaska ends and Canada begins? Oh, you're catching on, you too. <laughs> and then down into the Tucci Valley and then here you start pulling up the Klondike River till it meets the Yukon. And that's, that's Rabbit Creek right here. That's where you'll find the place I stake my claim. The Golden Fleece. And you're welcome to it. The Golden Fleece. Uh, I hope we find it. Oh, you will. With help. You, uh, you see this charm, this uh, amulet of stone I wear around my neck? I couldn't help but notice it. Looks something like a human eye gazing right into your skull. It does indeed. I want you to have it. How kind of you, but why? Well, as a good luck piece, right, Joe? Oh, it can be good can be very bad. Depends who's wearing it around his neck. Well, now, if you get to this point here alive, you'll be within a whisper of the golden fleece. And by that time, you'll both of you need every bit of help that you can get. The help is there. What kind of help? Young Indian woman named Medika, daughter of a mighty taggish chief. She lives with a toothless old woman for companion right near here. And this, this amulet, she, she give it to me. She helped me once. Might do the same for you. But how? How could she help? Well, that's something you'll find out. If you are lucky. If she likes you. But I warn you, Medica, something very special. Her own people are afraid of her. They call her witch. Why, Joe? Well, she has a strange and unknown power that no one can explain. So if you find her, bless your stars. But at the same time, watch your step, my lad. Just watch your step. Jason, I tell you, I uh, can't take another step. Uh, I've, I've had it. I, I'm a beaten man. Hector. Hector, we can't stop now. We've traveled all of these weary months. I'm sure that we're nearly there. Oh, our food is almost gone. Our dogs have died of hunger, cold, exhaustion, and those icy winds, they keep blowing. The blizzards never stop. They bite into the marrow of my bones. If we quit now, all we've gone through has been for nothing. And that's madness. Jason, to push ourselves to death is equal madness. Then what's your choice? Get into sleeping bags here where we are. 
and slowly freeze or starve ourselves to death. <laughs> At 60 degrees oh. below zero, it won't be slow. I've already lost two uh, fingers from frostbite. I know. <laughs> I'm half blind from staring at the snow. My eyes, oh, they seem filled with red hot sand. And why, why push on the loss of sleep? Come on. Oh, come on, let's move on. I can't. Not one more step. Uh, JC, you, you go on without me. Let, let, let me die but You here. have got to come. I can't, I Not won't. Up. On your feet! You'll come if I have to drag oh, you! Oh, where? Jason, I warn you, let me go! Come on, I need your eyes! Let go of me! You'll be sorry. What are you doing? My hunting knife. The blade is sharp. Now you touch me once more! Put down that knife! What? What's that? I, I wouldn't know. It sounded like... Jason, there's something moving up ahead. It... it... It's coming toward us. What, what is it? I, I, I can't tell. It's, I can't. I, I think it... Yes. Yes, a man. He's coming straight this way. What, what can he want? What would he be doing here? The end of nowhere. Say nothing. We're about to know. You too. What? You, you, you come with what? me. Fast as you can. A woman. Who are you? And where are we? No time for questions now. My shack is over there. You come, you two. I am your friend. You come while there is still time. You're feeling better, Jason? Like one reborn. Watona, toss more wood onto the fire. I will, Medica. Watona's been with me since I was born. She can't do much, but I am loyal to her. I'm sorry for your friend. We did our best to save him. His wish to die was greater than his will to live. I know, Matika. And so you've trudged these many miles to find Joe's golden fleece. That, among other things. You know, the amulet, the eye you wear about your neck, led you my way. It was my father's, a great man. I owe my life to you. Cannibal Joe said you had strange gifts. Perhaps. And if you find the golden fleece, what then? How can I find it now? I can't see, half blinded by the snow. It's simple, Jason. Here, look into my eyes. Place your hands upon my shoulders. Now look hard. Look harder still. What, what happened? There are shapes beginning to appear. I can see. Matika, I can see. Of course you can. You are full of wonder. You've given me my eyes again. A small gift. What can I do to show my gratitude? Stay here with me, Jason. Stay here with me and you will learn of greater wonders yet to come. But understand, there is a price to pay. Which is? With time you'll learn, my Jason. It takes time. In the days that follow, Jason dips his mining pan into the shimmering waters of the sunlit creeks, rocks the gravel in his miner's cradle, always on the alert for the sparkle that spells gold. And as he does, he speculates on what further unexplainable wonders lie ahead for him in this bleak alien land, in the company of this strange woman with her mysterious powers. I shall be back shortly with Act Two. Stampede for the gold of Canada's Klondike some 80 years ago brought out the very worst in men. They came from every quarter of the earth, and those who managed to survive became like addicts who understand their sickness and can do nothing to control it. But Jason Cobb was the exception. Almost a year was passed, and aided by Medica's strange powers, he has found the claim known as the Golden Fleece. 
which has yielded its rich treasure to him. As he prepares for his return journey to the States, he listens to Medica. Why must you go, Jason? Why? I've had my fill of caribou and bear steaks. The moose hide pokes are bursting with my gold. It's time that I return to my own way of life. I'm going back to claim the land that's rightly mine. But you don't need that anymore. I mean to have it. Why? Because it's mine. And I am yours. Stay here. I don't belong here. I can't take up the Indian way of life. It's not for me. Am I for you? Of course. But at another time, maybe, or in another place, not here. Then take me with you, my beloved Jason. Take me. You know my way of life, so don't deny me a small taste of yours. You may not like it. If you are with me... There'd be problems. Problems? Well, the way the people think back there in Thessaly, you're an Indian woman from this frozen north, and I... We'll face what must be faced when that time comes. What happens to Watona? Old Watona. She comes with us. She'd die up here alone, but she will be no trouble. You know, it just might work. When Uncle Phineas sees you, can you imagine what he'll say or what he'll do? Your Uncle Phineas may not have too much to say or do, if that should be your wish. What does that mean, Medica? It means you must remember that I can do for you what no other woman on earth can do. You do remember. When do we leave to see your uncle in this town of Thessaly? Tell me, my Jason. I've been away almost two years, Uncle Phineas. I've come to claim my property. I know you have. You and this wild creature you've brought with you. You'll speak with more respect. Modica is my wife. Your wife? This wild-looking thing, dressed in her hides, laden with barbaric ornaments. Don't let him upset you, Jason. What I have endured these past two years, the hardships, the defeats, the agony, the sorrow, and then to know success and victory, all of this has made of me what you would call a man. Mm. And you call this acquisition your success? Calmly, Jason, calmly. I'm rich, Uncle. I am rich by any standard that you measure by. I've gold enough to purchase almost anything I desire. Yeah, that's something. Still... Still what? By terms of your dead father's will, I still could hold the property you call yours. But you would not. Don't push me, Jason. It's just possible I might. You mean you keep from Jason the land that's rightly his? It depends what meaning you give to words like rightly. I see. You mean to cheat him? I mean to keep the things I have. My things? Depends on your point of view. We have enough and more, dear Phineas Cobb, without what you propose to steal from Jason. And so, before we go, I wish for you to have a little gift. Huh? A gift? For me? This little amulet round my neck, hung on this chain of gold. It was my father's. Huh. That stone looks exactly like some human eye. What are you doing, Medica? I'd like you to have it, Uncle Phineas. Here, around your neck, like this. No! Who are you? You're not a woman. You're some kind of a witch. What have you done to me with your black magic? My chest is being crushed. I can't breathe. I can't... Madika! Your uncle is dead. Now, take the amulet off his neck. So. What must we do? Do. The land's now yours. The gold is yours. And I am yours. Whatever else you'd like is yours. We must get out of here as fast as possible. They'll think it was a heart attack. I mean, we must leave Thessaly forever. Start life again some other place. Where we're not known. Where I can keep you hidden. Where's that? I... I must say it. Where they won't know that you're... Yes, my Jason. Where they won't know that I'm a foreigner. That I do not belong among your people. That I am strange and different. I didn't say that. I know you didn't. We'll go, of course, whatever place you choose. And wrap me in my tuggish blankets. Keep me concealed. 
if that's what you want. As long as I'm with you and you love me. You love me, Jason, do you not? I owe you much, Medik. I know, I know, but that's not what I ask. If not for you... Are you in love with me? We'll go. New place, new friends. But I remind you, whatever friends you make will be my friends. Whatever enemies you make will be mine, too. Yeah, Jason, help yourself to a fresh cigar. Thank you. I've had my eye on you and Phoebe as you dance. You make a very handsome couple. Well, that's flattering. Your daughter, Phoebe, is a beautiful young woman, Senator Crane. Uh, it's Tom, my boy, not Senator. Tom. You know, I think this time is good as any for my announcements. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Since our young friend, our Jason Cobb, came here to Corinth County five, six years ago, he's done many great things for the people of our county and the state and, may I add, for our great party. We're very proud of him. We're here tonight to pay him further honor. It's my great privilege, and I'm sure this comes as no surprise to any... To offer all of you tonight the name of the next congressman from Corinth County, that handsome, brilliant servant of the people, all the people, Jason Cobb. <laughs> Jason? Wow. I, I, uh, I, thank you. I'm, I'm honored. You all know that. Uh, and if I am elected, I'll do my very best to serve you. <laughs> Jason, when I selected you, I picked me one sure winner. No one can stop you now. Cray and the Kingmaker. And Lee named. And that reminds me. Yes, yes, Tom. The uh, congressman from Corinth should be a married man. I don't understand. A pillar of society, upstanding, steady, with no marks against But, Tom, I have... I know, I know, that strange woman that you brought here with you, she and that old hag that follows her, we know about them. What about her? She and her two small sons, that... that doesn't count. That doesn't make you married, not not here, in Corinth. They're my sons, too. Modica is my wife. Oh, come on, my boy. There never was a marriage, and you know it. Get rid of her. The sooner the better. Medica, that's her name, could spell the end of your career. What can I do? We'll just send her packing to the polar bears or wherever it was that you picked her up. Tom, even if I wanted to... Jason, my darling, my congratulations. I'd hoped you'd ask me for another dance. I was about to. Please forgive me. Oh, oh, you don't mind my taking him from you? Or do you, Dad? No, he's all yours, Phoebe, dear. All yours. Thanks, Daddy. I can't tell you, Jason, how pleased I am for you. Thank you, Phoebe. I just hope that when you get to Washington with all those tempting, beautiful young women all hanging on your neck... Oh, there's none of them, I'm sure, could ever hold a candle next to you. Oh, thank you, kind sir. And I mean it, Phoebe. I think you know there's no one that I'd, I'd rather have for a wife than you. Oh, dear Jason. There are, as you're aware, some complications. I know. Do you still love her? I don't think I ever did, but I was uh, grateful. Well, then send her back. It, it's just that simple. Perhaps not quite that simple. Well, leave it to Daddy. He'll know how. No, Phoebe. I won't have her hurt if I can help it. If it must be done, it's I who will have to do it. I'm glad you're home at last. The children missed you. Can I get you anything? Medica, I must speak with you. Of course. A glass of milk, some crackers? Please, listen to me. Now, I've tried in every way I know how to help you and the children. I've been generous with my money. I've given you what time I could in a career that's most demanding. I don't deny that. I won't beat about the bush. I'm Tom Crean's candidate for Congress. And I will be elected come November. But, Jason, that's so wonderful. I'm pleased. I, I cannot have you with me any longer. I'm moving fast into another world. You must return up north to where I found you and take Watona with you. 
You cannot mean what you're saying. Why, my Jason, why? You know as well as I do. You cannot be alone. You need my care. I won't be alone. Tom Crean's daughter, Phoebe, she's to be my wife. I don't believe what you're saying. There is no other way. What we have had up to this point was fine. But all good things sooner or later must come to their end. I cannot have you standing in my way. <laughs> Old Phineas was right. You and your utter lack of manliness. Where is your shame? Shame? For what? I saved your life. I gave you back your eyes. I cursed the day I did so. I followed you, and I destroyed whatever threatened you. My thanks, Medica. Your thanks? I've borne your children. Enough, Medica. Where shall I go? Home to my father's land? Home to the people I deserted and betrayed? The people that now loathe me? That's impossible. Shall I go wandering around the earth, a beggar pleading for the world to take me in? You cannot. You must not hold me back. If ever you had love for me, then go. And let me live the life that's destined for me. It'll be best and safest for us all. Best? I will not have the kind of best that leads to suffering. Nor will I take the kind of safety which only ends in sorrow. Why not recall the good things that we've had and go? Go where? We have no land, no home. I've told you that. There is no harbor to protect me and my sons. What a fool I was. My sons will not go with you. You leave here alone. Alone? You cannot move. They stay here with me. Before I let you keep them, leave my babies here to be insulted in a land that loathes and hates them and me, I... Yes? Nothing, Jason, nothing. There's one more thing I urge you to remember. You tricked me into all of this. You know that. Trick? Or call it magic, call it sorcery, all the same. Or call it love. I'll never leave. Unless it is by force. Never. You'll have to make me go. If it should come to that. And while we're both remembering, I remind you that love can be as brutal and as ruthless and destructive as the deepest hate. I've loved you always, Jason. Well, once I dared most anything to give you pleasure, to protect you. I now will stop at nothing. Nothing. To give you all the pain that you deserve. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. And when that woman is endowed with a supernatural power, her fury can become a blazing inferno of hatred. To what tragic end will Medica use her gift? I'll return shortly with Act Three. friend William Shakespeare wrote, Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. Medica would agree completely with the bard, but now that Jason plans to desert her, alter his affections when it alteration finds, Medica must make other plans. Plans which, in her innermost thoughts, she had never anticipated. She's going to fight us, Tom. I did everything I could. If you won't move on this, then I'll have to do it for you. How? There are ways. I beg your pardon, Father. Jason, Medica's come to see me, to plead with me to use my influence, and... I can't handle it. She dared come here? Oh, please, both of you. You talk to her and do what must be done without me, please. She's come here to my home. How dare she? I, I beg you to go easy. Do nothing more to anger her. It may be just a little late for that. A little late for what, good Senator Crean? You leave at once. You're not welcome here. Oh, no, I stay, good Senator until I've had my say. You listen now to me, Medica. You're in this land illegally, you know that. Jason is not your husband, as our laws go. I have an order for your deportation right here in my desk, all proper, signed, legal. 
If you're wise, you'll go quietly with no excitement, no parade of tears, no threats. And if I go, my children, they go with me? That's up to Jason. They were born here in this country. If he wants to keep the little animals, that's up to him. But I'd be happier if you took your livestock with you back to where all three of you belong. You call my children livestock? Animals? If you're still here tomorrow morning... One moment, Senator. I would ask a favor. A favor? From me? A little one. I'll need an extra day before I leave. Another day. Another day and I will go. You need not worry. My people keep our word. I have no choice, Watona, my old friend. It's clear what I must do. Get me the robe. The golden-colored robe that I've been making. Fold it neatly. Place it in the wooden chest. Be careful how you handle it. And then? I'm giving it away. That beautiful robe... You made it for yourself. I shall be generous. For generosity can be the flower of justice. And now I swear by earth, by holy light of the midnight sun, by the entire host of all our northern gods, by frozen waters of the icy sea, the blinding snows, the makers of the moon and stars, by all of them, I swear that I shall do what must be done. Nothing on this earth will stop me. Nothing. Well, Medica, tell me, what's your plan? I have been thinking. Since last night, I've reasoned with myself, reproached myself. I think you're well advised in taking this new wife. With the rising of tomorrow's sun... I will be gone. And the children? I'm convinced that they should stay here with you, Jason. How could they manage in a land that's alien to them? They're babies. No, it's it's better that they should stay. I understand. Your wife-to-be, this Phoebe, I would like her to know that I have no bitterness toward her, bear her no malice. I'm sending her a little gift in celebration of her coming marriage. (gasps) A man can never read a woman's mind. What, what, what is this gift you're sending her? A dressing gown of gold threads woven in an Indian design. I, I made it for myself some time ago. I never wore it. I will not need it now. She'll make no trouble, Phoebe, I can promise. Medica frightens me. Now, there's nothing not out of fear. She's on her way, or she will be shortly. She knows that what is happening is inevitable. Your father's made it clear to her that there are no alternatives. Oh, is that you, Dad? Come in. Oh, who are you? What do you wish? It's old Watona. I come here from Medica. What is it? I come to bring a gift to your young bride. Oh, I meant to tell you, Phoebe, I forgot. She asks that you accept this gift made with her own hands. You place it round your shoulders, young, happy, golden bride. Go tell your mistress that we thank her. She says that it will bring you all the things that you deserve. I take my leave, young lady. Sir... Shall we see what's in the wooden box that she brought? I'm not so sure I want to see it. Not even sure that I should take it, coming from her. Oh, you're being foolish, dear. Medica means it as a token to show that she bears you no ill will. She told me so. Open it. I will. Oh, it's lovely. Jason, it's a full-length dressing gown, so finely woven with golden threads into some... Curiously beautiful design. I beg your pardon. I didn't know the two of you were here. Come on in, Tom. See the rich gift your daughter has just received. Well, what is it, Phoebe? Well, who's it from? Oh, your friend, Medica. She sent it as a parting gift to show there's no hard feeling. Just look at it. Well, why don't you take it from the box? Yeah, and model it for us. Oh, of course. Here. 
I'll, I'll put it on. Oh, what, 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 what's that? Does that go with it? What, what, what? Lying at the bottom of the box. Looks like a crude necklace of some sort. That, that stone yeah. there, like some human eye what? that stares what? at you and follows you. What is it? Don't touch it, Tom. Don't touch it. <laughs> Baby, what's wrong? I, I can't breathe. The no. minute that I put this Baby. up, my body's burning. Take it off. I, I can't. It's like hot daggers going through me. I can't stand the burning. Oh, Jesus. Take it off that cow. I can't. My hands won't move. Yeah, let me stand still. I'll take it off of you. <laughs> What's that? Does that feel any... Oh, 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 no. No. The same thing's happening to me. Come and needles. Fiery needles are sticking into me. White heart and scorching. I can't. Jason, help me. Jason, help. Come. Oh, Jason. Phoebe, what can I do to help? is concealed within this calm she sent me. This gift of hers has, has doomed me to my death. Madika. Madika. What fresh horrors, what new evils are you guilty of? father and the daughter. Both are dead. Slain by the poison that you sent them. You have done well, Watona. Leave me for a while with my two babies. Oh, my children. It was in vain I gave you life. I once had greatest hopes for you. That you'd look after me in my old age. All that will never be. Your father's seen to it that I depart from here in exile, leaving you both behind. But the day will never come when I shall give the children of my loins unto my enemies. Come, come, give me your little hands, my babies. Let your mother kiss you. Oh, my darlings. How fresh and young your eyes look. How straight you stand, my little men. How good it is to hold you to my breast, to feel your soft young cheeks on mine, the warm sweetness of your baby breath. Oh, I love you both. I will not ever let them take you from me. This golden dagger, see how it shines? How sharp it is. It was your grandfather's, a great chief and a great man. This dagger will guarantee that you, my babes, will never leave me. Never leave your mother. Be brave and shut your eyes. Open the door, Madika! Unlock the bolts! There's nothing that'll save you now! Open, I say! What's on? Why do you batter at the doors? Why do you shake the bolts? The dead will not awaken. Where is Madika? Where is that monster? Call her monster, if you wish. She's done no more than she thought must be done. Murder an innocent girl out of revenge and jealousy. And a girl's father. With her sorcery. Oh, Jason. You know not yet the full depth of your misery. What do you mean? She plans to kill me, too? Come, my lord Jason. Follow me. Where are you taking me, old woman? Here, to your bedchamber. Open the doors and you shall see. What? Ah. Your, your sons, my lord. Ah. They're dead. I can't believe it. Who did this? Their mother. But why, in the name of heaven, why? You must ask her. Where is this lonesome woman? She's wandering on the high cliffs outside the house, tearing her garments and her hair. Madika, listen to me! Don't come too close to me, Jason. I warn you, stay away from me. Your sons are dead because of what you did. I would not see them live despised and hated as I was. Call me a monster if you wish, for now I've torn your heart to pieces. 
just as you've torn mine. You fiend! Don't touch me, Jason. Keep your hands away. Look at the sea below. And the clear skies above. And the scattered soft white clouds. They all welcome me. You're insane. Ah, but I have not lost the gift of my great powers. I use them now for the last time. I am about to fly. Fly high over the seas, back to my place of birth. Not to the place we met, but back. Back to join the spirit of my fathers. The gods of the midnight sun. Then jump and kill yourself. Spare me the trouble and the shame. Jump. Rid the world of all your evil. Farewell, my Jason. Remember me. famous Englishman once wrote, few people know how to love or how to hate. Their love is an unbounded weakness fatal to the person they love. Their hate, a hot, rash, and imprudent violence, always fatal to themselves. And so Medica's love, which turned to hatred and revenge, was the weakness which destroyed not only the people and the world about her, it destroyed her, too. I'll be back shortly. The Medea of Euripides, on which our drama was based, was first produced in the year 431 B.C., more than 2,400 years ago. This study of a soul divided against itself was one of the first plays in all dramatic literature to turn the spotlight on some of the complexities of feminine human nature. Its capacity for passionate love, murderous hate, pride, willpower, ferocity, superhuman energy. Our cast included Kim Hunter, Mason Adams, Arnold Moss, Russell Horton, and Bryna Rayburn. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Do you believe in monsters? They exist, you know. The Irish giant in the Museum of Trinity College, Dublin. Dwarfs, which are stronger and live longer and usually have strong passions and acute intellect. The fabulous monsters of Guiana near Lake Parima, sketched in 1663 by Joost Segman in his collection of voyages. Those are just a few examples which will lend credence to the story we're about to hear. I saw it, Billy Lee. I, I, I saw it. I saw the thing. Now take it easy. Oh, you're shaking like an aspen leaf. How come you even went near Dead Lake? 
Well, you know better. Well, well, well. Things disappear there. <laughs> what got into you? One of my heifers wandered away. I saw him grazing down toward the lake. I just plumb forgot about the, the stories and went after him. When I got within a hundred yards of him, the heifer was on the shore, drinking. And that's when it it came out of the water and, and grabbed him. The heifer disappeared. He bellowed Billy Lee. It was horrible. <laughs> Mystery drama, The Horror of Dead Lake, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Roy Windsor and stars William Prince and Gordon Gould. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. monstrosities have attracted attention and have engendered the cloying fear we experience in the presence of the unnatural. The Loch Ness Monster, for example. Is it fact or fiction? The search for it still goes on. Cyclops? The monster with one eye? Oh, there undoubtedly was such a creature because there still are. Really? At a point where the nose sticks out from the forehead, there's a single orbital cavity with an eye in it. Well, in this tale, we encounter another deviate from nature when we discover the hideous thing that inhabits the dead lake. Claude? Yes? Was it all right? Not too grim? No, it was all right. I know how much you loved your father. Well, he lived a long life and he didn't suffer. The lawyer went over things and assigned them to me. The savings, the old house, that kind of thing. It was sad, come to think of it. But it's over now. You know, Polly, there's something I never told you because I'd forgotten about it. And so had my dad, for that matter. Oh? A castle in Spain? A map where the treasure is buried? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're not so far off at that. My dad left me 50 acres of land near a small town in Florida, Orisville. Fifty acres? Mm -hmm. And with land down there selling for a fortune? Well, not this land. Well, there's something funny about it. A long time ago, back in the early part of the 18th century, a certain Silas Baxter, an ancestor of mine, was, I kid you not, a pirate. Claude. He must have run a pretty good ship, because when he left the sea, he bought those 50 acres and built himself a castle. He called it the Captain's Doubloon. A castle? Oh, not a great big one, but big enough. The history of the Captain's Doubloon has been handed down from one Baxter to another and was among my father's papers. I see. What I've been left is the Captain's Doubloon in a state of ruin, the acreage, and something named Dead Lake. Why? Because nothing lives in it. That's creepy. Mm. My father never had any interest in the property. I don't know if he ever saw it. But we do own a ruined castle and 50 acres of land. With a dead lake where nothing lives. That's right. Claude, we ought to sell it. I think so, too. You know, it's funny nobody has ever wanted to buy it. Maybe they did. But my father never said anything about it to me. Dead lake. Claude... Yeah? Let's go see it. You mean it? Sure. Florida's no big trip from Philadelphia. Can you get time off from your job? I think so. I could take off Friday, and we could have most of Friday and the weekend. I can't promise anything, Polly. The captain's doubloon is a ruin. Maybe the acreage is worthless. But what about Dead Lake? I'd like to know why it's dead. Wouldn't you? Yes. Well, Tell you what I'll do. I'll telephone the lawyer who settled my father's estate. Maybe he can give me the name of someone to see when we reach Orisville. I don't think Orisville's much more than a widening in the road. I'm so excited. 
A deserted old castle. A dead lake. Makes chills run up and down my back. <laughs> Professor Micah, and uh, how are you, sir? Quite well, I thank you. Here is my food list. Uh, can you also obtain the chemicals I've written down here? Uh, oh, oh, yes, sir. No, no problem. Uh, have one of the boys drive over to Platt. Uh, no, I, I've got to pay him, of course. I understand. I will give you these. I have before. Yes, sir, you sure have. Doubloons. My goodness, what pretty coins. Solid gold. You mind if I ask you something, Professor? I mean, Johnny Reed was in here yesterday, and he's scared white. A heifer of his wandered down to the shore of Dead Lake, and Johnny said some kind of thing. Grabbed it and dragged it under the water. Johnny said it bellowed something terrible. Did you hear it? You know anything about it? It is wise to stay away from the lake. I do not go near it. I remain in the castle and do my work. Uh, well, maybe not for long, Professor. You've been squatting there so long, I guess you feel you own the place. But the real owner's coming to Orisville Friday afternoon or tomorrow. Ah. A fellow named Baxter. Same as Captain Silas Baxter. Who stole all them doubloons from the Spanish. Like these you just gave me. I have found a few. Mm -hmm. well, where will you go if Baxter tells you to get out? I would have no choice. I would leave. He will discover that the property is worthless. Uh, when he goes home, I will return. Mm -hmm, maybe. You got this idea of developing the land and selling it for home sites. You have tried to do that before, Mr. Billy Lee. <laughs> I sure did. Well, those persons I drove over to look at the land never did find their child. Quicksand. Not according to the sheriff and his men. They scoured and dredged the lake. All they found was some of the child's clothes. Yes, regrettable. The lake is dangerous. Why? There are unknown things in nature. It is better to let them remain unknown. Now, I will return tonight for my supplies. Oh, hello there, Professor. Good morning. Uh, I tell you, Billy Lee, he gives me the creeps. Uh, he may be gone soon, Johnny. Uh, how come? New owner's arriving tomorrow. Named Baxter. I can't say I'll be sorry to see Professor Micah go. He's in league with the devil. You remember that parrot? Oh, I sure do. Grew to have a wingspan of ten feet. Mm. Vicious thing. I remember we all went out and gunned it down. A horrible thing. Where did it come from? His experiments? That was just an ordinary little old parrot, no bigger than a crow. You saw what it became. Micah did that. He's always experimenting with something. Mm. Look here. Hmm. More doubloons. Wonder how many he's got. Uh, just a few, he says. Old Silas Baxter's supposed to have had thousands of them. But even if that old room's full of them, I wouldn't go near it with an army. Uh, you gotten over your scare? No, and I never will. That was the awfulest thing I ever saw, that poor heifer being pulled under the water by some thing. Now, what did it look like? What I saw, that was a... Uh... Kind of red color, round and fat, and it had uh, horns kind of sticking out in front, like uh, like feelers. Say no such thing, Johnny. Back up on that, Billy Lee. I saw the thing. Ah, you say the new owner's showing up tomorrow? That's right. Him and his wife. Staying in my, my rooms upstairs. You taking them over to their property? Well, I expect so. Then let me tell you. Stay away from the lake. And keep them away from it, too. The room's lovely, Mr. Harrison. Oh, oh Billy Lee. Oh, I'm pleased you like it, Mrs. Baxter. It's fine. I like your store, too. Oh, it ain't much. Uh, just a general store. Got just about everything in it that folks around here need. Well, it's very nice. 
Not bad for a one-horse town. Horseville isn't much, but those of us who've been here all our lives, we like it. If you want excitement, you Alaska close by, and St. Augustine's only 40 miles away. Nice country. We landed at St. Augustine and drove down. I enjoyed it. There's lots of pine, isn't there? Oh, sure is. Paper pulp. It's a big business down there. And cattle. He's a rancher now. Hi, Johnny. Oh. Meet Mr. and Mrs. Baxter. Hello. Johnny Reed. How do you Hi, do? Mr. Reed. Hi, you? Baxter's. You uh, really interested in the captain's doubloon, Mr. Baxter? Well, I don't know. It's my property. I might want to sell it off or interest some developer. I should think it would be worth quite a fair amount of money. You look skeptical, Mr. Harrison. Why are you shaking your head? No, no, don't go scaring him, Johnny. That's just what I'm going to do. It's not fair to keep him ignorant. Is it... Is it Dead Lake? No. How did you guess that, ma'am? Well, the name. There's something spooky about a lake that's dead. It's dead all right, except for one thing. There's something in it. Something I saw with my own eyes, and it's really something terrible. Oh, come on, Mr. Reed. I don't blame you, Mr. Baxter, for looking at me as if I'm escaped from the mental home. But a few evenings ago, one of our herd, a nice little heifer, went to the edge of the water of Dead Lake, and some awful thing grabbed it and dragged it under. A thing? What's a thing? Nobody, Nobody knows, knows, Mr. Baxter, but Johnny saw something. And strange things have happened down there before. Mm -hmm. Oh, and another thing, Mr. Baxter. For over 30 years, a squatter's been living in the ruins of the castle. A man named Micah. He was a professor. I'll tell you about him when we drive out. Spoke to him yesterday morning and said he'd probably have to clear out. He agreed, but uh, you'll meet him. A professor? And he's a squatter? What does he do? You'll excuse me for saying it, Miss Baxter, but I think he consorts with the devil. Oh, that's a little hard to believe in this day, Mr. Harrison. Oh, well, he's some kind of scientist, always sending for chemicals to Palatka to St. Augustine. He's, uh, now what did he call himself? An embry, embry, something or other. Embryologist? What's that, Claude? It's a branch of science concerned with the formation and development of the embryo. Teratology is the study of deviations from the normal. By golly, that explains the parrot with the ten-foot wing spread. What? It's the truth. I can swear to that, Mr. Baxter. Half the village went gunning for it. We shot it down. Oh, it's not possible. Yeah. Neither is that thing that lives in Dead Lake. we know about what exists at the bottom of the ocean? What prehistoric creatures live there concealed from our sight and knowledge? Monsters? Probably. There still are phenomena which we have not fathomed. What is that thing at the bottom of Dead Lake? We will encounter it when I return with Act Two. Subject is monsters. We seldom think about them, if we ever do, but there are monsters all the same. They are, in fact, studied in zoology under a special branch named tetralogy, concerned with deviations from the normal in the embryo. When deviations occur, the result can be a monster. Primitive man believed that a monster was the result of a woman's pact with Satan. Nonsense, of course. But the fact of the monster remains. What beautiful little birds you are. Which one of you will it be today? I have grown attached to all of you, but it must eat. An immutable law of nature. One feeds upon another, and that is how I learn. And that is what I live for. To learn. The great plant must live. And it is a carnivore. Claude. 
Bluin is right. The captain of Dubloon isn't a castle. It's a heap of rubble. One turret sort of standing. The rest caved in. The professor's at home. See smoke rising from the chimney. Strange smell. Secret. It's the chemicals. He's always experimenting with something. Have you been here before, Billy Lee? Oh, oh not to go inside. I've been around the grounds, but... <laughs> Like the rest of us in Orisville, I don't feel comfortable here. Well, we've seen it, Polly. You need to forget it and go home. <laughs> That's what the dog thinks, don't you, Bing? Well, we've come all the way from Philadelphia. Claude, we ought to meet this professor and see what it's like inside. And ask him about those doubloons he brings to Billy Lee for food. What do you say, Billy Lee? Well, I guess I don't have to say anything. There's the professor now. Afternoon, professor. Good afternoon. Is this, is this the Baxter? That's right. This is Baxter. My dog Binks. How do you do? Yes, a dog. I'm the legal owner of all this property, Professor Micah. I do not question it, Mr. Baxter. And I am an interloper. If you want to put it that way, yes. So, when it's convenient to you... Of course. I will gather my few possessions and leave. You've been here 30 years. Or longer than that. It is an isolated place. I uh, do my work here, my uh, experiments. Like that, uh, that monster parrot? I uh, told him about that, Professor. You remember how some of us in the village had uh, done it down? Yes, I have not forgotten. A pity... Well, I don't know about that. I mean, killing sheep and almost dragging off a child. I mean, uh, the destruction of the master's scientific achievement, uh, the phenomenon, proof that experiments in tetralogy can produce new breeds of animals that could change the face of the earth. I wonder if we might see the inside of the castle. You are the owner. Well, I don't want to inconvenience you. It is no inconvenience, but I caution you... Do not wander away alone. I have experiments in many stages of development. Some of them are dangerous. A Venus flytrap is one of them. So I know about their mayflies. Interesting little plants. I never... Uh, follow me. It would be wise not to bring the dog. I'll take him back to the car, Polly. No, no, let me. Like, come on, thanks. Hey, you go get your fill of the castle. No, I'll be outside. Come on. Oh, my goodness. What's that thing, Claude? It looks like a huge sunflower plant. And look at those pouches at the end of its leaves. They're bigger than a pelican's pouch. Much bigger and much more dangerous. It is a Venus flytrap. It can't be. They're small. But by controlling its growth from a seedling... I have created a new species. This is very powerful. Look, Polly. It's leaning toward me. And it's opening up. Claude. Do not approach it, Mr. Baxter. If it should seize your arm. Oh, that's horrible. Claude, stay back. Well, that's the first thing that will go. I'll take an axe to it. Let's get out of here, Claude. You, you live here, Professor? Yes, in the ruined tower. Uh, this is my plant room. Is there a basement? Yes, but... Except for me, uh, the dungeon is unsafe. You've got more things like this down there? My experiments are varied. Professor, please clear out as soon as you can. And destroy these experiments of yours. Oh, oh, oh. That's Binks. <laughs> Claude, that's Binks. He sounds like he's been killed. <laughs> Mrs. Baxter, all right? Yes. Yes, Billy Lee. Thank you. Glad you're still open. What happened? I can see by your face. Their dog. What? It wasn't anyone's fault, Billy Lee. Bink slipped his collar. Oh. No. And, uh, and Ryan Lucy uh, got him to dead late. I ran after him, but not in time. I saw it myself this time, Johnny. It rose up out of the water, a, a, a round, huge, slimy thing, and, and dragged the dog into the lake. What is it? What is the thing? I, I never saw anything like it in my life. 
I, I don't know what it is, but it's probably one of Micah's experiments. We went there this afternoon. My wife and I went into Micah's room in the castle, and Johnny, it made my hair stand on end. Didn't let the dog whine and wouldn't go with us. The relief that he'd wait outside with the dog. I, I was taking him back to the car. He fought the leash so hard, he, he slipped his collar and he flew toward Dead Lake. Ran after him, but by the time I got within 50 yards of the shore, something had caught the dog and was dragging him under. If I was you, Claude, I'd cut my losses and forget the place. No, sir. I'm going to get rid of Micah and find out just what makes Dead Lake dead. There's something in it. You caught a glimpse of it. So did Billy Lee. A big, fat, slimy thing with horns. Well, what is it? I know a man who might know. A friend who's a zoologist at the University of Pennsylvania. I've telephoned him for help. He'll be here late tomorrow. Then we're going out and solve this filthy, hideous mystery. Now that you've met Dr. Petty, let's hear what he has to say. You're on, Joe. I see everyone's well armed. Well, there's something in dead leg, Dr. Petty. And if we catch sight of it, we're going to blow it to bits. Lynx was my dog. I'm going along. I'm not afraid, and I can handle a gun. Well, all right. My plan, for what it's worth, Joe, is for all of us to go out there now. It's five o'clock. We ought to get there in half an hour. Then you and I will go inside and find out if Professor Micah has cleared out. Mm -hmm. If he hasn't, I'll throw him out. Then we'll destroy that awful plan. Once Micah's gone, all of us will explore that dungeon. Maybe that's where he's got the thing. You got any idea of what it might be? Uh, you described it as about six feet long, fat and slimy, with horns. Colored, a reddish kind of color. You know what it makes me think of? A giant snail. But they don't eat flesh, Johnny. Could it be a giant slug? I don't think so. I don't like to speculate, Claude, but since you telephoned me yesterday, I've been doing some research, although I don't believe all this. It's true, Dr. Betty. As a scientist, it's hard for me to believe, but I accept what you've told me. Why, Joe? What do you think it could be? A member of the Harudni, which is a branch of the Kaidapod worms. What? It's a worm? No, Johnny, but it could be a monster leech. One of those things that attaches itself to the skin. Yes. And in Egypt and in the Near East, there's an aquatic leash that is in streams and ponds and does extensive damage to horses and other baggage animals. Leeches? You make my skin crawl, Joe. Well, they've been used extensively in medicine. In 1832, France alone imported over 50 million of them for bloodletting. And you think that's what the thing is that's in Dead Lake? It's hard to say, Billy Lee, but you've described the leech. The red-colored body, bloated appearance, the slimy look. Of course... The fall of a leech five or six feet long boggles my mind. I simply can't imagine it. But if that's what the thing is, it could kill anything. Once those enormous suckers have attached themselves to any blood animal, the animal would be dead in minutes. Well, let's get started. Here, we'll, we'll take my pickup, sir. We've got an arsenal. And dynamite. Dynamite? Sure. If we don't see the leech, maybe we can find where it lives. And that's when I blow up his cave. People around here have a score to settle with that monster. I told you to get out, Professor Micah. So you did. And I will leave now. I have not had time to... Out. You have a rifle and a shotgun. Why? We think there's a monster leech in Dead Lake. And we intend to destroy it. Fantastic. I want you out of here. I have packed what I can carry. The rest I leave to you in the name of science. Get out, Professor. That marvelous Venus flytrap. I never saw anything like it, Claude. Look at those traps undulating and stretching toward us. He said it's powerful. That's the first thing we take care of. You have the shotgun, Joe. Look at us. Inching toward us. I'll release the birds. They're what he fed to the plant. Look at them go. Joe, 
Call the others. We'll try the dungeon. Well, come with me. We don't want to be separated. You've got a point. What a devil's hole this is, Joe. Let's get the others. Glad I brought the axe. Did you see that thing try to wind itself around me? Some kind of vine? Strong as wire. It's just awful down here. What's that over there, Claude? Shine your light. Uh, a huge door. Hinged with a drop lock. Do you think... Don't open it, Claude. Shh, shh, listen. Mister, what's that? Sounds like something breathing underwater. Wet, bubbly kind of breathing. There's one way to stop that. No, Claude, don't shoot. I've got a better idea. There is something behind that door. If it's the thing, the giant leech. You won't kill it with one shot. Oh, what's your idea, Dr. Penny? Well, that door must open into a tunnel. And the tunnel probably leads to the lake. Now, if we can trace the tunnel from above, on the ground, and see where it leads to, Johnny here can dynamite the entrance and block the thing in. That's when we'll have it trapped, and that's when we'll kill it. Good idea. Everyone stick together, and we'll go back upstairs and out. Oh, I never want to see this place again. You'll be all right, Polly, when we get out into the air. Come on. Walk between Joe and me. Is it possible? In nature, most things are. And nature, with a prod from an experimental scientist, has created a monster. A giant predatory, hideous, monster leech. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Have you ever had a leech attach itself to your skin? It happens not infrequently, in many freshwater lakes. They are small and they can be flipped off with the finger. But the experience makes one shudder. Imagine the horror then of speculating that what Professor Micah has bred, the thing that has made the dead lake dead, is a gargantuan leech. I'll get the dynamite. Hand me the rifle, Billy Lee. Sure. I'll grab the shotgun. Hold on. Here's the other one for you, Dr. Petty. Right. Joe, let me carry it for Johnny. I'd appreciate it if you'd stay with Polly. I'm all right, Claude. With just being in that filthy basement. No way, Polly. You're going to stay by the truck and Joe. Claude! No, absolutely not. I mean it, Polly. I think he's right, Mrs. Baxter. I tell you what. Why don't you swing the truck around and turn on the light and shine them on the north side of the castle? The locked basement doors on that side. Give us some light down to the shore, too. All right, Polly. Come on, hop in. Claude. No, please don't argue. You stay with Joe. Ready, Johnny? I'll lead the way. Keep your guns up. I'll be ready for anything. Joe, I feel sick. If the thing is what you think it is. Yeah, yeah me too. Let me get the truck turned around. Black as a tunnel. I'll switch on the lights. I see them. Claude and the others. The car lights do run down to Dead Lake. Isn't that an awful name for it? It's dead, all right, if there's a giant leech in it. (gasps) Joe, look. What? It's the professor. Now, what the devil... He's turning to the castle, not through the front, but through the north side of it. I wonder what he's up to. He disappeared now. Must be another entrance to the place. If Johnny does blow up the tunnel and the professor's in that basement... Claude ordered him out. I know that. All all the same, he is a human being. I don't think he's a human being at all. Shine your big torch over the lake, Johnny. Sure cuts through the blackness all the way to the other side. Johnny, look. Hmm. Something's moving just under the surface of the water. It's moving to the other side. Follow it with the torch. Look at it. Just a little of its back is out of the water, like a whale. Keep following it. I can hit it from here. No, Claude, no. Let it go. When it returns from the other side of the lake. Oh, no. That's a small deer over there. See? The thing is coming out of the water. 
Go fire a shot, Claude. It scared the deer. Look at that thing. It's half out of the water. The deer got away. Johnny, follow where the thing swims. It's coming toward this side of the lake. A few hundred feet north of us. Come on. No, 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 no. Hold it. If it does have a cave or a tunnel to a cave, we don't want to scare it off. Just watch it. It didn't surface. And it's disappeared. Now, let's move. All set, Johnny? Yeah. Here goes. Claude, run that torch along from where Johnny blew the entrance. Back toward the castle. That's it. Look. Yeah. The force of the explosion in the tunnel lifted the ground above the tunnel. And now we can see its path. It does go to the castle. It goes to that barred door in the basement. We've got the thing trapped. Maybe it's dead. That was a terrific blast. <laughs> but we got to make sure, Claude. There's only one way to do that. We have to open that big barred door. <laughs> What, Joe? I don't know. There was a big charge of dynamite. They must have found the tunnel. What about the thing? It's dead, probably. Just the force of the detonation could kill it, but I don't know. Look, they're coming back. Maybe they'll tell us what happened. Yeah, that got their attention. Is it dead? Claude? Is it dead? I don't know. We hope the explosion caved in on the thing and killed it. But we don't know. And there's only one way to find out. We have to go back into the castle. Oh, no. We have to, Polly. Uh, you, you saw it? Enough of it, Joe. It's a leech, all right. A monster leech. How big, Claude? At least six feet long. Round as a hippo and reddish in color. When it came out of the water, it writhed like a snake. And its, it's, it's blood-sucking cups, or whatever you want to call them, were bigger than half dollars. Mm. It's the most revolting creature I've ever seen. How in heaven's name did it ever come about? Experimental breeding and crossbreeding. Professor Micah developed gigantism in some strain of leech until he achieved one with monster size. But why would he want to do something like that? All scientists, Billy Lee, are fascinated by the subject of life. How it can be controlled and developed. He's in there, Claude. In the castle. Micah? That's right. The headlights from the truck picked him out just as he disappeared through some of those big stones on the north side. Well, then we may have killed him. The blast. If that blast blew open that hinged door. Come on. Let's see where he went in. and We'll follow him. Leave the dynamite detonating box here, Johnny. Grab this shotgun. You told him to get out, Claude. Why would he want to come back? Joe, I'm afraid. You stay here with me. There's nothing we can do to help. But if something... If something should happen to Claude... And it was my idea to come down here. He didn't want to. And now if something should happen... That could be it. See where I'm shining the torch? Yeah, it could be. Just about wide enough for a man to squeeze through. All right, follow me. Hold it, Claude. You bring out the rear. Now, wait a minute. I'm not going to have you risk your lives any more than you already have. Billy and me have the shotguns. Much more effective close range. You bring up the rear with your rifle. Right, Billy Lee? Right. I don't know what to expect, but whatever we find, it's bound to be close range. Uh, let's go, Johnny. This place is a house of horrors. Ought to be burned to the ground. It will be, once we know that the monster leech is dead. <laughs> it's Micah from that big room in the dungeon. Help me! Have your gun cocked, Johnny. And go slow. Oh, look. Oh, good Lord. It's, it's all over him. Move back, Johnny. Mike is dead. The leech is all over him. True, Johnny. Blood. All over. Is it... Is it dead? Don't go near it, Claude. Some of the suckers are still working away. We have to get Mike out from under. He's dead, Claude. Let's get out of here. We can come back when it's daylight. Get Mike and 
Hack that thing to pieces. Joe, I can't stand it. You just have to, Polly. We're not leaving this truck. But those gunshots, what if they run into? I can't guess. You can, but you won't. What if that blast of dynamite blew out that hinge door? If the thing wasn't killed in the tunnel. Hold it. They're coming out of the front of the castle. You see the flashlights? They're safe. Oh, Joe, they're safe. Are you all right, Polly? Still feel a little faint. When you saw Claude safe returning to the truck, you passed out. I remember. Joe was right. Professor Micah had developed a giant leech. It lived in a tunnel which ran from the shore of Dead Lake up to a cave near the castle. When Johnny set off that blast of dynamite, the tremendous repercussion broke the hinges of the door into the cave, and the leech got out. Micah was there in the room. He was probably stunned by the blast. And that's when the leech grabbed him. There was nothing we could do to save him. It must have been awful. That was a nightmare, Polly. We're returning there in the morning. So am I. Polly. No, Claude. I got us into this and I'm going to see what's in that room. Listen to the birds. Life has kind of returned to the captain's doubloon. I don't feel much like going down into that basement again. And I'm not sure it's safe for Miss Baxter. Don't you worry about me, Johnny. Now that I know the monster leech is dead, I'm not afraid. All right. But let's go in through the front. Have we got everything? Lights, ropes. And my shotgun, just in case. And camera. Watch your footing, Polly. And when we go down into the dungeon, stay between us. Uh, let me lead, Claude. I've uh, got the gun. There it is. Oh, Claude. Poor old Micah's under that thing. Oh, aim that big light right, right at it, Johnny. That's incredible. It's six feet long and four feet thick. Micah let out one scream and then he was dead. Partly fright, maybe. Keep the light trained on him, Johnny. We'll try to pull him free. Let me take a few pictures first. No one's going to believe this horror. Claude, what about Professor Micah? What happens to him now? We give him a decent burial. And Joe wants to find out, if he can, why Micah did all this. Billy and I searched the castle. In the one tower, still partly standing, Micah had a room and his books and a small laboratory. Yeah, there were a lot of papers and chemicals. But the real discovery was this diary. It goes back 40 years, back to 1931, in fact. Now, under an October date, listen to what Michael wrote. Today, I was discharged as an assistant professor of zoology because I was consulted by a friend whose son was certain to die from acute nephritis. I urged the man's doctor to attempt a transplant. The doctor was repelled by my suggestion. I explained that in zoology... I had conducted many experiments in which I have saved small animals with various organ defects. My suggestion was rejected, and so was I. I have left. I intend to continue my experiments somehow, somewhere, well, south probably, where at least I will have the climate in my favor. And one day... I am convinced the name of Micah will be honored for his proof that life can be prolonged and improved. There it is. And a lot more. Poor man. He wasn't really mad. He, he just felt rejected. And because of his bitterness, his experiments became grotesque. Through that huge parrot, for example, he intended to prove to skeptics that man's magic, science, could reshape mankind and his environment. He was an intellect, and far ahead of the time in which he lived. 
And the giant leech? Like the parrot, another proof of what Micah maintained. Control of life. And both got out of hand. I'm going to publish Micah's papers, Claude. And I'm going to burn the captain's doubloon to the ground, make that land habitable again, and stock Dead Lake with fish. That horror is gone. Nature, with a little help from me, will restore it. Nightmares are made of such stuff as a dream about a monster leech because the word makes the skin crawl. And when in sleep, a fiend or incubus oppresses you, wake up. It will go away. But was it real or just a nightmare? I'll be back in a moment. I think, to dismiss anything. Was it conceivable years back to imagine men walking on the moon? Is the notion of a huge killer shark unimaginable? We know a great deal about Earth, something about the universe, but isn't anything, or almost anything, conceivable? Monsters are, and our story's giant leech was one of them. Our cast included William Prince, Gordon Gould, Anne Shepard, George Petrie, and Gil Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Who is it? I can't see over the back of the seat. I don't know about the passengers. It's the stewardess who was up front. How did she get to the rear of the plane? I don't know. <laughs> That's it. In a moment, Mr. Morris. Miss Newman in S1. And Mr. Downing in S2. Make them secure. Stewardess, I demand to be released and let off at this stop. Thank you, boys. As soon as you're out, we'll button up and take off. Stewardess! Do you hear me? I... Didn't you hear? Why won't you listen? We are in the takeoff run. Please do not smoke. And make sure that all safety belts are fastened. Release until a light goes on. Do not release. Collapse. Who has a chance? Can't you stop it, Mr. Bob? Some way. I guess I can't tell you. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by All State Insurance Companies and Contact, the 12 hour cold capsule. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time. Pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. As the poet says, let us fill the cup... What are you having? How about equal parts suspense and mystery with just a dash of terror and chill to taste? So, they say that a lie is only the truth in masquerade. But does the opposite also hold? Can we say that the truth is a lie in masquerade? What is masquerade? 
Well, for that matter, what is reality? Who are we? Who do we really see when we look in the mirror? The image that gazes steadily back at us, that anticipates our every move, our every breath. Who is it? Or what is it? Darling. Hello, dear. Dinner ready? No. Oh, you plan for us to dine out? No, Gerald. Well, why isn't dinner ready, then? I haven't had a chance to prepare it. I was busy. Doing what, Cecily? Oh, learning how to load. What are you doing with that pistol? Learning how to aim. Cecily, don't point that at me. And learning how to fire. Uh, uh, why, Cecily? What? Uh. Our mystery drama, The Many Names of Death was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Alexander Scorby. It is sponsored in part by imported Vigna Rosé wine and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. You know how it is with some people. They go along for years. In a groove, a routine, or a rut. Characterize it any way you like. Ten, twenty years, the same job, the same apartment, same wife. It might just occur to a man to ask himself, is this all I have to look forward to? There are those men who ask this question and keep asking it. But these are the men who rarely do anything about it. It's the men who don't ask, who seemingly plod along contentedly and quietly. Oh, yes. <laughs> Look out. Look out for Gerald Furlong, who fills all the specifications we have just stated. Uh, Mr. Furlong. Yes? Good morning. My name is Helene LaRue. Yes? I'm your new secretary. Oh. Uh, Mr. Spruance, you know him, the personnel manager? Yes. Well, when I heard that old lady McKay... Uh, oh, I beg your pardon. Miss McKay was leaving. I asked for the job. And he said I could have it unless you had someone else in mind. Well, I... Uh... Actually, I'm the best typist in the pool. Are you? Oh, yes. You can check it. Everybody always asks for me. Yes, but I don't... Of uh... course you don't know. How could you? Unless we try it. What have you got to lose? Well... Then it's settled. Now, all you have to do is sign this memo. What memo? The memo to Mr. Spruance, which says you authorize my appointment as your secretary. Yes, but I... Uh... Well, now, I don't want you to think I'm pushing you or taking too much on myself. But a good secretary handles all the details, ties up all the loose ends, keeps the desk clear. And as soon as you sign that, I can call Mr. Spruance's secretary. All right. Ah, that's it. Yes, sir. Oh, Mr. Furlong, you do have a bold, strong handwriting. Unusual, sir, but that's to be expected. Expected? Oh, yes. You see, your name is Gerald. Yes. And do you know what the name Gerald means? No. Well, it's an old German name. It means strong leader of an army. Hello? Hello, this is Elaine LaRue. Tell Mr. Spruance that Mr. Furlong wants me to be his secretary. The memo's on its way. Thank you. Well, strong leader of an army. Mm, don't you feel like one? No, I'm afraid I don't live up to my name. Oh, you just think you don't. My dear young lady, I know I don't. Don't call me that. You dear young lady. Why, does it offend you? Yes. Oh, I, I'm sorry. When you call me your dear young lady, you're putting yourself down. I'm afraid I don't understand. Well, you make yourself sound like an old man. Oh. Uh, and you're not. You see, I worked in personnel. I had to check everyone's records. Now, Miss LaRue, those records are highly confidential, and they're... Ah, no you're only 45. It's true that you look 55. No. Now, Miss LaRue, one thing I frown upon in this office is the discussion of personal matters. Of course, of course. If you went about things differently, uh, <clears throat> you would 
Look, 35. Miss LaRue, I have some letters to dictate. Yes, sir. This is to, uh, to Mr. Oliver Stevens at Carpenter and Stevens. Uh, you'll find the address in the files. Dear sir, pursuant to, uh... Yes, sir. Uh, read that back, huh? All you said was, uh, dear sir, pursuant to... Oh, yes, yes. Uh, pursuant to our agreement, I must inquire of you, uh... Uh, Miss LaRue. Yes? You know, you've gotten off here on the wrong foot. But, Mr. Furlong... I dislike flattery. I intensely dislike it. I despise it. But I... Now, please do not interrupt me. I am not a fool. Oh, I never said you were. Your flattery is doubly obnoxious because it's it, it's so, so... <laughs> so what, Mr. Furlong? Because it's so extravagant, so obvious. Oh, but I wasn't... But, uh, I might tolerate flattery that's that's clever. But you, my dear young lady, are ludicrous. There you go again. Calling me your dear young lady. I'll call you anything I like. I'm your employer. Well, why am I ludicrous? Now, how can you tell me that I could look like a man of 35? Because it's true. Do you know what 35 is? I know what it looks like. 35? That, that, that's another world, another another generation. I know. To tell me that I could look 35 again is... is well, it's an insult to my intelligence. I could make you look 35. What did you say? Well, you'd have to dress differently, wear colors, let your hair grow long. Miss LaRue, this conversation has become far too well, personal. Well, we can end it any time you say. Uh. <clears throat> now, pursuant to our agreement, I must inquire of you if you feel obligated to provide financing for... Yes, Mr. Furlong. At, at the risk of sounding foolish, why did you say I could look 35? I learned something about you, Mr. Furlong. How could you learn anything about me in so short a time? Well, I learned that you're a man who fights against his name. I haven't the faintest idea of what that means. Your name, Gerald... Strong leader of men. Oh. Oh, why do you fight it? Why do you deny it? It's what you were meant to be. Really? It's true. Who says so? I do. And how would you know? Because I believe in nomenology. <laughs> oh, it's the science of names. I believe that our names tell us what we are. I think that's ridiculous. Do you? Well, I think birth itself is a... Mysterious happening. And the parents unconsciously have an insight into what their child could be, and they name him accordingly. They might not even be aware of it. Gerald. Well, I'm certainly not a strong leader of men. But you could be. You have it in you. It's ridiculous. Oh, you said that before. I'll say it again. Now, why is it any more ridiculous than any other belief? Why is it any more ridiculous than, say, astrology? Tell me, uh, what does Helene mean? Light. Hmm? A torch from the Greek. Light? Yes, light. Have I brought you any? How's the fish, dear? Oh, a bit bland. Bland? Huh? That's odd. It's been prepared exactly as usual, and you never complained before. Well, it just happens to lack taste. But you have to watch your intake of salt. Why? Why? Well, it's just the prudent thing, isn't it? That's what you always say. Yes, I suppose so. Did they replace Miss McKay? Yes. I hope they gave you a mature woman. You can't stand those flighty young girls. What's your new one like? Well, I really haven't noticed yet. Oh? How is that possible? Oh, look, Cecily, my dear, I have so much to do. I simply can't bother to note those things that have nothing to do with business. You are overworked, dear. That's true. I'm aware that I have a secretary, that I dictate letters to her, that she has a name, in this case. Uh, what she looks like? Well, I, I simply couldn't remember. Poor dear. Cecily, tell me something. 
How old do I look to you? Why? Oh, just curious. I hadn't thought about it. Well, you don't have to think about it. Just tell me. Well, darling, you look your age. Do I? If anything, a bit older. Really? And that's been responsible for your success. A man who heads up a trust department who's responsible for other people's money can only inspire confidence if he looks mature and... And, uh, settled, huh? Oh, yes, dear, and you certainly do. Is it possible that... Is it possible that anyone could ever take me for, say, 35? <laughs> 35? Oh, darling, I, I don't see how. Why do you ask? Oh, no reason. Are you sure? No, look, please, forget it. I simply can't imagine why you'd even ask such a strange question. Especially... Especially what? Especially since you're not in the habit of asking idle questions. Coffee? No, no, darling. If you'll excuse me, I'll go to the library. I have some work. Well, Gerald, this... This goes against everything you ever... Why, you made it almost a religion not to bring work home from the office. Yes, dear, I know. But every religion encounters a bit of heresy now and then. Don't stay up too late. No, dear. I just have a few things to check out. Hello? Miss uh, LaRue? Oh, good evening, Mr. Furlong. Good evening. I was waiting for your call. But what do you mean you were waiting for my call? Well, and I was right. You did call, didn't you? Well, yes. However, my secretary has to expect to work all hours, and if you object, then perhaps you'd better resign. Oh, I don't mind. I don't mind at all. You have such a fascinating voice. Now, now see here, Miss LaRue, this is a business call. Of course it is. Look, I had so many things to do today that I, I can't recall if I sent a letter to Mr. Oliver Stevens. Ah, uh, Mr. Oliver Stevens of Comptor and Stevens. That's right. Because if I forget to write one... Well, you did, uh, Mr. Furlong. You dictated it, and I typed it and mailed it. Good. That is a relief. Uh, otherwise, I'd have to call him this evening and explain that he shouldn't expect to... No, nope, the letter went out. Well, that's... Well, that, that's what I, I, I wanted to know. Is there anything else? No, I, I can't think of anything. Oh, then, good night, sir. Good night. Uh, oh, uh, just another minute. C could you tell me what... <laughs> what what the name Cecily means? Cecily? Mm hmm Oh, yes, sir. That's um, a Latin name. It means one who is in the dark or blind. <laughs> Yes, dear. Did I wake you? I'm sorry. Oh, working at night's the worst thing in the world for your nervous system. Yes, dear. I'll just brush my teeth and get right to bed. Gerald. Gerald. Who's there? Gerald. Who's talking to me? Look in the mirror, Gerald. I am. I, I'm looking at... Don't you see me? What is all this? I must be having... a hallucination. Look in the mirror, Gerald. Who do you see? I see myself. No. You see me. But, but who are you? The image you cast in the mirror. That's me, isn't it? No. That's me. I can't believe this. I, I'm... You're what? What? Drunk? You never drink. Mad? You're the sanest man in the city. I'm seeing things. Why? What's happening to me? That's it, Jerry. What is happening? I've gone mad. You will be. Soon, Jerry. Unless you fire that girl. Which girl? Oh, don't play games with me. I've looked at your face for the last 45 years. You have no secrets from me. Why should I fire her? You know why. I don't know what you're talking about. If you don't get rid of her, you're headed for ruin, disgrace, death. How can you say that? It's true. You know it's true. Don't you, Gerald? Deep down, way down, don't you know where it must end? How it must end? 
Yes. Use your common sense and fire her first thing in the morning. Will you do that, Gerald? Yes. First thing in the morning, I'll fire her. You look in the mirror, and a perfect stranger starts to talk to you. He wears your face, but you know he isn't you. He knows every thought in your head and every emotion in your heart. But you know he isn't you. Who is he? We shall acquire some new insights when I return shortly with Act Two. a face that looks back at our own each time we gaze into a mirror. But is it always the same face? The quick answer, the automatic answer is yes, certainly, of course. This teaches that we should never answer anything without pausing for thought. We might get the same surprise that happened to Gerald Furlong. It was the same face, but it wasn't his Good morning, Mr. Furlong. Good morning, Mr. LaRue. Come into my office, please. Yes, sir. Now, Mr. LaRue, I have something to tell you. Oh, I know. You want to fire me. Well, I've been thinking. A, a man and his secretary, they, they spend considerable time together, and therefore they should have similar temperaments. Mm, and you're too busy thinking to have fun. Obviously, we don't have a similar temperament, Miss LaRue. Very really well. I'll go back to the pool... And you can get yourself another dried-up old maid to match the one you've got at home. Now, see here. Yes, what is it you want me to see? How, how did you know... How did you know I was going to fire you? Well, you keep fighting your name. You're not a Gerald. Look, what are you fighting? You know, you never had a good time in your life. Why should you care? Because I'm in love with you. That's impossible. We don't know each other. We, we have nothing in common. Oh, that's all nonsense. You fall in love because you hear a certain tone in somebody's voice. You see a certain light in someone's eye. But how can such a love be lasting? Oh, who says love has to last? You know, love comes and goes. Love is. And then one day, it just isn't. And it's gone. And nobody knows why, and it doesn't matter, because sooner or later it will come again with someone else. You're a strange girl. Oh, we're all strange. We, look, look we, we can't talk here. I, I'll take you, take you out to lunch. No, 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 no lunch. Why not? Because you must lose weight. I'll take you shopping. <laughs> I like that jacket, and with the aqua shirt. Oh, but I only wear white shirts. Oh, that's all in the past, darling. Now look at yourself in no, the mirror. No, no. No? Absolutely not. But how can you tell it? I just don't want to. I insist now. Come on. Look in the mirror. Have you ever seen anything so... so handsome? Well, it's... It's a work of art. Gerald. No. Gerald, this face, this face you see, it isn't my face anymore. Gerald, don't. Don't kill me. I'm not killing you. What are you saying, darling? Darling. Already? But darling, I... You can't do away with me, Gerald. We've been together too long. We've built up a whole world together. You just can't get rid of me and get another image. Well... What do you think, darling? Fire her, you fool. Get rid of her. Walk out of here before it's too late. Save yourself. I think... What's there to think about? He'll take it. And now, for some sportswear. Good morning, darling. Morning. Bacon is ready. Will you have two eggs? We have cereal. We... Uh, just a cup of coffee. But you must have breakfast. No, no, I'm fine. Just coffee. Darling, where did you get that suit? 
Oh, uh, I did some shopping last week. You like it? Well, it, it looks a bit... Uh, yes? Young for you. Young? And that shirt and the tie. Well, those colors are quite violent. Violent? Well, it's hardly the image for a trust officer. And besides, dear, middle-aged men who strive for a, a juvenile look only succeed in making themselves appear ludicrous. Which is how I appear to you. No, no, I didn't mean that. I only... Oh, look, look, we shouldn't quarrel, especially today. I, I have to go to Chicago. Oh? You know, just for a few days. We have to investigate a financial... But you, you'll never travel, dear. Well, I can't refuse this client. No, I suppose not. I'll cut the trip as short as I possibly can. Yes, dear. <laughs> I must say, it's convenient to the office. Well, the rent was higher than you said you could go. What? It's all right. Come here. Mm. Oh. I must say, you learn fast. <laughs> I didn't have to learn. I always knew it. It was just out of practice, that's all. Let me show you what I bought me this afternoon. Look, I hope your account isn't overdrawn again. Oh, it was a steal. My first mink cake. Oh. Was it necessary? No, that's not my joke. The king of the army. It's the old trust officer speaking. Oh, I just asked. Don't you want me to keep warm? Of course. That's better. What would you like to do tonight? Oh, what are we supposed to be doing? I'm supposed to be taking a client to a long and involved business dinner. Oh, well then let's go to the high hat club. Oh, I think I heard of that place. What did you hear? I don't think it's the kind of establishment I should be seen at. Then what are we waiting for? My turn again. I'll bet. Marty! Hi. Hi. Gerald, this is Marty Trainer. He owns the place. Gerald Furlong. How do you do? Oh, Furlong, huh? That's a good name for a horse player. Oh, he doesn't have to play with the horses, Marty. He's too skillful with the tie. I'm afraid it's beginner's luck. <laughs> when you're hot, you're hot. You're on a streak, ride it. I will. Bet it all. Hey! hey. hey. Come on, darling, you won. Let, you won. Let it ride. Yes, I know. You should be getting home. Oh, I wish I didn't have to go. So do I. You know the right thing to do? Mm. I should divorce Cecily and we ought to get married. Why should we get married? Because we're in love. <laughs> oh, weren't you in love with Cecily once? Well... Yes. Ah, and that's why you married her, but it didn't help. It didn't keep your love alive. You and I will we'll be different. No, we won't. We may love each other till the day we die, and we may fall out of love tomorrow morning. But I want us to keep our love. Oh, love can't be a guaranteed investment. Isn't the here and now? See a doctor. Why? I'm the one who's sick. You're killing me. No, no. Don't turn your face away. Look in the mirror. Look at me. I'm looking. Don't you see how I've changed? You, uh, I Look, we, we've never looked so good. Soon, you'll have a new image. And what becomes of me? I'll be dead. Frankly, I couldn't care less. But I'm the only image you're comfortable with. I'm the only image you can live with. I used to think so. I'm learning different. You're a fool. Get rid of her. Oh, no. She'll get tired of you sooner or later. And then what would you have? Elaine's what I've always wanted. I never had the nerve to let myself believe it. You can't afford her. Who says so? The apartment, the clothes, the gifts, the jewels. And now the gambling. Who knows more about gambling than I do? Haven't I gambled with investments all my life? <sighs> It's not the same thing. Except this time I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying life. It can turn all at once. It can sweep you away swiftly, suddenly, like a tidal wave. Gerald, get rid of her. 
You'll never know what hit you. No. She, she'll kill all of us. I don't care. I don't care. Joe. What, uh, what do you want? I thought I heard you talking to someone. You what? I heard you talking to someone. Oh, come on. That, that's ridiculous. I thought so, too, at first. But lately, it seems... Well, you seem to be having angry conversations. Indeed. About what? I don't know, but I'm sure I hear voices. You sure you're all right, dear? Is something wrong? No. Uh, no, it sounds like yes. Oh, I suppose I'm a little bit lonesome these days. I see so little of you. Look, darling, things are becoming impossible at the office. You know, the way the market is behaving. I, mean... I know, I know. There are terrible pressures on you. Why don't you quit? Quit? Yes, dear, quit. Find something else. It isn't easy to get a new job at 45. But you don't look 45. You look at least 10 years younger. Well, how would we make out while I was looking around? Well, you've been very judicious with our money. We should have quite a bit put by. Cecily, we don't have. In the present market, our holdings have... Well, they haven't done well. They've lost. They've lost considerable value. Oh. It's my fault. I, I'm sorry. Well, there's my inheritance. Oh, no, no. No, we couldn't... It's $50,000. No, 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 no. We, we must never touch it. It could help ease us along. Cecily... Oh, Cecily, you're, you're too good to me. Don't say that. I love you. Let's start life all over. Is it something to think about? Yes, it, it is something to think about. Where are we going? The usual place. Ah. What does that mean? You just said the usual place, which means our lives are becoming predictable. Well, don't you enjoy it there? Tonight, I'd like to go dancing. Oh, yeah, dancing? Why do you hire the best band in town? How would you know? You never dance to well, it. If you want to dance tonight, that's what we'll do. Let's go somewhere else. Why? Because if we go to Marty's, you'll get involved in a card game. No, I won't. I, I promise you. Oh, you make that promise every night, and you break that promise every night. Well, tonight will be different. You'll see. <laughs> I want to go home. Darling, we, we, we can't go just yet. I see no reason why we can't do anything we please any time we want to do it. I've lost too much money. Oh, what? It's only money. I can't quit now. Oh, this place is becoming a bore. I can't afford to. And you're becoming a bore, too. Don't say that. Uh, but I love you. Do you understand? Well, I love you, too. Just another half hour. Uh, Mr. Furlong. Yes, Marty. Do we see you again? No, Gerald, no. Don't play with him, please. You can't beat him. What are you talking about? The cards are going to come my way. I can feel it. You can't beat him. His name is Martin. What? After Mars, the god of war. He's a child of Mars. Gerald, let's leave now. Sure, sure. Look, all I need is just one good part. Gerald, don't play with him. Uh, you go get your coat and meet me here. Oh, <laughs> Mr. Furlong, just you and I left, huh? Oh, no fight for the pot. I believe you were the opener. 500. Oh, a very good bet. I think I'll raise. Make it a thousand. And a thousand better. A man with confidence. However, another thousand. A thousand to you again, Marty. Well, I must respect that. I call. You should. I have a full house. An excellent hand. Good enough to win most of the time, but not good enough this time. What are you... I have four little deuces. Oh. So, let's see. In the pot where your overall bets are $5,500 and added to your previous indebtedness, we have uh, <clears throat> a total of 35000 What? That's impossible. I have your markers here, Mr. Furlong. Care to check the arithmetic? Look, I don't carry $35,000 around with me in cash. Who does? We can wait. Till tomorrow. Gerald? Are you ready to go? Gerald? Yes. Yes, Elaine. We're ready to go. He 
says he's ready to go. But the question is, where? Where do you go when you've just lost $35,000 that you don't have? Where do you go? And what do you do? Well, this could be as good a time as any for Gerald to find out if he can live up to his name. Strong leader of men. We'll know everything when I return shortly with Act Three. not the first time, it won't be the last time, a man will seek to change his image. But is an image like a shoe, a coat, a tie, something a man may take off and cast aside? Can an image refuse to be changed? Can it fight back? It's very late at night, after a disastrous evening, and Gerald Furlong is once again confronting an image in the mirror. The image he seeks to change. And until recently, it was such a quiet, unobtrusive, submissive image. Now will you leave her lane? No. She's ruined you. I can't blame her. Tell Cecily. Confess. Why? Where else can you get the money? The money? The $35,000 you gambled away. I'll... I, 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 you what? You counted on Cecily's money. You knew it was there. That's why you gambled. That's a lie. Ah, you're talking to me. I can raise it. Where? How? She, she loves me. She'll let me have it. That's what I've been telling you. Confess to Cecily. Confess everything. I'm not Cecily. Helene. Helene, I, I'm, I'm in over my head. Please help me. Of course. I knew you would. <laughs> That's what love is. No. Oh. Your necklace, your bracelet, and the furs. Uh, you want me to sell them? We can raise quite a bit of money. Mm. Maybe not all of it, but enough to, to give me a breathing room. I see. I'll, I'll make it up to you later. Darling, I won't do it. But you... We're... We're in love. Yes? You said you'd help me. Help you in the right way. The way you should be helped. What do you mean? The way a man named Gerald should be helped. I don't understand. Gerald strong leader of the army? Are you going to bow down before the demands of a cheap gambler? I, I lost the money. Well, how do you know you lost it, honestly? How do you know the cards weren't fixed? I don't. Well, stand up to him. Refuse to pay him. What? But, but he'll... He'll what? Gambling's against the law here. His club is illegal. He has no claims on you. He can't go to court about it. Yes, but still... Still... Are you going to hold still? Be Gerald. This is how I love you. This is how I help you. Yes. Yes, he has no legal claim. You're, you're right. Yeah, you're right, Mr. Furlong. Absolutely right. I have no legal recourse. Then I shall say good day to you, sir. But... I have other alternatives. Yes, I can imagine. Huh. Can you? I can imagine that you'll try to frighten me with your uh, underworld connections. <laughs> underworld connection? You've seen too many movies. You think you can scare me with strong arm tactics? I'm not afraid of you. Why should you be? Or anyone else. I've been in a war. I know how to use a weapon. I have one in my house. I can defend myself, and I will. Now, you are a trust officer for an important brokerage house, Oh, right? I see. Blackmail. <laughs> I'm not afraid. I'll deny I was ever in here. <laughs> you can't. You see, we have proof. <laughs> what do you mean by proof? Well, now, when I press this button, that white screen comes down from the ceiling. And another button. And we have a projector. And now we have a motion picture, and look who the hero is. Oh, why, it's you. I, I don't believe it. Ah, oh, Mr. Furlong, isn't it true? One picture is worth a thousand words. How well you, you photograph. I mean, there you are, betting, raking in the money. Oh, you are a gambler, sir, that's obvious. So how you relish what you're doing, huh? Well, have you seen enough? 
will you do with it? Show it to my, my... My management people? Oh, yes. It won't do you any good. They'll fire me. That won't get you your money. Oh, yes, it will. What do you mean? They're not responsible now, for listen, what I... Now, listen, we exhibit this little documentary. We tell your management, unless they make good on your debt, we will show the picture to their clients. We will say to them, here. Here is how a man who handles your money amuses himself in his spare time. Is he doing this with your money? I think your management will pay us off, don't you? You violence? Who needs violence when this kind of persuasion is so much more, uh, persuasive? I need time. Of course. Take a few days, take a week, even more, and think about it. I'm sure something will occur to you. It's empty. What happened? She's gone. She's disappeared and she took everything. What's this paper? <laughs> Darling, love comes, love goes. And for us, it's over. Think about me as I shall think about you. And remember always, remember your name is Gerald, strong leader of a host. She's gone. She's gone. Of course she's gone. What did you expect? Where are you? What do you think I am? Look in the mirror. A mirror? A small mirror with a pearl-encrusted border. She was going to take it along with everything else, but she forgot. Well, what are you going to do now? No. Now I'm, I'm going to... It's not too late. Get down on your knees to Cecily. Pray to her to forgive you. Never. No, not to her. Not to Cecily. You can't afford to have pride. I'll get the money somehow. Oh, no. Not that way. I know what you're thinking. Look, it's the only way. I won't let you. I won't let you kill her. I'll stop you. It'll be a burglar. No. Yes, a burglar. And and, and he killed her. No. No, Th- Gerald. That's how it happened. I've got the gun at Don't home. do it, and... Gerald. She'll be angry, but in the end, she'll forgive you. I'll have an alibi. They'll never be able to prove Gerald, it. Gerald, don't. Don't kill her for her money. I have to. I won't let you. You can't stop me. I can warn Cecily. How could you? You, you, you can't. I'll stop you. I'll kill you first. Cecily? Cecily, where are you? Here. I'm here, darling, in the living room. Oh. How are you? As well as can be expected. What does that mean? Considering that my husband has... A. Deceived me with another woman. B. Squandered every dollar he has in the world. And C. Plans to murder me for my inheritance. I don't feel too badly. What on earth are you... Is it true? uh, Where where could you possibly get such a crazy idea? You told me. I told you? Yes. The strangest thing happened. I was sitting at the mirror combing my hair. And I looked in the mirror and it wasn't my face at all, but yours. That's... that's impossible. And you started to talk to me. And you told me everything, including the fact that you want to kill me. No, it it isn't true. Look, how how could you see my face in the mirror? But I did. And you spoke to me. It could have been a dream. Perhaps. But does it matter? Darling, I... I love you. Why why would I... I suppose I've been blind, but no more. I wish I could convince you. What are you looking for in that drawer? Uh, For... I'm not looking for anything. That's not true. You were looking for this. What? Cecily, don't. You... You couldn't shoot me? No, I couldn't. I'm not like you. Then... Why are you pointing that pistol at me? Get out. Get out. This is no longer your home. I'm no longer your wife. And I'm holding this gun because as long as I hold it, you won't be able to kill me. Cecily, you're mad. It's all in your imagination. Stay just where you are. Well, we've been married 22 years. We, we, we love each other. Not another step, I warn you. Cecily, you wouldn't shoot me. You couldn't. Stop. Give me that gun. No. No. Drop it. No, It'll no, you off. want to kill me. Help. 
Shut up. Help me, somebody. He wants to kill me. I'll, I'll help you. Keep out of this. You keep out of it. Go off there. Get back. Back in the mirror where you belong. No, I don't. I don't belong there anymore. You have another image. Get away. Let her go. Let her Gerald. Uh, Gerald. <laughs> He saved you, Cecily. He saved you. Gerald. He's a better man than I am. Who? Look in the mirror. Let me get a doctor. Look in the mirror, in the mirror. Do you see him? Him? I don't see him. Then he's gone too. He's gone. Gerald. They're both gone. Gerald and the image. I know we have the realists in the house and the psychologists who will tell us that they can reduce it all to a matter of the inner self. Split personality. Guilty conscience. Well, to each his own. It could have been an image... Acting independently? Proof, absolute proof is missing for both sides. I'll return in a few minutes. A French philosopher once said, We leave a part of ourselves behind us each day. That's true. But where do we leave it? Sometimes a very close and introspective look in the mirror might help us arrive at the answer. Answers. So much in demand and so short in supply. However, we do have the full answer for your mystery, suspense, and excitement needs right here. Our cast included Alexander Scorby, Laurie March, William Redfield, and Marion Haley. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Perhaps you can try to take up your life again. I must see her, Gordon. See her? That's why I'm here. Why I asked you here. I must see her, Gordon. Gaze upon her lovely face once more. But, but she's buried, buried a week ago, you said. In the family vault... On the Buckingham Estate. I want to go there tonight. Force entry into the vault. Open her coffin. And look at her once more. Just once more. I need you because I... I fear to go alone. There is more to fear than that, Guy. What do you mean? A, a body, dead and buried for a week in a damp and virtually airless vault. Guy, you'll not see Victorine as she was in life. I shall see her. Guy, this is mad. I beg you to... I must! I don't care what she has become. I must see her once more. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. 
fantasy world of a child. All diagonal squiggles of shimmering color. The effervescence of cascading balloons, mint candy sticks and sugar trees, gingerbread houses, and yellow brick roads. Or something dark and terrifying, because the logic of a young mind has no moral strictures yet to shape it. That's what this story is all about. Which is which? Yes, Mr. Charles. I heard you. I knew you wouldn't leave me. Mr. Charles? What does the child mean, Ellen? It's the name she's taken to call in her grandfather. Oh, Lord, take us. She's talking to the corpse. Of course I won't cry anymore now. I promise, Mr. Charles. Yes? I understand. What? Oh, I see. Well, then. Goodbye for now, Mr. Charles. Lysha, child, what are you doing in here? Talking to the dead? <laughs> mystery drama The Providential Ghost was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Beatrice Strait. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Silver Birch Hills is the kind of exclusive community you will find within a comfortable limousine ride of any large American city. Very private people who want to be hermetically sealed in a private world. Huge estates, accumulated wealth, frozen attitudes about life that go back generations. Great for the people who like to think they're the only people, but not so wonderful for little girls of ten full of curiosity and excitement about life, like Felicity Depew Miller, who may never know how lucky she is that she has Ellen Gardner in her life. And, of course, that lovable old recalcitrant grandfather of hers whom she calls Mr. Charles. What's he saying, Mr. Charles? <laughs> I should think he's saying thank you for the peanuts. And isn't it a lovely day since you came along, Felicity? You go again. Don't call me that. <laughs> it's your name. And I hate it. It's a nice name. It means happiness, joy, and good luck. Just the same, I hate it. The way you don't like me to call you Grandpa, or like that. Well, Grandpa and Grandfather makes me sound old and creaky and falling apart. Which you're not. And Felicity makes me feel the same way, which I'm not. <laughs> so you promise to call me Lysha. Uh, yes, I'm your Mr. Charles. Right on. Hmm? That's the thing they say now. Right on. Oh, what's it mean exactly? I don't know. But if you say it, it means you're not no pope, like Aunt Sissy or Aunt Jane. <laughs> well, I don't know how I ever fathered them, but there they are. All right, Lysha. That's better. Mm. See, even the elephant agrees. <laughs> well, animals are smarter and, and nicer than people, especially elephants. Right on, Mr. Charles. Yeah, you made your point. But why Charles when my name is Henry? That's only one of your names. <clears throat> I saw all the others in the big family Bible. Oh, good Lord. Forget those. Still, why Charles? Because Mr. Charles is my panda. Oh, yes, yes, of course. See, Mr. Charles is my very favorite person in all the world. So, that's why when we didn't want to say Grandpa or those other things, I decided you were my real Mr. Charles. Uh, I'm very flattered. <laughs> what should we do next? Hmm? You want foam candy or, or ice cream? You know what I really want, Gra <laughs> Mr. Charles? No, what? I don't really want to go home. Because it isn't like a... A home now. Uh, it's a big, gloomy old barn. I've got to admit that, but still. I liked it enough when Mom and Pop... 
But, but after they, they... They went away, there was just you. Well, now there are your aunts. I hate my aunts. I hate them. Well, dear me. <clears throat> I don't know I altogether blame you, but you do have Ellen and me. I know. And I love you both. It's just I... You what, dear? I just don't want to go back to Lakeview House. But that's your home. Not since Mom and Pop. Aunt Sissy and Aunt Jane say I have to say went away. That isn't how it was. They died. They were drowned. Oh, no. Come, 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 Nasha. Let's not think about that. Hmm? We're out for a nice day at the zoo. Mr. Charles, what's wrong? Nothing, little one. Not a thing. But, but you look all white and, and sort of papery. Oh, that won't do at all. I'll just take a, a magic pill. <laughs> well, you'll see. I'll look all ruddy again. I'm scared, Mr. Charles. Oh, whatever for. If you ever went away like Mom and Pop... I, I don't know what I'd do to be safe. Safe? Just you and Ellen. That's all that keeps me safe. And if you weren't here, maybe Ellen wouldn't. Wouldn't what? Wouldn't be here. So you see, you just can't leave me. Oh, I, I promise you, I never will. Keep quiet, Henry. No, I'm on your damn diet. No booze, no cigarettes, nothing but pap to eat. I can't dilate my arteries just to please you. And call me Charles. Charles? What for? It's the only name that means anything to me. It's what my granddaughter wants to call me. And I like it. Okay, Charles, if you want it. Uh, how long? How long can I live? Oh, how the devil can I answer a silly question like that? I can't die, Elliot. It's, it's Lysha. Lysha? My granddaughter. Oh, Libby's child, Felicity. It's a whole new deal. I'm Charles and she's Lysha. Huh? Whatever you say, uh, Charles. No, I'm going to ask that question again. How long? Okay. The general condition you're in right now, you ought to be in a hospital. You could have another heart attack any day. And the next one's pretty sure to be the last. Well? Well, I have to last long enough to make sure Lysha grows up safe. What are you so worried about Lysha for? She has your housekeeper and your other daughters to bring her up. Oh, Ellen is fine, fine. But Sissy and Jane are something else again. Well, what's the matter with them? They're fine church-going women who would... Who have forgotten, if they ever knew... How to be a child. They're sour as buttermilk. You're too hard on them. Well, maybe, but in turn, I find them too hard on Lysha. If she were left alone with them... Well, as I say, I'll, I'll just have to make sure she isn't. Oh, it really is too bad, Sissy. Missing lunch, and now the tea is getting cold. Well, why don't we just pour, Jane? I think we will. Where do you suppose he is? I don't know. But didn't he have an appointment with Dr. Farnsworth? Well, that was before lunch. Oh, you don't suppose... Oh, nonsense. If anything had happened, of course, we would have been notified by now. Well, just the same, he isn't well. Oh, this isn't his physical health I'm beginning to be concerned about. I, I think he's held out surprisingly well after the last attack. It certainly has surprised me. I thought he'd be gone within a month after Libby. Oh, don't. Don't remind me about her. That's all over and done with, Sissy. But she was my sister. And mine. Now, let's put Libby out of our mind. She's gone forever. Our concern now is with Father. What worries me is that he's slipping in his mind. Papa? Yes. All those silly things like changing Felicity's name and... Allowing her to call him by the name of one of her animals, Mr. Charles, indeed. Well, you know how he is about her. <laughs> yes, indeed. A child can wind him about a little finger, just like her mother. Well, Ellen spoils her, too. Yes. 
Believe me, when Father dies, she will be the next one to go. Felicity needs a firm hand and plenty of control, which I intend to see that she gets for everyone's sake. Oh, uh, you intend to see gets what, Jane? Father! I didn't hear you come in. Uh, I'm like the fog. I creep in on little cat feet. Do you... Do you feel all right? Oh, don't look at me as though I'd flip my wig. The modern expression which means gone out of my mind. Oh, maybe you'd like a little tea, Papa. Good Lord, no. Maybe I'll have a drink instead. Now, you know you're not supposed to drink. Mm. Or have any fun at all, eh, Jane? Well, you know my philosophy. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die. <laughs> at least I can be merry anyway. Where's Lysha? She's been sent to her room and told to go to bed without supper. Why? Now, you know how often I've spoken to her about tracking mud into the house. Well, she did it again today, and when I scolded her, she was unruly and impolite. And she said it didn't matter what I said, that Mr. Charles was the only one who mattered, and he wouldn't punish her. She really is very rebellious, Papa. Well, you can hardly blame her when she gets so little understanding from either of you. I knew it. Taking her part immediately. It's just like Libby all over again. Now, that'll be enough. I don't want to hear any more. I'm going upstairs to Lysha. I suppose you're going to countermand my orders. She has to get a little love from somebody in the family. I, I didn't mean to dirty up the old carpet. Oh, dear, 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 baby. I was just hurrying home to see you, Mr. Charles. Why does she have to be so mean? Well, now, 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 Lysha, you, you don't want to be too hard on Auntie Jane. Yes, I do, because I hate her. Just the way she hates me and she used to hate Mommy. She's the one who should be just like Mommy and Daddy. I wish she was dead. Dead. Oh, honey, honey, that's no way to talk. I have to, because don't. See, Mr. Charles, if you ever, ever went away like Mommy, no, no. Then, then she'd want to get rid of me. <laughs> and Aunt Sissy, too, because she does whatever Aunt Jane says. And then, <laughs> then if, if I was all alone, I, I don't know what I'd have to do. Oh, don't you worry, <laughs> I should. Don't you worry. Even if I had to go away. You trust me to make sure that somehow Mr. Charles would be around to protect you. How can he promise to be around to protect her? And does Lysha need protection, really? Is what she says true of two strict old ladies, or does she fantasize them as witches? A simple enough situation, perhaps, but as you will see, far from it. As the fuse of Mr. Charles' life burns down to the powder keg of buried emotion. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Aisha has been left temporarily to the comforting arms of Ellen, the housekeeper. Mr. Charles sits momentarily exhausted in his great armchair while the pain of the angina recedes from his left arm to a still dull ache in his chest. Another nitroglycerin tablet eases it enough for him to make a phone call for Dr. Farnsworth and now a second call to his lawyer, Mr. Courtley. Arthur, Henry Poindexter. I'm sorry if I'm interrupting your dinner, but this is an emergency. Well, don't ask, just listen. Did you prepare that codicil for my will? Good. Well, I want you to get it over here to me as fast as you can. I said just listen, damn it. Bring someone, Cora or your secretary, I don't care, as a witness. No, no, no. Dr. Farnsworth will be here and he can be the other. For obvious reasons, not my daughter's or Ellen. Yes, yes, I'm I'm waiting to make sure of that right now. Uh, p please come, it, it, it's an emergency. Uh, just a minute. Who is it? 
It's Ellen, Mr. Poindexter. Uh, that's Ellen now, Arthur. I'll, I'll see you in a, in a hurry. Come in, Ellen. Now close the door and, and come in and sit beside me. Oh, Mr. Poindexter, are you all right? No, Ellen, I'm afraid I'm not. Oh. No, 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 no. The doctor's on his way. Let him see what he can do for this heart of mine. I need you to set my mind at rest. Anything I can do, sir, you know that. First, how is Lysha? She's asleep or I wouldn't have left her. I, I got her calmed down some. Mostly it was sheer emotional exhaustion. Uh, she's high strung, like her mother. Well, it, it's that mind of hers. <laughs> you know, it gives me a start sometimes how grown up she is for ten years old. Ellen, I want you to do something for me. If it's in my power. I want you to be Elisha's legal guardian. She's my sole heir. Oh, but what would I have to do? Be responsible for Lysha till she's of age or, or till she gets married. You mean almost like, like I was her mother? I mean, I hope exactly like. Yes, but what about Miss Jane and Miss Sissy? Oh, they'll, they'll be well provided for. And they can always make their home here. I want to, Mr. Poindexter, but... Sure, I don't know what Dennis would have to say. Uh, Dennis? Oh, he's my my intended like. Oh. oh, we've been going together ever since, well, for, for about a year now. We're going to be married in a couple of years when he retires from the force. The force? Oh, he's with the police, plain clothes. Oh, you might remember him when he was here in connection with... Oh. When, when Miss Libby and Mr. George had their accident. Uh. Uh, Sergeant... Dennis Mullaney. I th yes, I think I do. Well, why can't you be married, Ellen? Maybe you could take Lysha to live with you. There'll be plenty of money. Oh, it isn't that. It... Uh, that'll be the doctor or my lawyer. One or the other had better get here soon. I'll go and get the door. No, no. Let someone else. Ellen, I, I have nowhere else to turn. I'm going to name you anyway. No. Mr. Charles, oh, Granddaddy, Mr. Charles. I was so scared you'd gone away and left me. Oh, no, no, no. Now, little one, you know I promise you Mr. Charles will always be around. Oh, you have that papery look again. My father's right inside, Dr. Farnsworth. I had well, no idea. Thank you, Miss Poindexter. Uh, hello, Ellen, Lysha, Henry. Uh... Now, I want all the rest of you out of here, pronto. No, no, don't take him away. Oh, come along, dear. Let the doctor help him. Don't leave me alone with them. Now, Lysha, that's quite enough. If you leave me alone with them, they'll kill me, Mr. George. Miss Felicity. <sighs> Looks as though I may have another patient. Uh, but you first, Henry. <laughs> no, don't worry, Elliot. I won't be leaving this veil of tears yet. Oh, not until I've signed my will anyway. Thank you all for coming to pay your respects. Thank you. The funeral will be tomorrow morning, 11 o'clock, at St. Andrew's Cathedral. Heavens. I hope that's the last of them, Helen. Oh, Mr. Poindexter had, had so many friends. Yes. My father was somebody. But what are you doing downstairs? Why aren't you up with Miss Felicity? Well, I, I was looking for her. I, I was out of the room a moment and she disappeared on now me. Now, look, you were told to stay with her. Mr. Courtley is waiting in the library for the reading of the will. Go and ask Miss Sissy to come down there... And then find Felicity and see she stays put. Yes, ma'am. I'll take care of it. And I'll take care of you, Ellen. Just as soon as the funeral is over, out you go. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Quartley. Miss Poindexter. My sister will be right down, and we can get this ridiculous formality over with. I think under the circumstances that Miss Gardner and Lysha should be here, too. Who? Well, I... Mean Felicity and Ellen. 
Under what circumstances? They are both uh, principles. Ellen! My father made her a legatee? Not precisely. But she must be here. I don't understand, but... But I see no reason for a child of ten to be involved. Well, since Felicity is a minor and her interests will be represented, uh, perhaps we can dispense with her. From your attitude, perhaps you'd like to dispense with me and my sister also. I think at least one of you should be here. Absolutely inexcusable. I can't believe what I've heard. To be left practically unwelcome guests in our own house? At the whim of our former housekeeper? You know, as far as I'm concerned, you're more than welcome. Oh, thank you for your generosity. But will we be received with joyful open arms by our niece? Oh, sure you will, ma'am. Now, you give me the chance. I'll bring her around. You, you can't be seriously considering fostering this madness, accepting the terms of this will. He must have been out of his mind. I assure you he was not. In no sense. I have affidavits from Dr. Farnsworth and two psychiatrists your father insisted on having examined him uh, the day before this will was signed and witnessed. You mean there's nothing I can do about this? In my legal and personal opinion, not a thing. That's something which we shall see about. Well, Ellen, it looks as though you're going to have a rocky time. If there's any way I can help... Oh, I'll manage. And I'll have to talk to you later, Mr. Courtley. Right at the moment, if you'll excuse me. It's Lysha I'm worried about. I, I don't know where she's got to, and she's that upset I've got to find her. I'll walk out with you. You know, this is a tremendous responsibility that's been thrust on you. I think if you have a lawyer or some friend that's close, perhaps you ought to talk it over with... I will, but wait a minute. Yes, Mr. Charles. I hear you. I knew you wouldn't leave me. Mr. Charles. It's what she's taken to call on her grandfather. Oh, the Lord take us. She's in talking to the corpse. Of course I won't cry anymore. Now I... I promise. Yes. I understand. What? Oh, I see. Well, goodbye for now. Lysha, child, what are you doing in here? Just talking to Mr. Charles. Oh, now, come away, dear. This is no place for a little girl. It's all right. I don't have to cry anymore now. What do you mean, now? I mean, now that I know Mr. Charles hasn't really gone away. He just talked to me and told me I shouldn't be afraid. Would you excuse me, please? I have to go upstairs to my room and think about all the things he told me. Is that child all right? I don't know. The three people she loved most in the world, taken away from her in less than a year. I'm not wise enough to know what that might do to the mind of a child, especially one as sensitive as her. What is it, Dennis? You're not eating your dinner. Oh, I'm sorry. It's just, there's so much on my mind. Well, I thought we were after settling that. I mean, you being guardian and all, I told you it's all right with me. I know, Denny. It's sweet you were about it, too. It isn't that swarrying me for the moment. Well, what then, sweetie? Well, I, I don't even know if I should be away from her tonight. Well, sure, it's your regular day off, isn't it? Oh, yes, but I don't know if I should have left Lysha alone. Yes, Mr. Charles. I understand. No, I'm not scared. I'll do just what you tell me. Yes? I know just where to get it. And do what? Oh, sure, that's easy. Mm-hmm, just like magicians do. But what about Auntie Jane? Okay, just like you say. One thing at a time. Goodbye, Mr. Charles. I love you, too. Come in. I'm not asleep. Oh, 
Well, here's that nice cup of chocolate I promised you before you went to bed. Thank you, Aunt Sissy. Did you bring one for yourself, too? Oh, yes. We can have a little party. There, now, that's yours. And I'll put mine on the table beside it. I don't really like chocolate all that much. Oh, now you have to drink it. Could you get Mr. Charles for me? M- M- Mr. Charles? Oh, oh, I didn't mean Grandfather. He's passed on now. I mean the other Mr. Charles. I left him in the bathroom. Oh, oh, of course, dear. Your big woolly panda. I'll get him right away. Only he's not. I'm talking to you, Mr. Charles. My real Mr. Charles. I'm doing what you said now. There we are. Mr. Charles in person. You suppose he'd like some nice hot chocolate, too? He doesn't like it much, either. Oh, well, then let's just show him how good it is. Hey, you drink it all down, dear. I I made it especially for you. You drink all yours, and I'll drink all mine. It's a deal. Well, Sissy, did you have your chocolate with Felicity? Yes. How did it go? Well, I can't believe it. It, No problem at all. I'm so relieved. Oh, yes. I'm glad Ellen's night out gave us the chance. Maybe we're getting somewhere with Felicity after all. Wouldn't that be nice? It would solve everything. Yes, yes. Well, what is it, Miss Jane? Oh, it's Sissy. It's my sister. Call Dr. Ponsworth. At six in the morning. I don't care if it's the middle of the night. Get him here. Get the hospital. Get someone. I think she's dead. Now, what is going on at Lakeview House? What hallucinations can a child of ten have? How real and sharp can they be? How terrible might their power of suggestion be? If Mr. Charles is a real ghost, or only a figment of the imagination, could a child be responsible for someone's death? I'll return shortly with Act Three. bedroom, Sissy Poindexter lies dead. Lysha has been mercifully packed off to school as usual to protect her, however briefly, from this new shock. And among the unexpected visitors at the house are Sergeant Dennis Mullane and, of course, Dr. Farnsworth. Well, Doctor? No question, Miss Jane, as to the cause of death. Cardiac failure. But that's impossible. It's been a long time since I examined either of you. I think perhaps I should do an autopsy, if you'll give me permission. No. Why not? I will not have the body of my sister desecrated. It might help to know why she had cardiac failure. How? Would it bring her back? No. No, let well enough alone, Dr. Farnsworth. This family has a curse on it. Leave us to handle it in our own way. Now, uh, why do you suppose she's all that vehement about it? Who are you? Oh, I'm sorry. Sergeant Dennis Mullane. You remember we met on the sad occasion of the drowning of Miss Poindexter's young sister, little Elijah's mother, and her father. And that Ellen and me are engaged to be married. Of course, yes. What are you doing here today? Well, like I say, Ellen and I are engaged, so naturally I had a particular interest. And then again... Are you hinting at anything? I don't know. Why should you want an autopsy? I can give you the same answer. I don't know, for sure. Are you going to issue a death certificate without one? I reckon. No real reason why I shouldn't. Could you hold it off till tomorrow? I don't know if I want to. Why should I? Well, let's be frank, Doctor. For whatever our own reasons, we both think there's more here than meets the eye. I need a little time to trace a couple of things. I'm going to sign the death certificate. Heart failure. It happens even as early as 50. You got any more to say? Yeah. 
Let it go till tomorrow. You can sign it then. There's nothing to lose. But you're not like yourself at all, Denny. I, I don't know why you have to ask all these questions. Sure, it's only to protect us all. So what about that bottle? It was only a prescription the doctor gave to be filled for Mr. Poindexter. Was it digitalis? Or something like that. Uh, just before he died, he'd gotten a whole new bottle of pills? Yes, I, I picked them up myself. Mm, and after he died, was the bottle still there? Of course. When I cleaned up his room, I put it in the drawer by the bed. Is it there now? I suppose. Well, it's not. It's here. You took it from the drawer. I did not. I found it in the pocket of Miss Cicely Poindexter's dressing gown. But what would it be doing there? Well, now, that's what I asked myself, since it's empty. Did you know that digitalis is in an overdose is a fatal poison for anyone, heart case or no? No. And didn't you tell me that Miss Sissy and the little girl had chocolate together last night? Didn't she tell you that? Yes. The pills would dissolve very easily in a hot drink, and they'd have no taste. Not in chocolate, anyway. But sweet Mary herself, what are you trying to say? That Lysha might have had something to do with it? A childless hen? I, I'll not believe such a thing of my little Lysha. Well, I don't want to either, Ellen. If Miss Sissy didn't die of natural causes... And before any of us can be really happy and free again, we're going to have to pin down just how she did die. Well, what are you going to do? I'm going to go right out on a limb the way I should have a year ago. I'm going to get enough equipment to drag the lake. <laughs> If it hadn't been Aunt Sissy, it might have been me. But who should I tell? Okey Smokey, I'll just hang tight till you get back to me. Oh, there you are, Felicity, dear. I was looking for you. What for? Why, Ellen has to drive in and do some shopping, and she thought perhaps you'd like to ride with her. That's funny. What is, dear? Ellen just told me she was going to have a bit of a lie-down. A what? A lie-down. That's what she says when she means a nap. Oh, well, she's changed her mind. She's down in the car in the small garage. She was just starting it up, and I was telling her some last-minute things, and all of a sudden, she thought you might like to go along. Oh, I would. Well, then, let's go down to her. I have something else to arrange. Is it just to Poulter's farm? Oh, no. You'll be going further than that. Quite a long way, in fact. I don't care. I don't care if we never get that. Such a nice thing to say, Felicity. And you know something? What? Neither do I. She shouldn't let the car run with the garage door closed. At school, in safety first, they told us it's dangerous. There's a gas that could kill a person. Why? The things they teach you at school nowadays. But they're perfectly correct, Felicity. It's exactly what it's going to do. You pushed me. You scraped my knee. Don't worry. Soon it won't hurt at all. Nothing will hurt you anymore, Felicity. <laughs> going somewhere, Ellen? Oh, Miss Poindexter. Well, yes, I, I just wanted to see if Lysha was all right. Well, you won't have to worry about Felicity or Lysha, as you call her, anymore. What do you mean? I, I'd better go to her. I know. It's too soon. <gasps> that, that's a pistol. That's just what it is. And pointed at you, Ellen. Oh, what for? Oh, don't be alarmed. As long as you do, as you're told. You see, you're not mistress of this house. No matter what the will said, I am. So back up, into the room, and sit down. I, I don't understand. And while we're waiting, I'll try to make it all quite clear. May, make what clear? What we're waiting for, of course. Miss Jane, you really... Shh. Quite still. Uh, and don't think I'll be afraid to shoot. I have before, you know, when I killed Felicity's mother, Libby, with this gun. And her weakling of a husband. Oh, 
killed them. But, but they were drowned in an accident. Yes, that's what everyone thought. Just as I told Sissy we could make them think. You remember that day, don't you? Oh, I'll never forget it. I was away with Lysha at dancing school when we heard... Quite right. Father was in bed with his first heart attack. And I just found out about his will. Oh, it didn't surprise me that Libby was to get almost everything. She was always the favorite. From the time she was a baby, Libby was the center of everything. Libby always came first. Oh, Miss Jane, don't do this to yourself. Don't... Shut up! Now, you listen to me if no one else will. When it came to the point, <laughs> I couldn't stand it anymore. It was all so easy. <laughs> two shots. George and Libby even had the sails up. Two shots. Two shots was all I needed. It was to help stay off, and the wind was blowing offshore, away from the house. I locked them in the cabin. I lashed the teller and shoved them off. There was a nice quartering wind to carry them on a reach straight out to the middle of the lake where they sank without a trace. Because before I shoved them off, I'd taken care to remove the bilge drain plug. Her gunners were awash within a quarter of a mile and she went down like a stone to bury both and them under 30 feet of mud and silt on the bottom of the lake. <laughs> a perfect murder. Oh, dear Lord. But it was all for nothing. <laughs> Felicity just took Libby's place in father's love. So, when the will cut us out again, she had to go. You tried to, to do away? Yes. Oh, it should have been so simple. All the rest of father's pills and a cup of chocolate. Oh, but I should never have allowed Sissy to handle it. She's always bungled everything, clumsy little fool. She must have mixed up the cups. Then it... And it wasn't a heart attack, you... Where's Lysha now? Well, what have you done to her? I haven't done anything. Carbon monoxide will do that for me. I don't understand. She's locked in your little garage. The connecting door to the house needs a key. The overhead door is far too heavy for her to lift. And the car is running. Oh, mother of God, don't look so stricken, Ellen. A very gentle way to die. Come on, you old door. I can't. I can't open it. Oh, Mr. Charles, where are you when I need you? Now, 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 don't get panicky, Elijah. You know I'm always around. It's getting awfully hard to breathe. And I feel so sleepy. We'll soon fix that. The way we did before. You mean when I switched the chocolate cup? Something like that. Now, think. You remember the day we came back from the zoo and I forgot my house keys so we couldn't get through the garage door to the house? Yes. Oh, yes. The extra key under the doormat. That's right. Take that and open the door, and then be sure to close it tight behind you. I will, Mr. Charles. You're going to hide till Aunt Jane comes down here. And as soon as she does, you go let Ellen out of her bedroom, and the two of you take my car and run for your lives. <laughs> Lysha? Shh. How did you escape? With the key. Mr. Charles told me where to find it. And he said we should take his car and run. Well, that's just what we're going to do. Your Aunt Jane is a raven lunatic, and she has a pistol into the bargain. Felicity. Felicity. <laughs> As if she could hear me. But where is she? Not in this corner. Under the car. No. She couldn't have escaped. What's that? Who shut the door? Got to get the key. Open the door. Go! Oh! Oh! It isn't there! Oh, 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 oh,
go punch. What's the matter? Someone, someone's holding it outside. Who's it got? I can't, I can't see. Certainly. Probably there was no other way Jane Poindexter could have been brought to book. There was small chance of Libby and the boat ever being found. And what proof was there that the digitalis had ever been in the cocoa cup since Sissy was careful to wash them both out? As for the rest, it would only have been Ellen's word against Jane. Which leaves only a couple of questions that I'll try to answer when I return. What happens to you at 10 can color your life. But a child also has amazing recuperative powers and the capacity to forget. Growing up as Dennis and Ellen's child, for they adopted her as soon as they were married, there were too many sunny days in Lysha's life for any dark corners to remain. One thing she never did forget, and that was her beloved Mr. Charles. As for Mr. Charles, was he only an echo of the common sense he had taught his granddaughter? Or was he a real and most providential ghost? included Beatrice Strait, Hetty Galen, Bryna Rayburn, Court Benson, and Gilbert Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I would have to make an investment. Would it be a wise investment? Yes, I think so. Why don't you do it? I can't. I don't have the money. Paul, is it a lot of money? Well, it is to me. I don't have it. Darling, we will have lunch together tomorrow. How much money? $10,000. 10000 Well, it's, a, it's for an initial startup expense. Paul, I have $10,000. Oh, no, I wouldn't touch your money. My money? Paul, there's nothing I own that, that isn't yours. But I couldn't... You're not used to sharing with another person either. I could lose this money. Pick me up for breakfast, and we'll go to the bank. But... I don't want to hear another word. Just tell me you love me. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. 
We call ourselves modern, don't we? We say these are modern times. The years past are prehistoric or ancient or medieval. We say with some pride that we are modern, as though we'd smartened up considerably and discarded old, worn-out, discredited theories and practices. Yet our medicine has its roots in antique magic, and our science has its origins in archaic superstition. Without magic and superstition, it is unlikely we could have survived to become modern. She has everything. A loveliness to take your breath away. She has sweetness and gaiety. But she has something else. I don't know what it is. She has a wild talent. She's always had it. But what is it, a wild talent? No one knows precisely. Except those, perhaps, who take the trouble to learn. Our mystery drama, The Red Frisbee, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Robert Dryden. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Luden's Medicated Cough Drops. I'll be back shortly with Act One. One of the Earth's loveliest seas is the Caribbean. In a gentle curve on the bosom of that sea lie the islands known as the Antilles. A man has come to one of these islands not only for the brilliant sky, the soft sands, the hot sun, and the cooling winds, but for the quiet and the isolation that only an island can give. What he finds there, we will tell you in this tale. I'd come to the island after three years spent with an aboriginal tribe in the interior of Australia. I needed to relax and reflect and try to sort out the ideas I wanted to incorporate into my article for the Anthropological Journal and later expand into a book. With me, I brought my voluminous notes, a suitcase full of old clothes, and my dog. Haven't you had enough? Okay, okay, one more time. Okay, fetch! Ha, 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 good dog. He's so beautiful. What? He's beautiful. Oh, well, thank you. Have you always had him? Sure, since he was a puppy. He's been all over the world with me. We just spent three years in Australia together before we came here. Look, here he comes. What's he got in his mouth? Oh, that's a frisbee. A what? A frisbee. You know, one of those round plastic things that you throw, you know. Oh, no, I don't know. I never had a frisbee. Oh, well, they're kind of fun. They go sailing through the air. All right, drop it, boy. Drop it. Oh, he doesn't want to. <laughs> he knows he looks handsome with a red frisbee in his mouth. With his black hair and all. What kind of dog is he? Labrador Retriever. All right, drop it, boy. Good boy. That's enough now. I'll throw it again for him. I like to see him swim with it in his mouth. He looks so beautiful. Okay. Fetch! <laughs> oh, he's a good swimmer, isn't he? Oh, yes. Will he swim out very far? Well, as far as I can throw the frisbee, I guess. That's wonderful. You like to swim? I can't. You can't swim? You live on this wonderful island and you can't swim? I used to be able to. What happened? I forgot how. You forgot? Yes. Oh, here he comes with his red frisbee. Well, how could you forget? I just forgot. Oh, look. He wants you to throw it for him again. Well, you do this all day if I throw it for him. And would he swim very far out? Mm, I suppose he would. All dogs can swim, I guess. No, not right away. They have to be taught. Like people? Not exactly, but they have to be made to realize that they can. That's about what it amounts to, I guess. They don't always know that they can. They're as surprised as anybody when they find out. 
That's fascinating. Are you going to throw the frisbee again? No, I think he's had enough for today. We both have. Will you uh, be coming back tomorrow? Yeah, I imagine so. Maybe I'll see you here. That would be nice. Well, bye, Ben. Bye. Hey, hey, uh, w- wait a minute. Uh, you, young lady. What? How did you know my name? See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. I watched her swinging off down the beach. I judged she might be about 17, though she could as well have been 12 or 20. She wore a sort of shapeless smock. Her legs were a ruddy brown from the sun, and her hair was streaked in shades of gold. I remembered her eyes, which were the startling blue of Delft China. I heard again her clear young voice calling, Goodbye, Ben. See you tomorrow. And the next day, I was on the beach early in the morning. Not now, boy. No, no, no. We're waiting for someone. Well, what is it, boy? Hey, 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 what are you doing? Where are you going? Come back here. He'd seen her before I did, before she rounded the curve in the shoreline. Or had he simply sensed her coming? Or what? At any rate, there she was, swinging down the beach toward me. Hello. Hello there. You're out early. So are you. I didn't keep you waiting, did I? No, I'd have waited all day. Oh, you wouldn't have had to do that. I knew you were here. I had to do something for my mother first. How did you know I was here? I knew. But how? The way a person knows those things. <laughs> but people don't just know those things. Don't they? Oh, you saw me from your house. Where do you live? Do you have a place on the beach? Oh, no. We live in the great house. What's the great house? <laughs> it's just a house. They call it the great house because it used to be where the governor lived. The Spanish governor? Long time ago. Ben, aren't you going to throw the red frisbee for the dog? See, he wants you to. How did you know my name is Ben? I guess you told me. I never told you. You never asked. I never told you, but when you left yesterday, you said goodbye, Ben. Why don't you throw the frisbee? Ben is my name. But you had no way of knowing that. My name I is... really don't care what your name is. May I throw the red frisbee? Sure, go ahead if you want to. I do want to. There. There, fetch, boy. Why, he does swim beautifully. What's your name? Nikki. You told me yesterday that dogs had to learn how to swim. Now, what I said was they have to find out that they can swim. I guess that's true of people, too. Probably we can all swim, but we have to find out at some time or other that we can. It's quite a discovery for a person or a dog. How did your dog find out he can swim? Well, it was when we were in Australia. I made a weekend trip to the Great Barrier Reef, and of course I took him along. I was sitting on the beach with him, the way we're sitting now, and I had this red frisbee, the same one I have now, and I threw it into the water. And he plunged in after it and brought it back. Next time, I threw it further, and he brought it back. I'd never thrown it so far that he couldn't stand up in the water. But then I did. I threw it way out, out to where the water was over his head. But he went after it? Oh, yes. And he got to about three feet away from it, and all of a sudden his feet didn't touch bottom anymore. But he stretched his neck out and grabbed the frisbee anyway between his teeth. And he tried to turn around to bring it back to me, and that was when he found out he couldn't touch bottom. And he started to swim? Not yet. He sank under the water. Oh, no. He came up again right away. He looked so surprised, and then he went under again. What did you do? Did you just stand there? He went down for the third time, and I started in after him. I should hope. But before I got to him, he started to swim, paddling away like mad. You know the way dogs do? Oh, I know. And there was such a look in his eyes, such a look of triumph, belief in himself. It was as though his ancestors from way back, hundreds of thousands of years ago, had whispered to him somehow down the ages as though they'd said... You know how you can do it. And he did it. I've never forgotten that. That's a beautiful story, Benedict. It's true. 
What did you call me just now? I, I don't know. Yes, you do. You called me Benedict. Yesterday, you called me Ben. Well, that could be a lucky guess, but Ben is usually short for Benjamin. And my name is Benedict. And that's what you called me. Well, if that's your name... Yes, but how did you know? How could you know that? You're kind of hurting my arm. Oh, I'm sorry. Ben, would you like to meet my mother? I'd like you to. All right. Anytime. Will you come this afternoon for tea? I'd love to. Ask anybody where the great house is. Everybody knows the great house. All right. Oh, and Benedict, be sure to bring your dog with you. It was easy to see why it had been called the great house. The woodwork was solid mahogany and carved. The doors were mahogany, too, nearly six inches thick. The rooms were large and square and full of sunlight. The girl, Nikki, met me at the door and took me to her mother. A beautiful woman with the same dealt blue eyes. This is Benedict, Mother. And this is his dog. I'm so glad, Mrs. Oh, why don't you call me Monica? Since you and Nikki are such good friends, we're very informal here. Oh, well, thank you. Ben, may I take the dog down to the beach? Nikki, please. I just want to throw the red frisbee for him. Please, Nikki. May I, Ben? Well, if you want to. I won't stay long. I, uh... I hope you don't think my daughter's rude. She has strange ways, but she's a good girl. She's a wonderful girl. Oh? You think so? Mm. She has everything. She has a... A loveliness that takes your breath away. Yes, she is lovely. She has sweetness and gaiety. Yes. But she has something else. I don't know what that is. You don't? Do you? She has a wild talent. A... a what? A wild talent. Well, what is that? What is a wild talent? No one knows precisely. Except perhaps... Those who take the trouble to learn. All talent is wild, really. It comes from heaven knows where. It cannot be coaxed or bribed or bought. It cannot be cultivated. It cannot be manufactured or in any way acquired. But no matter where it comes from or in whom it resides, talent is never a tame thing. It is always wild, as the winds are wild, as the seas are wild, as the world was, in its beginnings, and as it remains at its core, wild. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. sands the color of a ripe peach on an island in the blue waters of the Caribbean Sea. Benedict has met a girl called Nikki, who lives with her mother in a stately home called the Great House. Nikki has persuaded Benedict to come to the Great House to meet her mother, but no sooner had introductions been made than she asked to be excused to take Benedict's dog to the beach, leaving Benedict alone with her mother. I hope you don't think my daughter rude. She has a wild talent. Uh, a wild talent? Is that what you said? You've never heard of such a thing? Oh, I can't say I have. What is a wild talent? Oh, no one knows precisely. If you take the trouble to find out. Well, what is it? Is it? Is it mystical? Is it magical? Would it help if I said that it had something to do with extrasensory perception? Thought transference? Did your daughter tell you that she knew my name without my ever having mentioned it? No, she didn't tell me. But then she wouldn't. And not only that, she called me Ben, which is my nickname. And the next day she called me Benedict, my given name. Suppose she was lucky in guessing that I'm generally called Ben. She could have assumed it was the diminutive of Benjamin, a pretty common name. But she didn't. She called me Benedict... A fairly uncommon name. I'm surprised she didn't mention it to you. 
Nikki's very casual about such things. She takes them for granted. But does she think that everyone is so so intuitive? Doesn't she realize that she is somehow different? I don't think she gives it any thought at all. Tell me, has she always had this wild talent? She never showed any sign of it. At least none that I noticed until two years ago. Uh, until... Yes? Until her brother died. Oh. Oh, she didn't tell me. I, uh, I didn't know she'd had a brother. He was drowned. Oh, I am sorry. Well, my goodness, you were invited here for tea and I've never given you any. Oh, that's quite all right. No, no, I'll put the water on right away. It won't take but a minute. There's no hurry. Nikki? Oh. Oh, it's you. Your mother's in the kitchen. She'll be right back. She... Nikki, are you all right? You look a little... You're not feeling ill or anything, are you? I'm all right. <laughs> well, did you two have a good time with the red frisbee? Oh, yes. I threw it very far out. Well, fine. Tea will be ready shortly. Uh, Nikki's back. Nikki? Nikki, uh, go upstairs immediately and lie down. The tide turned. Go upstairs, take a hot bath, and lie down in your room. Yes, Mother. You see, the tide turned, and I, I had to come back. I'm sorry, Benedict. What's the matter with her? She said the tide turned. It was when the tide turned that her brother drowned. Benedict, I don't think we can have our tea today, but come back tomorrow, will you? And I'll explain what she meant when she said the tide turned. I wasn't sure that I'd see Nikki on the beach the next morning. She looked so pale, so ill when she returned to the great house the previous afternoon, as though she'd seen a ghost, would be the way some people would have described it. And from the little I'd learned of her brother's death, I thought this might indeed be true. Nevertheless, I went to the beach at my accustomed early hour in the company of my dog carrying in his mouth his beloved red frisbee. The dog looked up suddenly, just as he had the day before. The frisbee dropped onto the sand, and he started his gallop down the sand. I knew then that Nikki would soon come into sight. And so she did, her loose smock blowing in the wind, her brown legs carrying her confidently, almost arrogantly, toward me. Hi, Benedict. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. I'm glad. Where's the red frisbee? He wants you to throw it. Oh, it's here. May I throw it for him? Certainly. Fetch. Fetch, boy. How's your mother? <laughs> oh, she's fine. I'm sorry you didn't get any tea yesterday. Oh, that's all right. She thought she should look after me. Did you do what she said? Did you take a hot bath and lie down in your room? Of course. That's what I always do. Nikki. Does the turning of the tide always upset you? It turns at different times, you know. Sometimes it's rather gentle, and sometimes it isn't gentle at all. Well, that depends on the sun and the moon. Does it? It's because of the attraction of the sun and the moon that the tides ebb and flow. They act unequally on the waters of the earth. They disturb their equilibrium. Do you understand? All I know is that here they happen quickly. Suddenly. There's no warning. Well, that's because... Well, never mind why it is. I wouldn't understand it anyway. I'm not clever like you. All I know is that when the tide goes out so fast... So fast. One hardly has time. Oh, here he is. With his red frisbee. May, may I throw it again? Of course. Mitch! <laughs> Nikki, uh... Did you like my mother? Very much. Not a pity I had to spoil everything. You didn't spoil anything. Oh, yes, I did. No, no. As a matter of fact, she invited me to come back today for tea. And I accepted. And you do like her. I told you I... Because I know she likes you. Did she say so? 
No, uh, not, not in those words, but I, I know she does. Now, just how would you know a thing like that, hmm? Do you think I have to be told things in order to know them? Or read them in a book? People often tell things that are not true, and books can be wrong. But when you know... Well, then you know. That afternoon at the great house, things went almost exactly as they had the day before. Nikki greeted me, then greeted my dog, then said... Did you bring the red frisbee with you? Of course. We never go anywhere without it. Mother will be down in a minute. She knows you're here. May I take the dog to the beach and throw the frisbee for him? Well, if you want to, but... I do want to. Nikki, where are you going? To the beach. I wish you'd stay. I... I am sorry, Ben. Oh, that's all right. She enjoys the dog. Let her. Well, she's forever doing this. Doing what exactly? Bringing men home to meet me and leaving us alone. Men of all ages, all nationalities. I think she wants to marry me off or something. <laughs> that shouldn't be hard, provided you wanted to cooperate. After my son was drowned, I, I was very melancholy for a long time very long time. I shut myself in my room, wouldn't talk to anyone for almost a year. Finally, my husband grew tired of a wife who was no wife at all, and he left. Oh, I'm sorry. I wish I could have been. Actually, I didn't care. Well, now, let's have our tea, shall we? This time I have it all ready for you. And some little cakes. Oh, splendid. I'm hungry. I spent a long time on the beach today, and it gave me quite an appetite. <laughs> well, help yourself. Lemon or milk? Ah, uh, a little milk, please. Nikki informed me on the beach this morning that you like me. Well, I do. Here's your tea. Thank you. I asked her if you'd said so, and she said no, that... She just knew. As usual, her instincts are right. She has a great contempt for things that are learned and a great devotion to things which are simply known. I've never been quite sure just what she means. Why can't she swim? Oh, well, she used to swim quite well. What happened? Did it have something to do with the tides, with the turning of the tide? It had everything to do with the turning of the tide. I'm curious. Living on an island, one would think she would... But if you don't want to tell me... I've never talked about it since it happened. But since it happened, Nikki hasn't been able to swim. Not a stroke. She's tried, poor child, but she just can't. She says she's forgotten how. Oh, can one forget a thing like that? I thought it was something once learned, never forgotten. Nikki forgot how to swim the day her brother was drowned. They'd gone in the ocean together on a beautiful day, just like this one. Well, if, if you don't want to talk about no, it... No, I do, per... I do. They swam out to where some rocks jutted out into the sea. And they played on the rocks for a while sunned themselves, went back into the water again. It was then, just then, that the tide turned. It started to go out? The tides turn suddenly down here. They can catch you unawares. At first, they laughed. And really, they laughed, so Nikki told me later. But as the receding tide grew stronger, they stopped laughing and clung to the rocks... They started shouting for help. No one. No one. Please, don't go They on. grew weaker and it grew harder to hold on to the slippery rocks. The tide grew stronger and... At last, my son let go. And the tide started to carry him out to sea. Nikki swam after him, but she couldn't quite reach him. And then... And then... Please. Some natives who had just beached their boat saw them, and they knew immediately what had happened. They went out after them. They reached them. At least they reached Nikki. They hauled her into the boat. And then they turned to save her brother. 
but it was too late. He'd gone under. He never came to the surface again. There was so little I could say when Monica finished her tragic story. I got up to go, sickened by the inadequacy of my own limp words. But at the door, she said, Come back tomorrow, will you, Benedict? Come early? If you want me to. I do. I do. Tomorrow morning. I need to talk to you. You think you've heard everything, but there's more. Oh, there's more. been a guest in a house far grander, far more beautiful than your own. Perhaps it overlooked the bluest of seas and flowers grew all around it. Palms and pines and little yellow birds that perched on their branches. And perhaps you thought to yourself, how could anyone ever be unhappy in such a house? Well, as our story has intimated and will later reveal, anyone can. I'll return shortly with Act Three. On a Caribbean island, in her home called the Great House, the woman called Monica has been telling Benedict the tragic story of the drowning of her son two years before. The boy's sister, Nikki, had been saved. Unable to go on with the tragic tale, Benedict took his leave. The next morning, I took my dog to the beach, proudly carrying his red frisbee in his mouth. I was prepared to wait for Nikki to appear around the bend in the shoreline, but I found her waiting for me, staring intently out to sea. Oh, there you are. Oh, here we are. I want to talk to you. Well, how about him? He wants you to throw the frisbee for him. Later I will. I, I have to tell you something. What's that? My mother loves you. Oh, now, Nikki, you couldn't possibly know a thing like that. I do know it. It's impossible. We've only met twice. But you're going to see her again this morning. She told me. Well, she... She wants to talk to me about something. She loves you. It's impossible. We hardly know each other at all. What difference does that make? She hasn't loved anyone for two years. And now she loves you, and you... What about me? You... Do you love her? What do you think? I don't know. What's happened to your wild talent? Oh, that. That's what your mother calls your way of knowing what other people are thinking and feeling. Everybody wants to give names to things. They think once they've given something a name, they've got it pinned down. Like your dog. He's not really a dog. He's what he is. And he wouldn't be any less than what he is if we called him something else. Or didn't call him anything at all. So why call having feelings about people a wild talent? Why call it anything? I think I see what you mean. Uh, look, it's time for me to go see your mother. You want to come with me? I, I think I'd rather stay here with your dog. I'll, I'll throw the frisbee for him. See, he wants me to. All right. And when you get tired of that, come to the great house. Maybe I will. I walked slowly to the great house, not really knowing that I wanted to hear the end of Monica's story. She'd been so distressed the day before. But I'd given my word, and when she admitted me, she seemed composed and cordial. Thank you for coming, Benedict. Well, I said I would. Well, where's your big black dog? I'm used to seeing you two together. I left him on the beach with Nikki. Did she say anything to you this morning about... about me? Well... Did she? Please tell me. She said... I don't know where the notion came from. I'm sure not from you. She said that you... you were fond of me. She said more than that, didn't she? 
Yes. She said that you loved me. Yes, she told me that, too, that I loved you. I'm sorry, Ben. I hope it didn't embarrass you. Not really. You see, ever since her brother's death and her father's desertion, she's been trying to find someone for me to love, someone to replace the loss. She brings men to the house the way you'd bring gifts to someone who was ill. That's very sweet. Sweet, yes, but futile. Well, now, I told you yesterday that I had more to tell you about about the day my son was drowned. Monica, it must be painful for you to talk about... No, it's not the drowning I want to talk about. No? It's what came after. When the natives came to this house. Uh, One of them came into the room, this room. And he told me about the turning of the tide. About the children clinging to the rocks. About the letting go. About setting out in the boat to save them. And I waited, of course, to hear that they'd been rescued. There was a silence for a few seconds. And then the man said, The girl is alive, ma'am. And I said, What about the boy? And there was another silence. And then he said, Ma'am, the boy was drowned. And I stared at him. I was filled with horror and shock. Terrible shock. Oh, of course. And then I course. heard myself say... I heard myself. The words simply just burst from me. I never meant... But I said it. Not gently. Not softly. It was a cry from my heart. I said... Oh, why did it have to be the boy? Oh, my... No, wait. You haven't heard it all. You haven't heard the worst. I heard myself saying those terrible words, and then... Then I looked up, and standing in the doorway was... Nikki. Nikki, my daughter. And the look on her face. The stricken look on her young face. She couldn't have misunderstood what I meant... But if one of them had to be saved and one had to die, why couldn't it have been the boy who was saved? Why couldn't she have been the one to die? What can I say? What can anyone say? I've tried to atone for my awful words. There is no atoning. I said them. I meant them when I said them. And she knew. What has happened is that Nikki has been trying to give me back my son in some way. Any way. Any man who was attracted to her, and many have been, she's brought to me. Laid them at my feet, so to speak, offering them to me as though she were the guilty one because she lived while her brother died. Oh, uh, that's Nikki at the door with my dog. She said she might... Well, shall I let her in, or shall I tell her to wait or go back to the beach? Tell her to go back. I, I can't. Not right now. Of course. Where's Nicky, boy? It's just the dog. Nicky's not with him. Where would she be? I left her with the dog at the beach. Uh, Monica, the dog's telling us something. Well, Nicky, where is Nicky? Come on, let's go to the beach. not here. What are you looking for? The red frisbee. What for? I don't know. Except she said she was going to stay here and throw it for the dog. Well, why would she have changed her mind? Why did the dog come to the house without her? Could she have gone someplace else? Where? Why? She'd have taken the dog with her. Ben, I see something. What? Out there in the water. Uh, it could be. Nikki can't swim. I'm going in. It could be her. I'm going to fetch a boat. Uh, one of the fishermen. Hurry, I know. if that's Nikki, she's pretty oh, far out. I see a out. boat, I see a boat. Help! Help! The fishermen with their boat got to her before I did, and it was they who saved her. When the doctor had been called, treated her for exhaustion, ordered her to bed, and left, Monica joined me downstairs in the drawing room of the great house. 
she's going to be all right. Yes. Thank God. In a few days... Benedict? Yes, Monica? Nikki was right. I do love you. Because I saved your daughter? No, I didn't do that. The natives did. I loved you before that. Nikki knew it right away. Oh, that wasn't love. It may have seemed like love, but it wasn't. You felt gratitude. You felt relief. Because after two years, you told me the story of the drowning and all that it came after. You trusted me to understand, and I think I did. There's a feeling that mothers have for their sons that's unlike any other. It's the closest thing to pure love that a woman can feel. Now, I don't know why this should be so, but it's so. No. No, you don't love me, Monica. Now, now I'd like to go up and say goodbye to Nikki. You're leaving? Mm-hmm. Going back to the mainland. I hope you'll come back one day. Oh, I shall. I shall. Hello. You knew who it was, didn't you? Of course. I'm leaving tomorrow, Nikki. I came to say goodbye. Oh. When are you coming back? Oh, next year, after I've done some writing. You knew I'd come back, didn't you? Of course. Nikki, when I swam out to try and save you... You didn't really have to do that, you know. I was afraid you'd drown. But I was swimming. You can't swim. You told me. I was swimming. Not very well. But I was swimming. It came back to me. Why did you swim so far out? When they picked you up, the water was way over your head. I had to. Nikki, were you trying to drown yourself? I told you. I was swimming. Yeah, but so far out... I was looking for my brother. Nikki, you must have known you couldn't find your brother. I had to try. I've been trying for so long to give her something. Someone. I couldn't. It's not up to you, Nikki. Your mother has to find someone to love who loves her. She has to do that by herself. But if... If I could do it for her, she'd... She'd forgive me. Forgive you for what? For... I don't know. For... For being alive? I guess so. Yes. Nobody has to be forgiven for that, Nikki. It's not a sin to be alive. Are you sure? I'm very sure. Nikki, when I was swimming out to try and rescue you, I found something floating on the water. I found this. Oh, why, it's the red frisbee. The waves should have brought it back to shore. Why didn't they? Because, because I kept it with me. It's how I learned to swim again. Remember, you told me how your dog found out he could swim? How you... Kept throwing the frisbee further and further until he was over his head. And how it came to him all of a sudden that he could swim. Well, that's what I did. I kept throwing the frisbee out further and further and... Suddenly it came to me. I could swim. And then it was just like you said about the dog. I felt so... So triumphant. I believed in myself. Nikki, I have to go now. Ben, you love me, don't you? Now, how did you know that? I just knew. You haven't lost your wild talent after all, have you? Oh, that. It's a beautiful thing to have a wild talent. I suppose so. Do you, uh... Do you by any chance love me? I don't know. Not yet. Maybe it'll come to you. 
I hope when it does, you'll discover that you do love me. Next year, when you come back, then I'll know. While I was packing, the dog sat watching me, the red frisbee in his mouth. There was always a chance we might go back to the beach again. And I thought, what will Nikki say a year from now? Will she say, yes, she loves me? A warm feeling swept over me, a, a certainty that she would. A bright glow of anticipation. She loves me even now, I thought. She just needs time to find it out. What do you think, I said to my dog. And he dropped the red frisbee on the floor, stood up on his hind legs and licked my face. Was he trying to tell me that I would still have his love, even if I couldn't have hers? Or was he telling me that I was right? That I, too, had a wild talent? Does a wild talent live in each of us? Can we stop trying to be so clever, so learned, so successful and return somehow to what we call primitive? To the style of living where our feelings count for more than our brains. Where our feelings count for everything if they are free and tuned to the world we inhabit and the creatures that inhabit it with us. Once again, I can only ask the question... I do not have the answer. I'll be back shortly. They say that when Gertrude Stein was dying, I knew that she was dying, she turned to her friend and companion of many years and said, Alice, what is the answer? And Alice replied... No one knows. Then Miss Stein, after a long look at her friend, said, All right, then. What is the question? Our cast included Robert Dryden, Jada Rowland, and Terry Keene. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Oh, for heaven's sake, why didn't you stay out of my life? Why did you have to call me? I want to see you, Edith. No. You can't. You can't look at me. I don't want to see what I look like in your eyes. Why not? Because... Because I'm an old woman now. No, not you. Yes, yes, I'm old. Older than I ought to be, thanks to you. I look older than my mother does. That's what my last ten years were about, Harry. Working like a dog. No money, just... Just getting poor and old. Let me come up, Edith, just for a while. We could talk. No, stay away from here. You understand me? You say you're a dead man? Fine. Stay dead, Harry. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. 
I'm E.G. Marshall. As the centuries of recorded time go marching in review, head and shoulders above the rest of us march the great innovators, the scientists, the inventors. Their names are blazoned large in the annals of the world. Newton, Euclid, Da Vinci, Einstein, the navigators, the astronauts, the explorers. But some who have opened new paths to mysterious realms go past unsung. For example, Herbert Boggs, whose strange and unique story I bring you now. Herb? Hmm? What do you mean, read? Well... It's hard to explain, Sadie. But you know, ever since I was shocked by that electricity, it's like, uh, like written up there in my mind. It's like I was printed on a notice board. I can read the future, Sadie. Like it was, uh, the first page of tomorrow's newspapers. Mystery drama, The Shock of His Life, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Larry Haynes. I'll be back shortly with Act One. If you were to pick the most unlikely spot for a miracle that could baffle modern science, you couldn't do better than Elmhurst in the borough of Queens, New York City. Or a more unlikely man for it to happen to than Herb Boggs. Herb is a medium man, which is to say he is middle class, ordinary, and in a crowd most likely to go unnoticed. He's been married to Sadie for 36 years, two children, grown and married. He has his own little bar and grill. His interests are beer, boxing, football, the ponies. He also likes the comics. Hey, Sadie, look. Look at this here. What? Sparkman. See how he handles them creatures from outer space? Which one is he? The fella in the union suit? Oh, Sadie, that ain't no union suit. That's his uniform like. Well, why would a grown-up man want to wear a kid outfit like that? Because, because it frees his muscles to do things... Oh, what's the sense explaining to a woman? Herbie, what are them zigzaggy things sticking out of his hands? Oh, that, that, that's his electrostatic ray. He hits you with that and zingo, you're static. It's like electricity. Oh, he must run up some utility bills. Oh, come on. What'd you say to He ain't hooked up to the electric company. That's like his own electric power. Oh, in the comics, anything can happen. But it ain't for real. Oh, yeah. Well, don't you kid yourself, Sadie. You'd be surprised how many real scientific ideas come straight out of the comics. That, that's, that's how it's a real education to read them. You know, these guys who draw them are geniuses, most of them. Yeah, what, well, honey, why don't you get me a beer, huh? Why don't you get it for yourself? Well, can't you see I'm turning the game on? You know I always watch the football games on Sundays. All right, Herbie. You have your day of rest. But, honey, don't turn it up too loud. Yeah, all right. No louder than I have to hear what's going on, okay? Well, I don't have to hear. Oh, no. Oh, come on. The what picture, the picture, Blue. Put, uh, put the beer down someplace, huh? You mean something's happened to that, too? Well, you got eyes, ain't you? We got the, we got the sound, but no picture. Uh, Harvey, what are you doing? I'm going to get the back off. I can fix this thing. I, I can't miss the game. You can't fix it. You need a TV, man. What, a 33 bucks a crack? Anyway, where are you going to find one on a Sunday, huh? You shouldn't mess around, Harvey. It's dangerous. Well, what's the difference? You can still hear. I don't want to just hear. I want to see. You better not shove your hand in there. Oh, I can see already there's a tube half lying there. It just needs to be stuck back in. I read in a paper where it said a person should never... Ah, ah. <laughs> Mrs. Uh... It, it's Boggs, Doctor. Oh, yes, Boggs. Well, 
He was fooling around trying to fix the TV. While it was turned on? Yes. And he got a shot. Oh, yes. He just went down like a rag doll. Only when I kneeled beside him on the floor, he was... He was all stiff like. Mm -hmm. Does he have any pulse? I don't know. I, I didn't stop to find out. I just called the police. But after, when you went back to him? I don't know. I didn't think to try. Was he breathing? I don't think so. That's what scared me so, Doctor. He was laying there just like a corpse. Stiff, like I said. How long? Pardon? How long was he lying there in that condition? Oh, I wouldn't know. For a while. And then, after I, I, I got him on his back with the pillow under his feet and all, then I could hear him a little, sort of, like, you know, snoring. The way he was when you first got here. But you can't estimate how long it was before you heard him making that sound. Oh, I was so scared. I, I mean, every second was like a year. And, well, maybe five minutes, ten. Is it going to be all right, Doctor? We have him breathing clearly now, and we're going to take him right down to the hospital. Oh, um, do you have a car? Oh, no. You uh, want to come along? Oh, yes. Couldn't I sit with Herb and hold his hand? I, uh... I think you better let me and the medic do that, Mrs. Boggs. Oh. You climb in with the driver. All right. Okay, Hank, open up the hooters and get us to the hospital fast. We don't want to arrive with a DOA. Sorry to keep you waiting so long, Mrs. Boggs. Herb, how is he? Well, at the moment, his condition is stabilized. His respiration is satisfactory, he's out of cardiac arrest, and his EKG is normalizing. What does that mean, Doctor? Well, Mrs. Barks, when you called police emergency, we got to you as fast as possible. But there was a period after your husband sustained the electric shock, during which we don't know his medical condition. But you said he was breathing and all again? Yes, his condition now is stable enough. What we don't know, Mrs. Boggs, is what may have happened to him in the period after he sustained the shock until we arrived and could start treatment. Doctor, I don't mean to be stupid. I just don't quite follow well, you. Let me try to explain. When we have sudden shock, like a, an electrical one, yes. which stops normal functions such as breathing and heartbeat, time is of the essence. Oh. I won't go into all the complications and technical terms, but if... Through shock, a patient loses all cardiopulmonary functions for more than four to six minutes. Well, then we're in deep trouble. You mean my herb would die? Not necessarily. What I do mean is that he could suffer irreversible brain damage and change. Oh, you think that that's what could have happened before you got to our apartment? Well, I honestly don't know. Mr. Boggs is still in a coma until he comes out of it. And we've had a chance to evaluate the EKG and other tests... I can't give you any definite answer. I'm sorry. But you don't think he's going to die? I um, can't even promise you that. I know it's little comfort, but perhaps if the damage has already been done, it might be better for him and for you. I want him to come, too. I want him back. Well, of course you do, Mrs. Boggs, and I want you to have hope. But I also ask you to wait and see... The man you get back could very easily be as different from night and day as the husband that you remember and love. Good morning, Herbie. Sadie, where am I? Where should you be when you're sick? The hospital. Hospital? What am I doing here? But don't you remember? You were messing around with that TV. Like Mike, who comes to fix it. Didn't Mike warn you? What? Well, he said you'd, you know, never touch in the back without you pull the plug. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I remember. Hey, who won? Who won what? The game. What game? The game, the game that was going on when the set pooped out. Well, how should I know? You think I should care about football players when my husband was lying like dead? What husband? You! Herbie, you went and electrocuted yourself. How come you're in the hospital? I wake, wake, wake it up like this, I couldn't figure. I never... 
I never felt better in my life. Oh, we'll let the doctor decide that. No, what do I need a doctor for? I know how I feel. I want to get out of here and go home. Now, just a minute. No, just a minute. Get my pants, Sadie. I don't belong here. Herb, you've been sick. Real sick. Two days you've been laying there like dead. You can't go home unless the doctor signs you out. All right, so get him and have him. I can't do that. He thinks you might have... Well... You know, with the electric shock and all. No, I don't know. Like I say, I feel like a million bucks. Now, I need out. I got things to do. What things? Well, like, I can't... I can't explain that there are things going on in my head. Now, honey, I don't care about rules and regulations. I'm getting out of here. Doctor or no doctor. Herbie, you got to have him to get out. And how am I going to convince him? Oh, he's going to let me out without any trouble. How do you know? Well, I can read it. It's that simple. Read it? What do you mean, read it? In my brain. In my brain, Sadie. Just like I can read so many other things now. Now, just trust me, huh? Like you always did. Gee, Herb, I want to. I want to with all my heart. But... Oh, it's all so kind of different. I, I don't know where I'm at. You don't have to worry about where you're at, Sadie. Just get yourself set for where we're going. Now that we've been struck by lightning. Oh, boy. Good to be home. I just don't understand. After all he said, the doctor didn't make any problem about your coming home. Oh, well, why should he, Sadie? I'm in better shape than he is. Get me a beer, hon. Huh? Oh, sure, Herbie, if you say so. And you want a glass? Um, 32 years married, you asked me that. When did I ever use a glass? Are you sure? Doctor wouldn't... Sadie, what do I care about the doctor? I know what's good for me. And for you. Here, just let me show you. Who are you calling? Of course. The bookie? Yep, that's him. Now look, Herb. We ain't got money to take flyers. I mean, like after the hospital and ambulance and all, you know? No, I don't know. And who says this is a flyer? This is something I gotta get through your head. Uh, hello? Horse? Yeah, 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 Herb. Yeah. You know, Herb Boggs? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Listen, uh, you're holding some winnings for me. Um, 120 bucks, right? Yeah, that's a, that's all right. You check your books. It's there. Yeah, well, listen, I want to take a little flutter. Now, uh, you got notable gaffer in the first going off a of 10 to 1, right? Ah, and uh, pleasure sky in the fourth, 70 to 1. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I want to parlay them on the nose to win. Yeah, yeah, the whole bundle. Are you crazy? Herb, you had winnings of over a hundred dollars, and you're betting them on a daily double with two outsiders? Honey, honey, not to worry. I can't lose. What do you mean you can't lose? I already read the results. Clear and simple, the way the things are from here in. What do you mean, red? <sighs> well, it's hard to explain, Sadie, but ever since I took that that belt of electricity, it's like it's like written up there in my mind. Like, like, I, like I was printed on a notice board. I, I can read the future. Like, like it was the uh, first page of tomorrow's newspaper. So as Herb, or I should say, like Herb would say, here's a miracle happening right in the western end of Long Island. Or is it? As the amount of extra electricity which Herb Bog's body accidentally absorbed brought about some strange physiological or psychological change, or has it, as Dr. Baines feared, caused some profound and irreparable damage that gives him delusions? I shall return shortly with Act Two. Herbert Boggs, owner of a small local bar and grill who suddenly is electrified and claims to be able to see in the mind's eye the front page of tomorrow's newspaper. It is also a fact that the electrical shock was of such severity that it put him into cardiac arrest and eliminated all his vital functions for an indefinite period. A period, however, which may have been long enough to cause irreparable damage. Herb. 
Herb, why don't you take a nice rest in your armchair and let me fetch your slippers? Oh, Sadie, will you stop acting like I went round the bend? I'm telling you the truth. That you could see into the future? Well, not the whole future, just like I could see what could be on the front page of a paper. The racing results? Well, if, uh, if someone won big enough to get a headline and other things, too. I'm just telling you the way it is, Sadie. Maybe I'd better get you some aspirin. Will you, for crying out loud, stop treating me like I had some kind of a sickness or something? I got vision right here. How can you be sure? It's just I am, Sadie, I am. All right, we can prove it out. Wait a minute. What are you doing? I'm calling the number. What number? There's this number you call to check the betting results. Couldn't you just listen in on the radio? Well, of course I could listen. This is faster. Yeah, yeah, like already I'm getting the rundown. About the horse race, the parlor? No, 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 he isn't up to that now. He's on basketball and football right now. Oh, oh wait, 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 here he goes on exactors and perfectors and all that. No. Hey, no, wait a minute. What? Here, here he goes on results of big oval track. First race. Notable gaffer wins a 10 to 1. Hey, hey, you know what that means, honey? We won? We just made ourselves 1,200 bucks. We did? Oh, we can sure use it. Oh, no, no, that ain't using money, honey. We, we, we have it all riding on the fourth race. Herbie, if we lose that, do we lose it well, all? we ain't gonna lose it. Well, how can you be so sure? Shh, shh, hold it, hold it, hold it. Yeah, the result's coming in right now. Yee-hoo! Pleasure Sky took it by a nose. Uh-huh. I told you, I told you I could see it just the way it's going to be, huh? The second horse won? Yeah, paying 70 to 1. That oh. means you and me, Sadie, just cleared ourselves more than $35,000. Huh? <laughs> we never had that much money all at once in our lives. Yeah, well, you better get yourself used to it, baby, because that's the way it's going to be from now on. Oh, no, Herbie, please. I'm scared. Let it go with that... You came in lucky once. Don't stretch your luck. What's the stretch? That ain't luck. Don't you understand? I know. I know before it happens. Darling, I... Have you been sick in the hospital? I think you ought to take it easy for a while. No, I know. I know what you think, Sadie, and I don't blame you. You think that electric shock curdled my brain or something, but it ain't that way. I wish I could make you see it so clear. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I just came back from the hospital, and you were with me all morning since I woke up, right? Right. So, you know that I haven't heard a radio or seen a TV or looked at a paper, right? Yes. The morning paper. Well, we got it in the house? All right, all right. Now, fine. Now, I won't look, all right? But you look on the first page. Yes. And someone won big on a lottery, right? Uh, yes. Huh? <gasps> Joseph Davis... A retired construction worker was the grand winner in the $2 million state lottery. All right, Sadie. Does it give the number of the ticket? Oh, let me see. Uh, yes. Yes, right here. It was no, number... No, no, wait, wait. I'll tell you. I'll tell you without even looking. Um, uh, two, four, three, eight, six, nine, two. Right? What? Yes. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, you see? You see, I know which number is going to win. Oh. Yeah, let, let, let this Joe Davis have his two million next month. If we want it, we'll have it. How? Well, well, when I put my mind to it, I can see the number. Well, how can you get the number you want? Well, may, may, maybe I can't, but there's uh, 83 other places knowing the right numbers can put you and me on easy street for the rest of our lives. Where? The numbers, the horses, the right spread in basketball, football, a hundred ways, Sadie. I don't have to guess anymore. I'm going to know. Oh, there's something terribly dangerous about all this herd. It just can't lead to any good. Are you kidding? How good can it get? It's going to be a whole new life. Oh, I guess that's what I'm afraid of. Oh, come on, Sadie. Why should you be afraid? Because you go live it. I got my own second sight. You're headed for real trouble. And worse than that, you ain't going to be my herb anymore. <laughs> I love her. Hi, Angel. Come in, close the door. Well, do we kiss, Gino? Or is this strictly business? <laughs> kiss first, Sherry, baby. Then we talk. Mm. You're it, Gino, all the way. I, uh, I need a little information, and I can't think of anyone better to dig it up for me. <sighs> so tell me. I got a customer, a live one, for a lot of years. 
He's gone sour on me. Oh, he owes you? Oh, no. He quit gambling? Worse than that. All of a sudden, he starts to win big too often. I want to know why. Look, Gino, isn't this man's work? This guy happens to be a bartender who owns his own little place. So? Isn't gambling man talk? Customers talk to bartenders. It don't work the other way around. Hmm. What'd you do? Misplace the goon squad? No, no, this doesn't call for strong arm stuff. You catch more flies with honey than Okay, you... okay, I get the message, Gino. What's the address? And how do I recognize this pigeon? The address is on the paper. You'll find him behind the bar. His name is Herb. Herb Boggs. Yes, miss? Can I help you? Oh, I, uh... If it was something to eat, we don't open the grill till 5.30. Uh, no, I don't want to eat. I, I, I couldn't. I, I... I'd like a drink, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, would you rather have it at a table than... Here at the bar? No, please, I... I I don't want to be alone. In trouble of some kind? Yes. No. Well, there was a man bothering me. To get away, I said my husband was meeting me in here. Is he? No. No, I just said that to get away. My my husband... My husband's dead. Oh. I'm a widow. Oh. All alone now. I don't know why it is. Men seem to sense that. Try to take advantage. You know how it is? Ah, wow. Yes or no. (laughs) Now, listen, you'll be safe in here. What what, what did you want to drink, huh? Oh, just a sherry, I guess. (laughs) I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to laugh. It was just... You see, I'm not much of a drinker. And I didn't know what to ask for. So the first thing I come out with is my name. Oh, oh Sherry, Sherry. Yeah. That's your name, huh? Yes. Uh. But like the poet says, what's in a name? So I guess I, I will have a Sherry. And not too strong, please. Oh, no. I'll give you the best. Yeah. Yeah, this will never hurt you. A glass of wine. Oh, like that other poet said. A glass of wine. A loaf. How did that go? Uh, a book of voice, uh, verses. Underneath the bow, a jug of wine, a loaf of bread, and thou beside me singing in the wilderness. Huh? Oh, gee, that's <laughs> beautiful. Ah, uh, well. How come an educated man like you ended ended up behind a bar? I ain't claiming I'm any college grad or nothing like that, but... Well, you spend enough years behind a bar, you'd be surprised how many things you learn. Oh, you've read it to me like you were an actor. Oh, it made me feel so much better. Honest. I don't feel sad anymore. Wow, that's great. Hey, now look, you haven't even tried your sherry. Oh, I know. It's silly, but... Oh, I hate to drink alone. I don't suppose you would join me as my guest. Oh, no, 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 no. I never drink in my own place. Well, some... Some other place? Hey, hey, hey. Now, look, I'm a married man. It's just because I'm lonely. Oh, I... I, I don't think I know your name. Oh, well, it's Herb. If you want to have a drink, my, uh... My relief barman just came in. It's, uh, my quitting time, and, uh... Oh, come on. Come on, Cherry. I'll take you across the street to Adam's Rib. Oh, that's so sweet of you, Mr... I, I mean, Herb. No, no, it isn't. Cherry, honey. Uh, you see, it's because I, uh... I read in my mind's eye it's what I'm going to do anyway, so I might as well check out why right now. <laughs> so I'll get my jacket. Uh, oh, uh, the sherry's a buck and a half a clip. Uh, just leave it on the bar. You know, you're a funny man. Yeah, not funny, just strange. Well, I dig men who are far out. Oh, no, 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 Sherry, it won't work. What do you mean? Look, if I was younger and I didn't have my Sadie... Now, I'm not saying I wouldn't go for all your flash in me, but uh, it won't work. Because, first of all, there is Sadie, and I never cheated on my wife yet, and never will. 
on second off because I know it ain't the cards. You're sure? If you came up to my pad right now, I couldn't make you change your mind? No, I don't have to be sure. I know. I know because I know I'm not going to your place. How? Well, like I said, I can see it in my head. I, I can kind of read it like... Any time up to 24 hours ahead, I know whether a thing is going to be or if it isn't. How could you do that? Well, I didn't ask to be able to. I, uh... You see, I took a jolt of electricity and uh, I nearly cashed in my chips. Oh? Yeah. And when I came out of it, I guess uh, it kind of scrambled my brain some. and Well, change over some of the cells or like that. But anyway, I could... Uh, I could see into the future. Oh, like a day before a race, you could know which horse was going to win? Oh, that's easy. Oh, boy, are you the man with all the luck? Well, not so fast. You see, the trouble with knowing about things in advance is you get to take the bad with the good. Like, uh... Like it's just, uh... Just coming clear who sent you to pump me. Only... I don't see your... Uh, all that clear yet. Why? Nobody sent me. No, no, Sherry, honey, that's a lie. Uh, but you know, you know Marks, right? All right, now you tell me what, what does Gino want with me? I wouldn't know. Oh. Well, I know this much. If a, a big fish like Gino is after me, it can only mean trouble. So, you see, Sherry, maybe I'm not so lucky after all. As long as man has existed, he has ached to be able to know his future in advance. The seer, or the professed seer, has been a dominant figure in every culture in the world. But if all the prophets and magicians and astrologers and others actually had such a power, would they really want the divine gift? Or learn like Herb that it brings far more harm than good. I shall return shortly with Act Three. One of history's wisest men, Sir Francis Bacon, once wrote, Men must pursue things which are just in the present and leave the future to the divine providence. The wisdom of this thought is something poor Herb Boggs is about to discover. Even though his ability to read the future was not something he is directly responsible for, it is a gift that was wished upon him, and which, despite its advantages, he is rapidly beginning to think he would rather have wished off him again. I brought us some nice, fresh coffee, Herb. No, no, no. None, none for me, Sadie. Oh, would you rather have a beer? No, no. Well, uh, should I turn on the TV? No, no. Oh, now I know you must be sick. No, I'm not sick. I've got a problem. Oh, I knew something was bothering you ever since you come home to dinner. Herbie, how can I help? Now, Sadie, this has nothing to do with you. Everything that has to do with you has to do with me. All right, all right. All right, now listen. When I first found out about, uh, about my gift, like, I, uh, I lost my head a little, all right? Well, you didn't seem no different to me. No, I mean about how I saw all the money that I could make. You know, all my life I played the numbers, the ponies, wherever you could lay a bet, right? Every cent I could afford and too much of the time, like you know, when I couldn't. I know. Well, you know what I figured last year? I'm a loser over 40 years averaging out. I blew 50 bucks a week. That's 100 grand I blew, Sadie. With interest over all them years, it could have been two. That's all you or me would ever need. Now, do you think that's smart? No, that wasn't smart. But now you could get it all back and more. Yeah, yeah, that's what I figured, Sadie. I wasn't going to be greedy. Just get back my stake and maybe like interest money, you see? Only... Only I'm a stupid. What's so stupid about that? Well, I try to move too fast. I got... I got Horse Turkle screaming what was I trying to do to him, and I should have listened. To what? Well, he asked me to take it easy, or either 
let him in on what kind of handicapping system I was using. Well, I fobbed him off, so... He must have went screaming to the big shots, you see, wherever he lays off his bets. So now I... I got Gino Marks on my tail. Who is Gino Marks? Oh, he's a real, real hard guy, Sadie. This, this is his district, you see, and he doesn't like anybody that messes with his profits. Herbie, don't get mixed up with gangsters and hoodlums. We don't need the money. Forget it. Well, the whole trouble is I was going to forget it. I just about had our money back, Sadie. Well, whatever we've got, you don't need anymore. Well, I'm not sure I even deserve the hundred grand I have. It ain't so much of a gift, you know. We've come right down to it. Like last week when we bumped into Mo and Jane Rosen, you know. Yeah. Uh, oh, it was nice to see them look so well. Who could have guessed? <gasps> yeah, me. I knew. I knew she'd be dead the next day, Sadie. Oh. Yeah. And, and that nice young kid that, that lives upstairs, well, she ain't going to have that baby. She, she'll be lucky if she stays alive. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, and, and that's how come I know that Gino Marks is after me. You see, I can see all these things before they happen. And just to win some dough, who needs the, the other stuff that you got to suffer? That's why I want to forget it all or try to before... Oh, it, but, but before what? Maybe before that. What? Before. i got to answer that. Why? Let it ring. Take it off the hook. No, no, no. That's no good, Sadie. i got to answer sooner or later. Yeah... Yeah, that's why it's speaking. Well, what? What, what? what does he want to see me for? Well, okay, at least I can ask. Yeah, when? Well, tonight. Well, I, I don't know, it's kind of late. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be there. Who was it? Who else? That was a message. From Gino Marks. What? He wants to see me tonight. Tonight? He's already sent a car for me. Don't go, Herbie. Sadie, I gotta. Why? Well, because you never get anything for nothing. Now I gotta find out what I... I gotta pay for the good luck. Why should you have to pay anything? You worked hard all your life. You deserve some. Wasn't coming out of the shock I got enough. I should have left it at that, but I was tempted. And when a guy gives in, Sadie, I guess he's just gotta face it. There's always the devil to pay. Mr. Marks? Yeah, that's right. Close the door, Bugs. Take a seat. I want to talk to you. Sit down. Sit down. Yeah. And I come right to the point. It's the way I work. <laughs> You know, you've been nicking my organization pretty good the past week. You mean I made a few bets and took some money off you, huh? That's what I mean. Too much. Yeah, well, uh, you won't have to worry. I, I got all I need now. Oh, you're going to quit cold turkey. Yeah, yeah. I don't buy it. No horse player on a hot streak ever quit. Well, this one is ready to. I don't know if I want you to. You mean... You mean you want me to go on winning? Can you? Well, I... I can't say. Uh, what do you want, Mr. Marks? Hey, now that's getting right to the point, isn't it? You know, I just possibly might go into business with you. Business? With me? Why not? I go for success. But before we get too excited over what may just have been a, a run of luck, why don't we have a trial period? A trial period? For what? To see if it's really true, you can call it spots. If you can, we pick our spots and bet heavy. I mean heavy, Bugs. 80% to me is major partner, the rest to you and I'll bankroll. And, uh, suppose, uh, suppose I refuse. <laughs> now, you really don't want me to get into strong arm stuff, do you? Oh, no, no, no. You wouldn't dare lay a hand on me. Not as long as I could be the goose who lays the golden eggs. Oh, I wouldn't have to. Because uh, that wife you love so much, Sadie, you know her name? <laughs> yes, Sadie. Now, you wouldn't want anything to happen to her. Hmm? 
We got a deal. We got a deal. Hey, no, 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 look, wait, don't, don't, don't you hurt her. I can act and explain everything. Oh. Oh, Sadie, Sadie, I'm sorry. What was you having, sweetheart? A nightmare? No, oh, how, could, how could I have a nightmare? It's not even dark yet. Well, almost. You haven't had your supper. No, no, I can't eat. Herb, you gotta have something. It's just leftovers, since you won't even let me leave the house the last three days. <sighs> Herbie, what is it? What? I can't explain, Sadie. It's, it's, uh... I, I don't mind all the beer and the drinking and the sleeping all day and walking around all night. But what's the use, Herb? You can't hide forever. What are you hiding from? Your partner? Yeah. Oh, I never wanted you to go in business with a man like Gino Marks anyways. Well, why didn't you just quit? Oh, Sadie, don't you think I wish I could? If it's the money you want, give it back. I tried that. He doesn't want it. Well, what does he want? Well, you know. For me to tell what I see inside my skull is going to win the next day, so he can bet. So give it to him. What do you care? Well, you don't understand, honey. For weeks I have, and then just like that I had to stop. Why? Well, because. Because I don't know anymore. All of a sudden it just stopped just like that. So... That's why you wouldn't answer none of his calls the last three days. Honey, you can't put it off much longer. He's got men watching down there in the street. I've seen them. Yeah, I know, I know. They've been there around the clock ever since we first made our deal. He don't even trust nobody, Sadie. That's why... Oh. Uh, Who's that? I, 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 I'm going to... Sleep. No, 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 Sadie. Let me... You, you go back in the bedroom, all right? No, I'm staying right by your side. But just stay at the line of the door. Uh... Who, who, who is it? You could see me through the viewer. You know, open up. I got nothing to say to you. You can't put it off forever. Well, come alone. I just want to talk to you man to man. Better let him in, Herb. Tell him how it is, huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, oh, okay, just a minute, Mr. Marks. Evening, Mrs. Boggs. Yes. Hi, Herb. What do you What do you want? Well, you know me. I don't waste time. Right to the point. Nearly a week now, and we don't win, huh? Oh, I dropped the bundle. What is this? A double cross? Now look, I know, I know, I know you lost. All right, you 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 can have everything I got. All everything right? you got is peanuts in my league. Why don't we win anymore, Boggs? Because I lost the power. I don't believe you. It doesn't matter what you believe. You can't change anything. Oh, I don't know. Excuse me, Mrs. Boggs. Hey, now, you let go of my don't wife. Come any closer. You wouldn't dare shoot this her. This isn't the conventional gun, Herb. It's an electric stun ray in the experimental stage with the government. But we've made a few improvements, see? Instead of stunning, this can kill. Now, I'm taking Sadie here with me, and you're going to give me some winners for tomorrow, or you're not going to see her again. No, I won't let you. Hey, well, you fool. You'll have to kill me first. Me. I'll be one of us in hell first. You'll kill me. Where are we? 
In the hospital? The hospital? You mean he didn't kill me? He he didn't hurt you? Nobody hurt me. And nothing's happened to you, thank heaven. Even if you did near kill yourself on the TV. And you dreamed all that? Oh, I always knew I had a smart husband. No, 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 not so smart, or I wouldn't be here. You're you're sure now, Sadie, huh? Herbie, we brought you here to this hospital straight from the house. And you've been in a coma for the last 24 hours. (sighs) Till you just woke up a half hour ago to tell me all you dreamed. Gee, it all seems so real. It's hard to believe. I'm never going to make another bet, Sadie. Suppose I won. I wouldn't sleep easy for the rest of my life. Smart man, Mr. Herbert Boggs, who learned a valuable lesson. No matter what the odds a man gambles, they can't be beaten unless you have the devil on your side. And having won with his help, what have you won? His payoff is that if you commit yourself to him, no matter how long and lucky the wheel spins, he is waiting for you in the end. I'll be back shortly. Some years ago, Mr. and Mrs. Boggs retired to Florida. Herb spends a good deal of time fishing. He likes the quiet. But there are few backwaters left, and the sounds of radio invade all of them. Sometimes, as Herb catches the field for the following day, the name of some horse will vibrate in his mind as the winner. But he never checks the results, in case he might be right. The peace inside him he has now is too precious to be disturbed again. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Joan Shea, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Who's Marla? You wouldn't understand. You could explain it. You wouldn't believe it. Look, your name is Howard Spurlow. I know my name. You are about to be tried for murder. I know that, too. I'm the attorney appointed to defend you. We've been through all this. Why don't you let me alone? You have to have a defense. Why? Why did you kill him? It doesn't matter. It does matter. Premeditated murder, first degree, puts you in jail for life. I don't care. You don't care now. Wait. The state of shock you're in will wear off. You'll care. I wish you'd let me alone. On the other hand, second degree or manslaughter or lesser charges, you could get a maximum of ten years. Maybe as low as three or four. Tell me, why did you kill him? Why don't you let me alone? This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Life and death often turn on small, almost insignificant events. A neglected appointment. An accidental meeting. 
The postponed date. A flat tire. The shortcut through a dark alley. Oh, yes, the almost overlooked minor items that mark the destiny of so many. For instance, Skip Turner never dreamed that a walk on a clear, cool night could lead to a frightening confrontation. The play acting is over. You will give me the secret rope, or I will kill you right here. Skip! Slowly, Val, he's bluffing. You will place the necklace in my hands. Now! If I had the necklace, I wouldn't have it on me, right? I'd have it stashed. So if you knock me off, you'll never get your hands on it. Mr. Turner, kidding you would give me much pleasure. Kidding anyone is pleasurable. <laughs> Mystery drama, The Angry God, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Saul Panitz and stars Larry Haynes and E.V. Juster. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Sinoff, the sinus medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. suppose you could say it starts and ends in today's Greece, a land of brooding mountains and a history that reaches back thousands of years before Christ. But this is not what brought Skip Turner to Greece from the United States. Likeable, soft-spoken Skip Turner, who wears his clothes with the casual air of someone born to wealth, is the kind of person who makes friends just like that. You'd never know that he's one of the world's most skillful jewel thieves. And right now, on this street in Athens, Skip Turner is moving faster than usual because he made a mistake. A bad mistake. How stupid can you get? Look at the damn amateur. The alarm, it was right there. Now what? A cab. No, no, no. Driver could remember. I can walk back to the hotel. Maybe that... Oh. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. it's my, my fault. Uh, hey, hey, you speak English. Well, so do you. Yeah, ever since I was a kid. You know, I, I wonder what's got me so frantic. Uh, it, it's uh, probably a traffic accident. No, I don't think so. Look, huh? up at the corner, hardly an accident. Oh. Yeah, it looks like regular troops and police, too. I've learned to mind my own business, especially when I'm in somebody else's country. No, they're sealing off the block. Lining up on the other corner, too. Yeah. yeah. They're blocking off the whole area. Well, what do you make of it, Mr... Oh, I'm, uh, I'm Skip Turner. <laughs> Valerie Parker. Hi. Yeah, it looks like, uh, they're searching everybody. Well, maybe a check on passports or identification papers. I don't know. I don't know. This doesn't look routine. Well, I suppose it's not our concern, but... I... Oh, good. We're ready to leave. You made it just in time, Mr. Turner. I did? Well, yes, the tour. What? The Delphi tour. We're about to leave. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, follow me. Uh, but I, I don't have... Well, let a... me handle the delicate negotiations. You speak Greek? Well, the tour leader speaks English, and he's male. So, he speaks my language. Gee, I don't know how to thank you, Miss Parker. Oh, so formal. Val's a lot better. And I'm Skip, okay? Okay. Uh, when do we get going? Mm, soon, I hope. We should have left 15 minutes ago. Yeah, they've uh, still got the barrier at the corner. Oh, I wonder what they're looking for. Or whom. Yeah, uh, what, what, what do you do? I'm a photographer. No kidding. Mm hmm, no kidding. I've been a freelancer for more than five years. Oh, haven't you ever seen my credits? Photos by Val Parker? Well, I promise I'll be looking from now on. <laughs> Skip, did you bring your lunch along? What? We're supposed to make a stop before we get to Delphi. Oh, that sure looks like lunch. Sandwiches? Uh, I, I don't follow you. I, I don't have any food. Well, then, what's that bulge in your jacket? Huh? Are you packing a gun? Oh, oh, you mean this? Oh, no, no, no. That's just a fat wallet. My passport, health card, traveler's checks. Oh, <laughs> you must think I'm naive. I've been around. I know the bulge of a rod when I see one. No, 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 I swear. That's, uh, that's a sucker play, especially in a foreign country. Hey, come on now. You're putting me on. <laughs> you know what's really funny? 
a respectable American in his late 30s or early 40s. Well, thanks for the early 40s. And here he's talking like a character out of a TV show. Well, I, I like a joke like anybody, only there's a time and a place for that kind of a joke. Now, suppose somebody who hasn't got a good sense of humor heard you and took it seriously. You know, I can see myself busted in the Greek jail. All right. What's really in that breast pocket, huh? Well, if you really have to know, it's a bottle of nitroglycerin. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, if you please. Who's that? Well, search me. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Colonel Poulos of the Athens Police. I wish to beg your pardon for the delay you have suffered. Because of this uh, emergency. But now I have given permission for this bus to proceed. Hey, 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 hey. It's about time. Colonel. Uh, young lady, yes, please. Uh, can you tell us why you've deployed so many police and soldiers? Or is it a secret? Yeah, why'd you do that for? I want to There know. has been a rather daring robbery nearby at the home of one of our leading citizens. Only one item was removed indicating that the burglar knew exactly what he was after. Or she... I do not rule out the possibility of a woman. I suppose it's valuable. Exceedingly. It was one of our most important treasures from the ancient days of Greece. In fact, it was to be given to the government in the near future. But we will catch the thief. The entire area is sealed off. He or she is uh, trapped. Well, then, why are you allowing us to go on? Well, you are all American tourists with a legitimate reason for being here on this bus. So the barricades will be put aside for you. Uh. I trust you'll enjoy your trip to Delphi. Uh, just between us, Val, what's so special about this Delphi place? Well, the picture possibilities in Delphi are supposed to be fantastic. Spectacular mountains, unusual ruins, and of course, the Oracle. The Oracle, oh yeah, unfortunate. But when the Colonel was telling us about the burglary, you looked like you were sitting through a movie you'd already seen a dozen times. Oh, what's a big deal? Diamond necklaces have been stolen before. Uh, how do you know it's a diamond necklace? Well, the, the, the colonel, he said so. Well, I don't think he did. I'm sure he didn't. Well, he, he said it was worth plenty, right? So uh, I figured diamonds. Uh-huh. Are you satisfied? No. Well, what's bugging you? You also said it was a necklace. A diamond necklace. What if it turns out that what the police are looking for is a diamond necklace? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the comfort stop. We will be here for 20 minutes precisely. Are you getting out? Uh, no, I guess not. Oh, not even to stretch your legs? Well, I wasn't going to, but okay. Come on, I'll buy you a drink. You're on. Hey, mm. how about that? That's a, that's a helicopter, so what? I don't think it's coming in here. Yeah, yeah, it could be. It is. It looks like it's going to land in the parking lot. Oh, it's a police helicopter. Police? Yeah, it says so right on the side. <laughs> Not exactly like the English, but close enough. Find out what's up. Well, anyway, we're the only ones left in the park. Uh, listen, I'll tell you what, you go ahead. I'll be out as soon as I put on a sweater. A sweater? In this heat? Well, yeah, we'll, we'll be uh, heading into mountain country soon. Yeah, see, you can see them from here. But you can wait till we get... Oh, I'm sorry, it's none of my business how you dress. Excuse it, huh? Yeah, sure. I'll, uh, join you in a minute. I wish to beg your pardon for this intrusion. But these two police officers, my assistants, will look through your bus. We'll take only a small amount of time and will not interrupt your schedule. Uh, Colonel? Ah, ah, yes, yes. The same young lady as in Athens, I believe. Mm, yes, Valerie Parker. I have a question. Please. We're under suspicion, aren't we? The way you say it, Miss Parker, is uh, a little harsh. Oh, well, what else would you call it, then? Well, as you may have guessed, despite the tight security we placed on the district where the burglary occurred, we have not yet found a guilty person. Then the thought came to me. The net was closed tight. Except, except for this bus. You're saying you think someone on the bus did it? It is only possible that the guilty one is among you. Oh, your thief is probably back in Athens. You seem so certain. How do you know? Well, I don't. But if... Well, for instance, if, if I had stolen whatever it is that was stolen... A necklace. 
Very rare. Uh, a diamond necklace? Some of the largest and most brilliantly cut diamonds in the world. It is known as the sacred rope. Yes. I saw a two-page color spread in a magazine just a little while ago. Oh, it's fantastic. Mm. If, uh, Colonel, if the person who took it is on this bus, he or she would have the necklace along, right? Possibly. Well, it would have to be. The necklace could have been dropped somewhere near the scene of the robbery. Well, did the thief have the time to do that? After all, you guys got there pretty fast. Oh, you have good thinking. Ah, ah, my men return. And from their sad faces, I can already see they have found nothing. However, they will now pass among you and collect your passports. But why? Simply a matter of form. They will be returned to you tomorrow in Delphi. I hate to be without my pass. Skip, what's wrong? Huh? What do you mean? Well, you look kind of funny all of a sudden. Well, uh, must be the sun. It uh, kind of bleaches me out. I'm okay. They're coming out for the passports. Here you are. Charlie Stowe? Yeah, and mine. Charlie Stowe? Oh, you are a tricky one. Uh, what now? I thought you said you were going to put on a sweater. Oh, well, uh, you see, I thought it over and I decided... I decided you were right. It is too warm. If I didn't know better, I'd think you'd wanted an excuse to get rid of me. For what reason, I can only guess. But it must have been something tricky, at the very least. <laughs> Under your seat? Here, let me... No, no, no. no. It's easier for me. There. I got it. Oh, wrappers from chewing gum. And there's there's more on your seat. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's my gum. I, uh, I was in a hurry to get to you, so I just dropped the wrappers. I'm sloppy. Hmm. No sweater? Then you chew a whole pack of gum? I don't get it. I, uh... Like gum. That's all there is to it. What's the big mystery? Well, you weren't chewing gum when you joined me. Wasn't I? Well, Skip, there there were five empty wrappers. So what? <laughs> that would have made a wad big enough to puff out your cheeks, and I'd have noticed that. You know, you remind me of my mother. She always figured I was doing something I shouldn't. And I don't think you have a sweater in that bag. I don't? No. Are you, uh, gonna tell the colonel that I don't have a sweater? I think you know what's bothering me. Are you sure you don't want to change your seat? What for? Well, who wants to sit next to, uh, to a thief? Oh, I never said that. You know, when the colonel showed up back in Athens and mentioned the robbery, and then I said something about diamonds, you were convinced I was the guy they're looking for, right? Well, you have to admit that it looked kind of... Yeah, I admit nothing. And then the bit with the seat. What do you think I am, a dum-dum? You figured I wanted to stay in the bus to hide the loot. And the gum. What was I going to use the gum for? If you're going to be a Sherlock Holmes, be a good one. How do you figure the gum bit? Well, that was the cleverest part of your scheme. I, I mean, if, if it was a scheme, you take the necklace and you hide it. Uh, well, let's see. Under one of these two seats. Yeah, that's it. Uh -huh. And you chew up a whole lot of gum. Five pieces. And then you use that to hold the necklace in place. I see. Mm -hmm. You'd still like to see if there's anything under my seat? Of course not. I know you're... That, that I'm innocent. Yeah. Yeah, but you'd like to check it out anyway, right? After all, you don't know me. We, we met only a couple of hours ago. Well, only if you won't get mad. <laughs> Go ahead, though. No. I, I know there's nothing there. How do you know? Well, Come I... on, let's settle this. Go ahead. Well, if it was there, you wouldn't... How do you know I'm not bluffing? Like in a poker game. Golly. What? I... I just thought... What if... If it is there... What do I do then? You mean, what do I do then? What do I do to you? a boy, I was taught never to threaten unless I was prepared to carry out the threat. In the Old West, it was good advice not to draw a gun unless you meant to use it. Or, as it was put by a most literate man a long time ago, if you cannot bite, 
never show your teeth. The question is, has Skip Turner really shown his teeth? I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Suspicion is a monster that feeds upon itself, as Val Parker is discovering on the way to Delphi. An intellectual pursuit of a problem has just turned into something of a different character. In fact, what seemed to be a harmless puzzle is almost at the point of solution. And with a solution, there is also a not-so-subtle threat. You don't mean what you said. You you wouldn't... Oh, yes, I would. Just like that? Uh-huh. If I reach under your seat and find what I think I may find, then... There are 52 other people on this bus. Well, we'll be getting off in Delphi, and then... Come on, that's a good act, but... Yeah. I don't believe you. Try me. Oh, Skip, I... I, I, I've got to know. You you must admit everything points to you. And look, even if you did take the necklace, I'd never believe you're simply a crook, an ordinary crook. I... I won't tell a soul... It's, it's, it's just a matter of satisfying my curiosity. Okay. I'll take you at your word, curiosity. So go on, see if the necklace is under the seat held there by chewing gum. Go on, it's okay. All right. Here I go. Oh, so far, nothing. Oh, wait. Find it? It was here. The police couldn't find it. How do you know it was here? Oh, look. Look. It hit my finger. Yeah, dirty. Look again. Do you see? Oh, dirty gum. So what? Well, it proves my point. You had the necklace under your seat. It only proves you're colorblind. Colorblind? Sure, look at that gum. It's the red kind. Red, thou. I don't... Oh, yeah. Darn it. Yeah. The gum wrappers you found were from the regular kind. I feel like an idiot. Naturally. You were leading me on. Why not? You were so very sure. Chewing gum. A whole pack. Five pieces. You said you swallowed it. Oh, I love that gum. Oh, you're pulling my leg. Now, what happened to the gum? I thought it was under the seat, and it's not. So it has to be somewhere else. And where the gum is, so is the necklace. I, I'm, I'm willing to bet on my theory. But well, I'll bet... On your life, that you'll never get a chance to find out. Hey, cut it out, whoever you are. Put that light out. Stop shining it right in my eye. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Oh, that you, Skip? What are you doing in a hotel parking lot, anyway? Well, I might ask you the same question. Why the flashlight? Are you looking for something? Oh, there you go again. I just thought I'd take a walk around. Hmm, nothing like a parking lot, is there? And what about you? Well, I'm looking for some picture possibilities. In the dark? If you look over there, you can just make out some columns against the sky, you see? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's the place? Hmm, the Temple of Apollo. Oh, isn't that something? You know, you're all wound up. For a photographer, this whole country's like a kid in a candy store. How come you're not over there right now? Or don't you have any, any uh, you know... Uh... The strobe light? Yeah. Mm. I'm loaded with all kinds of equipment for day and night. Right here in this flight bag. But I wouldn't want to be out over there alone in the dark. Oh, no. Oh, come on. That's kid stuff. Well, I suppose you like it black as pitch. Now, what does that mean? Nothing. Forget it. Any friends again? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Uh, you gonna hang around out here? Hmm. So pleasant... Smell that mountain air. Yeah, well, so long. You're not going to leave me out here alone. Well, you were here first, well, alone. Well, that's true. Oh, who's that? Yeah, relax. Hello? Lady? Gentleman? That's oh, the guide. Uh, what's his name? George. Yeah. Hi, George. Oh, uh, I have no wish to interfere. With what? I came to take the bus to the village. 
It's a very pleasant evening. Uh, take it where? I thought this was our bus for this tour. No need to get excited over a bus. Oh, our bus is covered with dust from many kilometers from Athens. I cleaned so it shines like everything. Well, why don't you clean it here? Oh, impossible. But in Arakova, water in hose. No water in hose in Delphi. Yeah, well, I'm going with you. No, 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 no. Th- that is not for me. Well, the devil with your regulations. Now, look, I'll help you wash the bus. How's that? I-, I-, I wash and you put water on with the hose, okay? Me too. Women's rights. I can wash too. If lady and gentlemen make big promise not to talk. No, don't, don't <laughs> let it worry you, George. Nobody will ever know anything about it. What's this all about, Skip? Okay, I've got to trust you. You guessed right about the whole bit and the gum. Uh-huh. The necklace is under the right fender, so this bus must not get to the village. Understand? No. Hold on. Hmm? What do you think I am? What are you blabbing about? He's an innocent bystander. But the guide? Yes. What do you think? <laughs> oh, no. Follow my lead, will you? Now, you get sick, Val, okay? A pain in the stomach, anything. I must be crazy to even think about helping For you. For Pete's sake. Oh! oh. Uh, w- w- what is it? Oh, oh no, no, no. Oh, Val, oh, Val, just oh, lie down, huh? Uh, uh, George? Oh, no. Yeah, George, George. Oh, no. hey, hey, stop. Oh. Okay, oh, keep it up, keep it up. <laughs> What is matter? Uh, 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 George, George, the lady, she she feels sick, understand? Sick, sick. There is a doctor in the village, Arakova. No, I don't think she needs a doctor. Uh, I'll step outside and see if I can't flag down a car and get her back to the hotel. I I take her back to the hotel in Boston. No, 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 uh, a car... Would be faster on these roads, uh-huh. George. It'll only take a few moments. You stay with her and uh, open the door for me, will you? Uh, George. Yeah, there is no lady. Man say he come back soon. He go try to stop a car. Oh, I'm glad you're with me. Uh, thank you. Yes. Oh, I, I think I, 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 I'm feeling a little better. There's not mother. a car in sight. Hey, you look a lot better. Got all that color's coming back in your cheeks. Oh, it was a sharp pain, but it, it's gone now. Good. It's happened to me before. It, it could have been the excitement coming here and all that. Yeah, 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 sure, that's it. Uh, listen, Val, do you think uh, you think you can walk? Oh, we aren't too far from the hotel. Oh, of course I can. Okay, okay, let's go. Okay. Here, let me take your arm. Right. Uh, oh, uh, George, I'm sorry, but we can't watch the bus with you. Uh, it's too nice an evening. The stars are out, you see, and uh, Val and I want to be alone, don't we, Val? <laughs> Boy, what an actress. You were great. <laughs> <laughs> I was rather convincing, wasn't I? Uh-huh. You have the necklace? Uh-huh. May I see it? No, uh, you better not. Why'd you do it, Skip? Because they said it couldn't be done. Who said? Oh, well, never mind. What do you do with it? It's so well known that nobody will buy it. <gasps> what? Do you realize I'm an accessory now? No, 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 you're in the clear. I forced you. That's the story in case... Hey, move over. The car's coming. Hey, what's that over there? That light? Yeah, it looks like a candle. That's what it is. It's a roadside shrine. The place is full of them. Yeah. And a car that just went by, it stopped. Well, so what? Can't a car stop without you getting... Well, I don't like it. So- somebody got out of the car. It's coming this way. Well, probably thinks we need help. Come on, we got to get out of here. Well, Come on, move it. No, wait a second. What? Here's the shrine. Here, well, what's this here in the back? Picture an icon. Yeah, it'll fit right behind it. Okay, stop praying. Pray, pray, Val. Okay. Put your head down. I, I don't know what you. Oh, I get it. Yeah, just keep on praying. It, it could be just somebody out for a walk. You're seeing monsters. Yeah, it could be, but don't stop what you're doing. What? Just make it look good. Good evening. I am Dimitrius. Hi. Uh, can't see you. I am over here. <laughs> I will come closer. Please. No sudden moves. Now, why would I... Oh. Oh, now I see it. Do you like our country, Mr. Turner? Hey, how do you know my name? I ask you a question. Yeah, it's a great place. Great. Would you like to die here? What? It can easily be arranged. Hey, now, that's no way to... Then understand me. I want it. Now. Now, look. Look, I... I, uh... I got a few bucks in uh, traveler's checks and some drachmas, too. And uh, the whole thing doesn't amount to... I am not a petty thief. 
Who is the woman? Why, she's on a tour. Uh, Miss Parker. Uh, Val, this is uh, Demetrius. You have quite a reputation, Mr. Turner. When this sacred rope was reported stolen, it was an easy matter to discover who might have it. But, of course, you must have calculated that such would be the case, is it so? Well, I, uh, I heard that somebody lifted it. Rest assured that by now, Colonel Poulos has received information from Interpol and is probably looking for you, too. Now, you will give me this sacred rope or I will kill you here and now. All right, now, hold it a second, and will you? And naturally, when I kill you... The young lady cannot be allowed to exist as a witness. Ah, oh, he's bluffing. You will place the necklace in my hands now. If, I say if, I had the necklace, I wouldn't have it on me, right? I'd have it stashed. So if you knock me off, you'll never get your hands on it. Once again, this is not a motion picture. Such a speech means nothing. And Mr. Turner, killing you will give me much pleasure. <laughs> Kidding anyone is pleasurable. Give it to him. Please, Skip. Oh, as soon as he got it in his clammy hands, we're dead. That bag. You would open it. It's mine. Open it. You. Put the light on the bag. Good. Cameras. Yeah. What is that? A strobe light attachment. Mostly for nighttime photography. You just press this button... Like this? Yeah, and this? And this? Oh, my eyes! Like, I am blind! My, my eyes! Run, Val! This way! Up the hill! Awake! Oh, the necklace! Oh, lady! You'll be able to see in a minute, and he has the gun! I'll have it in a second. You start climbing, and I'll. Okay, I got it. All right, let's go. Run like the devil. We're, we're just below the Delphi ruins. He'll follow us, rest assured. Oh. Don't stop. He's shooting blind. He can't see us. It's too dark. Oh, that was. No, just run that way. Here, take my hand. Okay. Now we've got to get to the top to stand any kind of a chance. Do you hear him? Not much yet, but he'll come. Oh, you're so damn stubborn. Give him the necklace. It's our lives, don't you understand? He'll put a bullet in the back of our heads anyway. Shh, shh. Hey, something. Let's move. Come on. I can't run any further. I'm sorry. The place is like a big cemetery. We better separate. No. It's the best way. Here, you see that building over there? That little place with the columns about the only thing around here that wasn't knocked flat. Oh, I'm afraid. I want to stay with you. No, you're tired. You can't climb. Now, you get inside that place and don't hardly breathe. And I'll lead him away, okay? I might even get a chance to get at him with a rock or something. Oh, stay with me. You please. head for that building. Oh, that must be the treasury of the Athenians. It was built as a tribute to Apollo. Well, that information is a big help right now. Oh. Now, go on. And remember, not a squeak. Goodbye, Skip. Yeah, I'll move over here. Away so I can see you get inside and then I'll start to the top. Skip! Skip! Answer me! Skip! Where are you? There is something palpably ominous when darkness casts a veil over an ancient ruin. It is so easy to imagine almost anything. And whatever your fertile imagination creates could be horribly real. In just a moment, we'll show how real. And I return with Act Three. Something improbable because it has never happened to you? Do you doubt that men have walked in space and set new tracks upon the dusty surface of the moon? Does your mind reject the gods of ancient Greece who sat atop the fog-shrouded mountain of Olympus and played with human fates as a child plays with his toys? Then you have company, for Skip Turner is one of you. Give me your hand, Mr. Turner. Oh, who? Where? I regret your fall. The entrance to the sanctuary was left open by mistake. And you fell. I, I don't see anything. There's nothing. This stone is now back in its place. My name. You know my name. When you fell, 
You did not move. Unconscious. I discovered you had not broken anything but the torch you carried. Your name was on a card in your pocket. This room, you... You called it a sanctuary. Of the priestess, Pythia. It is here that she received the words of the god, Apollo. Uh, on the bus, coming up, I was reading that they never found the room where... Officially, they have not. My father is a scholar of the ancients and intends to reveal this chamber when we have concluded our research. Oh, how rude of me. I am Pythia. But... But that's the name of... The priestess. Yeah. My father is an archaeologist. You know, I almost forgot. There's a girl up above and some crazy character who calls himself Demetrius with, with murder in his heart. He will not find her. She will not be harmed. It is so. How do you know? Just because you have the same name doesn't mean you can read the future. It is so. Just as your coming here was ordained by Apollo. Ah, oh, come on. You can't take this stuff seriously. You see the wall? There. What do you see? Oh, somebody chiseled a couple of birds, big ones. Eagles. They belong to Zeus. It was Zeus who set them free from opposite ends of the world, and it was here in Delphi where they met. And that made it the middle of the world? Come on, now, I've got to get out of here. You may ascend. There is a passage that leads to the temple. Yeah, well, I'm worried about Val. Show me the way out. First, I must tell you of a necklace. A what? It was formed by Apollo, and it blazed like the sun. And Apollo gave it to Pythia as a reward for her faithful service. Yeah, good for her. Now, may I... You will listen, Mr. Turner. For your fate has also been ordained. But I only... I see want... wore it proudly for 1,200 years. And then it was stolen. Apollo was angry with Pythia. And he caused the earth to tremble. And even his temple, here above us, fell into pieces. He then decreed that Pythia would find no rest until the necklace had been returned to her. Do you understand, Mr. Turner? Look, I don't know what this all has to do with me. The priestess is a restless spirit, condemned to roam through time. It brings her only sadness and a longing for the days when the gods walk together with people. Yeah, well, I'm sorry for her. That's too bad. You should not tempt an angry god. Well, I'll take my chances. Hey, the ground's shaking. The gods speak. Oh, come on. You're crazy. It's an earthquake. The necklace. For the anger of the god will increase. You're out of your mind. Demetrius, you're working with me. Fate may be changed. The God speaks through me, Mr. Turner. I warn out. Come on before both of us get killed. Hear me. Do not ascend. For the God's vengeance awaits you. The slopes of Mount Parnassus are sacred. And the possession of the necklace is a death warrant. It is here, in the place of the oracle, that there is safety. The boulders that fall are as feathers. Give me peace, Mr. Turner. The necklace. I have waited all these millennia. Looks like I'm going to get killed. I want it to be in the open, not down here like a rat. Hey, hey, the light went out. I see you. Don't play games, huh? This place is falling apart. Now, you come with me. I see you. Where are you? Look, I can't stay here. Yes, that's it. Come in, come in. Uh, sir? You know who I am? You remember me? Oh, yes, sir. Colonel Poulos of the Atoms Police. Mm. You are named George? Yes. I drive bus. Also, I am the guide. I am looking for one of the Americans. A Mr. Turner. Do you know him? Uh, I have done nothing. Not you, George. An American. Listen. I arrived two hours ago, and the people here say that they saw Mr. Turner, but then he went out and he has not returned. I swear, sir, I do not... There is also a young lady, an American like Mr. Turner. Ah. You have seen him? Where? They, they, they sit in bus? Next to each other. Ah. 
She has light hair. And on the bus, she had the green dress. They come to wash, boss. What? But we do not wash. Lady be sick, then better. Good. Then they go walk. Then I drive, but I see car, white car. So stop, boss. But car is empty. Good car. Demetrios, it's his car. Then, uh, far away, boom, boom. Shots? You heard shots? Yeah, boom, boom. Tell me where you found the car. Exactly where? I've got to get there immediately. Val, are you there? It's me. Oh, yes. Who's oh, scared? He, he was shooting. I've never been so scared in my life. Okay, okay. And, and you... Where did you disappear All right, never mind. Where's Demetrius now? Oh, out there somewhere looking for you. Oh, Skip, couldn't we go down now if we're quiet? All right, we'll give it a try. No talking. Hold on to my hand. Yes. I've got to cross the floor of the temple. Skip? Shh, shh, That creep Demetrius could be anywhere. Do you want to give us away? That will not be necessary. Run! Run! That would be inadvisable. There is sufficient moonlight for me to see most clearly. Okay. Okay, I know when the strings run out. I'll make you a deal, Demetrius. I am holding the pistol, Mr. Turner. There is no need for me to bargain. Let the girl go. Perhaps. What does that mean? The necklace, or she will die first. Okay, you win, Demetrius. One what? Huh? final time what? I call to thee. A message, Lord. A sign. Who's that? Who's your call? What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? She's crazy. Thinks she's the original oracle or something. In the legend, there were eagles. A sign, Apollo. Show them your displeasure. No. That is just with All right. Okay, I've got a gun don't hand. Don't. Run, Val. Oh, oh, run. Don't. 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 Ah, the gun is still mine. The necklace. Throw it here. I shall only wait a moment. All right, catch it. The bird! It's diving! I don't believe it. The bird caught the necklace and is bringing it to Pythia. Oh, impossible. This cannot be. Apollo, you insisted in it right for play. You. Play you will all die. He hit her. Die! die. Look at me. Do you recognize me? I I think so. Mm. Colonel Poulos, I found you here on the edge of this hole in the ground. No, 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 no. Do not try to stand up. Skip? Mr. Turner is not here. You are alone. Oh, I remember now. Both swallowed up? Both? I know of Turner. Demetrius? Yes. They were right over there when it happened. Is there any chance? Uh, I would not think so. I'm sorry. Colonel? Oh, never mind. Is there something? Oh, you wouldn't believe me anyway. I wouldn't blame you. Will you allow me to be the judge? There was this girl. No old woman. So very old. As I said, we found no one here but yourself. This uh, woman, is there some doubt as to her age? You don't believe me. But she was so young. No more than... younger than I am. Yes, yes. Uh, go on, please. Well, she just appeared. First, she... she wasn't there. Just Skip and that man... Demetrius, they were fighting over the necklace. And then she she was there, by that rock, in, in a white robe. Demetrius almost had the necklace. But an eagle plucked it out of the air, brought it to her. An eagle? Yes. Miss Parker. <sighs> What's the use? I, I knew you'd act this way. But an eagle. No, wait. Wait, I, I, I remember something. Something Skip said. He... 
Oh, I think he told me her name. Ah, the name. What was it? Oh, a pit. Piss, piss, oh, I, I, I don't know, something like that. Pythia? Could be Pythia? That's it. Pythia. And, and when she put on the necklace, she began to age. Of course. Oh, don't humor me. I know what... Oh, I almost forgot. I took some pictures. Ah, then we will see how real your story is after they are developed, if you have it on film. Oh, I, I took them with my instant developing camera. But the one of Pythia didn't come out. Ah, uh-huh. we had better go. One thing is certain. There was an earthquake, and the crevasse was opened here. Could there be a chance? If they fell into it, none. Miss Parker... Your story, you must admit, it is difficult to believe... You say it was an eagle? Oh, yes, there was no doubt about it. I've seen eagles before. Eagles have not been seen here in hundreds of years. Oh, somehow I botched the shot of the woman, but will you take a, a look at this one? Holy mother. I, I don't believe. It is an eagle. And look in its talons. The necklace... any skeptics listening, here is a dispatch from the Greek National News Service. A mild tremor was reported in the area of Corinth and Delphi, which registered four on the Richter scale. At Delphi, two men lost their lives when they fell into a large rift in the earth. The quake revealed a hitherto unknown underground chamber, which is believed to be the legendary chamber of the Oracle of Mythology. I'll be back shortly. What life comes down to is a perpetual contest between good and evil. Mark Twain warned that if you are good, you'll be mighty lonesome. It would seem that not too many of us are content to be lonely. On the other hand, you might remember this when you meditate on the peculiar nature of man. There is so much good in the worst of us, and so much bad in the best of us, that it ill behooves any of us to find fault with the rest of us. Our cast included Larry Haynes, E.V. Juster, Ian Martin... And Matt Pollan. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. You can have Zoria, but let her keep Parker. At least in her memory. No. The whole world must know. Especially the scum who are still in hiding. Let them realize there is no escape. You're not going to kill Ramon Zoria. He is already dead. I listen to you. You know how? The way you listen to others, with deaf ears. He died on an island long ago. He will die here and now. Go ahead and pray. And what's wrong with praying? It's the will of the Lord that I be found. I'm content. You may kill me. I... I was hoping you would put up a fight. Uh, I would beg for your mercy. That would make it easier for you, wouldn't it? Or offer me a fortune the way Martinez did. How can you stand there quietly as if you're judging me? Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Pleasant dreams.